The Jell-O program, coming to you from the Rich Theater in New York City, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Cheerio. Ladies and gentlemen, if I seem to be just a bit excited tonight, please forgive me because Jack and I just got our first glance at a wonderful new recipe book that the General Foods people have been working on for the past year and a half. It's called The Calendar of Desserts. And friends, this calendar of desserts is the most attractive, most convenient, most exciting book of recipes ever introduced on the air. In all our seven years of broadcasting, we've never offered you, Jell-O listeners, a recipe book of any kind. Frankly, we wanted to wait until we had uh, something really outstanding. And the calendar of desserts is it. It's not just a small booklet that you'll use maybe a time or two, but a recipe book designed to be used every single day of the year with a grand dessert suggestion for every day from January to December, charmingly illustrated and cleverly arranged for rapid reference. Just name the day and presto, this convenient calendar names the dessert. There are 365 different ideas for all kinds of desserts, including pastries, puddings, cakes, cookies... And, of course, dozens of delightful Jell-O desserts, too. All of you I know will want this swell calendar of desserts, and we've made it easy to get. Simply send your name and address to Jack Benny, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan, enclosing 10 cents in coin or stamps. Write for your copy of this new handy calendar of desserts tonight, if possible, tomorrow, sure. played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, this week our program originates from New York City. Yes, sir. New York, which was originally purchased from the Indians for $24. Yep, 24 bucks. So tonight we bring you a man who could have bought it for $23.50, Jack Benny. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Jello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, I don't mind you kidding me about being tight when we're in Hollywood. But here in New York, it doesn't fit. You see, there's a guy living in this town that makes me look like Diamond Jim Brady. <laughs> yes, I think I know who you mean. I think you do. Uh, this particular fellow whom I shall refer to as F.A. <laughs> is so stingy that all during the election, he wore a Roosevelt button with Teddy scratched off. <laughs> and uh, Now, wait more. a minute, Jack. I wouldn't make any gags about Fred Allen if I were you. Remember, he's right here in New York, and you might have trouble with him. Oh, I'm not scared of that windbag. <laughs> Now, let me tell you something, Don. I've got a bodyguard with me that's one of the toughest mugs in New York City. His name is Killer Hogan. So don't be afraid to ask me what I told you to this morning. Go ahead, Don. Ask me. Okay. Tell me, Jack, why did Alan say on his last program that your teeth were so sensitive that you had to warm your dental floss before using? <laughs> is that true? Uh, no, he just said that because he's jealous. You see, Alan has no teeth at all. Well, I can't understand that. I've often seen him chewing gum. Don, you may have seen him uh, gumming his gum, but not chewing. <laughs> As a matter of fact... Uh, oh, hello, Hogan. Everything's okay outside, Chief. <laughs> okay. Everything okay in here, Chief? Yes, okay. I'm on the job, Chief. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, Don, it's sure great to be back on Broadway. And, oh, pardon me, Jack. Was that Killer Hogan? Yes, he may not look so tough, but he's really a gorilla. 
Uh, tell me, Don, have you uh, had any fun in New York? Oh, yes, indeed, Jack. The little woman and I are having a grand time. Oh, yes, the little woman. By the way, Don, as long as this trip is a sort of a honeymoon for you, I'd like to pay your wife's hotel bill as well as yours. Oh, no, you don't have to do that, Jack. Oh, yes, Don, I insist. Well, thanks, thanks very much. That, that's darn nice of you. That's all right. By the way, uh, where are you living? At the Ritz-Carlton. Oh. <laughs> Oh, the uh, Ritz-Carlton, eh? Yes, it's on Madison Avenue. I know where it is, you big fat head. <laughs> All right, Don, I made a promise, and I'm going through with it. You can live at the Ritz. Thanks. Now, here's a handful of nickels. You know where to eat. <laughs> no use standing in line for change. Uh, hey, change. Oh. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a dame out here. Should I let her in? A dame? Yeah, she looks suspicious. Out of my way, ecstasy. Mary. <laughs> Mary, aren't you the one? You know, Mary, you got a bigger reception than I did. You must be... Hogan, what are you standing there for? She took my blackjack away from me. <laughs> Mary, please return Mr. Hogan's blackjack. Some blackjack. It's got jelly beans in it. Never mind. Hand it over. Okay. Here it is, Hogan. Don't... Oh. Darn you. Mary, I won't have you beating up my bodyguard. You can go, Hogan. Okay, Chief. Now, Mary, was that nice? A fine bodyguard. He's okay. I got him from a very reliable employment agency. He must have sent you a manicure by mistake. <laughs> just leave him alone, that's all. Okay. Hello, Don. How's the little woman? Oh, she's just fine, thanks. And you know what, Mary? What? Jack is paying all of our expenses at the Ritz Carlton. That's great. Jack who? <laughs> Jack me, that's who. I'm paying all the expenses for Don and his wife while they're in New York. It was my own idea. Can't be the heat. It's cold here. <laughs> all right, it's cold here. Oh, by the way, Mary, I saw you last night at the Edwin show. Did you see it, Jack? Edwin? Uh, not yet, Don. Well, don't miss it. He's a scream. <laughs> I tell you, Jack, my side still ain't. <laughs> oh. Edwin, eh? You should have been there. You know, Jack, Don laughs louder at Edwin than he does at you. Oh, he does, eh? What else do you see, Mary? Oh, I saw a lot of swell shows. I've been going every night. Edwin, eh? I saw George Washington slept here and Panama Hattie, and I saw... Just a minute, Mary. Listen, Wilson, what's so funny about Edwin? <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, Jack, I think he's one of the best comedians I've ever seen. Oh, you do, eh? Yes, I do. Well, then get him to pay your wife's expenses at the Ritz. <laughs> Oh, Jack, you don't expect Don to go to a musical comedy and not laugh at it, do no, you? No, but he doesn't have to keep raving about Ed Wynn all the time. I wasn't raving about him. I just said I liked him. All right, you like him. That doesn't mean you have to go around telling people that I'm washed up. Then he's through. <laughs> Finish. Who said that? I can read between the lines, brother. What are you talking about? The minute he gets in town, he's got to run right over and see the Ed Wynn show. Oh, Jack. And he comes to the program. All he talks about, Ed Wynn, Ed Wynn, Ed Wynn. <laughs> That's all I hear. Well, what about it? Personally, I can see no reason for paying his wife's hotel bill. <laughs> so? <laughs> so the, uh, the deal's off, Don. Oh, boy, I wish I could get out of my girdle that easy. <laughs> I wasn't trying to get out of it, Mary, but... Say, Chief. Oh, fine. Uh, there's a young fella out in the hall who claims he's a tenor. Should I give him the old one, too? <laughs> no, let him in. Okay. Come in, you. Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, oh, Mr. Benny. <laughs> now, you can go now, killer. Dennis, give Mr... <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, give Mr. Hogan his blackjack. The jelly beans, too? Yes. Now, get out, Hogan. <laughs> Who is he, Mr. Benny? My bodyguard. I got him in case Fred Allen tries to have me slugged. Well, something. you don't have to worry about anyone annoying you at the hotel, Mr. Benny. You're at the Sherry Netherlands, aren't you? Yes, Dennis. Why? Well, my uncle is the house detective there. Oh, is that so? What's his name? Peekaboo McNulty. <laughs> Oh, 
<laughs> oh, yes, I met him. And by the way, I wish you'd speak to him, Dennis. He threw an ant of mine out of my room yesterday. <laughs> It was very embarrassing. I'll mention it to him. Thanks. Well, Dennis, as long as Phil isn't here yet for his band number, how about doing your song? Okay. I wonder where he is, anyway. Mary, did you call Phil at his hotel like I told you to? Yes, and before I could tell him who I was, he made a date with me. Oh, well, he'll probably be along pretty soon. Go ahead, Dennis. Let's have your number. Okay. Now what? Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? It gives me extreme pleasure to welcome you to our... Thanks, Hogan. Drag him out. <laughs> Okay, Chief, I knew I'd get rolling. I knew you would. <laughs> Once before I fell in love so blindly Never asking how or why or when Darling, I was treated so unkindly I resolved I'd never fall again There I go, leading with my heart again There I go, acting not so smart again Oh, it's unwise I can't disguise my love Oh, I know Too much love may curb the fire There I go Led astray by my desire There's no golden rule To guide a fool in love I tell my heart, be careful, or you'll find that you dream alone. I'm wise, it's true, what good does it do? My heart has a mind of its own, dear. And there I go, spilling all the dreams I knew. There I go, thrillingly in love with you. Don't know if you care, darling. There I go. That was uh, There I Go, sung by Peekaboo's nephew. <laughs> And very good. By the way, Dennis, you remember before we left Hollywood, I promised your mother I'd keep an eye on you and see that you behaved yourself. Who, me? Yes, you. I don't want to stop you from having a good time here in New York, but I don't like the idea of you're going to burlesque shows and then waiting at the stage entrance for the girls. That isn't nice. Well, you do it. <laughs> Dennis, after all, I'm a little older than you are. A little, he says. <laughs> I mean, I'm an adult. In the first place. Hiya, Jackson. Look what I found out in the hall. Phil, put Hogan down. <laughs> okay, well, here I am, folks. Come on, Patty Kay. <laughs> you had to ask for it, didn't you? All right, killer, you can go. Should I give him the old one, too, Chief? <laughs> no, just get out. Okay. I'm on the job, Chiefy boy. <laughs> Say, Jackson, who is that guy? Never mind him, Phil. What's the idea of showing up so late? Well, you know how it is, Jackson. I only get to the big town once a year. I got a lot of things to do, a lot of things to see. Uh-huh. Now, take this afternoon, for instance. I, I went to Staten Island. You went to Staten Island? How did that happen? I followed a blonde into a hotel that turned out to be a ferry boat. <laughs> oh, so you went to Staten Island, eh, Phil? Did you see the Statue of Liberty? Yeah, and she waved at me. Now, cut that out! <laughs> Anyway, Phil, it's nice to do a little sightseeing while we're in New York. Oh, boy, Fifth Avenue on a windy day. <laughs> Quiet. What a guy. 
Say, Phil, don't forget you promised to take me to see Life with Father next week. It's a date, Mary. Wait a minute, Mary. I took you to see Life with Father the last time we were in New York. Yeah, but look where we sat. Way, way up in the balcony. Oh, we weren't up so high. Go on, a St. Bernard dog brought us our program. <laughs> Don't be silly. We couldn't have been so far up. I saw the whole show. Sure, but you hogged the telescope. You had it just as much as I did. Hey, Chief. Oh, my. Uh, there's a man outside that says he's a doctor. A doctor? Yes. Should I give him the old one, too? Yeah, give him the one, too. Where is he? Jack, look. It's that quack you had in Hollywood. Oh, my goodness. Well, well. How's my little man this chilly, willy day? Dr. Leroy, I told you last week my cold was cured. What are you doing in New York? Now, I've got a cold. Is there any of that medicine left? <laughs> no, there isn't. Well, as long as I'm here, I might as well look you over. Doc, I told you there's nothing wrong with me. I feel wonderful. Now, open your coat. Oh. I want to tap your chest. Now, what's the use? Now, hold still. You see, there's nothing wrong. Let's try over here. <laughs> Well, there goes my watch. <laughs> now, Doc, will you please leave me alone? Just a minute. I want to see if your lungs are all right. Take a deep breath. Oh. Come now, take a real deep breath. Oh, all right. Now hold it. Ladies and gentlemen, while Jack is holding his breath, why don't you run down to your neighborhood grocer and ask him for a package of Jell-O? It is not only tempting, but economical and easy to make. Mm, 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 mm. Jell-O comes in six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Mm, mm, mm. So always look for the big red letters on the box. I thank you. Well, good night, Mr. Benny. Mm, 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 mm. I'll see you tomorrow, and then you can exhale. I'm exhaling right now. For heaven's sake, how long do you think I can hold my breath? Look at his face, Doc. It's all blue. Don't worry. It'll go back to gray in just a minute. <laughs> Goodbye. Imagine that hey, wasn't guy. He a, wasn't he a different doctor than we had the first show? <laughs> You know, folks, that's what I like about radio. If your doctor gets sick, you can always use one of your writers. Imagine that guy coming all the way from Los Angeles. He was here, Mary. He didn't come from Los Angeles. Believe me. I see him every day. Well, it's Rochester's fault. I told him before we left Hollywood to call up the doctor and tell him I don't need him anymore. Hey, Jackson, where is Rochester? I don't know. I haven't seen him since our first day in town. We got off the train, he came to the hotel with me, unpacked my trunk, pressed my new brown suit, put it on, and that's the last I saw. <laughs> now, Phil, play a number while I cool off a little, will you? Okay. But listen, Jackson, this isn't my regular band, so don't expect too much. Phil, believe me, if they hit just one good note during the entire number... You have not made this trip in vain. <laughs> now go ahead, Chiefy. was anything played by <laughs> Phil Harris. Oh, so you're the one played by Phil Harris and his New York Orchestra. Say, uh, Phil, uh, where did you pick up these musicians? Oh, I just stood in front of the Bond building and whistled. 
<laughs> well, from the sample I just heard, you better go back there and pucker up. <laughs> Say, Mary, uh, do me a favor, will you? Uh, what do you want? Uh, get my little book out of my overcoat. I got some phone numbers there where I might be able to reach Rochester. Okay. I'll find out once and for all whether he's California's ambassador to Harlem or working for me. Hey, Chief. Oh, fine. What is it, Hogan? There's a guy out here who says he's the mayor. The mayor? Yeah, he don't look like LaGuardia to me. <laughs> he don't, eh? No. Hello, Jack. Can I see you for a minute? What? Why, it's the mayor of Walt Keegan, Bidey Talcott. Come on in, Bidey. <laughs> well, this certainly is a surprise. I'm glad to see you, Bidey. Listen, Hogan, this gentleman is the mayor of my hometown. Oh, oh, oh. Then I'm glad I didn't give him the old one, too. <laughs> What do you mean, the old one-two? One-two, button my shoe, three, three four, four, shut the door. Yeah. I know. Get out of here, will you? Holy smoke. Huh? My goodness, Jack, who is that fellow? Well, it's like this, Bidey. Fred Allen's got a bunch of thugs out looking for me, so I had to hire a bodyguard. Bidey, you know the gang, don't you? Sure. Hello, Phil and Don. Oh, glad to see you, Mayor Talcott. Hiya, Bidey. What's cooking? Phil, please. <laughs> well, well. And there's Kenny Baker. Hello, Kenny. Hello. Dennis, wake up. You're not Kenny Baker. What's the difference? A tenor's a tenor. Well, I've had trouble with all of them, if that's what you mean. <laughs> Tell me, Bidey, how's the old gang in Waukegan? How's Julius Sinekin and Stubb Wilburn? Oh, they're around. The last time I saw Stubb, he was on the floor of his garage. Well, fixing a car, eh? Nope, just laying there. <laughs> Ah, good old stuff, huh? Here's your little red book, Jack. Thanks. Oh, Mary, you remember Bidey Talcott, the mayor of Waukegan, don't you? Oh, sure. Hello, Mary. Hello, Bidey. What's that under your nose? <laughs> that didn't go the first show, either. <laughs> uh, say, Bidey, I don't know why we didn't change that. We were changing. How did I overlook that? Bidey, I meant to ask you, isn't that your gavel sticking out of your coat pocket? Yeah. Well, what do you need that for? You're in New York. I brought some walnuts with me. Oh. Goody, after the show, we'll have a party. Yeah. Now, excuse me a minute, Bidey. Say, Mary, I've got to get in touch with Rochester. Call up this first number in my little book. He may be there. Okay. Well, Bidey, I can't get over your being in New York. What's the big idea? I came to see you about the premiere of your picture, Jack. We're all set for you and Walt Keegan. And Walt Keegan? Why, Bidey, didn't you know the premiere of Love Thy Neighbor is being held right here in New York Tuesday night? Well, I'll be doggone. Jack, yeah. that number's ringing. Uh, give me the phone. Excuse me, Bidey. Uh, hello? Hello. This is the Harlem Social Benevolent and Spare Ribs Ever Thursday Club. <laughs> oh, can you uh, tell me if Rochester's there? Come again? Uh, Rochester Van Jones. He works for me, and I want to talk to him. Uh, are you Mr. Jack Benny? Yes. Uh-oh. <laughs> What do you mean, oh, oh, is he there or not? Well, he was here, Mr. Benny, but as soon as he started to win, he left. Oh, I see. Was he shooting craps? Uh, he must have been. We ain't much on backgammon up here. <laughs> oh, well, where do you think I can get in touch with Rochester? Uh, you might try Monument 81700. That's his girlfriend. All right, thank you. Mary, try Monument 8, 1700. Okay, Chief. <laughs> oh, Bidey. Yes, Jack. I'm surprised you didn't know about the premiere being held in New York. Well, can't you switch it to Waukegan? Uh, not very well. You see, it's all set for the Paramount Theater here Tuesday night, Bidey. And... Well, I'll be doggone. Yeah, well, look, Bidey, there was nothing here I could... Here you are, Jack. Give me that phone. Excuse me, Bidey. Hello? Susan Brown, the sweetest gal in town, talking. <laughs> Well, Miss Brown, uh, this is Jack Benny. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm trying to get in touch with Rochester. Is he there? He was, yes. Oh. Well, do you think he'll come back? In all modesty, I can guarantee that. <laughs> Brown, when he returns, will you please have him call my hotel? And also tell him he's not getting any salary this week. That ain't gonna worry him much. He's got a paradise that must have gone to Harvard. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, he has. Well, Miss Brown, where do you think I could reach him right now? Well, he left a number here. Uh, Lehigh 25863. Lehigh 25863. Is that another girl? If it is, I'm going to cut your brown suit to ribbon. <laughs> Call anyway. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Doggone, that boy's always in trouble. <laughs> they marry. What? Uh, Rochester won a lot of money in a crap game last night. Well, figure out some way to get it yourself. I'm busy. <laughs> it's not why I mentioned it. Dial Lehigh 2 5863 and see if he's there. Okay. You know, Bidey, I'm awfully sorry about the premiere, but didn't you get my letter? Sure, but I want the opening to be in Waukegan. So do I, Bitey, but it can't be done. Well, why not? Look, Bitey, if I told you once, I told you five <laughs> times. The premiere is in New York, and there's nothing I can do about it. Here you are, Jack. Give me the phone. Excuse me, Bitey. Hello? Hello, Lennox Avenue, Jim to your spin club. <laughs> Now, look, Mr. Uh, Mr. Radcliffe Spears, Jr. talking, sir. Now, look, Radcliffe, I'm trying to get in touch with Rochester Van Jones. Uh oh. <laughs> this is Jack Benny. Yeah, you heard me, uh oh, didn't you? <laughs> now, listen, uh, what about Rochester? Is he there? Uh, he was here, but he made his point and left. <laughs> I know, I understand he's been very lucky. Lucky, he says. <laughs> now, Radcliffe, please tell me, where did Rochester go? I don't know. Hey, Sylvester, where did Rochester go? I don't know. Hey, Pancake, where did Rochester go? I don't know. Hey, hey, hey. I did everything I could to have the premiere held in Waukegan. I went to Paramount personally. I argued about it. But they insisted that it must be in New York. So you see, Bidey, if there was anything I could possibly do, I did not have to do it. Friends, during the last few months, I've heard a lot of stories about what a swell book this new General Foods calendar of desserts was going to be. But honestly, I never dreamed it was going to be half as beautiful and original as it really is. It's a unique dessert book that gives you a new dessert idea for every day in the year. 365 different suggestions covering every kind of dessert and a whole host of clever Jell-O treats, too. For example, on page 9, there's a recipe for a grand dessert called Current Ruby Molds. Made with rich red strawberry jello, and it's really good. Strawberry jello, you know, like raspberry jello, is now better than ever with the new improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. So get your copy of the calendar of desserts and be all ready to make this grand treat and 364 others. Just send 10 cents in coin or stamps to Jack Benny, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan, and a copy of this beautiful, useful day by day calendar of desserts will be mailed to you promptly. Send for yours today. number of the 11th program in the current Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night, still broadcasting from New York City. Say, Bidey, as long as you're in town, how about sticking around till Tuesday and see the opening of our picture? Okay, of course I'll have to call up the little woman. Well, now you're talking. Good night, Joni. Check it out.
The Jell-O program, coming to you from the Ritz Theater in New York City, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Tookie. <laughs> You know, friends, a lovely shimmering mold of jello on the table has a wonderful way of lending luster to a meal, just as Christmas trees and candles, tinsel and holly lend their own special gaiety to this merriest of merry seasons. Even the simplest family dinner takes on extra charm and attractiveness when the high point of the meal is a grand jello dessert. How inviting its shining colors look, and how intriguing its rich, tempting flavor tastes. No other dessert can add more to the spirit and pleasure of any occasion. Because no other dessert can outrival Jell-O's glistening beauty and refreshing goodness. So, ladies and gentlemen, decide now to add a new note of festive delight to your meals during the holiday season. Tomorrow, ask your grocer for Jell-O in any of Jell-O's six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. By the way, strawberry and raspberry Jell-O both have a new improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And the result is a rich, distinctive goodness rivaled only by the juicy, ripe fruit itself. A unique flavor that cannot be duplicated in any other way. Try a grand treat made with genuine Jell-O and you'll realize right away why Jell-O is America's favorite gelatin dessert. Tookie played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, there being just two more shopping days till Christmas, we bring you that fugitive from Gimbel's basement, Jack Benny. Thank you. Hello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And Don, speaking of Gimbel's basement, I never saw so many women shopping in my life. I got shoved around like a blintza in Lindy's. <laughs> Boy, what a mob. Pretty hectic, huh? Hectic. You know, Don, I can understand my derby getting caved in, my muffler torn, and the sleeve of my coat ripped off. But how I lost my pivot tooth, I'll never know. <laughs> that was really an experience. <laughs> oh, I can just imagine what you must have gone through. You know, a funny thing about women, Don, all year long they're so helpless. You have to open the door for them. They can't light their own cigarettes. They cling to your arm as you walk down the street. They're as delicate as butterflies. And then, about two weeks before Christmas, a mad glint comes into their eyes. And with an umbrella for gouging and a handbag for slugging, off they go. Come on, girls, let's mangle the mail. That's their battle cry. Well, Jack, women are a little excitable when they're shopping around Christmas time, but I don't think they're as tough as you say. Oh, you don't, eh? Don, I was in Macy's yesterday afternoon, and a little gray-haired lady, couldn't have been over five feet tall, put down her cane and yanked a washing machine right out of my arm. <laughs> I tried to get it back, and she kicked my hat off. <laughs> Imagine. My goodness, Jack, you don't mean to say that a little old lady took a big washing machine away from you. Don, I wouldn't have minded that so much, but it was a demonstrator. I'll probably never get my laundry back. <laughs> that is my own fault, I guess, for waiting so long to shop. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, doll. Doll? Well, look who's so affectionate around Christmas. You're certainly giving out with that soft soap. Oh, no, I'm not, Jack. You're not, eh? Then why did you call me doll? Because your hair is glued on. <laughs> All right, all right, young lady, that did it. There goes that mink coat I was going to buy you for a present. You were going to buy me a mink coat? Yes, I were, or was. <laughs> I was going to buy you a mink coat. I bet it were, or was, from Rabbit. <laughs> oh, no, it wasn't. You've lost a very beautiful gift. And you know, and you know the kind I hand out. Go on, you wouldn't buy Hedy Lamar a Coca-Cola. For Christmas? What are you talking about? <laughs> Let me tell you something, Mary. A girl like Hetty Lamar could make a playboy out of me. I'd buy her quarts of bubbling champagne. You'd buy cider and put an Alka-Seltzer in it. 
right, keep it up, keep it up. There goes Don's Christmas present, too. Hey, wait a minute, Jack. I didn't say anything. Oh, pardon me, Don. I got a little mixed up there. Watch out, Don. He's laying for you. No, I wouldn't forget about Don's present. Not after the way he laughed at the premiere last Tuesday night. How'd you like the picture, Don? Oh, I really enjoyed it, Jack. I got a big kick out of it. I laugh like anything. Sorry, Mary. The mink coat is over the dam. <laughs> Anyway, Don, now that you've seen Love Thy Neighbor, what do you think of Fred Allen in it? Well, to tell you the truth, Jack... I mean, don't you feel... <laughs> don't you feel that I get much bigger laughs than he does? Well, to tell you the truth, Jack, I think you're very good in the picture and so is Allen. The honors are equally distributed. Oh. Oh, I see. Oh. Oh. Uh-oh. Mary. <laughs> then, Don, in your fat-headed opinion... <laughs> You think Alan goes over as good as I do. Exactly. You both have a lot to do in the picture. You both photograph well, and you both get big laughs. Well, we both don't pay your salary, so start leaning my way. <laughs> Imagine saying we photograph equally well. That's ridiculous. Jack looks much better than Alan. Why, certainly. And Alan, you can have. <laughs> Mary, one more crack out of you, and you'll be saying, Oh, my goodness, I left my baby in the automat for Olsen and Johnson. <laughs> Remember that. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Well, old pal, you got nothing to worry about. I got your Christmas present bought, packed, and ready to hand over. Oh, so you've been shopping too, eh, Phil? You said it. All day yesterday, one store after another. Well, did the women kick you around much? Yeah, but I got it coming to me. <laughs> Said it. You know, Phil, I've been so busy, I haven't had a chance to buy your present yet. Uh, what did you get for me? I ain't saying. You'll have to wait till Christmas. Oh, come on, Phil. Tell me. All right, Jackson, I'll tell you what I bought you. Remember that camel's hair overcoat we saw in the window on Fifth Avenue? The one you were so nuts about? Yeah. Well, I got you a box of nuts. <laughs> oh, well, Phil, unless you're kidding... When Mary is in the audience stooging for Olsen and Johnson, you'll be in the lobby trying to get out of a straitjacket. <laughs> Catch on? The way I've been going the last few nights, a straitjacket wouldn't be bad. He's not fooling, folks. <laughs> you know, Phil lives on the 18th floor of the St. Moritz Hotel, and he never uses the elevator. He just goes in and out the window. <laughs> Now, Phil... Yeah? It's about uh, a little quicker on the yeah. You know, when I say now, Phil, you come right back. Yeah, there's no laugh when I say now, Phil, you know. Yeah. It's about time for a band number, so let's have it. What are you going to play? I don't know. This bunch don't speak English. Oh, fine. Well, don't worry about it, Phil. Just pick up your baton and follow him. Go ahead, kid. <laughs> was Jingle Bells, played by Phil Harris and his Central Park troubadours. Uh, troubadours meaning they are traveling musicians, 
And Central Park meaning they ought to get a room tonight. <laughs> that joke went over better the first show. It shows you we should change for the night show. <laughs> What a gang you picked up here, Phil. Huh? Well, music is just a sideline with these boys. I know. And I wish you'd tell the drummer to stop pestering me. I've got all the potato peelers I need. <laughs> Those guys sell everything from razor blades to mink coats. Ha ha! What are you all hoeing about? Fink, the fiddle player, has wonderful mink. <laughs> I saw him. Hello, Mr. Benny. Uh, hello, Dennis. Boy, am I a wreck. Women, women. Nothing but women. <laughs> oh, have you? Have you been shopping, too? No, I just came from Roseland. Oh, oh ten cents a dance, eh? Yeah, I cleaned up. <laughs> Hey, Dennis. Dennis, I hear that you and Kenny Baker have been stepping out and seeing the town together. Is that right? Yeah. And you know what, Mr. Benny? What? The other night I made him pay for everything. I stuck him for $2.45. You did? Well, now, Dennis, that's not very nice. If Kenny is kind enough to show you a good time, the least you can do is go 50-50. Or better still, pay all the expenses yourself. It's all right to save money, Dennis, but there's... Nothing like being a good sport. <laughs> What's that for, Miss Livingston? Everybody else knows. <laughs> That's so. You see, Dennis, there's only one way to be popular. When you're out with a fella and he reaches for the check, you take it first. And if he should pick it up, you grab it right out of his hand. Grab it. I can't stand this. <laughs> Mary, come back here. Okay. What's the matter with you? Dennis is just a kid, and while he's still young, he's got to be taught how to conduct himself in public and not be a cheapskate. I don't understand you, Mr. Benny. No, you don't. <laughs> I don't understand you, Mr. Benny. You don't understand. Well, look, Dennis, I'll explain it to you. Dennis, we'll go out for a bite to eat after the broadcast, and I'll show you what I mean. I'll pick up the check, and you take it away from me. <laughs> See? Then I'll take it away from you, and then you take it away from me. Then what? That's all, Bob. <laughs> Mary, I warned you. Cut it out, kid. Cut it hey, out. Jackson. Yes, Phil? My band number's over, and I still got a lot of Christmas shopping to do. Do you mind if I run along? Why, no, Phil. In fact, I think I'll go with you. There are a lot of things I got to get myself. Don, you can take charge of the rest of the program, can't you? Oh, sure, sure. Don't worry about it, Jack. Come on with us, Mary. I want you to help me pick out a few things. Okay, but don't embarrass me. I won't. You know, there's a swell store near my hotel, the Sherry Netherlands, where I can buy almost... <laughs> Wait a minute. Answer the phone, Mary. Okay. Hello? Hello, Miss Livingston. This is Rochester. Oh, boy, are you going to get us? Jack, it's Rochester. Rochester. <laughs> Give me that phone. I'll find out right now where he's been for the past two weeks. Hello? Hello, boss. What happened to you? Where you been? <laughs> Where have I been? I've been on the phone for the last ten days trying to reach you. I called every hot spot in Harlem that's got a telephone. At the hot ones, you can't hear it ring. <laughs> Rochester, I don't want any flippancies. I want the truth. Now, we arrived in New York a week ago Thursday. The 12th, they tell me. <laughs> yes, the 12th. It is now December 22nd. Just three days before Christmas. Happy Yuletide, boys! Never mind that! <laughs> what I want to know is, what became of the time between December 12th when we got here and December 22nd, which is today? Well? Well? Well, on Friday the 13th, I was right up to the door of your hotel, ready to go to work. Uh-huh. And just as I was about to enter, a black cat ran across my path. I see. Well, couldn't you walk around the cat? I did and wound up at 125th Street. <laughs> oh, well, so much for Friday. 
Now, what happened on Saturday and Sunday? I we can't end it up to Harlem. Up a Hudson, that up is. Hudson. Take it again, huh? <laughs> How did I know when he's on the other side of the telephone? Okay. Well, we'll get to Monday. I must be psychic. Then we'll get to Monday. After your weekend, Rochester, why didn't you call me at my hotel? I was so full of sherry, I couldn't think of Netherlands. Now, don't give me that. Look, Rochester, I haven't any more time to argue with you. Where are you calling from? Uh, what's that, boss? I said, where are you right now? Just a minute. What's the address here, sugar? 31 Lennox Avenue, honey. 31 Lennox Avenue, honey. <laughs> Rochester, who are you talking to? Susan Brown, the sweetest gal in town. Oh, yeah, I spoke to her last week and left a message for you. Did you get it? Just a minute. Honey, did you give me a message from Mr. Benny? Why, Rochester, you knows I did. She forgot to give it to me, boy. <laughs> Oh, she forgot to give it to you, eh? Yeah, she's as dizzy as a blonde, but it can't happen here. <laughs> I see. Now, Rochester, I want you to go over to my hotel right away. That made up for the one you muck. <laughs> I want you to go over to my hotel right away. There's a lot of work to do, and it's got to be done before tomorrow. Yes, sir. Now, how soon can you get over there? Just a minute, boss. Say, Sugar, I don't think I'll be able to take you to the Savoy Ballroom tonight. Oh, that's all right, honey. I'll get somebody else. You better not get somebody else. I ain't going up there alone, Rochester. I want somebody to snuggle up to. You get somebody to snuggle up to, and it'll be your last snug. <laughs> Rochester. And I do mean last. You threaten me, Shorty, and I'll cut them $9 out of your hip pocket. <laughs> Rochester, answer me. I want you to come right over to my hotel. Leaving right away, boss. So long. Goodbye. Now, listen, sugar, don't make any date. I'll run over to see Mr. Benny, put on the old personality, and be back here in a half hour. Rochester, you forgot to hang up. Uh-oh. Oh, Rochester. <laughs> Yes, boy. I heard your conversation. Don't you believe it? Get over here. <laughs> Goodbye. I'm the same trouble with that guy every time I come to New York. Come on, Mary. Let's go shopping while I'm mad. Yeah, that'll hold you down. Let's go, Phil. Right with you, Jackson. All right, Dennis. Let's have your song.
Now, stick close to me, Phil. You too, Mary. I don't want you to get lost. Okay, Papa. Hmm. Are you going to take us to see Santa Claus, Daddy? <laughs> Pipe down, both of you. Got to have some system here. Now, let's see my Christmas list. I got to buy a compact or something for my Aunt Molly. A lawnmower for Dennis. <laughs> a Mickey for my rider. <laughs> Let's see. A deck of cards for Simney. Let's see. What else here? See, look at that crowd of women at the bargain counter. Where? Oh, boy, what a mob. See you later, Jackson. I'm going over and mingle. See you later. Gosh, I wish I knew what to get for Aunt Molly. Mary, I wonder if she could use a lipstick. Has she got lips? What do you think? <laughs> she got lips. Here's a counter. Here. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Uh, I'd like a lipstick, please. Oh, come now. <laughs> Look, it's not for me. I'm buying it for my Aunt Molly. I see. <laughs> a lipstick for your Aunt Molly. That's who it's for. She lives in Chicago on LaSalle Street. What number? <laughs> I don't know the number. Oh, you don't know the number, and yet you want to send a lipstick to your Aunt Molly. I'm not going to send it. I'm going to take it to her. I'm going to stop off in Chicago on my way to California. Oh, I suppose you're the only one that ever went to California. <laughs> what are you talking about? I live in California. I got a home there. Well, I've got a home here, but I don't brag about it. I wasn't bragging. Now, look, mister, all I want is a lipstick. Am I going to get it or not? Sorry, I've decided against you. <laughs> Next case, please. Guy isn't screwy, then I don't know what. More trouble over a lipstick. Mary, I ought to go over to the grocery department and get Don a case of Jello. He'll love it for Christmas. And why don't you get two cases so you can fill a stocking? I'll get all the six flavors. That'll do it. And Mary, while we're in the store, I think I'll buy a collar button. I need one. Yeah, your Adam's apple ain't practical. It's just an emergency. I lost a button. There's the men's department over there. Pardon me, could you tell me where I can buy an evening gown so I should look like Lena Turner? <laughs> Miss, that's Lana Turner. Lena, Lana, I'll never make it. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Miss. I'm Jack Benny. I'm not a floor walker. I saw your picture. Get ready. <laughs> She looks like Babe Marks. <laughs> Come on, Mary, let's get that collar button. <laughs> I haven't got much time. You'd have plenty of time if you stopped flirting with that girl. Who was flirting? She thought I was a floor walker, didn't she? Well, you didn't have to roll your big blue eyes at her. Mary, just because my eyes happen to be large and devil may carry. <laughs> Don't have to accuse me of flirting. Here we are. Good evening, sir. What can I do for you? I'd like to buy a collar button. A collar button? Yes, sir. Now, here's a nice one for $85. $85 for a collar button? Yes, that includes dress shirt, tie, socks, patent leather shoes, and a double-breasted tuxedo. Well, that's a good buy, all right, but all I want is a collar button. Sorry, we never break up a set. <laughs> well, now, that's ridiculous. You know, mister, I've shopped in every city in the United States, but I've never been in a store like this. I tried to buy some lipstick a few minutes ago. Lipstick? Oh, come now. <laughs> it sounds silly, but I had a good reason. And the salesman at that counter insulted me. Oh, Jack, look. What is it? Look who's over there at that counter. Where? Right there. Isn't that Kenny Baker buying a camera? Well, sure enough, it is Kenny. Let's go over and say hello. <laughs> Gee, miss, this camera looks swell. I think I'll take it. How much is it? Three dollars. Three dollars? Gee, Dennis would like it all right, but haven't you got something for 55 cents? Well, yes, but I thought you wanted to spend three dollars. I do, but he's already hooked me for 245. <laughs> oh, Kenny. Hello, Kenny. Huh? Oh, well, well, I'll be doggone. Hello, Jack. How are you, Mary? Gee, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> Gosh, Kenny, I haven't seen you in a long time. Hey, you're, you're getting to be a big boy now. I sure am. You want a cigar, Jack? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Look, Mary, he's got a whole pocket full of cigars. Yeah, I had them left over from Wilkie. <laughs> oh, 
fine. Same old telly. How about a little kiss, Mary? Okay. Hmm. Big boy, all right. Cigars and everything. Huh? All right, kids, break it up. <laughs> Come on. Wow, he has grown up. Say, that was a real kiss, huh? Personally, I'm a wreck. <laughs> well, pull yourself together. Come on with us, Kenny. You can buy your camera later. I want to talk to you. Okay. I'll see you later. i got to buy some hose. All right. So long, Larry. Say, Kenny, how do you like your new job? See, that Fred Allen is pretty tough to work for, isn't he? No, he's swell. We get along great together. Oh. <laughs> but I'll bet you don't have as much fun as you used to have on the old Jello show. Gee, you remember all the laughs and good times and everything? Yeah. But I'm having a wonderful time with Fred. Ah. Gee, talk about laughs. Say, he's a riot. That's so? Yeah. <laughs> and you know what, Jack? Mr. Allen pays me every week. <laughs> hmm. Does, eh? Yep. Pays you every week. Huh? Yeah, none of that see me later, kid stuff. <laughs> Well, you must have a pretty short memory, Kenny. I used to have that envelope for you every week, too. Yeah, but with Mr. Allen, I don't have to play treasure hunt. <laughs> oh, well, good, clean sport. Never hurt anybody. Say, Kenny. Yes, please? Oh, fine. <laughs> Say, Kenny, I just happened to think of something. Remember the time you first came to work for me and I invited you over to the house for a Thanksgiving party? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget how bashful you were. You remember I asked you if you wanted to have some more turkey? Yeah, and I was so darn nervous I said yes. Oh, that turkey wasn't so bad. Have you got much left? <laughs> Same old Kenny. Gosh, I'll never forget the time. Kenny, remember when it was Halloween and I didn't know you were in the backyard? Huh? Yeah. All of a sudden, I heard a noise at the window, and there you were. Wasn't that fun? Oh, I sure was. <laughs> Thanksgiving and Christmas are two days out of the year when it's fairly easy to decide on a dessert. Because you can figure that most families will be looking ahead to mince pie, pumpkin pie, or plum pudding. But during the rest of the 365 days of the year, choosing a dessert is always a problem. And that's where General Foods' new calendar of desserts comes to your rescue. This handsome recipe book gives you a different dessert inspiration for every day in the year. Between its bright, attractive covers, you'll find 365 suggestions for all kinds of delicious treats, profusely illustrated with beautiful color photographs. There's page after page crammed with mouth-watering pictures and descriptions of clever dessert dishes, pastries, puddings, cakes, and cookies, not to mention lots and lots of grand jello desserts. A flip of the page brings you a new and tempting dessert idea every day, and it's easy to get, too. Just mail 10 cents in coin or stamps to Jack Benny, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan, and a copy of the calendar of desserts will be forwarded to you at once. Send for yours today. Merry Christmas. See you Wednesday, Miss Benny. How often do you lie awake at night, ladies and gentlemen, listening to the ticking of the clock grow louder and louder and louder? And how often would you avoid that wakefulness if you drank Sanka coffee instead of ordinary coffee? Sanka coffee permits sleep because it is 97% caffeine-free. And Sanka is real coffee at its delicious best. Start drinking Sanka coffee tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company. 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 The Jell-O program, coming to you from Hollywood, California, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Encino Madness. Just as it's fun to close the year with a happy celebration, so it's always pleasant to finish each meal with a grand flourish by serving rich, shimmering Jell-O. Jell-O's gay colors and refreshing flavor top off a dinner in perfect style. So during the next year, friends, plan to serve Jell-O even oftener than you do now. Get several packages of Jell-O tomorrow, choosing any of Jell-O's six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Incidentally, strawberry and raspberry Jell-O both taste better than ever. They have a new, improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And this gives them a rare goodness rivaled only by the juicy ripe fruit itself. A unique flavor so distinctive that it cannot be duplicated in any other way. 
Start now to enjoy a treat without equal, America's favorite gelatin dessert, Jell-O. Madness played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, our program last Sunday came to you from New York City. Immediately after the broadcast, the entire Jell-O gang left for Hollywood, and Christmas found us aboard a Union Pacific train passing through Nebraska. Yeah, Nebraska. <laughs> so before starting our program this evening, we would like to turn back the clock to last Wednesday night and show you how we celebrated Christmas Eve under these unusual circumstances. Yes, dances. <laughs> Damn it. About 7 p.m., Jack went into the observation car with Rochester to decorate a huge Christmas tree which he had purchased in Chicago. And even though we were on the train, Jack was determined to give us a real old Jingle bells, jingle bells, gee, they are terrific. Imagine spending Christmas on the good old Union Pacific. Rochester. Jingle bells, jingle bells. Rochester, will you stop that singing and hold the ladder steady? The way this train is swinging, I can hardly keep my balance. Okay, I got it. Now, let's see. Darn it, I wish I'd thought of buying some ornaments. Uh, Rochester, hand me those oranges and bananas there. I'll hang them up. Should I peel them? No. I just want to add a little color to the tree. I ought to have something on the top here. Rochester, where's that ham sandwich I cut into a star? I got hungry and ate three points off it. <laughs> mm, look at it. Now tear up some more timetables and sprinkle them on the lower branches down there. The conductor said we should stop tearing them up. Well, we got to have snow, don't we? But the conductor said... I don't said... care what the conductor says. I'm running this tree. He's pretty mad at you anyway, boys. He found out that Dennis Day is over 12. <laughs> What? I told that boy not to roll his pants down. <laughs> oh, well. The heck with the conductor. He found out I wasn't a porter, too. <laughs> Nobody told you to say that. Now, let's see. Uh, this side isn't right yet. I think I ought to hang some kind of an ornament up here. Uh, Rochester, lend me your wristwatch. Here you are, boss. Thanks. Hey, wait a minute. This is my wristwatch. How come you were wearing it? I gave it to me for Christmas. <laughs> oh, you gave you my watch. Yeah, you want to put a car on it? <laughs> I'm keeping it. Now, let's see. I think I'll hang it over here. A little to the right, boys. No, no, no. It looks good here. Then I'd move it a little to the left. No, no. I like the watch right where it is. Then I'd move one of those three oranges. It looks like a pawn shop. <laughs> Oh, I see what you mean. Now, if I can only... Oh, hello, Mary. My goodness, are you still on that ladder? Well, I got to get this finished before the party tonight. By the way, did you speak to the brakeman like I told you to? Yeah. What did he say? He said, Christmas tree or no Christmas tree, you can't have his red lantern. <laughs> That's fine cooperation. Can't even have any lights on this tree. Rochester scratched the brakeman from my Christmas list. Okay. And the engineer thought I was crazy when I asked him for the bell off the engine. Oh, he did. All right, there goes the engineer's present. I'll scratch his name off. Scratch the fireman, too. He said you can roast your own chestnuts. <laughs> this is a... The darnest thing I ever heard of. Well, gee whiz, you don't expect him to turn the whole train upside down just because you bought a Christmas tree. Mary, I'm just trying to make the trip a little more enjoyable, that's all. Rochester, how does the tree look from down there? It ain't believable. Well, you're supposed to use your imagination. Now, the timetables I tore up represent snow. Uh-huh. And those oranges are supposed to be beautiful glass ornaments. Uh-huh. And the bananas are long, silvery icicles shimmering through the branches. Doggone, how can anyone get that high just on a ladder? <laughs> Well, 
I didn't expect you to understand it. Say, Mary. Mary, where's the rest of the gang? Have you seen Phil? Yeah, he's in the club car trying to make a date with a girl. He even promised her a screen test. That's just like Phil. Then he gets on a train, he tries to date up a girl. Where's Dennis? He's the girl. Phil's plastered. <laughs> oh, no, he isn't. I saw him an hour ago, and he was all right. Mary, let me have one of your earrings. I want to put something shiny on the end of this branch. Oh, hang up your gold tooth and let me alone. <laughs> Mary, I'm trying to get this finished. Now, please help me, will you? Okay. Say, Jack, here comes that kid that got on in Omaha. Oh, yeah, the pest. You ought to be in bed. Hey, sweetheart, what are you doing up that ladder? What do you think I'm doing? I'm decorating a Christmas tree. What, bananas? You're nuts! <laughs> Those bananas are long icicles. Now, go away. Darn it, I wish I'd bought some tinsel. That's just what I need here. Hey, sweetheart, are you Santa Claus? Maybe I can get some tin foil. That'll help. Hey, are you Santa Claus? <laughs> yes, yes, I'm Santa Claus. Now, beat it, will you? Well, where's your red underwear? My red underwear. He's got it on, believe me. <laughs> yes, I'm going to keep it on when we get to California. Mary, hand me that lampshade. I'll hang it up here over the ham sandwich. Boy, what a screwball. Oh, yeah, you wouldn't dare say that if we were alone. <laughs> now, run along, will you? Run along. Your mother wants you. My mother hates me. <laughs> I don't blame her. Now, get going. Scram. Well, I'll be darned. Even kids notice him. <laughs> I hope he stays away. Oh, Jack, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Picking a fight with a ten-year-old kid. Uh, he started it. He called me a screwball. Well, if the screw fits, put it on. <laughs> Slug that brat if he comes in here again. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Well, for goodness sake, what's that? It's a Christmas tree, Phil. That's the best I can do on this train. Holy smoke, are we on a train? <laughs> oh, fine. Of course we're on a train. Well, I better tell my guitar player he just went out to play golf. <laughs> oh. Well, he better have his niblick with him. He's going to have a little trouble getting over the Rockies. <laughs> hmm. Here comes my friend, the conductor. Mr. Benny, three people in the next car want to go to bed, and they've all got up a burst. How much longer are you going to use that ladder? Tell them to keep their shirts on. I'll be through in a minute. They got their shirts off, and they want to go to bed. I can't help it. I've got a job to do here. These icicles don't hang right. Icicles, smicicles. Give me that ladder. <laughs> Let go of that. Let... Whoop! Whoop! We're going around a curve, boy! Whoop! Rochester, hold that ladder! <laughs> Jack. What? You're all covered with schmicicles. <laughs> yeah, look at me. Now, conductor, this is all your fault. If I told you once, I told you five times. I'd be through with this ladder in a minute. And now this thing. We've got to do this thing all over. That, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what happened Christmas Eve on the train. That's right, Don, but we still had a lot of fun. Oh, we? we sure did. And now, getting back to our program, Dennis Day will sing that popular Spanish ballad, Perpedia. Take it, Dennis. For I have found you love of my life In some of the lovers of Your eyes are echoing perfidia Forget the love, our promise of love You're sharing another's charm With a sad lament my dreams have faded Like a broken melody and the gods of love look down and laugh at what romantic fools we mortals be. And now I know my love was not for you. And so I'll take it back with a sigh. Her pity I mean goodbye. Mujer, si puedes tú 
quando io t'abla preguntale se tu alguna vez te te cado di adorar e il mare feco de mi corazon la vetta che mi ha visto llorar la perfidia de tu amor With a sad lament, my dreams have faded like a broken melody. And the gods of love look down and laugh at what romantic fools we mortals be. And now I know my love was not for you. And so I'll take it back with a sigh. Perfidy, I mean goodbye. Perfidia, sung by Dennis Day, and very good, Dennis. I didn't know you could sing in Spanish. You really did a great job. Gracias, senor. Gracias? That reminds me, Dennis, you haven't mowed my lawn in three weeks. (laughs) It's uh, growing. You know, it's uh, growing pretty high. I'll take care of it tomorrow. Anytime after lunch. (laughs) Uh, Say, Don. Yes, Jack? I want to congratulate you on the way you described our Christmas Eve on the train a little while ago, but I wish you would put a happy ending to it. Well, what do you mean? Well, if you remember, I put the tree back up, and then we all sat around, opened our presents, and had a jolly good time. Yes, we did, Jack. And uh, I want to thank you for that lovely pickle fork you gave me and the little woman. Hmm? (laughs) Well, I wanted to get you something novel, yet useful. Yet cheap. <laughs> now, Mary, if you think that a solid silver pickle fork from Tiffany's is cheap, you're just silly. Well, let me tell you something, Don. Uh, you can hop that fork at any pawn shop in town for $35. Thank you. I will. <laughs> you're welcome, and hmm. Nobody but a big fat announcer would say a thing like that. <laughs> Oh, Dennis, uh, did you like the uh, present I gave you? Oh, yes. Thanks very much, Mr. Benny. You're welcome. Gee whiz, I can hardly wait till summer. Well, you just have to wait, that's all. What'd he give you, kid? A bottle of white shoe polish. (laughs) Yes, sir. A quart bottle of Clancy's Classy Cleanser. As enough to last you all summer. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking of summer, let me remind you that regardless of season, Jello is. Wait one a of minute, the... Don, wait a minute. You don't have to sneak in a plug tonight. This is the last program of 1940, and your commercial is going to have real production. Okay, Phil, let's have it. Hit it, boys. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for the last time this year, let me tell you about Jello. During the past 12 months, millions of happy housewives have gone to their neighborhood grocer and returned with boxes of tempting and appetizing Jell-O. For they know it's not only economical and easy to make, but comes in those six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. I thank you. There you are, Don. There you are. That was all for you. Well, Don, the next time you talk about Jell-O, it'll be 1941. Yep, next Tuesday will be New Year's Eve. Oh, and by the way, Jack, are you planning anything special for that night? I certainly am, Don. It's a big night for me. Jack's going to put on his full-dress suit and go to the midnight show at the Pantages. <laughs> Not this year, sister. <laughs> I'm going downtown to the Paramount. <laughs> you see, and they know why. Nah, I didn't even have to say it. <laughs> Say, Jackson, what? why don't you come out to the Wiltshire Bowl Tuesday night? Balloons, paper hat, confetti, and all that stuff you love. Well, I might do that, Phil. Bring a girl along. No, no, if I come over, I'll be alone. What for? All of Jack's girls have to work on New Year's Eve. <laughs> Not all of them. Gladys Bisco hasn't worked since that steam table fell on her foot. <laughs> Well, 
poor kid. How's she getting along, Mr. Benny? Oh, fine. We're suing. <laughs> Say, Phil, I may bring Gladys at that. Uh, I wonder if she's got an evening gown. I've seen that dame, Jackson. Keep her covered. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Phil. Our ideas of beauty aren't quite the same. You like one type of girl, and I like Gladys's type. Hey, that's, that's what makes horse races. She could run on any track in the country. <laughs> Don't be catty. Say, Phil, how about playing a band number before I get sick of Gladys myself? <laughs> what do you say? Okay, I'm back with my own boys this week, and we're going to play in the old Harris Manor. You know, good and loud. Uh, you mean uh, loudly. That's it, loudly. You can even change that a little. <laughs> Uh, go ahead. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I want to thank you for that lovely toupee you gave me for Christmas. <laughs> well... <laughs> well, why... <laughs> well, why aren't you wearing it? It's not cold enough. Goodbye. <laughs> you ought to... You ought to see his head, folks. What a spot for the ice follies. Play, Phil. <laughs> by, played by Phil Harris and his Loudly Orchestra. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, this being the last program of the current year, for the feature attraction of the evening, we are going to present the 1940 version of our annual New Year's fantasy entitled Father Time Rides Again. Now, in this whimsical drama, I will play the part of Old Man 1940. And Mary... Yeah? Uh, you will be Mrs. 1940, my loving, loyal wife. And we have 12 children. January, February, March, April... May, June, and Herman. <laughs> That's July, and so on. Now, the scene of our play is the home of Mr. and Mrs. 1940, who live in a great big house called The Earth. It is almost... Say, Mr. Benny. Yes, Dennis. You know, I read this play four times, and I still can't understand it. <laughs> well, you see, Dennis, this drama is... Uh, uh, explain it to him, Phil. Okay, you see, Dennis, this drama is a sort of an uh, uh, allegorical fantasy <laughs> which, uh, which symbolizes the old year and the, su the, the subsequent tradition. <laughs> Transition. Oh, I get it. Thanks. You're welcome. Listen, Jackson, the next time you give me a line like that, I'm going to punch you right in the nose. <laughs> Phil, you know you loved it. <laughs> and now for our play. The scene, a great big house called The Earth. The time, almost midnight of December 31st, when Mr. and Mrs. 1940's lease is about to expire. 
Curtain. Music. Oh, Mariah. Mariah. What do you want, Pa? Better hurry up with that packing. Landlord said we got to get out by midnight to make room for the new tenant. The new tenant? Who's he? Oh, some little nudist by the name of 41. He don't know what he's getting into, does he? Nope. Things around here sure have been a mess. You said it. But of that, Mariah, we ain't so bad off in this side of the house. We got 48 rooms that's in pretty good condition. Yes, sir. Say, Pa, turn on the moon. I can't see what I'm packing here. Okay. Hey, moon! What do you want, you old fossil? <laughs> I want some light down here and quit winking at my wife. Okay. Say, you want some milk, too? Milk? Yeah, a cow just jumped over me. Boy, that's a Lulu. <laughs> Well, I'll be darned. Quit gabbing, Pa. We ain't got much time. That's right. There's them shooting stars. They're having a feud again. <laughs> Doggone it, Pa. Even with all our troubles, I kind of hate to leave here. So do I. Yes, sir. Darn those flies. They're all over the house. Shoo, shoo. Leave them alone, Ma. We need them. Well... Five minutes to twelve. We better start rounding up the kids. Wonder what? who that can be. I'll go over and see. I dream of Jeannie with the light brown hair. Boy, am I hep to the jive. <laughs> well, well, look who's here. Who is it, Pa? It's Venus from across the Milky Way. Hello, kid. <laughs> Well, what are you doing here? I heard you were leaving tonight, so I thought I'd drop over and say goodbye. Yeah, mighty sweet of you. Say, Venus, you put on a little weight, didn't you? Yeah, especially around the equator. <laughs> Getting so I can't tell you from the Big Dipper. <laughs> well, thanks for dropping in, Venus. Been a pleasure knowing you. Same here. Goodbye, kid. Goodbye. Well, Ma, it's almost midnight, so put on that silly hat of yours and let's get going. Okay, Pa. Hmm, there's the first stroke of 12. I wonder what's keeping the new tenant. Don't worry, he'll be here. I suppose so. Say, Pa, look out the window. There's a dark cloud. Oh, yes. Are you going to rain, Cloud? No, just passing by. <laughs> Darn that cloud, it's wearing my wristwatch again. <laughs> oh, well. Hmm, time's a fleeting. But we can't leave until that little rascal gets here. That must be him now. Yep. Come in. Well. Hello, young fella. Are you the little New Year? I ain't baby Sandy. <laughs> well, well, my boy. Come right in. Well, this is it, young man. Tell me, what you think of your new home? Boy, what a dump. This house could sure stand a lot of fixing up. I know it, son. A lot of things wrong. That darn Mars has been acting up all year. Of course, he hasn't bothered us in this wing so much. Everything's okay from the Hudson Bay window in the attic clear down to the basement. But come over here, son. I want to show you something. See that other wing of the house right across that big swimming pool? Yes, sir. Those rooms are in the gall durndest condition you ever seen. Holes in the furniture, walls torn down. Tell you, son, it's lucky we got that swimming pool. Yep. Well, gee, who's causing all the trouble over there? Oh, a couple of hoodlums. One of them is getting pretty sick of it, I understand. <laughs> A bulldog's been niffing at him. <laughs> Son, you got a tough job ahead of you. But everything's all right here, eh, mister? Yep, everything's fine. You got the same caretaker that was here for the last eight years. <laughs> you ought to get to know him. What's his name? Just call him Franklin. Nice fella. For heaven's sake, let's get going. Just a second, Ma. Now, there's just one more thing, son. What's that? Well, after I leave, if you see another fella puttering around that looks as old and decrepit as I am, don't throw him out. It ain't another father time. It's just Fred Allen. 
He's been kicking around here for years. Oh, sour puss, eh? That's him. <laughs> Come on, Pa, you're talking too much. I am coming, Ma. Round up the kids and we'll be on our way. Well, good luck, son. Watch your step. Thanks, old timer. You're welcome. Happy New Year, young fella. Happy New Year. Uh -huh. Come on, Ma. This being the time of the year when most of you housewives are getting new 1941 calendars to hang on your kitchen wall, I'd like to tell you about another kind of calendar that you can get, a calendar that you can keep on your kitchen shelf and use every single day of the year. It's the new calendar of desserts, a beautiful recipe book that's really different, a recipe book such as you've never laid eyes on before. The calendar of desserts contains 365 novel and intriguing ideas for desserts. A brand new suggestion for every dinner during the whole year. For example, on page five, there's a dessert made with plump, juicy black cherries and rich red cherry jello that will bring a gleam to every eye every time it's served. And there are 364 other swell ideas in this handy calendar of desserts. So send in right now for your copy. Just mail 10 cents in coin or stamps to Jack Benny, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan for this clever year-round calendar of desserts. Send for it today. last number of the 13th program in the current Jello series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank the radio critics, writers, and columnists of America for the honors bestowed upon my program, members of my cast, and myself in the recent poll conducted by Radio Daily. I also want to thank our listeners, as well as my authors, Bill Morrow and Ed Boulogne. We all wish you listeners a very happy new year. Good night, folks. program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Moon Over Tarzana. <laughs> Bright and gay and so exciting, quick and thrifty and inviting, full of flavor, rich and mellow, all together, this spells jello. Yes, friends, Jell-O is certainly an all-around good dessert. It's a dessert that has everything, rich, shimmering colors that tell you here's a mighty swell treat, and a world of grand, intriguing flavor. Flavor so pleasing, so refreshing, so downright satisfying that it rivals the real juicy ripe fruit itself. Jell-O is easy to prepare, too, one of the simplest and quickest desserts you can possibly serve. And, of course, you can treat the family to a delightful Jell-O dessert for only a few pennies. So order Jell-O tomorrow, choosing any or all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, or lime. Incidentally, strawberry and raspberry Jell-O are now better than ever. Both have a new, improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. Try these grand flavors and enjoy Jell-O's rich, distinctive goodness. Serve a tempting mold of Jell-O tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you.
That was Moon Over Tarzan up played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this being the fifth day of January, we bring you a man who is still doing his Christmas shopping, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, when you saw me in that department store yesterday, I wasn't shopping. I was exchanging some of my Christmas gifts. Well, that's quite a coincidence. I was doing the same thing. Would you believe it, Jack? Three different friends gave me electric razors. Now, you think that's bad? I got enough bottles of cologne to have people whistle at me for the next ten years. <laughs> no kidding, Don. I must have gotten 25 bottles of that stuff. Oh, what are you going to do with it all? I gave it to Rochester, and he's going to throw a cocktail party. <laughs> He uh, mixes it with orange ice and calls it a Central Avenue lullaby. <laughs> uh, but when you saw me in that store, Don, I was only exchanging the gift uh, Phil Harris gave me. You were? Why, Phil told me he gave you a lovely present. Oh, it was lovely, yes, but I don't know. I didn't feel right in it. Oh, well, you shouldn't have exchanged it, Jack. You'll hurt his feelings. I don't care whether I hurt his feelings or not. I'm too old for an Indian suit. <laughs> I don't know what's the matter with Phil He gives the darnest Christmas present Last year he sent me a manhole cover <laughs> Imagine a manhole cover Oh yes, I remember that What'd you ever do with it, Jack? What could I do? I put Home Sweet Home on it and hung it on the wall <laughs> And I wish you could have seen what the... Oh, hello, Mary Hello, Jack Happy New Year, Don Same to you, Mary What about me? It's a wonder you wouldn't thank me for the swell time I showed you New Year's Eve. You didn't even phone me. I want to do it big. I'm going to hire a skywriter. <laughs> it won't be necessary. You know, Don, I took Mary to the Wilshire Bowl. And boy, was I raring. At the stroke of 12, I grabbed a horn and blew the old year right out. You did, huh? Yep. And at 12.01, Jack put the horn in his pocket and said, let's go home. <laughs> Mary, the only reason I suggested going home early was because I didn't want to have a hangover the next day. A hangover? From what? Breaking balloons? <laughs> Listen, Mary, don't try to give the impression that I'm an old dodo. I was the life of the party. I had you on that dance floor every minute. Anything to keep me from eating. <laughs> you ate, sister. You... <laughs> Believe me. You had the special T-bone steak with French fried potatoes and choice of two vegetables, including tax, $1.29. <laughs> You know very well you had a swell time. Okay, I had a swell time. You darn tootin'. Say, Mary, is Jack a good dancer? I couldn't tell. That was the first time I ever did the turkey trot. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the turkey trot at all. I was doing the laconga. The laconga? Yes. Couldn't you hear me going? One, two, three, uh. One, two, three, uh. One, two, three, uh. <laughs> What'd you think that was? I thought your rheumatiz was giving you the biz. <laughs> that was very funny, Mary. You know, I wonder why you and Phil don't quit this program and get one of your own. Harris and Livingston, every week an audition. <laughs> You're too smart for this show. Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Happy New Year. Same to you, kid. Is anybody an aspirin? Oh, boy, what a head I got. Why, Dennis, I'm ashamed of you. I bumped it getting out of my car. Oh. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. That's all right. You can bump your head. <laughs> I thought you meant you'd been celebrating too freely. By the way, Dennis, uh, where did you go New Year's Eve? I went there. Don't worry. Oh. <laughs> okay. Say, I wonder what's keeping Phil. You went where, Dennis? Never mind. I went there every night, just like you told me to. All right, all right. <laughs> Say, Don, have you seen... Dennis, where have you been going every night? Mary, it's none of your business. It's a good picture, all right, but, gee, I can't laugh all the time. <laughs> Dennis, please. I'd rather go back to mowing your lawn. <laughs> now, Dennis, I don't want to hear another word about it. Why, Jack Benny, do you mean to say you've been sending the kid downtown to laugh at your picture every night? Mary, I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, Dennis, it's time for your song, so let's have it. My girl laughed at Fred Allen, but don't worry, I kicked her. <laughs> now, Dennis, everybody's waiting for your song, so let's have it, please. What's it gonna be? A brand new number called, I'm Gonna Round Up My Love. That'll be fine, go ahead. 
And by the way, if your girl thinks Fred Allen is so funny, get another one. Mary, stop looking at me like that. <laughs> Do you hear? Oh, brother. I wish that kid wouldn't babble so much. <laughs> And needing her by my side I'm gonna round up my love Gonna win her tonight In the prairie moonlight I'm gonna round up my love Gotta make her agree to belong to only me. Then together we'll ride high, and together we'll sing low. Side by side, roaming the rain, we'll go. Lasso my gal I'm gonna make her my pal I'm gonna round up my love Yippee yippee I ride high Yippee yippee oh sing low Side by side roam in the rain We'll go I'm gonna make her my pal I'm gonna round up my That was I'm Gonna Round Up My Love, sung by Dennis Day. There you are, Dennis. That was, well, you were in very good form. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> Jack? Why, Dennis, what's come over you? You've always called me Mr. Benny. Well, I saw so much of you last week, I feel like we're old friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. But you know, Dennis, I kind of like the idea of your calling me Mr. Benny. It adds a little dignity to the program and shows uh, your respect for me. Do you want me to call you Mr. Benny, too? That won't be necessary, Mary. Gee, I can call him Jack. <laughs> and now, folks... Wait till the girls at the May Company hear about this. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Don't get smart, Miss Livingston. Oh, do call me Mary. Now, cut that out! <laughs> you asked me a question, I answered it. Now, let's forget it. Well, look who finally breezed in. Hiya, Jackson. Am I late? No, Phil. Uh, we realize that taking up a half hour of your valuable time once a week is quite an imposition. Now, hold on, Jackson. In fact, Phil, I think that next Sunday I'm going to have a microphone installed across the street in the pool room so you can say hiya, folks, without putting your cue down. <laughs> would, you, uh, would you care for that? Now, before you bawl me out, Jackson, I want to tell you that I'm a changed man. You're looking at the new Harris. Oh, I am, eh? I'm not kidding. Oh. On January the 1st, I made a resolution. I'm going to cut out smoking, cut out drinking, cut out gambling, and I'm going to cut out staying up so late. Well, I'm glad to hear it. When are you going to cut out running after women? When they stop running. <laughs> I thought so. Well, Phil, here's another resolution for you during this new year. Why don't you learn something about music? You mean I should be like Stokowski? No, Phil. All I ask, all I ask is when you pick up a piece of paper that has lines across it, 
and little black dots all over it. Don't look at your boys and say, there's a spy around here. This stuff is in code. <laughs> <laughs> little as they know, it embarrasses them. <laughs> okay, Jackson, that'll be another one of my resolutions. Speaking of resolutions, Jack, I've resolved that during 1941, I'm going to find new ways to tell people about Jell-O. You are, kiddo? Yes. <laughs> Instead of telling them about strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime, I'm going to mix them up and say, strawberry, lime, raspberry, lemon, orange, cherry, and. Oh, oh, the and at the end. Gee, they'll never dream it's the old Jell-O show. <laughs> Anything else, Don? Yes. Remember how I always used to say, uh, look for the big red letters on the box? Uh-huh. Well, this year I'm going to say it backwards. Oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> box the on, letters red big. D for look. Well, mouth my shut. <laughs> Don, that's a very novel idea. Oh, thanks, Jack. I'm awfully glad you like it. I'll see you get a raise for that. Backwards. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a number by Phil Harris and his orchestra who will play it not backwards, not forwards, but in their usual manner. They will start in the middle and blast both ways. <laughs> uh, all right, Phil, let's have it. Okay. Say, uh, by the way, Jackson, I got my expense account on our New York trip all made out. You want to see it now? Uh, no, Phil, I'll look it over later. What is it total up to? 3,427... Give me that! <laughs> Let me see that expense account. There you are. I got the whole thing itemized. That's itemized. <laughs> itemized. If you don't mind, I'll look it over. Let's see here. Mm, hotel room, $42 a week. That's reasonable. Meals for two weeks, $63. That's very reasonable. You don't have to read it, Jackson. It's in perfect shape. I'll just give it a quick glance. Now, let's see. Hey, Jack, look. There's one item you can't complain about. Where? Right there. Laundry for two weeks, 37 cents. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, that's not bad. Uh, let's see what else he has here. Bottle opener, 10 cents. <laughs> Ice, 250. Bromo, $135. <laughs> What do you want us to play, Jackson? Wait a minute, Phil. I'm not through yet. <laughs> Taxi cab, 11.50. That's okay. Charles Bagby, musical arrangements for orchestra, 37 cents. <laughs> 37 cents? That must be the same guy that does his laundry. <laughs> yeah. See, what else is here? I-G-R, $45. $45? Phil, what's this I-G-R? I got robbed. <laughs> My goodness, you don't expect me to pay for that. <laughs> you don't expect me to pay for that, do you? Oh, what are you beefing about? I never even charged you for bailing out my guitar player. <laughs> oh, well, that's very sweet of you. Now, let's see. Well, here we are again, Bromo 100. <laughs> Phil, you and I will talk this whole thing over later. In the meantime, let's have a band number. Okay. Look at this next item, Mary. Elevator, $400. What could he want with an elevator? <laughs>
That was There'll Be Some Changes Made, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra, where there will be some changes made. (laughs) And, uh, Phil, getting back to your New York expense account, it's a ridiculous total, and I'm not paying for all of your hilarity. Okay, Jackson. But as long as we're on the subject of the dough, how about that 50 bucks I won from you from the Rhodes Bowl game? That you can take to court. <laughs> I didn't see the game, Phil, so the bet's off. I thought you'd squirm out of it. Well, yeah. Jack, I thought you told me you were going to the Rose Bowl game. I did go, but I, I didn't stay. <laughs> Tell him what happened, Jack. Mary, Don wouldn't be interested. Oh, yes, I would. What happened, Mary? Well, Don, it was like this. The woman for you. Jack got the tickets and told us to meet him in front of Tunnel 16 at 1.30. 1.30, 1.30. 30. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, Phil Dennis and I took a cab. But when we got to the bowl, Jack wasn't there yet. So we waited and waited and waited. You should have seen the crowd, Don. There were thousands of people. Programs, programs, names and numbers of all the players. Program, miss? No, thanks. Come on, fellas, let's go in. We can't go in. we got to wait for Jackson. Yeah, he's got the ticket. I don't see why he didn't come with us. Well, you know how romantic Jack is. He's bringing his girlfriend Gladys to the game, and they're driving out alone in the Maxwell. Say, that little waitress ain't so bad looking when she gets dressed up. I think that Jackson's stuck on her. You said it. Yeah, he said it. (laughs) Dennis, why don't you go get lost in the crowd? Don't think I couldn't. (laughs) Hey, look, Mary, ain't that Jack and Gladys coming this way? Oh, yes. Jack would be wearing a beanie. And get a load of that fur coat on Gladys. Gee, Gladys, I, I never saw you looking so good. You're sure pretty when you're all dolled up. Thanks, Dee Dee. I mean it. Get your programs here. Program, mister, 15 cents. Oh, Speedy, can I have a program? You're darn right you can. Here's a half a dollar, buddy. Keep the chain. Oh, boy, now I can get my toupee out of Hawk. <laughs> Well, here's the gang, Gladys. Hiya, fellas. All set for the game? Yeah, we've been waiting on you, Jackson. Come on. Say, Gladys, you know Mary and Dennis, don't you? Sure. Hello, everybody. Hello. Gee, Gladys, that's a pretty fur. Did you trap it yourself? (laughs) You know darn well I gave it to her for Christmas. Oh, pardon me, honey. Do you know Phil Harris? Do I? Hmm. Hiya, Gladys. I'll have a ham on rye. Now, Phil, (laughs) cut that out. (laughs) Not working today. Come on, fellas, here's our gate. Let's go. Take it, take it. Hold your own stubs, please. Here you are. Oh, hello, Gladys. Hello, Eddie. How are you? Fine. Taking your old man to the game? (laughs) I'm not her old man. I'm her fella. Come on, sweetheart. Say, where's Dennis? I'm stuck in the turnstile. (laughs) Well, push it a little, for heaven's sake. Here's Tunnel 16 over this way. Oh, yeah. Say, Gladys, are you still working at the Shamrock Cafe? No, I'm at a drive-in now. Speedy thought I ought to be outside where it's healthier. (laughs) Darn right. What's the use of being in California and not enjoy the sun? It's great for you. Yeah, I wish I could get off the night shift. You will, honey Well, here's the entrance, kids Say, look who's here Hiya, Gladys Happy New Year Same to you, Lefty Lefty Hmm Who's that fresh guy, Gladys? Lefty Flanagan Boy, can he drive a truck I can imagine Hey, look There's a hot dog stand Let's see Yeah, you want a hot dog, Gladys? I'm not hungry right now Okay, we'll get him inside Better get one now, Gladys. You know Speedy. That's Speedy. (laughs) All right, I'll go over and buy the hot dogs. Everybody wait here so you won't get lost. Hey, mister, five hot dogs, please. Five puppies coming up? Oh, hello, Stranger. Why, Schlapper, (laughs) now! People, Schlepperman, are you running a hot dog stand now? And look at my sign, Zachy boy. All the hot dogs you can eat for ten cents. 
That's fine, but how can you make money with an offer like that? Taste one and you're tasting the answer. <laughs> oh, they're, they're pretty tough weenies, eh? What suitcase handles they would make? <laughs> well, they still look good to me. Give me five of them. Okay, what kind of mustard do you want? Mustard? What kind? Yeah, sure. I got strong, mild, and channel number five. Oh, mild, I guess. How much do I owe you? Five hot dogs, 50 cents. Well, that's fair enough. Here's a dollar. Here's a quarter. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> You're welcome. So long, Slep. So long. Get your red hats here. You ain't kept till you dine with Slep. <laughs> Here you are, kids. Take your hot dog. Thanks, Jack. Here's my dime. Keep it. Everything's on me today. Gee, I'm thirsty. What are we going to drink with our hot dog? Here you are, Gladys. Put that back in your pocket. <laughs> Phil, just for once, why don't you see a football game where four teams aren't playing? <laughs> now, where's Dennis? He'll be back in a minute. Oh. <laughs> Well, well, he's, uh, he's got his own ticket. Let's go in. Here's the tunnel. Gee, it's dark in here. Huh? So dark in here. <laughs> yeah. Say, Speedy, remember the time we went through the tunnel of love at Ocean Park? Oh, Gladys, for heaven's sake. <laughs> Cut it out. Oh, I'm sorry I slapped you. Gladys, it's all over. Forget it. Now, come on. Stub, please. There you are. Right this way. Oh, hello, Gladys. Hello, Nick. Where you been keeping yourself? Oh, I've been around where you been. Come on, come on. Show us our seats. <laughs> Listen, Gladys, do you have to talk to every fellow you meet? Oh, Speedy, you're so jealous. I'm not jealous. Here are your seats, mister. Thanks. <laughs> These seats are all right, aren't they? Yeah, right on the old 40-yard line. Say, Jack, who's playing here today? Two of the finest teams in the country, Stanford and Nebraska. Then why does your pen say, love thy neighbor on it? <laughs> I gotta wave something, don't I? You know, I kinda like Nebraska. Well, I'm for Stanford. You wanna make a little bet, Jackson? Yeah, I might. Hey, Gladys, how are you? Oh, there's Lefty Gordon. Hello, Lefty. Another lefty. Don't you know anybody that's right-handed? <laughs> Used to, used to. You're going with me now. I wish you wouldn't talk to everybody. Hey, Jackson, what about that bet? Okay, Phil, you've got Stanford, and I've got Nebraska. Oh, yeah, pal. Is this seat back an old pal, old pal? Oh, fine. <laughs> yes, a young man has it. He'll be here in just a minute. Oh, don't mention it, pal. Hey, friend of yours is a friend of mine. <laughs> this would happen to me. How much dough you want to bet, Jackson? Any amount you say, brother. Just name it. Okay, 50 bucks. Hmm. 50, eh? Take another number, Phil. <laughs> oh, no. If he wants to bet 50 bucks, it's okay with me. Quiet, quiet. I want to hear the game. The game hasn't started yet. No, thanks. I never touch it. <laughs> How can you talk to a guy like that? Look, Jack, here comes the Nebraska team. Oh, yeah. Gee, they're a husky bunch of fellas. Yeah, listen to that crowd. Yes, sir. You know, Gladys, I'll bet there are 90,000 people here. That's terrible. Many thousand people without a home. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Many thousand people. What are you talking about? <laughs> They've got homes. They're here for the game. Oh, no, no. You're just saying that because I'm your pal. You're not my pal. I never saw you before in my life. No, thanks. I never trust you. I don't know why I always run into one of these guys. Ignore him, Gladys. I am Gladys, old pal, old pal. Don't you dare speak to her. Here, hold my coat, Mary. He's on the floor already. What do you want? Well, he can't talk like that. Hey, look, Jackson, here comes that good old Stanford team out on the field. Oh, say, those boys look pretty good, too, don't they, Gladys? Oh, they're a swell bunch. Hello, fellas. Hello, Gladys. What? Well, I'll be darned. She knows the whole team. Well, that's the last straw. I'm leaving. I'm not 
not even going to stay and see the game. Oh, Speedy, calm down. Calm down, nothing. And let me tell you something else, Gladys. The next time you go out with me and say hello to every Tom, Dick, and Harry we meet, remember, two can play the game. So there you are, Dom. That's exactly what happened at the Rose Bowl game on New Year's Day. Jack really lost his head, huh? He sure did. Okay, I'm a fiery, jealous nature. What can I do? Play, Phil. Okay, Speedy. Friends, before dessert at dinner tomorrow, why not serve the family a real surprise, something delightfully different, like apple snow jello? A delicious combination of cold, spicy applesauce and crimson raspberry jello. Or try apricot pecan layers, crunchy pecan meats, and golden canned apricots molded in shimmering orange jello. These are just two of the many grand treats that you'll find described in the new calendar of desserts book. In this big 48-page recipe book, you'll discover 365 suggestions for all kinds of novel and tempting desserts, pastries, puddings, cakes, cookies, and, of course, lots and lots of swell desserts made with delicious jello. And this unique calendar of desserts is just as beautiful as it is useful, too, full of lovely paintings and handsome photographs in brilliant glowing colors. So be sure to send for your copy right away. Just mail 10 cents, just 10 cents, in coin or stamps to me, Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan, and this handy day-by-day recipe book will be forwarded to you at once. Don't wait until tomorrow, friends. Send 10 cents for your copy tonight. We're a little late, so good night, folks. program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra is a program with Grounded in Glendale. <laughs> One way to describe Jell-O, ladies and gentlemen, would be to say it's a dessert that makes everybody sit up and take seconds. Because Jell-O is a grand, tempting treat that always looks and tastes like more. The clear, glowing colors of Jell-O carry a rich invitation, a promise of rare delight. And it's a promise that's always fulfilled by Jell-O's swell, refreshing flavor. We're sure you'll like Jell-O, sure that once you try... So start serving Jell-O real soon. Ask your grocer for several packages, choosing any or all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. By the way, strawberry and raspberry jello both have a new, improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And the result is a rich, unique goodness that's better than ever. Serve jello tomorrow, friends, and discover for yourself why jello is America's favorite gelatin dessert. Gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to bring you Hold back... it. Hold it, Don. Jack isn't here yet. Well, I saw him just a few minutes ago. Where is he? He just went in the other room to talk to his riders. Oh, boy, is Jack burned up. Well, them two guys get away with murder. They never have a program writ till the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going in to see what's happening. Gee, he's always having trouble with his riders. Now, look, fellas. If I told you once, I told you five times. <laughs> You gotta have the program written before we go on the air. Every week we just barely make it, now today look what happened. No script at all. Well, what are you worried about? Yeah, it's only Friday. <laughs> it's not Friday, it's Sunday. And there's no excuse for you guys not knowing it. I gave both of you calendars for Christmas. <laughs> I knew this would happen someday. Well, we were stuck this week. We didn't have no inspiration. <laughs> Oh, you didn't. Don't yell at me. I'll fly to pieces. (laughs) 
I'm not yelling. I'm just, I'm just asking you to work. That's all. I'm paying you to work. And that's another thing. We want more dough. Well, you certainly picked the right time to ask me. You're getting plenty now. What do you want more dough for? We want to get a room tonight. <laughs> now cut that out. Fine team of writers I've got. I've been looking for you all week. Where were you? The Boba Hot Springs. <laughs> You're not supposed to be in Saboba. You're supposed to be here with me. Come on, Jack. We're waiting for you. Be there in a minute. Now, look, fellas. Hey, who's the dame? That's Mary Livingston. She's on the program. You've met her 400 times. Oh, yeah. That's the girl we write for, Eddie. You're Eddie. I'm Bill. <laughs> and I'm Benny. Glad to know you. <laughs> Now, now, listen, fellas. Jack, you better hurry up. Let those two dream boats alone. I told you, Mary, I'll be there in a minute. Okay. <whistles> Not bad. And stop <laughs> whistling. <laughs> now, look, fellas. Look, we're on the air, so I'm going out and do the best I can. Meanwhile, you stay right here and prepare some kind of a play for us. Okay. Say, how about a murder mystery? A murder mystery? You know, where a guy comes home and finds his wife in the arms of another man. Door opens. Now I got you. Why, Julius, what are you doing here? You know what I'm doing here. I didn't go to Tarzan at all. Why, Julius, Julius, put down that gun. Oh, no. Bang, 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 now, bring it, bring it in as soon as possible. Okay, give me the pencil, Eddie. You got it, Bill. I gave it to you yesterday. Oh, no, I gave it back to you. Yeah, but after that, I put yeah, it... Use in... my pencil. <laughs> For heaven's sake, get started. Now, go to work. And those guys, they go to Saboba Springs, and I have no broadcast. What's the matter, Jack? You having trouble with your riders again? Yes, on every week, they're getting lazier. Now, tonight, no material at all. Why don't you fire him, Jack? He can't. They dug up a photograph of Jack when he was in third grade. What's wrong with that? He was the only kid with a handlebar mustache. <laughs> oh, it was just fuzz. You could hardly see it. Anyway, that picture has nothing to do with my writers. If this ever happens again, I will fire him. What are you worried about, Jackson? If you ever get stuck for material, I'll be glad to let you have my author... Your author? Yeah, the guy that writes all my funny stuff for the Wilshire Bowl. Oh, fine. Phil, you're always bragging. No, you're always bragging about your writer. I've been to the bowl a thousand times, and I've never seen him. Who do you think parks your car? <laughs> oh, so that's your gag, man, huh? Well, the next time he points at my Maxwell and says, that does it, I'm going on the wagon, I'll run right over <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> say, uh, say, Dennis. Yes, please? Hmm. Dennis, as long as we're stuck here, how about doing your song right away? Well, why don't you and I ad lib a little? To and fro. <laughs> to and fro, eh? All right, Dennis, let's ad lib. I'll start it. Uh, who was that lady I saw you with last night? That was no Thor. That was a battle act. <laughs> well, I think you better sing, Dennis. At least it'll be better than standing around. Come in. Special delivery for Mary Livingston. Right here, boy. Give him a tip, Jack. Here you are, buddy. Say, you're rather old for a messenger boy, aren't you? You ain't gonna get the mumps anymore yourself, bub. <laughs> and I... And I had, a, I had to give him a 50-cent tip. You gave him a dime. I gave him a quarter. I know what I gave him. <laughs> Who's the letter from, Mary? It's from my mother in Plainfield. <laughs> well, listen, one time I'm glad to hear from the old lady. <laughs> yes, sir. What you got to say, Mary? Listen to this. <clears throat> my darling daughter, Mary. Just a few lines to say hello and thank you for the small check you sent me for Christmas. It looked like a refund from the gas company. Boy, is she mercenary. By the way, Mary, we have a new address now. We had to move from the old house on Elm Street as the landlord, who was engaged to your sister, found his glasses. <laughs> hmm. 
I mean, I thought your sister was very good looking. She has beautiful skin. Yes, but there's too much of it. Oh. oh, I see. The weather's been awful lately. In fact, it was so cold here this week, your Uncle Herman froze an ear off. Now he only has two. <laughs> More things happen to your relative. <laughs> oh. And Mary, I must tell you about New Year's Eve. The whole family... Mary, we had enough of that letter. How about a song, Dennis? Okay. The whole family went to the midnight show of Jack's new picture. Mary, we've had enough... Oh. Oh, hold it, Dennis. <laughs> uh, what was that, Mary? Uh, the whole family went to the midnight show of Jack's new picture, Love Thy Neighbor. Well. We weren't in the theater ten minutes when your brother Hillard was thrown out for taking the title seriously. <laughs> He's just the type. No more news, so we'll close with love to all from your mother, Smiley Franklin Livingston. <laughs> well, she had a program so I could write her a letter. Well, let's have your song, Dennis. I'm going out and see how my writers are coming along. If they're stalling, I'm going to give them... <laughs> Fellas, I know it's a good title for a murder mystery, but where's the play? Well, we got a lot of ideas, but we can't write them down. Why not? I gave you a pencil. Yeah, but there ain't no lead in it. <laughs> See? Oh, there ain't no lead in it. Give me that pencil. Look, fellas, you turn this little knob here, and out comes the lead. It's an automatic pencil. Oh, yeah. Look, Phil, you turn this knob, and the lead comes out. Say, that's good. Let me turn it. No, I want to turn it. Come on, just one. I've turned it already. <laughs> All you gotta do is put the pencil on a piece of paper and push it a little. Now, please write that mystery play, will you, fellas? Okay. Boy, if I ever get my hands on that picture, I'll fire him so fast they won't know what hit him. 
Well, Don, it'll be a few more minutes yet. What'll we do? I don't know what to talk about. Me neither. Why don't we talk about currents and events? <laughs> You mean, you mean current events. All right, Bill, let's talk about current events. What do you think of the president's new deficiency appropriation bill? Anything Wilkie does is okay with me. <laughs> he didn't get in. Wilkie did. What's the matter with you, anyway? Well, I got a laugh, didn't I? Now, there you are, Jackson. Why don't you hire me for a ride? Because I hired you once for a band leader, got gypped, and I'm disillusioned. <laughs> No, I guess we'll just have to st uh, stall around until my boys get that play written. Gee, if this was television, you could take your teeth out and make like Popeye. <laughs> it's very funny. Remember when you dropped him at the hockey game in New York and the Rangers made a goal with him? <laughs> Mary, that wasn't my teeth. That was my cigarette case. Sure grins, don't it? <laughs> All right, all right. There's no use trying to keep this up. I'm going to see if my writers have got anything. I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Rochester, I can't talk to you now. But this is important, boss. It's about Mr. Billingsley, our boarder. Mr. Billingsley? What about him? Well, I've been telling you for months to get rid of him. He's getting crazier every day. Oh, he's just a little odd, that's all. I don't even call the wagon. <laughs> Oh, you just don't like him. What's he done now? Well, you know that mechanical man he was building? Mechanical man? Oh, you mean that robot? Yeah, remember you said it would never be practical? Uh-huh. Well, that ain't your cousin Boo-Boo walking around the kitchen. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What's the, what's the robot doing in the kitchen? He's making himself a sandwich. Actual grease on whole wheat. <laughs> Now, Rochester, this is no time for joking. I don't want that big mechanical thing roaming around my house. Aren't there any buttons to control it? Yeah, there's three of them. When you press the first one, he knocks you down. Uh-huh. And when you press the second one, he picks you up. I see. Well, what happens when you press the third button? He goes, Woo! <laughs> What? And slaps you down again. Well, for heaven's sake, watch out. That thing is dangerous. If he comes near me again, I'm going to take a sledgehammer and beat the batteries out of it. Well, there must be some way to shut it off. Now, look, Rochester, I'll be right home after the broadcast. In the meantime, don't go near the kitchen. I'm calling from San Diego. <laughs> Well, you get right back, and I'll wait up for you. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Gee, I... I never thought that mechanical man would work. Well, I guess I'll have to raise Mr. Billingsley's rent. He's got a roommate now. <laughs> Play something, Phil. I'm going in and beat the gags out of my writer. <laughs>
look, look, fellas, look at this page. That word is murderer, not moiterer. Well, well, a gangster would say moiterer. I'm not a gangster, I'm a police captain. Read your own script. Now, fellas, it's time for our play, so I'll take what you got and bring the rest in as soon as you can. Give me those pages. Please give me those pages. All right, please give me those pages. <laughs> now, now, concentrate, will you, fellas? Fine thing. Grandma on the installment plan. Well, how does it look, Jack? Are we going to do a play tonight? Yeah, but we'll have to do it without a rehearsal. Here are your parts, kid. Now, let's see. I'm going to be Captain O'Benny of police headquarters. And, Dennis, you'll be my assistant, Sergeant O'Day. Oh, thanks. Oh, welcome. <laughs> now, Mary, you're going to be the widow, Mrs. J. Malcolm Smith. The widow? Yes. Your husband has been killed, leaving you $3 million, an estate on Long Island, and a yacht. And you're all broken up. Why, does the yacht leak? <laughs> no, you loved your husband. Oh. Now, let's see. <laughs> Phil... Phil, you'll be the family physician. And, Don, you're going to be the bugler. Bugler? Oh, they must mean butler. Yeah. <laughs> you're, uh, you're the butler, Don. Well, so much for casting. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the feature attraction this evening, the Benny, when we act, you better like uh, act like you enjoy it, players. <laughs> we'll present... We'll present an original mystery drama entitled The Murder of Malcolm Smith... Or, although he wasn't drafted, he was drilled. <laughs> Say, that's not a bad title. I think I'll get the boys a room tonight. <laughs> well, let's go, fellas. The opening scene is the office of Detective Captain O'Benny at police headquarters. Curtain. You see. <laughs> Hey, Sergeant O'Day. Yes, cop? That's cab. <laughs> Did you answer the burglar alarm at the First National Bank? Yes, sir. Well, were there any suspicious characters around? No, the furniture movers told me they hadn't seen anybody. Furniture movers? Yeah, two fellas with a safe. Those were the burglars. What's the matter with you, anyway? I'll take it. Hello, police headquarters. Hello, this is Mrs. J. Malcolm Smith talking. Yes? My husband, J. Malcolm Smith, wealthy stockbroker of New York, Palm Beach, Miami, heir to the millions left by his father, has been killed. That's shocking news, Mrs. Smith. Are you sure your husband is dead? Definitely. <laughs> I will be there in five minutes. Goodbye. What's up, Chief? Wait till I hang up. <laughs> J. Malcolm Smith, the stockbroker, has been murdered. What's the J for? Jazz bow. He sold neckties on the side. <laughs> Come on, let's get going. This is an important case, Sergeant O'Day. And we're going to find the murderer of J. Malcolm Smith or... or... For what? Or nothing. We're all out of script. <laughs> hey, fellas, hurry up with the rest of this, will you? Play something, Phil. <laughs> Writer. They couldn't even finish the sentence. Hold it, Phil. There's a few more pages, Jack. Thanks. Now go back and get to work. We got a union. We're going out to eat. Not until you finish the script. Okay, blue eyes. <laughs> even my writers notice them. <laughs> now let's see. Oh, yes. This is an important case, Sergeant O'Day. And we're going to find the murderer of J. Malcolm Smith, or my name ain't Captain O'Benny. Heck, I could have thought of that myself. <laughs> let's go. Open the door. This is the police. Open up or we'll break it down. Yeah, down. <laughs> Come on, O'Day. Let's crash it. <laughs> there goes my cigarette case. <laughs> Here it is. 
Good evening, gentlemen. Did you ring? I'm Captain O'Benny of police headquarters. We're here to investigate the murder of J. Malcolm Smith. Yeah, J. Quiet, you. <laughs> Where, where's Mrs. Smith? She's in the library. This way, sir. Come along, O'Day. You stick with me and make notes. How do you get the lead out of this pencil? Look, you turn this little knob and out comes the lead. <laughs> You're as bad as my two writers, Mink and Schmink. <laughs> Here we are. Pardon me, are you Mrs. J. Malcolm Smith? Yes, Captain. Tell me what you know about the murder of your husband. Well, we were sitting here in the library listening to the radio, when all of a sudden I turned around and there was my husband on the floor with five bullet holes in him. You're lying. Here's the body. And he only has one, two, three. He was only shot one, two, three, four times. Now count him. (laughs) Give me that dagger and I wish my writers would concentrate. Five gunshots. Make a note of that, O'Day. Oh, cop, K. Oh, cop, cop. Okay, Coop. Okay, Pat. There's nothing to it. Oh, cap, Coop, cop. Now, Mrs. Smith, I want the truth. You really hated your husband, didn't you? You hated him. No, no, I loved him. I loved him, I tell you, loved him. Then why did you shoot your husband? He was always saying, wrong time, no see. <laughs> Don't be flippin', Mrs. Smith. You killed your husband, and I know why. You murdered your husband because... Because... Oh, fine, we're stuck again. All right, Bill. This is embarrassing. Hold it, Bill. All right, boys, come on. Some more pages. Here you are, chum. Thanks. <laughs> oh, yes. Now, listen, Mrs. Smith... You murdered your husband because there's another man in the case. Now tell me, who's your lover? Who is he? Well, what's going on here? Hello, darling. Hello, dear. Aha, uh-huh, the other man. What's your name? My card, sir. Hmm. Dr. Philo Harrison, F.C. What's the F.C. for? Physician and surgeon. <laughs> So full of corn, and I like that better. <laughs> oh, listen, Harrison, I don't think you're a doctor at all. Where did you study medicine? Medicine, medicine Wisconsin. Wisconsin. <laughs> I thought so. Now, come clean, you. You're this woman's sweetheart, aren't you? Why, that's ridiculous. Preposterous. Incredible. Fanaphone. Budapest. Ralsefran. Cut that off. <laughs> you two are responsible for the murder of Jane Malcolm Smith. And you're under arrest. You can't arrest us. You can't prove we did it. Oh, yes, I can. I know your motive. You killed Mr. Smith because... Oh, nuts. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, while we're waiting for the finish of this thrilling murder mystery, why don't you run down to your neighborhood grocer and ask him for a package of Jell-O? And if you'd like a copy of Jell-O's wonderful new calendar of desserts recipe book, just send a dime, ten cents, to Don Wilson, Battle Creek, Michigan. Be sure to do it today. Hey, fellas, we're stuck again. Here you are, chum. <laughs> All right, let's finish this. I know your motive, Dr. Harrison. You killed Mr. Smith because you're in love with his wife. That's the truth now, isn't it? No. No, I didn't do it. I didn't kill him. Oh, yes, you did. You're guilty of murder, Harrison, murder. And you're going to hang for it. All right. I'll confess. I did it. I killed him. I killed him because I hated him. I'm glad he's dead, you understand? Glad, glad. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> Not bad, eh? I ought to get the Academy Award for this. You'll hang for it. Come on, you two. Slap the handcuffs on him, Sarge. I didn't bring him with me. Oh, well, never mind. It ain't believable anyhow. Play, Doctor. (laughs) If you haven't yet sent in for your copy of that brand new recipe book, The Calendar of Desserts, do so real soon. It's a beautiful-looking book that you'll find a pleasure to own. And let me show you how downright convenient it is to use. 
Suppose, for example, that you're trying to think of an idea for tomorrow night's dessert. With this new recipe book, you'd simply open it to the pages that contain dessert suggestions for January. And there, under January 13th, you'd read about a delightful jello treat called Raspberry Charlotte, a combination of luscious raspberry jam and rich crimson raspberry jello. That's all there is to it. You simply name the date, and this clever book suggests the dessert. There are 365 dessert ideas in this swell book, a different one for every day in the year, including all kinds of pastries, puddings, cakes, and cookies, and many, many desserts made with bright, shimmering jello. So send for your copy now. Mail 10 cents, just 10 cents in coin or stamps to me, Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. Do it tonight. This is the last number of the 15th program in the current Jello series. We will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. <laughs> Say, boys, but next week, will you please try and have the program ready before we go on the air? Okay. Hello, Ma. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do? Good night, boys. <laughs> Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with On the Road to Pismo Beach. <laughs> You know, ladies and gentlemen, once Jell-O has become a favorite dessert in any family, it usually stays a family favorite from then on. Every day we get letters from folks telling us how they've been enjoying Jell-O for years and enjoying it more and more all the time. And there's a reason for this, too. Jell-O is just so downright delightful that once you try it, no other dessert ever seems quite so gay and beguiling, quite so rich in rare, tantalizing flavors as Jell-O. And another reason why Jell-O is such a year-after-year -year favorite in most homes is because it can be served in so many different ways. Using Jell-O's six delicious flavors... Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Incidentally, if you haven't tried strawberry and raspberry jello recently, do so real soon. Both are now better than ever with a new, improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And the result is something mighty distinctive, a truly unique goodness. Why not enjoy a grand dessert made with bright, tempting jello tomorrow? <laughs> on the road to Pismo Beach, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce that last Monday, a great and well-deserved honor was bestowed upon our illustrious master of ceremonies. Oh, Don, do you have to tell everything? For many years now, the outstanding stars of Hollywood have been selected to inscribe their footprints in the forecourt of Grauman's Chinese Theater as a tribute to their supreme artistry. Don, please, I'm so flustered. So without further ado, I bring you the latest celebrity to achieve this great distinction, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Jello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, your introduction was awfully sweet, but I wish you hadn't brought the subject up. It might make people think I'm hammy. Well, Jack, it was a grand tribute, and I feel that our listeners should know about it. True, Don, but it makes me feel so darn uncomfortable. No, I really didn't want you to mention the honor accorded me at Grauman's Chinese last Monday at 2 p.m. before a crowd estimated by the police at over 3,000. I mean, it, it happened, it's over, now let's forget it. But, Jack, there isn't the slightest reason... Now, now, Don, there must be other things to talk about. So, uh, let's change the subject, shall we? <laughs> 
Now, just a minute, Jack. There isn't the slightest reason why you should be embarrassed over this wonderful compliment. Well, maybe so, Don, but Mr. Still... Grauman must have thought a lot of you to suggest adding your footprints to such a distinguished group. I know, Why, but... Jack, a great artist like you should realize... Hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, hello. Uh, what's that, Don? <laughs> A great artist like me should what? How are you, Mr. Wilson? He's fine, he's fine. Sit down. <laughs> I, I... I... I should realize what, Don? You should realize that... Uh, oh, darn it, I forgot what I was going to say. But you had it on the tip of your tongue. Concentrate. I... I, I should realize what? Now, the... let's see... Uh... Hiya, Jackson. Are you on the beam tonight? Uh, quiet, Phil. Don is trying to think of something. Uh, I, I should realize what, Don? Uh... Oh, it slipped my mind, Jackson. We might just as well forget it. Well, that's a fine how do you do. <laughs> Don, we were talking about me putting my footprints in the cement in front of Grauman's Chinese Theater. Oh, yeah, I read about that. You know, Jackson, this was a big week for the both of us. And what do you mean? Well, at night school, I received a great tribute. I got a gold star for spelling. Oh. Congratulations, Phil. That's terrific. Thank that's Thank well, you, Mr. Harris. Congratulations. Thanks. Mm. I think that gold star was footprints. <laughs> So you're an honor student, eh, Phil? Yeah. I was the only guy in the class that could spell Mississippi. Well, that's a toughie. Let's hear you spell it now. Okay. Hold my coat, Dennis. <laughs> spell it with your coat on. Go ahead. Mississippi. M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. Oh, very good. Now spell river. R-I-V-B-E-R. <laughs> I knew it, I knew it. Uh, Phil, uh, you can now take that gold star and paste it back on a Hennessy bottle. <laughs> no kidding, you ought to quit. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. What are you talking about? Oh, nothing in particular. We're just fooling around. What's the matter? Didn't your writers prepare anything this week either? You mean mink and schmink? <laughs> Now, they said they needed a vacation, so they uh, went to Catalina Island to write the program. Did they send you any material? No, but this morning I got a wire from them. It said, uh, have just pinned script on Seagull. Watch for it. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys are always going someplace. Remember the time you sent them out for a hot tamale and they went to Mexico City? <laughs> Do I? That tamale cost me $800, and it was ice cold when I got it. <laughs> oh, well, we'll manage. We did last week. Say, Dennis. Yes, please? Hmm. Uh, how, how about a song? Okay. Say, Miss Livingston, did you hear about Mr. Benny at Grauman's Chinese Theater? Hear about it? I was there. All right, Dennis, let's have your song. Talk about laughs. Who's talking about laughs? Sing, Dennis. What Sing. happened, Mary? Well. <laughs> 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 well. Jack oh. and I went to a matinee at the Chinese last Monday, and they were fixing the sidewalk there. All right, they were fixing the sidewalk. And Mr. Grauman happened to be standing at the box office. Yeah? So Jack went up to him and said, Mr. Grauman, as long as you've got all this wet cement here, how about paying a tribute to my supreme artistry? Now, wait a minute. So Mr. Grauman said, what do you mean? And Jack said, you know, make with the footprints. <laughs> He said that to me. Go ahead and sing, Dennis. Wait, Wait a minute now, Jackson. We want to hear this. Oh. Yeah, what happened, Mary? <laughs> well. So without waiting for an answer, Jack jumped in in the wet cement and disappeared. <laughs> disappeared? Yeah, they were filling in a manhole. <laughs> well, it's still a wonderful tribute, and I'm proud of it. Now, let's have your song, Dennis. Okay. Say, what's that in your ear, Mr. Benny? Cement. Now go ahead and sing. <laughs> Mr. Grauman pays a little tribute to my supreme artistry, and everybody's jealous. <laughs> I don't 
red skies, I hear a rhapsody. My days are so blue when you're away. My heart longs for you, so won't you stay? My darling, hold me tight And whisper to me Then soft through a starry night I'll hear a rhapsody My days are so blue when you're away my heart longs for you, so won't you stay, my darling, hold me tight, and whisper to me, then for a starry night, I'll hear a I Hear a Rhapsody, sung by Dennis Day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight, the Benny Hungry Hollywood Harlequins <laughs> will present their version of that... Hey, very... wait a minute, Jackson. I thought you said your writers didn't work this week. Uh, that seagull came in while Dennis was singing. <laughs> uh, the Benny Harlequins will present their version of that sensational <laughs> Warner Brothers picture. That masterpiece of human emotion. That gripping melodrama of the sidewalks of New York, City for Conquest. Uh, thank you, Warner Brothers. Now, um, now in this, in this epic, and nice of them to come all the way from Burbank. <laughs> Now, in this epic, I will play the part as portrayed by James Cagney on the screen. That of a rough and tough kid who fights his way through the slums and grows up to be a prize fighter. And Mary... Why, Jack, how can you play that part? You're not the Jimmy Cagney type. I'll handle it. Now, Mary... Imagine you playing a prize fighter. That's just silly. Oh, I'll do all right. Now, Mary... But, Jackson, you ain't tough enough to be Jimmy Cagney. It ain't believable. <laughs> well, I'll try it anyway. Uh, now, Mary... Mr. Harris is right. You're not tough enough. Oh, yeah? Put him up, Dave. <laughs> Put up your jokes. I'll show you who's not tough enough. Oh, Jack, calm down. Why pick on Dennis? Well, you know how excitable I am. <laughs> I guess I lost my head. Sorry, kid. Can I put my dukes down now? <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, now, my name will be Danny, and Mary, you're going to be my girlfriend, Peggy. You know, the part Ann Sheridan played. And you're madly in love with me. Why can't I play Carol Lombard's part? She wasn't in the picture. That's what I mean. <laughs> Mary, you're either going to be madly in love with me or infatuated with the May Company. <laughs> Now, Phil, <laughs> Phil, uh, you're going to be Eddie, my kid brother, a frail, artistic sort of fellow whose only interests are his books and his great love of music. Yeah? Yeah, you're high-strung and delicate, Phil, and your forehead suggests deep intellect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you grow up to be a great composer and finally conduct your own symphony... At Carnegie Hall. At last, the part that fits me. <laughs> Phil, it's just that we're stuck. Uh, that part fits you like a mail-order suit made by a nearsighted tailor for a couple of other fellas. <laughs> uh, now, Don. Yes, Jack? Uh, you have one of the most important parts in our play. You are the narrator, and you symbolize the spirit of a great metropolis. 
In fact, Don, you are New York. He ought to take a little weight off his bronx. <laughs> you said it. Now, this play, ladies and gentlemen, will go on immediately after a number by Phil Harris and his orchestra. Now, Phil, how about playing... I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bimmy. This is Rochester. Well, I'm sorry, Rochester. I'm busy. You're going to be busier than that. I'm quitting. <laughs> Quitting? What's the trouble now? It's about that mechanical man Mr. Billingsley made. You mean the robot? Yeah, he's breaking up everything in the house. You know that big grandfather's clock we got in the hall that runs so good? Yes. Well, Tempest has fused it for the last time. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That, that clock was very expensive. I tried to stop him, but he whammed me right on top of the head. On top of the head, why, that robot is made of iron. Did he hurt you? I won't need collars no more. <laughs> well, look, Rochester, I told you before, there are buttons on that robot to control him. All you have to do is sneak up behind him and press the button. That's how I got my neck shortened. <laughs> now, Rochester... Just call me Turtle. <laughs> Now, Rochester, I don't want that mechanical man roaming around the house. Where is he now? He's in the kitchen. I think he's that way about the electric refrigerator. <laughs> now, now, that's just silly. A robot has no emotions or feelings. He hasn't even got a personality. He has now. He's wearing your toupee. <laughs> Take it off of him. Now, Rochester, this is no time for joking. I'll be home right after the program. Meanwhile, tell Mr. Billingsley to keep that robot in his own room. Okay. What was that? My neck just came out. So long, boy. So long. Hmm. Play, Phil. I wish Mr. Billingsley would take a trip somewhere on his magic carpet. <laughs> by played by Phil Harris and his Sunset and Vine Orchestra. <laughs> Sunset meaning they are playing right here on Sunset Boulevard and Vine meaning they are just clinging to their job. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, for our sensational melodrama, City for Conquest, Curtain, Music. Our scene, ladies and gentlemen, is New York. New York, the greatest metropolis in the world. Millions of people gasping for life and air. Fighting, biting, clawing away for a place in the sun. New York! Gee, that's wonderful. And now, we take you to the east side. The attic room shared by Danny, the truck driver, and his brother, Eddie, the young musical genius. As the scene opens, Eddie, with an inspired look on his delicate face, is seated at his drum composing his Symphony of New York. Listen. <laughs> no. No, I still haven't got it. 
I don't feel that ending, but I can't give up. I must finish my symphony. Ah, I have a thought. That's it. Now I've got it. Oh, that's it. That's the voice of New York. Hello, Eddie. How's me kid brother? Oh, hello, Danny. Why aren't you working this afternoon? Ah, uh, me boss started an argument, so I slugged him. And a couple of cops came along, and I slugged them, too. I slug everybody. Oh, Danny, you're always fighting. Will you ever pick up good manners by yourself, or do I have to learn you? <laughs> hmm. It ain't no use, brother. I'm just naturally tough. How's your symphony coming along? Oh, I fear the masses will never like it. It's much too highbrow. Let me hear what you've done so far, will you, brother? Very well. I call my composition Manhattan, uh, Al, um, uh, Al, um... Allegory. Manhattan <laughs> Allegory. Let's hear it, brother. All right. I'll start with the part you like, Danny. The part I call East River. With all its proud and passionate beauty. With all its shrieking jungle cries for life and sun. Gee. And I carry on the theme until I've told the complete story of New York with its wealth and power and everlasting loveliness. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Let's, let's hear it, brother. Oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful. I can see it all. The Empire State Building. The tenements downtown with the laundry hanging out the window. Oh, boy. And there's Central Park in the moonlight. It's winter and the snow is falling. And that's the winter got again. Holy smoke. Olsen and Johnson are still there. Oh, Eddie, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. <laughs> Eddie. Eddie, you're a genius. But what's, what's that cowbell for? Well, that symbolizes the burning of New York. You know, when Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over the lantern. <laughs> that was Chicago. Oh, brother. <laughs> That's got nothing to do with New York. Okay, I'll take it out. <laughs> but otherwise, it's beautiful. I could listen to that forever. Oh, hello, Peggy. Hello, Danny. Get that girl out of here. A composer has no time for women. Hmm. Well, Eddie, at least you can say hello to me, sweetheart. Hello, Eddie. Hello, babe. What you doing later? Eddie! <laughs> hello is enough. Gee, you look pretty tonight, Peggy. Is that a new scoit? Yeah, this is a new scoit. Is that a new shoit? Yeah. <laughs> this is a new shoit. How do you like my shoit? Too toit around Detroit. <laughs> well, so much for dat. Say, Eddie, how's your symphony coming along? Gee, Peggy, you ought to hear it. Gee, it's beautiful. Beautiful, yes. But who's ever going to hear it? Where will I get the money to complete my masterpiece? Oh, he's so high strung. <laughs> Might as well tear it up. I'll never achieve my ambition. Never, never, never. <laughs> Poor kid, he's so sensitive. Also unbelievable. <laughs> but don't cry, brother. I'll get you the money. I know what I'll do. I'll be a prize fighter. There's a lot of dough in that. A prize fighter? Oh, don't do that, Danny. No, no, Danny, you mustn't. You'll get your nose broken. With all this cement in it? <laughs> don't be silly. Your music belongs to the world, Eddie. To the world. And I'm going to see that they gets it. <laughs> Months pass, and Danny, the truck driver, becomes Kid Samson, the sensational newcomer to the ring. After an amazing series of knockouts, he is now the leading contender for the championship of the world. We now find Kid Samson in the gymnasium, training for the big fight. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. How am I doing, Eddie? Oh, Danny, I wish you wouldn't fight. I'm doing it for you, brother. Hey, Lefty, you think I'm in good shape now? Yeah, but now listen, kid. This guy you fight tomorrow night is plenty tough. And you gotta know how to handle him. Don't worry, I'm moiter him. Now, don't be too sure of yourself, kid. The champ's got a habit of leading with a side of portrait, and he's liable to hit you with a side of reason's summary, but watch this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll remember that. 
And when you duck, he comes back with a little cider boss. Watch out for that cast of sulfur. You know, he's liable to file you with a cider boss to cider bait to the kidneys. <laughs> I'll watch out for that. I'll get in close. Now, look, you can't be too careful. I remember in Chicago, he was fighting a guy in a cellar faucet. Yeah? One, two, three, the face. He stood back with a cat. Traffic syndrome? Get him in a cellar faucet, started reading. He pulled him in state, the reek. I've seen him. <laughs> okay. Maybe you're right. Give me a rub down, Lefty. I don't know where that bottle of alcohol is. You don't? It was here yesterday. Where is it? I broke it. I can't stand alcohol. <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake! <laughs> Hey, what's that sticking out of your hip pocket? That's for after the play. <laughs> Give me that. Here, Lefty, rub me down. Now, look, where'll you take your shower? There's no use saddle brushes, brushes, is there? <laughs> no, I'll do it later. Well, look who's here. Hello, Peggy. Hello, Samson. That's Kid Samson. With gray hair? <laughs> that don't make no difference. I'm as hard as nails. Get a load of this chest and feel these muscles. Where? Right there on my arm. Look at that bulge. That's a muscle. Where? I don't see it. Right up. Now you scared it. It's gone. <laughs> well, I gotta leave you now, Peggy. I'm gonna get me rubbed down. Gee, Danny, you ought to get some new trunks. What's wrong with these I'm wearing? They're so long I can hardly see your garters. <laughs> They're all right. Say, Danny, who are you fighting tomorrow night? The champ. And he's one of the toughest mugs in the ring. What's his name? Dennis Killer Day. That guy's dynamite. Oh, Danny. I know you're doing this all for me, but I can't let you go through with it. Give it up, Danny. Please. Please. Oh, stop crying. Stop, will you? I want my rubbing alcohol. All right, here. Come on, Lefty, let's go. Pull up your trunks, kid. I want to tie your shoe. <laughs> oh, yeah. They are a little droopy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Clem McNulty coming to you from the ringside of Madison Square Garden. We're about to witness the championship fight between Killer Day, holder of the title, and Kid Sampson, the contender. The killer is already in his corner. And here comes Kid Sampson, nervously pulling his trunks up. Whoops, he stumbles. He's up again. And these trunks, they are too long. Get me suspenders, Lefty. Now, before the fight begins, we'll have a word from each of the contestants. First, Kid Sampson, the challenger. I'll moiter him. And now the champion, Killer Day. I'll get killed. <laughs> Come on, let's get going. The referee's just given the boys their final instructions. They're standing in their own corners, nervously awaiting the bell. And there it is. The boys meet in the center of the ring, and Killer Day leads with a right to the jaw. Ooh. I'm sorry, Mr. Benny. Watch it, will you? I got me glasses on. Wait till I take them off. Kid Sampson removes his glasses. Ooh. And counters with a left to the referee. He can't see a thing without him. Oh, yeah? Where's that killer? I'll moiter him. Kid Sampson is staggering around, and Killer Day is moving in for a knockout blow. Ooh. The killer throws another one. Ooh. And another one. Ooh. And another one. Ooh. Ooh. Kid Sampson is down, and it looks like a knockout. Ladies and gentlemen, while Kid Sampson is in dreamland, let me tell you about Jell-O's new dessert recipe book. This interesting book contains 365 recipes and suggestions, one for each day of the year. It can be obtained by sending 10 cents to Don Wilson, Battle Creek, Michigan. I thank you. Ooh. Let me add that guy. I'll slug him. I'll moiter him. It's too late. You're in your dressing room. Oh, yeah. Darn that, Dennis. He hit me right in my big blue eye. Ooh. I'm sorry, Mr. Benny. Sorry, nothing. Now, listen here, Dennis. You knew very well this was a play and that I was supposed to knock you out. Well, I'm Irish. I don't care what you are. Hey, what about my symphony? The heck with your symphony. Dennis Day, I'm not going to forget this. There's no excuse. You saw the picture. Jimmy Cagney's supposed to knock out the champion. That's the only way he can get the money to help his brother. And what happens? The minute my back is turned, you hit me right square in the eye. Now, this is the last time I... During the past 40 years, ladies and gentlemen, Jell-O has become increasingly famous as the name of America's favorite gelatin dessert. And now, today... 
Those big red letters are acquiring new fame on the Jell-O pudding package. Jell-O puddings, as you know, are the most recent members of the Jell-O family. Swell, ready-prepared puddings with the same high quality you've come to expect of every product that bears the name Jell-O. Jell-O puddings are available in three grand old pudding flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. And you'll find each one full of rich, creamy goodness, the last word in smooth, mellow delight. Jell-O puddings take only a few minutes to make, and they sell for the same low price as Jell-O. So tomorrow when you order Jell-O, order Jell-O puddings, too. And in buying both, look for those big red letters on the box. The name Jell-O is a trademark, the property of General Foods. And you make sure of getting the finest dessert enjoyment every time you ask for Jell-O, your password to pleasure. This is the last number of the 16th program in the current Jell-O series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Ooh, how does my eye look, Mary? Let's go to Ciro's and get a steak for it. Okay, I'll take it out of Dennis's salary. Good night, folks. of Jell-O six delicious flavors have you tried recently? Probably all of them. But if you haven't, why not decide right now to enjoy the rest of them just as soon as possible? Sure, you'll like them all because they all have that tempting look, and each one is equally outstanding for rare, delightful flavor, a flavor as refreshing as the juicy, ripe fruit itself. You might try Jell-O's three citrus flavors, perhaps a gay dessert made with golden orange Jell-O or a mold of shimmering lemon Jell-O. Or tangy lime jello, the very color of bright green limes hanging in the summer sun. Try cherry jello, too. Ruby red cherry jello full of rich, enticing goodness. And by all means, don't overlook strawberry and raspberry jello. Because you'll find they're better than ever. Each has a new, improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And the result is something mighty swell. Dessert enjoyment at its downright best. So try a tasty Jell-O treat real soon. Whether your favorite fruit is strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, or lime, you'll find a grand treat waiting for you in Jell-O. set to music from Crazy with the Heat as played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce that Jack Benny is at home this evening where he is packing for a sudden and unexpected trip to New York City. Mary Livingston is with him. So without further ado, we take you to Jack's home in Beverly Hills. Take it away. Now, let's see. One, two, three... Uh, What else do you want me to do, Jack? Uh, Just a minute, Mary. Three, four, five, six. Mary, do you think I ought to take six of these to New York? Oh, take them all. No, these will be enough. I'll take six. Take the whole box. How much does Kleenex cost? (laughs) That's not the point. I'll just take six. If I had a cold, it would be different. Now, let's see. uh... Say, Jack... What are you going to New York for, anyway? I told you, I'm going there on business for a couple of days. I'm considering a part in a Broadway play. Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. I've had my fling in pictures, and I'm going to tackle the legitimate theater. In fact, I'm toying with Shakespeare. Why don't you get a yo-yo and leave him alone? (laughs) Now, Mary, I'm serious. One of these days, you'll see a big electric sign on Broadway, Hamlet, starring John Benny. John Benny? Who's that? Me. I'm going to change my name. Well, here we go again. (laughs) I know what I'm doing. You can jest, Mary. With a little experience, I may become one of the leading interpreters 
Interpretators? What's that? <laughs> if I don't get away from Phil Harris, I'll go nuts. <laughs> Mary, with a little experience, I may become one of the leading interpreters of the immortal bard. Now, let's finish this packing. Okay. <laughs> hey, Romeo, uh, Romeo, art thou taking this hot water baggie? <laughs> Certainly, it's cold in New York. I want that hot water bag, my heavy muffler, those galoshes, my mittens, and that brick. What are you taking a brick for? I'm going to heat it and put it in my bed. <laughs> now, let's see. What else? Hello, Miss Limson. Hello, Rochester. Oh, Rochester, my plane leaves in a couple of hours. Did you alter my tuxedo like I told you to? Yes, sir. Here it is. Alter your tuxedo? Yeah, I told Rochester to take the satin cuffs off the sleeves. They're all right, but they're a little dated. That belt in the black ain't exactly cafe society. <laughs> well, no, but I may buy a new one in New York. Here, pack my tuxedo, Mary. Okay. Say, Jack, what's this deep pocket for in the back? Where? Right here on the inside. Oh, that. Uh, I did a magic act for a while in Vaudeville, and that's where I kept my rabbit. That was a pigeon, boss. It was a rabbit. Uh-oh, it was a pigeon. Rochester, I ought to know. I'm telling you, I kept a rabbit in that pocket. Okay, it was a rabbit. You're darn right. And that egg I found was a moth ball with a yolk in it. <laughs> An egg? Oh, 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 now I remember. That was a pigeon, and I used it in my violin act. Oh, boy, was that corny. No, Mary, it was one of the most beautiful things I ever did. Gee, I remember that act of mine. I used to come out on the stage in an amber spotlight and play the glow worm. The glow worm? Yes. And near the finish of my number, Natalie would... That was the pigeon, Natalie. <laughs> Natalie would come out and fly around the whole auditorium. And just as I'd hit the last high note, she would swoop down, light on the end of my violin bow, and stand there with a neon worm in her mouth. <laughs> Oh, the, really, the effect was simply wonderful. And then for an encore, the pigeon would sit up on my head and coo while I played Waters of the Minnetonka. <laughs> oh, that, that pigeon was so cute sitting there. Uh, remember the night she got knocked off with a tomato? <laughs> you never even saw the act. It was sensational. Whatever become of that pigeon, boss? Oh, we split up. <laughs> and, you know, Natalie isn't doing so well. I saw her in a pot pie at the Brown Derby the other night. <laughs> uh, gee, Mary, we better, um... You're still tender, though. Mary, we better hurry with this packing or I'll miss my plane. Uh, do you want this string? That's a tie packet. Oh, Rochester, I want you to take care of our boarder, Mr. Billingsley, while I'm away. You know, see that he gets his meals on time and everything. I don't want to be alone with that man. I tell you, boss, he's cuckoo. Oh, you're always saying that. What's he done now? Well, last night he put on a fur coat and told me he was a beaver. A beaver? Oh, he was probably just going to a masquerade party. Well, he came back later and built a dam across the swimming pool. <laughs> what? You mean to say he built a dam clear across my swimming pool? Yeah. Well, why didn't you go out and catch him? I tried to, and he told me he was out of season. <laughs> My goodness. Well, he better clean out that pool while I'm gone. Say, Jack, what? where's that mechanical man Mr. Billingsley invented? Oh, he's around somewhere. Rochester's scared to death of that robot. I'm scared of anything that nicks my razor when I hit it. <laughs> well, don't tease him. Say, Mary, uh, pack, uh... Pack a couple of those, uh... See who's at the door, Rochester. The door? Yes. Maybe it's a salesman selling something we got enough of. Well, go and see. Let's find out. Okay. Never saw such a lazy guy. Mary, pack a couple of turtleneck sweaters. I'll need them in. Sweater over those ears. I pull them up from the bottom like a girdle. <laughs> How do I get them over my ears? Let's see. I hope I didn't forget anything. It's Mr. Harris, boss. Hello, Phil. Hiya, Mary. Hey, Jackson, here's that suitcase you wanted. 
Thanks, Bill. It's nice of you to lend it to me. Boy, get a load of those labels on it. Yeah, I had it with me last summer when I was on the road playing them one-night stands. Oh. <laughs> hey, Jack, look uh, at this label here. Rip Carlton Hotel, Empty Jug, Texas. <laughs> empty Jug? That's us. Kill them and fill them. <laughs> I never heard of the town. Where is Empty Jug, Phil? It's about 50 miles this side of Bottoms Up. Oh, fine. <laughs> All those jerk water towns. Phil, why don't you get booked into cities like Fort Worth or Galveston or San Antonio or Dallas? Leave me alone, Jackson. I know my market. <laughs> I'm glad you do. At least you're not kidding yourself, Phil. I'll give you credit for that. Yeah, credit. <laughs> oh, Dennis, I didn't see you come in. Well, I finished mowing your lawn, Mr. Benny. Is there anything else? No, that's about all. What do I owe you, Dennis? Well, two hours at 50 cents an hour. That's 75 cents. Oh, what a kid. Dennis, you're cheating yourself. Fifty cents an hour for two hours is a dollar. It wasn't last week. <laughs> Dennis, that's about all. Okay. Do you mind if I go in the other room and practice my song? No, no, go right ahead. Go in the living room, Dennis. There's a piano there. Thanks. Okay. Well, Mary, my suitcase is about full. We'll start on Phil's now. Open it up. Okay. Be surprised how many things you have to take with you. Hey, Phil, what's all this stuff in here? Oh, those are the posters we put up when we're on the road. Let's see one of them. Well, I'll be darned. Coming next week to the Trianon livery stable, <laughs> Phil Harris and his barefoot serenaders. <laughs> Phil, don't your boys wear shoes when they're on the road? Ah, we don't want to make our audience feel self-conscious. <laughs> oh, I see. Now, Mary, take these posters out of Phil's bag and put my wool socks in it. Oh, Jack, you're taking too much stuff with you. No, I'm not. Now, Mary, fold these things neatly, will you? I'll need all the space I can get. Okay. And, Phil, hand me my dressing robe. Here you are, Jackson. Thanks. I know you're taking chances in New York, you know. It's pretty cold there. It all comes back to me now. Of midnight blue, your face uplifted to my own. We called it a thrill of the moment and blame the moon up above. We didn't know what the glow meant, we never dreamed it might be love. It all comes back. Now, the love I threw away, now each lonely night I pray that it will all come back to me someday. It all comes back to me now, the love I threw away. Now each lonely night I pray that it will all come back to me I guess that's all the shoes I'll need. Say, Mary, do you think I ought to take a pair of rubbers to New York with me? I already packed your galoshes. Well, they're for snow. I want the rubbers in case the snow turns to rain, you know? Well, why don't you take some skates in case the rain turns to ice? Skates? Say, that's not a bad idea. Uh, pack them, too. Uh, why don't you take a spoon in case the ice turns to ice cream? Oh, quiet. <laughs> <laughs> You're so smart lately. <laughs> Now, let's see. I'll be going out nights in New York, so I'll need a... Uh, oh, Rochester! Yes, boss? A run next door to Mr. Ronald Coleman's house and ask him if I can borrow his opera hat. It's hanging in your closet now! <laughs> oh, yes. I borrowed it for my cousin Rita's wedding. She's had twins twice since then! <laughs> oh, it hasn't been that long. Oh, I know what I need. Now, go over and ask Mr. Coleman to lend me his black evening cape. That'll come in handy with my full-dress suit. 
You mean his full dress suit. All right, go borrow it. How do you know he's got an evening cape? I've seen him wear it in three pictures. Go get it, Rochester. I wouldn't buy anything else from Mr. Coleman, boss. I don't think he likes you for a neighbor. Ronnie, what are you talking about? We're very good friends. Did you see that sign he put up in front of his yard? What sign? House for sale as soon as I get my clothes back. <laughs> oh, well, there's a smart alecky thing to do. Who does he think he is, anyway? He must be pretty sore at you, Jackson. Who cares? Why should I worry about Coleman? He never listens to my program anyway. How can he? We've had his radio for two years. <laughs> Well, it's going back first thing in the morning. Needs new tubes anyway. <laughs> now, let's see. Mary, stop jumping up and down on those shirts to get them in the suitcase. You're not making wine. <laughs> say. Well, you've got too much stuff in here. Not if you pack them right. Be neat. That's how you got fired at the May Company. <laughs> We ought to get something from them pretty soon, don't you think? <laughs> you know, I don't, even if it's just a little handkerchief, you know, I... Well, I've got... Well, I guess... <laughs> well, I guess I've got everything now. Yeah, I think... Oh... Oh, hello, Mr. Billingsley. Good evening, Mr. Benny. Getting ready for a trip, I see. Yes, yes, I'll be away for a few days. I'm flying to New York. Flying, eh? Would you like to borrow my magic carpet? No, no, thanks. I'll, I'll take the plane. <laughs> After all, New, uh, New York is pretty far to go on a magic carpet. I'll be glad to put a hostess on it. No, no, thanks, just the same. I'll just be an old stick in the mud and take the plane. <laughs> I hope you'll be comfortable while I'm gone. Oh, don't worry. Mr. McDougal will keep me company. Mr. McDougal? That's the robot. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, by the way, how is Mr. McDougal? Oh, he's been in a frightful mood all day. I think I'll have his oil changed. <laughs> his oil changed, eh? Would that help? Always helps me. <laughs> Oh, 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 well, well, hmm, hmm, if you'll, uh, if you'll, uh, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Billingsley, I'll go on with my packing. Of course. Good night, Mr. Benny. Good night. One never knows. <laughs> you know, that guy is a little eccentric, but I, I can't help liking him. Does he always carry a bunch of bananas over his shoulder? No, this is the first time. Well, I might as well finish my packing. Now, let's see. What else do I have to do? There's the buzzer. I wonder if I took along enough handkerchief. Oh, sure. You got plenty. Yeah, I guess so. Hmm. Oh, Rochester! Yes, boy! There's someone ringing the doorbell. Maybe you'll go away! I never saw anybody so allergic to doors. Well, Mary, I guess I've got just about everything I need. Huh? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. You want to take your step-ins, don't you? Mary, men refer to them as shorts. With lace on them? <laughs> That's not lace. They're just frayed a little. I'll buy new ones in New York. Why don't you buy us some from Ronald Coleman? We're not speaking. Not until he removes that sign from his front yard. Announcing Mr. Don Wilson. You don't have to be so formal, Rochester. Hello, Don. Hi, Don. Oh, hello, everybody. Hello. Well, Jack, here's those ice cream puffs or those uh, cream puffs that you asked me to bring over. <laughs> Don, I know you haven't got much to do this week, but don't pad your part. <laughs> One word isn't going to help it any, you know. 
What was it you said, Don? What? I said, here are those cream puffs that you asked me to bring over. Cream? What are these for? Well, you phoned me this morning and asked me to bring over some cream puffs. I asked you for earmuffs. It's cold in New York. It's the silliest thing I ever heard of. Oh, I'm sorry, Jack. I'm sorry I stumbled and misunderstood you. That's all right. Mary, put these cream puffs in my suitcase. I'll eat them on the plane. Thanks, Don. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, Rochester, get the car out of the garage. We'll be leaving for the airport pretty soon. Yes, sir. Phil, help me close the suitcase, will you? Okay, Jackson. He was darn nice of you to loan it to me. Ah, don't mention it. A friend in need is a friend indeed, like my teacher says. Oh, so you're studying Proverbs in night school now, eh, Phil? Yeah, here's another one. Early to bed and early to rise... Won't help those bags under your eyes. (laughs) (laughs) He has to have Proverbs. I got a swell one, Jack. What? A penny saved is a penny earned. Say, that's good. I ought to remember that. Remember it? You wrote it. <laughs> Mary, believe me, I never heard of that proverb before in my life. By the way, Jack, uh, what time does your plane leave? In about... Say, look what time it is. We better get a move on here. Come on, Phil, help me close this suitcase. You got too much stuff in there, Jackson. Well, look, I'll sit on it, and you snap the lock. Okay. There. Snap the lock, Phil. Careful now. I'll be all right. Snap it. Okay. Open it. Open it. Open it up. Open it up. Woo! 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 Darn you, Phil. Why don't you watch what you're doing? I told you to be careful. Well, you didn't have to. Now, how are we going to... How are we going to close this suitcase? I'll sit on it, Jack. Okay, Don. Now, hurry. we got to get going. Now, Mary... <laughs> well, there goes the cream puffs. <laughs> Phil, tie a rope around the suitcase and let's go. The car's waiting, boss. We'll be right out. Where's Dennis? He's in the other room. Hey, Dennis, you want to drive to the airport with us? I live out that way. I'll ride my bicycle. All right. <laughs> We're coming, we're coming. Everything has to happen to me when I'm in a hurry. Nice of you guys to come down and see me off. Are you comfortable back there, kid? I'm okay, Jack. I was seasick for a while, but I'm all right now. Well, we'll be there pretty soon. We're making pretty good time. What are you talking about? We should have been at the airport half an hour ago. Well, don't forget, Mary, we had a few hills on the way. When we come to the next one, I'm not going to get out and walk for anybody. You'll get out the same as everybody else. (laughs) Rochester, can't we go just a little bit faster? What does the speedometer say? Take your choice. There's no needle on it. (laughs) I'll step on it. I've got to get my ticket, check my bags and everything. Gee, it's a beautiful night, though. What are you blowing the horn for, Rochester? I want to pass that catalog. Cadillac. I must be crazy. (laughs) Rochester, if you can't pass a catalog with this car, I'm really going to get rid of it. (laughs) 
And just drive. Say, Jack, are you going to see Fred Allen while you're in New York? Well, I certainly won't go to his house, and I doubt that I'll run into him on the street. Oh. You see, Allen never goes outdoors in the wintertime uh, due to thin blood and shoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, Jackson. You ought to use that on the program sometime. No, I'm not kidding, Phil. The soles on Allen's shoes are worn so thin that he can stand on a lawn and feel the grass growing. <laughs> Make a note of that, Mary. I can use that gag. Write it yourself. How can I write? I gotta wave this lantern. You want somebody to bump into us? <laughs> anyway, don't bother. I'll remember the gag. Hey, look, Jack. There's Dennis on his bicycle. Oh, yeah. Hello, Dennis! Hiya, Mr. Buddy! Hiya! Pass him, Rochester. Aren't your legs tired from all that pedaling, Dennis? No, nah, this is fun! That's good. Pass him, Rochester. <laughs> You want to hitch on back, Dennis? We'll give you a lift. No, thanks. This is good exercise. Ah, it's good exercise, all right. Pass him, Rochester. <laughs> Pass him. Embarrassing, ain't it? <laughs> well, step on it or something. So long, Mr. Benny. I'll wait for you at the airport. You come back here. <laughs> all right, go on, those reckless kids. Let them go. Oh, Jack! Don't you dare open your mouth. And listen, fellas, I don't, don't any of you breathe a word of this. I won't, Jackson. Don't worry about me. We still have a lot of time, so let's relax and enjoy the ride. We're going along fine now. Attention, folks, we're going down a hill. Please fasten your safety belts. <laughs> okay, buckle them on, everybody. You too, Harris. I don't want any lawsuits. Here we go! Whee! Boy, we're traveling now. See you at the airport, Dennis. I knew we'd pass them. Flight number nine, plane leaving for Phoenix, Fort Worth, Nashville, Washington, and New York. Phil, did you have my baggage weighed? The guy's doing it now, Jackson. Good. Here's your ticket, Jack. Thanks, Mary. By the way, Jack, I brought you something to read on the plane. Uh, thanks, Don, thanks. It's I Jell-O's new ticket. recipe book. It has 365 desserts in it, one for each day of the year. Swell, swell. I'll read it, Don. Say, Mary... And if you'll notice, Jack, it has beautiful colored illustrations yeah, I notice, that will tempt uh, even the most jaded appetites. Uh, good, good. I'll read it. How much is my baggage? And if you want there? additional copies, Jack, yeah, just uh, send a dime, 10 cents, to Don Wilson, yeah, Battle Creek, Michigan. Michigan. I'll read it. I'll read it. I, I mean, I'll send it, Don. I'll send it. Uh, how much does my baggage weigh, mister? Well, you're allowed 40 pounds on your ticket, and your bags weigh 90. That's Rochester. Take them out of the plane. Okay, boss. 50 pounds excess? That'll cost you a fortune. Cost me... Hold those bags, Rochester. How much is the excess, mister? 50 pounds at 75 cents a pound. That's, uh... That's, uh... 37.50. Open the bags, Rochester. <laughs> Open the bags. Come on, take out that heavy overcoat. Jack, it's cold in New York. I'm no sissy. Take it out. Take it out. <laughs> Take it out. Come on. Take it out. Go ahead. But, Jack, your plane is leaving in a second. Well, it'll wait. It'll wait. Take out those sweaters, Rochester. Oh, wait a minute, Jack. You'll need those. Take them out. Take them out. I take out that dress suit. I don't have to be so formal. Well, what about those galoshes? Take one of them out. He can hop through the snow. <laughs> take them both out. Take them out. Take them out. Now, look, Rochester. I want you to take all this stuff and put it back in the car. Okay. What about these woolen mufflers? Take them out. Take them out. I'm not going to Alaska. And when you get home, Rochester, press everything and put them back in my dress. How about these mittens? Take them out. I'm not going to the North Pole. Take them out. Take, now, Rochester, they'll be sure and take care of everything. I'll be back in a few days. I'll wire you first, and you can meet me here at the airport. Take those out, too, Mary. Take them out. Take them out. In the meantime, Rochester, keep an eye on Mr. Billingsley, and don't let that robot go roaming all around the house. Well, goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Take those sweaters out, Mary. Take them out. Take them out. Friends, I have a suggestion to make, and I hope it's one that you will take. Right after this broadcast, get an envelope, and in that envelope, place one dime in coin or stamps together with your name and address. Then mail the envelope to me, Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. And in just a few days, you'll be feasting your eyes on one of the most beautiful and original recipe books you ever saw, the new dessert recipe book that everybody's talking about. The book is unique, friends. It really is a brand-new invention in recipe books because it gives you a different dessert suggestion for every day in the year. 365 of them. All you have to do is turn to the day of the year you're interested in, and there's a grand dessert idea waiting for you. It's like magic. 
Like having an expert chef standing at your elbow every time you want an idea for a delicious treat. And the pictures? Well, just wait till you see them. You'll enjoy them as much as the desserts they illustrate. Now, here's how you get this swell recipe book, ladies and gentlemen, so listen carefully. Enclose 10 cents in coin or stamps in an envelope, along with your name and address, and mail it to me personally, Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. This is the last number of the 17th program in the current Jell-O series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce that during this week, all of us are making a special effort to assist the president in his drive against infantile paralysis. Do your part to protect the children of our country by joining the March of Dimes and sending your contribution to the White House. Good night, folks. The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Way Down Yonder in Seattle. <laughs> cold summer or winter, Jell-O is a mighty grand dessert. Yes, sir, the sun may be shining where you folks live, or it may be snowing outdoors. But snow or sun, you'll discover that there's no finer treat than Jell-O. Jell-O is a dessert that's always good, always suitable to every season. It's a dessert that everybody likes, everywhere, every time. Because Jell-O has such a gay, inviting look. A colorful beauty that's one of its biggest attractions. And you simply can't beat Jell-O for rich, refreshing flavor. A flavor that rivals the juicy, ripe fruit itself. So order Jell-O tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, choosing any or all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, or lime. Incidentally, strawberry and raspberry Jell-O are now better than ever. Both have a new, improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And the result is a truly distinctive goodness. Serve a tempting mold of Jell-O tomorrow. in Seattle, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce that Jack Benny has not yet returned from his trip to New York City. However, he will be back with us next Sunday, and in the meantime... No we're... kidding, Don. Ain't Jackson going to be on the show tonight? No, Phil. He wired me saying he's been delayed in New York. A big business deal's holding him up. A big business deal? Yes. He's probably sitting in a restaurant waiting for the other guy to pick up the check. <laughs> I know Jack. No, I'm serious, Mary. He won't be back until tomorrow. Well, what am I waiting for? Jello again. This is smiling Phil Harris talking. And folks, here's the hot one. <laughs> you know, folks, a funny thing happened. A manicurist says to a guy in a barber shop, Shall I file your nails? And he says, No, honey, just throw them away. <laughs> Ain't that a Lulu? <laughs> now, just a minute, Phil, just a minute. I'm sorry, but you can't be the master of ceremonies tonight. Jack has arranged to have Herbert Marshall take over the show. You mean Herbert Marshall, that big movie star? Yes, sir. Gee, Herbert Marshall. I wish I'd known about this before. My hair's a mess. Mine, too. <laughs> I wonder if we'll have time to go to the beauty parlor. <laughs> Say, Don, what time is Mr. Marshall getting here? Well, Rochester went over to pick him up. He should be here any minute. You know, I'm pretty anxious to get acquainted with that guy. I ain't never met him. <laughs> well, don't say ain't never in front of him. You'll scare him away. Don't worry now. I can be highbrow. When I put on the dog, you'd think I was graduated from Oxenard. <laughs> Oxenard?
Bernard. You mean Oxford. All right, I got my towns mixed up. But you got nothing to worry about, fellas. I can be just as ritzy as he is. Uh, you don't have to be ritzy, Phil. I've known Bart Marshall for years, and he's a grand person. Hello, fellas. Oh, hello, Dennis. Oh, boy, guess who I just saw out in the hall? Who? The big movie star, Hubert Marshall. Oh. <laughs> Hubert, you mean Herbert Marshall. You're as bad as Phil. Oh. Well, Dennis, why didn't you bring him here with you? Mr. Marshall's taking Jack's place on the program tonight. Gosh, if I'd have known that, I'd have faked a crumpet. <laughs> hey, Don... Don't you think you ought to go out and get Marshall? Yeah, don't lose him. Well, maybe that's him now. Come in. Uh, pardon me, is this the Jello program? Well, Bart, come right on in. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thank you. Thank you. I'm awfully sorry I'm late, Don, but Jack sent his man over in a Maxwell to pick me up. Yes, we, uh, we had some tire trouble. Oh, did one of the tires blow out? One would have been nothing. <laughs> Sounded like a gangster movie. <laughs> I know, Bart, I rented that car. Oh, uh, pardon me, I don't believe you know the other members of our cast. This is Mary Livingston, our leading lady. Hello, Mr. Marshall. How do you do, Miss Livingston? I've heard you on the air so often, I feel we're old friends. Gee. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, let's not be formal. I'll call you Mary and you call me Bart. Gee. You know, I'm not used to this sort of work. I hope I made good tonight. You made good with me already. Well. <laughs> and Bart, this is Dennis Day, our young tenor. Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Marshall, if I'm not too excited. <laughs> now, calm down, Dennis. Calm down. Hey, Don, how about giving me a knockdown? Oh, yes. Bart, this is Phil Harris, our musical director. Glad to know you, Mr. Harris. Put it there, Herbie. What's cooking? <laughs> what's, uh, what's cooking? Yeah, you know, are you jiving? Are you solid? Are you on the beam? Solid on the beam. He means, how are you? Oh, 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 I'm fine, thank you. The weird fellow, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, Bart, you'll, you'll just have to get used to Phil. Musicians are like that. Oh, are they? Well, I'm sure we'll all get along beautifully, although it's rather difficult coming in here on such a short notice. I'm sure Jack appreciates it. Hey, Herbie, I can't figure this out. Are, are you pals with Jackson? Jackson? He means Jack. Oh, I see. Oh, yes, yes. No, really, I, I ought to have an interpreter with this fellow. <laughs> <laughs> well, Phil, no, we're, we're not exactly pals, but I've known Jack for some time. Uh, did you work in a picture together? No, I've never had that pleasure. Well, then did you meet him at a party or something? No, ours is more of a business relationship. You see, for years now, Jack has been selling me Christmas cards. <laughs> Very nice ones, too. Christmas cards? Holy smoke! He meets more darn people that way. <laughs> well, let's get on with the program, shall we? I think a musical selection should be in order. You, uh, you have an orchestra, haven't you, Mr. Harris? Yeah, them's it. <laughs> But them's it. Yeah, them boys sitting over there is it. What's the matter? Don't you speak English? Well, frankly, old boy, I'm beginning to wonder. <laughs> Amazing creature, isn't he? <laughs> he certainly is, Bart. Well, what are you going to play, Phil? Well, it's an original composition written by myself, entitled, That's What I Like About the South. Oh, brother. Yeah, and I'm going to sing a couple of courses, too. I've got a good notion to take Herbert Marshall and go home. Now, don't you believe her, Herbie. It's going to be a great number. All right, let's hear it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a band number by Phil Harris and his them's it's. <laughs> Play, Phil. <laughs> Alabama, 
Let's go see my dear old mammy. She's frying eggs and boiling hammy. That's what I like most. Why, right there you can make no mistake. You wear your nerves, I'm never shaky. Ought to taste a layer cakey. That's what I like about salt. She's got baked ribs and candy yams, those sugar cured Virginia hams. Basement full of those berry jams, and that's what I like about salt. Hot corn, bread, and black eyed peas. You can eat as much as you please. Cause it's never out of season. That's what I like about salt. Ah, don't take one, have two. They're dark brown and chocolate too. Suits me, they must suit you, cause that's what I like most. Way down where the cane grows tall, down where they say you all walk on in with that southern drawl, cause that's what I like about salt. It's down where they have those pretty queens to keep a dreaming, those dreamy dreams. Let's sip that absinthe to New Orleans, that's what I like about salt. Come old Bob with all the news, got the box back coat and the button shoes, all caught up with his union dues, and that's what I like about the song. Here come old Roy down the street, who can't you hear them scuffling feet? He would rather sleep than eat, and then and then I like about She's got ham hocks and butter beans, spare ribs and turnip greens, mighty grouse in New Orleans, and that's what I like about the song. That was, um, That's What I Like About the South, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra, with a vocal chorus by Mr. Harris. Did you really write that number, Phil? Yep, every word of it. Ham hocks and butter beans and backbones and turnip greens. Don't that make your mouth water, Herbie? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it's one of the most appetizing songs I've ever heard. <laughs> by the way, how did you happen to compose a number like that? He was hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Mary. Ah, oh, now cut that out. <laughs> no, 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 that wasn't it at all. There's a lot of songs about June and moon and love, so I figured I'd write about food. Food, huh? Yeah, just give me a cookbook and a piano and I'm going to town. That's very interesting. I had no idea you had such a gastronomical outlook. Gastronomical? Hey, I better write that down. That's a longy. A longy? Uh, he means a long word. Oh, but why does he write them down? He puts them in a scrapbook. He's making his own dictionary. <laughs> yeah, I got over 300 of them, but I forget what they mean. I see, yeah. He gets more fantastic every minute. <laughs> Oh, by the way, Bart, did Jack mention in his wire about our sketch this evening? Why, no, he didn't. What sketch do you mean? Well, we were going to do our version of Somerset Mom's great play, The Letter. You know, the picture you made recently with Betty Davis? And Jack was going to play Herbert Marshall. Well, that's very flattering. And I was uh, just wondering, Bart, since Jack isn't here, perhaps you'd be willing to play your part yourself. Well... Do you think you can do it, Hubert? <laughs> Well, Bart, Bart, how about it? Would you like to join the Benny Little Theater group? Why, yes, it might be fun. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Dennis, you sing your song, and then we'll do our version of the letter. Oh, why bother? Let's just play post office. That might be fun, too. But I think we better do the letter first. Now, you, Mary, you will be my leading lady. Somebody pinch me. I'm dreaming. Ouch, Dennis! <laughs> I'm sorry, Miss Livingston. Oh, go ahead and sing. I'll get it. Hello? Oh, just a moment, please. It's for you, Mary, New York calling. New York? Probably Jack. Hello? Put him on. Oh, hello, Jack. How are you? I know it's long distance, but how much does it cost to say, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> All right, forget it. Say, Jack, how did your business deal come out? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> what about that business deal, Mary? Alan finally paid the check. <laughs> uh, what's that, Jack? 
Yes, he's right here. I'll put him on. He wants to talk to you, Mr. Marshall. Oh, thank you. Hello. Oh, hello, Jack. How are you? Sorry, old man. I, I forgot it was long distance. <laughs> what? No, you don't have to do that at all. No, no. No, but really, old boy, I don't expect anything. Oh, very well, if you insist. Thanks awfully. <laughs> Goodbye. Well, I'll be darned. Is Jackson going to pay you for being on the program tonight? No, but next year I get my Christmas cards for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have your song, Dennis. Mamucho, sung by Dennis Day, and a very beautiful number. You know, Dennis, I like the way you sang part of it in English and part in Spanish. That's quite a linguistic feat. Yeah, linguistic. <laughs> hmm. And now let's have a go at our sketch shop. I'll play the same role I had in the picture, that of Robert Crosby, the rubber planter, and Mary, you'll be my wife, Leslie Crosby. It's a very difficult role. Now let's rehearse a little. Kiss me, darling. Later, Mary. Now let's see. We'll need, uh, we'll need a barrister. Phil, do you think you can handle the part of the lawyer? Absolutely, old boy. How do you want me to play it? Gastronomical or linguistic? <laughs> uh, a little of each. Well, I think that about take, uh, takes care of the casting. Say, Mr. Marshall, am I going to be in the play? Well, in a way, Dennis. You see, you, uh, you enact the role of the man who's been murdered. But unfortunately, as the story opens, you are already dead. Oh, no dialogue, eh? <laughs> Well, uh, hardly. And now, ladies and gentlemen. Then I might as well go over in the corner and have a chair. That's a good idea. Of course, it'll be more believable if I lay down on the floor. Very well, you can, uh, you can lie on the floor. But if I do that, I'll get my new suit wrinkled. Young man, let's not worry so much, shall we? Okay, Bob. Good. 
<laughs> and now, for our feature attraction this evening, members of the Benny Stock Company and myself will present our version of Warner Brothers' current film achievement, The Letter. Speaking of the letter, ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you of the big red letters on the box. They spell Jell-O, America's favorite gelatin dessert. It is not only economical and easy to make, but comes in six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. <laughs> Quite of you, please pardon the interruption. That's quite all right, Don. I may want to be on the program again some other time. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the letter. <laughs> the locale of our play is Singapore in the Malay Peninsula. Leslie Crosby, a beautiful young Englishwoman has just been acquitted of the murder of Jeffrey Hammond, her lover. That's me, folks. I'm just full of holes. <laughs> Young man, will you please lie down? Yes, sir. Mrs. Crosby's husband, her friends, and even the court believe her to be innocent. However, a very valuable piece of evidence has been withheld. A letter. A letter so condemning that it would have changed the entire course of the trial and sent Leslie Crosby to the gallows. Hey, Hubert, shall I lay on my face or on my back? <laughs> Either one. <laughs> Her husband has no knowledge of this damning bit of evidence which is now in the possession of Mrs. Crosby's attorney. As the scene opens, the trial has just ended and Leslie is being escorted through the crowded courtroom by her attorney. One side. One side there. Thank you. Come into this room, Leslie. I must talk to you. But my husband... You can see him later. Come along. Well, Leslie... Aren't you going to compliment me on my magnificent plea? I had that jury in the palm of my hand. You had them drooling, too. All you talked about was ham hocks and butter beans. <laughs> Some plea. Well, I got you off, didn't I? Thanks to me, you are now a free woman. Why shouldn't I be free? I shot Jeffrey Hammond in self-defense. That's what the public believes. But you murdered him and you've done it with malice and forethought and all that stuff. <laughs> About. Well, just look at this. Look at this letter. Dear Phil, I waited for you last night until all... Wrong the... letter! <laughs> yeah, give me that. Now, here's the letter I mean. Do you see it? Why, that's the letter I wrote to Jeff Hammond. Precisely. Oh, fine. Now, look, do you realize that if this letter had been introduced as evidence, they'd have given you a hemp necklace? Oh, never mind that. How did you get hold of this letter? Well, I had to buy it from a blackmailer. He wanted $10,000, but I talked him down to 85 cents. 85 cents? Why, that's all the money my husband had in the world. Well, that's the best I could do. Here, now take this letter and burn it up. The most terrible thing I've ever read. And if your husband ever sees it, you're going to... Quiet. Here he comes now. Oh, yes. Hello, Robert. Hello, old boy. Ah, oh, Leslie, my love. Robert. Kiss me, my darling. Oh, my dear, I'm so glad. So glad this terrible ordeal is over. Kiss me, my darling. It's been like a horrible nightmare. <laughs> and now, thank heaven, it's over. At last, we are together again. Kiss me, my darling. You'll never know. You'll never know what I've been through. Those nights of torment and loneliness. Please kiss me, my darling. Oh, oh, yeah, oh yes, yes. Sweetheart. Hey, Herbert, we got the same technique. <laughs> If you'll excuse me, old man, I'll toddle along. This is the most gastronomical day I've ever gone through. If, if. Oh, Robert, alone at last. Yes, alone at last. Kiss me, my darling. Take it easy, old girl. We only just got through. <laughs> oh, Leslie, I can't tell you how happy I am. But I've made such a frightful mess of things. How can you love me after what I've done? But I do love you. Darling, I do. No, no, you can't. Believe me, Leslie, I love you now more than ever. I adore you, Leslie. Here, rest your head on my shoulder. Oh, boy, if the girls at the make company could see me now. <laughs> Gee. I have everything planned, Leslie. We're leaving Singapore, leaving it forever. Yes, we must go away. I know of a rubber plantation in Sumatra that we can purchase for only 85 cents. Uh-oh. But there's something I must tell you, Robert. I had to use that 85 cents to buy a letter. What? 
You've squandered my life savings on a mere scrap of paper. Leslie, let me see that letter. I haven't got it. Don't lie to me. What's that in your hand? Leslie, I must see that letter. No, no, I can't show it to you. Then read it to me. No, no, it's too shameful, too horrible. I don't care. I paid 85 cents for that letter, and I want to know what it says. <laughs> You're as bad as Benny. <laughs> Very well, I'll read it. Dear Jeff. Oh, Robert, it's too terrible. I can't continue. I insist. Read the rest of that letter. I can't go on with it. You must. All right. You might as well know. Dear Jeff, roses are red, violets are blue. I like my husband, but I'm nuts about you. <laughs> there. Now you know. So that's it. You were in love with Jeff Hammond. Yes, Robert, and I still love him. With all my heart and soul, I love the man I killed. Yeah, killed. Young man, will you please lie down? Kiss me, darling, kiss me. Please, Mary, please. Play, Phil. Christmas cards or no Christmas cards, I'll never go through this again. <laughs> Keep an eye on your heart, played by the orchestra. And Bart Marshall, on behalf of Jack and every one of us, I want to thank you for coming over here tonight and doing such a swell job of pinch hitting. No kidding, Herbie. You're terrific. Terrific? I'll bet anything that means terrific. Now you're catching on, Bob. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> well, everyone, I've had a grand time here this evening, and it's been fun meeting you all. Uh, say, Mr. Marshall, you live in Beverly Hills, don't you? Yes, Mary, I do. Well, uh, I live out that way myself. Would, would you mind dropping me off? Why, no, I'd be glad to. And uh, on the way home, maybe we could stop at a drive-in for a sandwich. A drive-in? That's a splendid suggestion. Of course, I, I'm pretty hungry. Uh, maybe we ought to go to a restaurant instead. All right, we'll, uh, we'll stop at a restaurant. Well, I'll phone Ciro's and reserve a table. <laughs> well, we certainly got there in a hurry. <laughs> Come along, Mary. Well, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, goodbye. Mary. Hello, right, everyone. Oh, by the way, Mary, I'm afraid I'm being rather rude. Do you think I ought to uh, invite the rest of the gang to Sierra's with us? Nothing doing. You're mine, Bob. Come on. <laughs> well, as a famous poet once said, ladies and gentlemen, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. And believe me, that's a quotation practically made to order for General Foods' new dessert recipe book. This grand book is certainly a thing of beauty. And it's a book that you'll find a joy forever. From cover to cover, it's filled with lovely paintings in the spirit of each month and season. And dozens of dazzling color photographs showing rich, luscious desserts. So vivid and natural looking that you'd almost declare they were real. There are 365 different dessert recipes and suggestions... One for every day in the whole year. Suggestions for shimmering jello treats as well as for delicious pastries, puddings, cakes, and cookies. And it's as easy to use as one, two, three. The most convenient book you've ever seen. It's easy to get, too. All you have to do is just send 10 cents in coin or stamps to Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. I'll repeat the address. 
Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. Send 10 cents for your copy tonight. This is the last number of the 18th program in the current Jell-O series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time when Jack will be back with us again. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce that this coming week marks the 31st anniversary of the founding of the Boy Scouts of America. May we, on this occasion, wish this great movement continued success. Good night, folks. Good night, Jack. Better step on it, Rochester. Yes, sir. You know, it'll be nice to get to the studio before my broadcast starts. Don't worry, boss. We'll have time to spare if the wind don't change. <laughs> well, I, uh, I don't want to be late, especially after being off the program last Sunday. You know, I was a little worried about that. I was afraid my gang wouldn't be able to do a show without my being there. Yeah, who, who'd ever think a program could be that funny with the both of us just listening in? <laughs> yes, it, uh, it did go over pretty well. Say, boss, that's the first time you ever missed a broadcast, ain't it? No, it happened once before when I fell asleep at a movie. It was my picture, too. I can't understand it. <laughs> Is everything comfortable there in the back seat, Mr. Billingsley? Oh, fine, thank you. <laughs> it's awfully nice of you to give me this lift. Oh, don't mention it. I wouldn't have bothered you, but my magic carpet is at the cleaners. <laughs> oh. Oh. Hmm. Oh. Hmm. I told you, boss, that man's cuckoo. He is not. Rochester, what's the idea of driving on this little side street? We always take Sunset Boulevard to the studio. Well, the policeman told me that on Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays, we got to keep this car off the main drag. <laughs> oh, Rochester, you'll say anything to run down my Maxwell. I wouldn't mind it so much, boss, if you'd just fix the springs in this cushion. Never mind. Every time I ride in this thing, I get the Martin Zorro. <laughs> Too bad about you. Oh, Mr. Billingsley, are you sure you wouldn't like to come to the broadcast with me? No, thanks. Just drop me off at the bowling alley. I'm going to have this ball taken off my thumb. <laughs> well, I, uh, I don't blame you. It must be a nuisance. I'll never eat taffy again while I'm bowling. <laughs> Oh, I was wondering how it happened. Rochester, will you please drive a little faster? I've got a program to do. I hope, to, I hope it's as good as last week. That Mr. Marshall is sure great. Oh, I thought Herbert Marshall was all right. Everybody's raving about him, boss. You couldn't have got a better man to take your place. I didn't want a better man. I made a mistake, that's all. <laughs> I ought to have my head examined. He's the talk of the town from Central Avenue to the sea. Oh, don't get so poetic. Just drive me to the studio and forget about Herbert Marshall. I sure laughed when he looked at Mr. Harris and said, Weird fellow, isn't he? <laughs> What's funny about that? And another thing, Rochester, you don't have to enjoy him quite so much. Who pays you, Mr. Marshall or me? Lately, it's been Santa Anita. <laughs> Well, unless you expect your luck to continue right through Bay Meadows, you better curb your enthusiasm. Now, get me to the studio. Can we give you a lift, babe? Mr. Billingsley, please! Now, that girl is a total stranger. Drive on, Rochester. Hmm. 
He was kind of cute, though. J-E-L-L. Oh! The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Emporia, Kansas, Stomp. <laughs> During the past 40 years, I suppose that literally millions of housewives have said to their grocers, Jell-O, please. But this oft-repeated phrase has recently been revised. Nowadays, housewives all over the country are saying Jell-O and Jell-O puddings, too. For today, friends, there's a new member to the famous Jell-O family, Jell-O puddings. Three grand creamy puddings that bear the same name as Jell-O, that have the same high Jell-O quality, and that sell for the same low Jell-O price. Jell-O puddings are rich, mellow puddings, as smooth as cream and full of luscious flavor. And like Jell-O, they take only a few pennies to buy, a few minutes to make. Be real sure the next time you order Jell-O, ladies and gentlemen, you order Jell-O puddings, too. In all three flavors, dark, rich chocolate, smooth, delicate vanilla, and golden butterscotch. Remember, Jell-O puddings are made by the makers of Jell-O, so you know they're good. Kansas Stop played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, after a week's absence from the Jell-O program, let us welcome back our good old master of ceremonies, Mr. Jack Marshall. What? For Benny, Jack Benny. Hmm. Uh, Jello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, you were a little mixed up on that introduction, weren't you? Well, yes, I was, Jack, and I'm sorry. It was just a slip of the tongue. Well, don't worry about it, Don. It could easily happen. After all, you've been with me only eight years, and I've been away for one whole week, (laughs) so it's only natural that you'd forget my name. Well, Jack, the only excuse I can offer is that since Herbert Marshall was on the show last week and did such a grand job, I subconsciously connected you with him. I see. Well, don't give it another thought, Don. It's a very common mistake. In fact, if I should happen to walk in on our program some Sunday night and call you Harry Von Zell, <laughs> it'll be Von Zell, believe me. <laughs> if I'm not too subtle. Now, wait a minute, Jack. There's no reason for you to feel jealous of Bart Marshall. He may have done a very good job, but there's no one who can ever take your place in our hearts. Don, if there's one thing I can't stand, it's a big, fat hypocrite. (laughs) A lot you and the rest of the gang care about me. The way you all drooled over Marshall last Sunday was revolting. Hello, Jack. How was your trip to New York? Well, if it isn't, kiss me, my darling. (laughs) What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. I heard you last week when you kept asking Marshall for a kiss. Now, you didn't even know the man. I do now, Bob. <laughs> That's not the point. You didn't have to act like a schoolgirl. Well, I couldn't help it. Gee, he's wonderful. Oh, everyone's wonderful to you but me. <laughs> By the way, Mary, uh, Bart took you to Ciro's uh, for dinner after the show last Sunday, didn't he? Yes, Don, and don't talk about it. I was so embarrassed in front of Mr. Marshall, I nearly died. Embarrassed? Well, what for, Mary? Well, the head waiter had seen me there with Jack so many times, he gave us each our own check. <laughs> Now, listen, Mary, the only time you ever pay your own check is when you order a la carte. (laughs) The regular dinner is always on me, and you know it. Gee, Mr. Marshall is such a gentleman. After we left Ciro's, he took me straight to my house, shook hands, and said goodnight. Well, why shouldn't he? He didn't try to put his foot in the door like you used to do. (laughs) Oh, for crying out loud. No kidding, Mary. Was Jack that kind of a guy? Now, wait a minute. As long as Mary's telling stories about me, let's get it straight. Look, Don, years ago, when Mary first came to work for me in New York, it was raining one night, so I said to her, you live way over in Plainfield. Can I take you home? Can I take you home girly? All right, girly. (laughs) Everybody said it in those days. 
Anyway, Don. Yes? Anyway, I put on my yellow slicker. With hat to match. It was a set. All the fellas were wearing it. <laughs> anyway, Don, when we got to Plainfield, it was still raining. And the only reason I put my foot in the door was because I wanted to come in and have a cup of coffee. There. That's the whole story. It is not. When you put your foot in the door, Papa bit your ankle. Well, how did I know he was laying there? <laughs> and if you remember, Miss Livingston, that's the last time that... Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. What's steaming? Was everything solid in New York? What? Did you latch on? Were you in there jumping? Hmm. Weird fellow, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, Jack, stop, will you? That's exactly what Mr. Marshall said last week. Yeah, Herbie pulled that one. Well, for heaven's sake, does he own every word in the dictionary? What a fuss you're all making over that guy. Now, wait a minute, Jack. What are you so upset about? It was all your idea. Yes, you asked Mr. Marshall to be on the program. You asked him to take your place. I didn't ask him to get laughs. He's a legitimate actor, and he double-crossed me. <laughs> That'll never happen again. Well, I'll say one thing about Herbie. He's sure got a lot of class. I tell you, Jackson, that guy's suaver than me. Uh, he's distinguisher, too. Suaver. And Mr. Marshall thinks... Marshall, that... Marshall, that's all I've heard tonight. Well, I guess that's about all the loyalty I can expect from this gang. That's life for you. Guy leaves the program, and the minute his back is turned, boom, the dagger. Boom is for a gun. All right. <laughs> The dagger. <laughs> if that's the way it goes, I've never seen it to fail. If my father told me once, he told me a thousand times, son, stay out of show business. Don't leave the clothing store. <laughs> Says, I need you. You're the best dummy I've got in my window. He didn't say that. But no, I had to be a wise guy. I had to leave Waukegan. So long, Dad. I'm going to Kenosha. <laughs> Kenosha. They had Vaudeville there. And that was the beginning. I had to get into show business. Better play, Phil. Okay. I'll never forget that opening night. Gee, I was a big hit. There I stood on the stage with my violin, taking bow after bow. I thought they'd never stop. They seemed like all the girls... Kenosha, I went to Milwaukee. I wowed him there. Then came Elkhart, Indiana. Oh, pardon me. That was You Can Depend on Me, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Say, Jackson, did you hear the song I did last week? The one I wrote myself? You mean the one about ham hocks and butter beans? And... Yeah, I heard it, Phil, but I don't get it. What does it mean? It don't mean nothing. It's just gastronomical, that's all. <laughs> yeah, I heard you say that. Before I... Phil, um... Uh, what does gastronomical mean? Gastronomical, capital G... I don't want it spelled, Phil. I, I don't want it spelled. I, I want to know what it means. Well, it's easy enough to figure out. Let's break it down. Okay. Gastronomical. Break it down. Well, gas. 
Gas is what you buy in a filling station. Uh huh. And throw. Throw means like when you throw a ball. I see. That's gas troll. Now, what's nomical? Nomical is what an Englishman wears in his eye. <laughs> uh, that's a monocle, but I'll settle for nomical. So, according to your definition, Phil, gastronomical is an Englishman with a monocle in his eye standing in a gas station throwing a ball. <laughs> Now, what's that got to do with your song? Are you trying to befuddle me? <laughs> oh, Phil, I just want to show you that you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, hello, Dennis. Ladies and gentlemen, before Dennis says hello to Jack, let me tell you about Jell-O, America's favorite gelatin dessert. Don, the kid's waiting. It's not only gastronomical and easy to make, but comes in six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. So look for the big red letters on the box. Okay, now you can sit down. Thank you. Well, uh, that chair will never smile again. <laughs> they can sweep that up. Can I say hello now? Yes. Yeah, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. What's going on? Oh, nothing. Boy, did we have a program last week. <laughs> Is that so? Uh, who was responsible for that hilarious half hour? The big movie star, Hubert Marshall. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, I know, Dennis. I heard all about it. Are you worried, Bub? <laughs> hmm. uh, Dennis, uh, you don't know it, but it's not too late for you to become a policeman. <laughs> so watch it. Anyway, a lot of people, a lot of people missed me last Sunday. Uh, Fred Allen didn't. He said it was the best Jell-O show he ever heard. Oh, he did, eh? Yes, he said it was the first time our broadcast had any class to it. Well, Allen's a fine one to talk about class. Any man that can be on a gasoline program for six months and still have those spots on his vest. <laughs> well. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... I saw him on the street in uh, New York. He ran down the subway like a rat. What a coward. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight, the Benny Little Theater Bunch will present their version of Somerset Mom's great play and Warner Brothers' sensational picture, The Letter. Wait a minute, Jack. We did The Letter last week with Herbert Marshall. And we're doing it again tonight with me. <laughs> I'll show that guy how to play it. Mary, what are you doing there? I'm printing a sign. I'm going to pick at you. Put down that pencil. Whether you like it or not, right after Dennis' song, we're going to do this play. Not with me in it. Me neither. Jack, I think you're very silly to do it. Well, that tops everything. Fine pals. Honest to goodness, if I'd have saved my money, I'd quit radio right this minute. What? I said if I'd have saved my money, I'd quit radio. You've saved enough tinfoil alone to retire. <laughs> What a girl. I maybe have 75 pounds of tinfoil, and right away I can retire. Anyway, fellas, we're doing our version of the letter, and that's final. So, Dennis, go ahead with your song. Okay. Say, Mr. Benny, what's tinfoil selling for now? Uh, 16 cents a pound. <laughs> Sing, Dennis. <laughs> That ought to make me a million or two This little idea for a hit song Is inspired by my love for you You are far too wonderful For any single heart alone my darling, you should be set to music for all the world to hold. All lovely words you whisper to me should be written down. 
and played My darling, you should be set to music For your number one on my heart's hip You Should Be Set to Music from Crazy with the Heat, sung by Dennis Day. And Dennis, I hate to bring it up right now, but I was out in my backyard this morning, and I noticed that while I was in New York, you did not mow my lawn. I'm sorry, Mr. Benny, but I was pretty busy last week. Well, sorry isn't quite enough, Dennis. You see, a contract is a contract. And when you signed your name to that little piece of paper, you agreed to sing and mow for me. <laughs> So tomorrow morning, I better hear a familiar rattle in my backyard. Well, I'm going to be pretty busy all day tomorrow, too. Dennis, are you going to mow that lawn or do I have to take you to court? <laughs> now, it's up to you, kid. What's it going to be? Okay, but I'm going to run over the petunias. <laughs> You'll do nothing of the kind. And while we're on the subject, Dennis, next time I wish you'd mow the lawn straight. Don't spell out down with Benny. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction, the letter. Holy smoke, he's going through with it. Yes, Phil. Now, I'll play the part portrayed on the screen by H.M. <laughs> that of uh, Robert Crosby, the rubber planter. And, Mary, you're going to be uh, Leslie Crosby, my wife. I won't say kiss me, my darling. Yes, you will. It's here in the script. Now, Don... I won't put any feeling into you it. You will, too. I will not. According to my contract, all I have to do is tell jokes and manicure your nails every Friday. Is that so? My contract says I have to tell jokes and play music. Phil, your contract says that you tell jokes and play good music. The word good is in there. Don't you remember? We scratched that out. <laughs> oh, yes. Your lawyer said it was irrelevant, immaterial, and impossible. <laughs> Anyway, uh, getting back to our play, Phil, you're going to be the... Come in. Well, look who's here. Gee, it's Mr. Marshall. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hello. 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 Well. Well, Bart, what brings you here? Better have a good reason. <laughs> Jack, old boy, I simply have to drop in tonight and thank you for asking me to take over your program last Sunday. It was a delightful experience. I know, I know, and you seem to have gone over very big. Oh, I wouldn't say that exactly. Oh, yes, yes, you did. What a ham. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was nice of you to drop in, Bart. Uh, you know everybody here. Of course, of course. Hello, Don. Well, hello, Bart. Glad to see you again. And Phil, how are you? Hi, you, Herbie. Sandra Claxon. Give out of the news. Sandra Claxon? Extraordinary creature, isn't he? <laughs> oh, positively weird, I always say. <laughs> and Mary, Mary, dear, I didn't see you standing there. You look charming this evening. With these goose pimples? Now cut that out. <laughs> Well, Bart, if you'll excuse me, uh, we'll get on with our play. Uh, we're going to do the, the letter, you know. The letter? I, I did that last week. Uh, very good, too. Uh, you were excellent. Oh, Jack, I thought it was just fair. Fair nothing, Bart. You were terrific. Boy, is he conceited. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you don't mind, old boy, uh, we'll go ahead uh, with... Say, Bart, look what I've got on. 
Why, Mary, are you still wearing that orchid I gave you last Sunday? Yes, and I'm going to wear it till there's nothing left but the tinfoil. Then Jack takes over. <laughs> now, stop showing off. <laughs> Very good, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Don't encourage her, please. Gee, Bart, didn't we have fun at Ciro's the other night? Yes, indeed. Of course, I'll never get over the, the waiter handling us he's a check. <laughs> <laughs> hmm... Uh, Mary was telling me about that. Well, Bart, if you don't mind... Hey, Hubert, remember me? <laughs> Dennis, will you pipe down? Come on, fellas, let's get going with the play. Uh, so long, Bart. Goodbye, Jack, and thanks again. Say, Bart, as long as you're here, why don't you stay and watch Jack play your part? Why, yes, that might be fun. Yes, do stay. Don had to open his big, fat mouth. <laughs> Well, well, let's go, shall we? <clears throat> uh, sit down, Bart. Uh, Bar uh, Dennis, uh, get Mr. Marshall a chair. Oh, don't bother. I'll stand right here. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Now the uh, the o the the opening scene of the play. The opening scene is the courthouse in Singapore in the Malay Peninsula. Uh, I will play the part of Robert Crosby, the rubber plant. That's Robert Planter. Well, he makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Gee. I'm sorry, Jack. Oh, boy, I'll go over and sit down. Okay. Mary, let go of him. <laughs> now, as I said before, the opening scene is the courthouse in Singapore. As the curtain rises... <laughs> oh, darn it, who's that? Answer the phone, Mary. Okay. Hello? Who? Mr. Harrington? Mr. Harrington, that's my sponsor. Give me the phone, Mary. He wants to talk to Mr. Marshall. Oh. Oh, it's for... Oh, it's for you, Hubert. Or Herbert. <laughs> our, our sponsor would like to talk to you. Your sponsor? I wonder what he wants. So do I. Answer the phone. <laughs> Here. Thank you. Hmm. Hello? Yes, this is Herbert Marshall. Oh, oh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Harrington. That was awfully sweet of you. Yes, I thought it went over fairly well. Sure, for one show. Let him try, it. <laughs> and try doing it week after week. What's that, Mr. Harrington? Hmm. Oh, no, no, no. No, I couldn't have been that good. <laughs> week after week, that's the test. <laughs> What? What's that? Oh. Oh, your wife liked it, too. What does she know? <laughs> well, please tell Mrs. Harrington how much I appreciate that. She never did like me. That's what I'm up against. Well, thanks again, Mr. Harrington, and I'm so glad you called. Goodbye. Well, it was nice of my sponsor to call you, Bart. Yes, and he seems to be such a lovely fellow. Oh, he is. He is. You know, Jack... I'd like to have you introduce me to him sometime. I just hope you live that long. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, for our play, The Litter. I mean, The Letter. <laughs> the Letter. Let's do The Litter. Our part. Mary, we're going to do The Letter. Hey, Jack, look at your watch. We haven't got time to do a play. Well, it's not my fault. I started doing it ten minutes ago. Anyway, we're going through with it. Get your parts, everybody. Now, don't be silly, Jack. They'll take you off the air. They wouldn't dare. Let's go. The opening scene, ladies and gentlemen, is the courthouse in Singapore. Leslie Crosby, wife of Robert Crosby, a rubber planter, is on trial for her life. And as the curtain rises, she's being escorted through the crowded courtroom by her attorney, Howard Crosby. <laughs> Closing the next time you give a party, friends, your invitations would be as follows. You are cordially invited to attend a party at our house. Jello will be served. Well, one thing sure, every single guest will be on hand when the happy day arrives. Because Jello, ladies and gentlemen, holds an invitation no one can resist. And folks just naturally seem to know that when there's Jello for dessert, the party is bound to be a lot of fun and a big success. Jell-O's brilliant glowing colors add a charming touch to the table. Make Jell-O the ideal dessert for all festive occasions, and the rich, intriguing flavor of Jell-O is just as delightful as the juicy ripe fruit itself. 
Better yet, parties that feature Jell-O are easier to give because Jell-O takes only a few minutes to make and a few pennies to buy. So keep plenty of Jell-O on hand for the parties ahead and for regular family desserts. Order all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors. And be sure you include strawberry and raspberry Jell-O. Each has a new improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And they're both better than ever. Enjoy Jell-O's distinctive goodness real soon and enjoy it often. This is the last number of the 19th program in the current Jell-O series and we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Mr. Alton Cook and the radio editors of the United States and Canada for the honors accorded us in the recent World Telegram poll. I also want to thank my listeners and my authors, Bill Morrow and Ed Boulogne. And, oh, yes, I want to thank Mr. Herbert Marshall for stealing my show last week. <laughs> Good night, folks. I'm not really mad. Be mad. Be mad. Be mad. J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with San Diego Serenade. <laughs> One of the most significant things about Jell-O, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that not only do many, many people serve Jell-O, but they serve it often. And the reason they serve it so frequently is because Jell-O does suggest itself for so many different occasions. For example, Jell-O is the first dessert you think of when you're pressed for time and want a quick yet delightful treat. Jell-O is the dessert you think of when there's a party to be planned because it's so colorful and swell tasty. And you turn to Jell-O when you want a luscious treat that's pleasantly inexpensive. Jell-O, with its rich, glowing colors and its unsurpassed flavor, is the ideal answer to every dessert situation. So order a supply from your grocer tomorrow, choosing any or all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, or lime. And by the way, strawberry, raspberry, and cherry Jell-O now have a new, improved flavor, obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And the result is a distinctive goodness that you definitely do not want to miss. Try a glistening mold of rich, tempting Jell-O tomorrow. Serenade played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, last Friday the 14th, which was Valentine's Day, was also the birthday of our master of ceremonies, Jack Benny, who was exactly... Yes, sir. ...years of age. <laughs> so tonight, we would like to reenact the events which occurred at Jack's house Friday evening. It was about 7 p.m., and a little group consisting of Jack, Mr. Billingsley, the boarder, and Mary, who had been dropped by to go to a movie, were seated around the dinner table. Let us eavesdrop, shall we? Oh, boy, there's nothing like eating at home, I always say. Uh, Mary, pass some of those extra fancy solid packs to tomatoes. <laughs> Will you? Oh, stop building them up. Well, they're delicious. Take some more. I'm tired of tomatoes. Where's the meat? It's coming. Rochester, I'm taking Miss Livingston to a movie. So will you please hurry with that extra choice, eastern cut, prime ribs of beef. <laughs> you mean that biggy little pot roast? <laughs> Never mind, bring it in. It's a pretty tough meat. It's a pretty tough piece of meat, boss. I don't know if it's done yet. Well, stick a fork in it. I did, and I can't get it out. <laughs> well, bring it in anyway. Okay. Say, Mary, aren't these nice dishes? Lovely pattern, isn't it? Yeah. Is this a set you want at the Beverly Theater? <laughs> All but the soup, Tureen. I got that at the Oriental. <laughs> Gee, these tomatoes are good. They're not seasoned enough. Uh, pass me that salt shaker you want at Ocean Park. Here you are. And that wise guy said I couldn't break those balloons. <laughs> how, uh, how are you enjoying your dinner, Mr. Billingsley? Just fine, thank you. Good, good. This watercress is delicious. Uh, those are ferns, Mr. Billingsley. Your... <laughs> your, uh... You're eating the centerpiece there. <laughs> 
Hmm. Uh, say, Jack. What? Why is Mr. Billingsley wearing that fife and drum around his neck? That fife and drum? Yeah. Well, that's my fault. I told him we were having Yankee pot roast tonight. <laughs> Oh, by the way, Mr. Billingsley, Miss Livingston and I are going to see a movie after dinner. Would you care to join us? No, thank you. I'm going to stay home tonight and get stiff. <laughs> get stiff? I thought you didn't drink anymore. I don't. I'm going to sit in the icebox. <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, I see. Here you are, folks. Make way for the pot roast. Mmm, that smells good. Did you get the fork out of it, Rochester? Only the handle. <laughs> You mean the prongs are still in the meat? Don't worry, boss. I put a band-aid there so you won't bite into them. That's very thoughtful of you. What do you want, Mary? A rare piece or an outside cut? Uh, give me the band-aid. That looks tender. You watch out or you won't get any. Rochester, hand me the pot roast. Here you are. You'd think that... Whoa! 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 <laughs> whoa, my fingers! The plate's kind of hot, boss. Well, it's a fine time to tell me. Never saw such a careless... Now, where the heck is the pot rose? There it is, up on the chandelier. <laughs> on the chandelier? Well, I'll be darned. It's dripping on my drum. <laughs> well, move over a little. Rochester, you're so clumsy. Now, go out in the kitchen and fix up a few cold cuts. We've got to eat something. Let's take some oranges and knock down the pot rose. <laughs> you can get a ladder and take it down later. Now, bring in the cold cuts. How would you like some genuine, boneless, skinless, imported Norwegian sardines? Packed in virgin <laughs> olive oil. Bring them in, Rochester. <laughs> now, Mary, while we're waiting, have some more stewed tomatoes. A fine meal. Well, they're very good for you. They'll make you strong. I'm strong enough now to walk to a restaurant. Well, if you don't like the tomatoes, don't eat them. Will you pass the bread, please? <laughs> uh, here, uh, here you are, Mr. Billingsley. Would you, uh, would you like some butter, too? I've never been there, but I hear it's lovely. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. What? Gee, that doesn't make any sense at all. Say, Mary, I've got an idea. Why don't we go to the movie and then eat later? Oh, Jack, I don't want to see Love Thy Neighbor again. <laughs> Getting so now, I can't even laugh at your love scene with Mary Martin. You're not supposed to laugh at that. Hey, Rochester, we're going to a movie, so never mind those sardines. I already opened them. Oh. Well, you can, you can eat them. I made some fried chicken for myself. <laughs> What? Rochester, this is only Friday, and I told you we're not having that chicken until Sunday. I'm having some people over at the house. The way it's been raining lately, the house might not be here Sunday. <laughs> oh, don't be so panicky. It is raining kind of hard, but it's nothing to worry about. Then why did you build an ark? <laughs> I've got to have a hobby, don't I? Anyway, to hear you two talk, I think it was a regular flood or something. Well, all I know is the milkman arrived on a surfboard this morning. <laughs> That's Mr. Kahanamoku. He's a Hawaiian. <laughs> and another thing, I won't stand for anybody running down the California weather. Quiet or I'll stick my fork in your water wings. <laughs> you wouldn't dare. <laughs> Sister. <laughs> now, come on, Mary. We're going to the movies. Hey, boss, boss. What is it, Rochester? There's a big crowd of people coming up the front steps. A crowd of people? Open up. Open up. Open up. Open up. Open up. Open up. What's going on here? You'll find out. Come on in, fellas. Surprise. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Well, I'll be doggone a surprise birthday party. Don, Dennis, and Phil. Come on, kids. One, two, four. He's the jolly good fellow. For he's the jolly good fellow. He's a which nobody can deny. <laughs> Gee whiz, fellas, I can't get over. Come on in and take your things off. Come on, everybody, wipe your feet. Come on, come on.
it, fellas. I can't get over you guys surprising me like this. No kidding. You didn't think we'd forget your birthday, did you, Jackson? No, but gosh, all this fun. Well, believe me, Jack, you've been so darn nice to the whole gang, you're entitled to it. Yeah, entitled. <laughs> Gee, I... I, I don't know what to say. I'm all choked up. This is really the last thing in the world I expected. You know, I was just sitting here getting ready to go to a movie, not even thinking about little me having a birthday party, and then you all barged in. Gee. Look, fellas, I'll just run down and see my picture and be back in 84 minutes. Come back here. Oh, yes, I'm so excited, Mary. I don't know what I'm talking about. Then. Say, Mr. Penny, what's that up there on the chandelier? A pot rose, Dennis. It's a long story. <laughs> But don't worry about it, kid. A pot roast on the chandelier, and he tells me not to worry. <laughs> Forget it, will you? I'll have Rochester take it down in a few minutes and make sandwiches. I just sent him to the store to buy some food. Oh. Did you give him any money? Uh-huh. I took $3 out of the sugar bowl. Mary, the sugar bowl is for laundry. <laughs> You want to buy groceries, you take the money out of the cookie jar. I tried to, and a cobra stuck his head out. <laughs> That's my East Indian burglar alarm. Say, Don, what's that you're hiding behind your back? Well, Jack, uh, Mary, Dennis, Phil, and myself all chipped in and bought you a birthday present. And believe me, Jack, it comes right from the heart. A present? Doggone you guys. You'll have me bawling in a minute. If you give it to me, I'll unwrap it. Hold it, Jackson. A speech goes with this, and I'm going to make it. Well, Mr. Benny... Ladies and gentlemen, and members of the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce? I copied this out of a book. Forget that part. <laughs> okay, go ahead. It is with great pride, or make it pride, yeah, it is make with it great pride, pride yeah. and pleasure that I and my fellow colleagues... Colleague, go ahead. Yes, present you with this beautiful gift as a token of our loyalty, devotion, and gastronomical appreciation. <laughs> Here you are, Jackson. Here it is. Oh, Go right. oh, right. 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 Gee whiz, fellas, I know it's my birthday, but you, gosh, you, you shouldn't have gone to all this. I, well, for heaven's sake, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> you like it, Jack? Oh, boy, just what I needed. A bicycle pump. <laughs> With a hose and all. Uh, which one of you heels suggested this? Well, we didn't know what to buy you, Jackson. You've got everything. Everything but a bicycle pump. Now I've got that. Oh, well. Thanks anyway, fellas. I'll wear it in good health. Rochester, there's someone at the door. I told you he went out for the groceries. Oh, yes. I'll answer. Probably another telegram. I've been getting them all day long. Hello, oh, boss, it's me. Rochester, you've got a key. Why make me open the door? I just want to give you an idea what I go through. <laughs> it's too bad about you. What'd you bring from the market? Well, I got some limes and lemons and grape juice for the punch. For the punch? Well, what are we going to have to eat? Boss, with the punch I make, people have been known to go for days without eating. <laughs> well, we still have to have food. And if you can't find anything in the kitchen, run next door to Mr. Ronald Coleman's. This is the day his cook makes popovers. Okay. Say, fellas, we'll have something to eat in a little while. In the meantime, let's play games or something. I'll call up some chorus girls and we'll play post office. <laughs> That's all we need, chorus girls and no food. <laughs> Say, I'll tell you what, fellas. How about playing blind man's buff? Oh, oh that's yeah, right. All right, now look at, look at, look at. I'll be the blind man. Who's got a handkerchief? Just take off your glasses and we're all set. <laughs> Oh, stop, will you? Have you got a handkerchief, Don? Well, I know a better game, Jack. Let's play Jell-O. Oh, fine. How do you play it? Well, uh, I'll take a lot of boxes of Jell-O and hide them all over the house. Uh-huh. And the first one that finds all six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime... Yeah? ...wins a $10 prize. Say, that's a swell game. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute, Don. Who puts up the 10 bucks? Well, uh, Jack, uh... It's your house. There'll be no gambling on the premise. <laughs> Blind man's buff, everybody. Come on, come on. Blind hold me, somebody. Take it easy, Jackson. The last time we played this game, it took us two hours to get your head out of the goldfish bowl. Oh, that's right. I know a swell game, Mr. Benny. It's called Clap Hands. What's that? Well, you folks sit down. I'll sing a song, and when it's all over, you all clap hands. 
A fine gas. A little dull, isn't it, Dennis? It's better than getting your head caught in a goldfish bowl. Well, maybe you're right. Sit down, everybody. Dennis is going to sing for us. I want to play that game where I can win $10. Well, go on a quiz program and don't bother us. Go ahead, Dennis. Sing something. <laughs> Rochester, there's someone at the door. Maybe it's me again. Answer that door. <laughs> sing, Dennis. He's the laziest person I ever met. <laughs> Again, Kathleen, across the ocean wild and wide, to where your heart has ever been, since first you were my bunny and green I'll take you to your home Well game, Dennis. Let's do it again Sunday on the program. Uh, who was at the door, Rochester? It was a special delivery, boss. I gave it to Miss Livingston. Oh. Did you give the boy a tip? How could I? You keep the tip money in the glue pot. <laughs> well, I would have reimbursed you later. What's the letter, Mary? It's a comic valentine from New York. New York, eh? Well, I have a pretty good idea who it's from. Uh, what kind of a valentine did arsenic and old lace send me? <laughs> Read it. Uh, to a comedian. <laughs> Uh -huh. Your eyes are blue, your hair is gray, and you're as dumb as Dennis Day. That's very funny. Yeah, very. <laughs> Wait till Alan gets the valentine I sent him. Somebody at the door, Rochester. How do you know I'm back for Mr. Coleman? I see you standing there. <laughs> now stop eating those popovers and answer the door. Okay. Doors, doors. I'd like to get a job working in a barrel. That's just silly. What could he do in a barrel? Always grumbling. Hey, boss, look who's here. Well, I'll be... Hey, fellas, look. Hiya, boss. Andy. <laughs> well, Andy Devine, we haven't seen you in six months. How did you happen to drop in? Well, Buck, I heard it was your birthday, so I thought I'd come over and surprise you. <laughs> you certainly did. Uh, how old are you, Buck? Well, Andy, I'll... I'll never see 36 again. <laughs> Even on a clear day. <laughs> That's very cute, Andy. And where's my present? Your present? Yes. I got two of them, Buck. Ma sent you a jug of sweet cider. Uh-huh. And Pa sent you a jug of hard cider. Well, look at that. Two jugs. Which is which, Andy? There goes Pa! <laughs> Hey, look out. It's, it's, it's spilling all over the floor. Quick, get me a sponge and a pillow. Get away from there, Harris. What's the matter with you? Say, Andy, uh, you're putting on a little weight, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, ain't we? <laughs> wow, that's... That's tell them, Andy. You're pretty sharp tonight. Sit down at the table, everybody. The food's ready. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh, take it easy. Oh, take it easy. The plates are all fixed. Gee, two and a half sardines apiece. And lots of popovers. Dig in, kids. 
There's someone at the door, Rochester. I'm busy, boss. Answer that door! <laughs> yes, and be quick about it. Well, Andy, I'm sure glad you dropped in. I had no idea that you'd remember my birthday. As a matter of fact, I didn't oh, know... Oh, good that. evening. Come right in, Mr. Marshall. Yay! Holy smoke, it's Herbie! Hello, everybody. Happy birthday, Jack. Well, thanks! <laughs> My good... Gee whiz, Herbert Marshall at my house. Quick, Mary, phone Luella Parsons. <laughs> She'll never believe us. Phone her anyway. Well, Bart, you're the last person in the world I expected to see on my birthday. You know, Mary and I were just... Oh, I'm sorry, this is Andy Devine. How do you do, Mr. Devine? I'm glad to know you, Mr. Marshall. You want to buy a horse? Andy, not now. Oh. Gee, as I started to say, Bart... Uh, Mary and I were just sitting here not even thinking of having company on my birthday. Stop looking at the package in his hand. <laughs> I'm not looking at it. Oh, yes, yes, the, um, the package. Here you are, Jack. A little remembrance. Many happy returns, old boy. A present for me? Well, gee, I feel like a darn fool. I, I didn't get a thing for you. You know? <laughs> It's, um, this is your birthday, not Christmas. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what am I thinking of? Hey, Dennis, get Mr. Marshall a chair. Gee, I'm all thumbs opening this package. Here's a chair for you, Hubert. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. Yeah, I, I can't seem to get this... the this, this string untied. Stop shaking. Well, I'm so anxious. My name is Billingsley, Mr. Marshall. <laughs> Well, I... <laughs> I'm glad to know you, Mr. Billingsley. Mr. Billingsley, sit down, please. <laughs> Darn this string. See, I'm trying to open this present. There, I got it. Well, thanks, Bart. Thanks a million. Hey, fellas, look. Look what he gave me. Look at these beautiful cufflinks. I mean, cufflinks. <laughs> Fourteen carat. Cheapers, he looked already. Well, they're beautiful. By the way, Bart, what's in that other box? That's a gardenia. I, I brought it for Mary. Well. Mm, he's just like all the other fellas. He starts out with orchids, and now I'm now down to a gardenia. Quiet. <laughs> Very good, Mary. <laughs> then better if she hadn't muffed it, Bart. <laughs> I can't get over these cufflinks. Thanks again, Bart. Thanks. I'm so glad you like my gift, Jack. You know, Jack, it's hard at the time to mention it, but I rather had the impression that you didn't like me. I didn't like you? Why, Bart, what do you mean? Well, I felt that you resented my taking over your program while you were in New York. I? <laughs> I resented me? Listen, fellas, did I ever say one word against this gentleman? Did I? You see, Bart, you're wrong. I regard you as one of my best friends. Ah, oh, you're full of kaplink. <laughs> Mary, smell your gardenia. Well, Bart, Bart, won't you join us at the table? Yeah, sit down, Herbie, and have some chow. Thanks, I believe I will. Now, here's a plate, Bart, all fixed. Well, two and a half sardines and a biscuit. Well, it's not much. I really must apologize. Not at all. This is fun. It's like being shipwrecked. <laughs> Well, that's, that's what we're having, a shipwreck party, you know? Yes, sir. Won't you have some of this punch, Bart? It's very good. Yes, have a cup, Bart. My, what a beautiful punch bowl. Yes, yes, it is. Ronnie Coleman's, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, it is, it is. We're very dear friends, you know. Oh, Rochester, bring him Marshall, Mr. Marshall some tea. Tea, 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 tea. <laughs> You'd like some tea, wouldn't you, Bart? Yes, thank you. Uh, how would you like it, Bart, with lemon or with irradiated, homogenized, vitamin D, evaporated milk? You can have either one. Uh, well, Jack, I think I'll just have some extra juicy, sun-ripened lemon. Oh, okay. Some tea with lemon, Rochester. Very good, sir. Hmm. Well, Andy... Andy, you never thought you were going to meet Herbert Marshall at my house, did you? Uh, gosh, no. I feel like a darn fool with no shoes on. <laughs> well, keep them under the table. Nobody will notice it. Uh, do, you, do you like the sardines, Bart? They're delicious. Oh, my goodness. Sardines and you haven't got a finger bowl. 
Oh, Rochester! Yes, boss! Bring in the finger bowls! We never had any! <laughs> well, then bring in saucer! Bring them in. You'll, you'll have one in a minute, Bart. By the way, Jack, what's that hanging up there on the chandelier? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a pot rose. A pot roast on the chandelier. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Weird custom, isn't it? <laughs> oh, 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 it's not a custom, it's an accident. You see, Bart, I know it sounds fantastic, but the pot roast bounced up there, you know? Bounced? Yeah, yeah, you see, here's exactly what happened. I was just having a quiet little dinner at home, not expecting anybody to drop in, and my man Rochester brought in this hot plate, see? Well, I didn't know it was hot, and I grabbed for it. You see, the pot roast was on the plate, see? And the minute my fingers touched it, I threw it up in the air. Well, that's how it happened. It sounds silly, but that's the whole story. When you send in 10 cents for the new desserts recipe book, what does it buy you? Well, just listen to this. And remember, for just one single solitary dime, too, you get 365 different suggestions and recipes for all kinds of grand, tempting desserts. That's a new dessert for every day, right straight through the whole year. There are ideas for simple family desserts, special party treats, desserts for holidays, desserts for all occasions, big and small. And they've arranged this big 48-page book in such a clever, original way that you can turn right to the dessert idea you want in five seconds or less. The moment you lay eyes on it, you'll say it's the smartest way to design a recipe book that anybody ever thought of. And you'll also say it's the most beautiful book of its kind ever printed. Pictures? Say, you never saw so many lovely paintings and color photographs in your life. But get the book and see for yourself. Place a dime in coin or stamps in an envelope and send your name and address and mail it to Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. That's right, just 10 cents, and the address is Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. Do it tonight. This is the last number of the 20th program in the Current Yellow series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time, broadcasting from Palm Springs, California. Palm, Palm Springs? Springs? Yes, sir. We're all going to have a little vacation. Say, Bart, would you like to come to Palm Springs with us? I don't think I'll be able to, Jack. I'm making a picture, you know. Oh. Well, if you can possibly make it, look us up. We'll be staying at the Cactus Blossom Auto Corps. <laughs> uh, good night, folks. <laughs> S-A-N-K-A, Sanka. That's the name to write in your memory book, ladies and gentlemen. S-A-N-K-A, Sanka. That's the name to say to your grocer, because Sanka is real coffee. It has a rich, delectable flavor. And it protects sleep, because it never prevents sleep. It's had the sleep-disturbing caffeine removed, so anybody can drink delicious Sanka coffee and sleep. Sanka Coffee presents We the People over another network every Tuesday night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Jell-O Program, coming to you from the Plaza Theater in Palm Springs, California, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with When the Midnight Choo-Choo Leaves for Beaumont and Banning. <laughs>
You know, ladies and gentlemen, every time you enjoy Jell-O, it's just as though you were enjoying it again for the very first time. That's the same sense of pleasant surprise you felt when you first made the acquaintance of this swell dessert. For Jell-O is a treat you always welcome. No matter how often you serve Jell-O, no matter how many times it graces your table, Jell-O's bright, glowing colors are always enticing. And Jell-O's tempting flavor keeps right on delighting everybody with its refreshing goodness. In fact, Jell-O today actually tastes better than ever before. Because Jell-O's six delicious flavors have constantly been made more delicious. For example, take strawberry, raspberry, and cherry Jell-O. Each has a new, improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And the result is something mighty distinctive. So enjoy Jell-O soon. Get several packages tomorrow and serve the family a grand treat with America's favorite gelatin dessert, rich, shimmering Jell-O. And the Midnight Choo Choo leaves for Beaumont and Banning, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you our master of ceremonies, toughened by the desert wind, tanned by the desert sun, and frightened by the desert prices, Jack Benny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jello again. This is Jack Benny, the sage of the sagebrush talking. And Don, I'm not the least bit frightened by the prices here in Palm Springs. After all, this is a resort. And when you're on a vacation, you expect to let yourself go and have a good time. But Jack, don't you think the hotels here are rather expensive? Not a bit, Don, considering what you get. Why, you take the El Mirador, the Desert Inn, the Colonial House, and places like that. They're the last word in swank and luxury. It's worth it. Oh, I agree with you there, Jack. By the way, you're stopping at the El Mirador, aren't you? Uh, no. Uh, no, Don, I have a lovely room at the T.P. Motel. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's a little bit out of town where it's not quite so crowded. I like it very much. The T.P. Motel, is that run by an Indian? No, it's run by a fellow named T.P. Ginsburg. <laughs> Uh, uh, Don, uh, Motel is his uncle. Oh. <laughs> however, uh, <laughs> however, uh, come to uh, uh, come to think of it, Don, the uh, Bell Boys, the Bell Boys are Indian, uh, full blooded too. Well, that's a novelty. Novelty is right. I left a call for seven o'clock this morning, and one of them came in and hit me on the head with a tomahawk. <laughs> Darn near scalp me. By the way, Jack, I don't remember passing the T.P. Motel. Where is it located? Well, you know the road that leads to the... Uh, pardon me, Don. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? On behalf of the Palm Springs Chamber of Commerce, I want to welcome you to this desert paradise. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. By the way, I don't want to get personal, but how did you happen to lose your hair? I left a call for 7 o'clock. <laughs> That guy sure gets around, doesn't he? Huh? Uh, what was that you were saying, Don? Well, I asked you about that motel you're stopping at. Where's it located? Oh, the teepee. Well, uh, uh, Don, here's how you get there. You know the street right out front here, the one that leads to Cathedral City? Oh, it's this side of Cathedral City. No, uh, no, Don. You go through Cathedral City. Oh. See? And, then, and then you know how the road curves out and goes on to Indio. Indio? Why, you're not living way over in Indio, are you? Uh, no, uh, Don, you go through <laughs> Indio. <laughs> you, uh, <clears throat> look, uh, the way I can explain it, you stay on Highway 66, and the only delay is when they stop you at the Arizona border. 
<laughs> uh, you know, for plant inspection and things like oh, that. Oh, my goodness, Jack. You mean to tell me that while we're all in Palm Springs, you're living in Arizona? Sand is sand. I'm still on the desert. <laughs> Anyway, Don, I told you uh, every place here in Palm Springs is filled up. Uh, this is the height of the season. Well, look who's here. Hello, everybody. Well. Hello, Mary. Hi, you, Don. Hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. What are you doing in town? I drive in nearly every day. What am I doing in town? Why don't you stay in Beverly Hills? That's closer to Palm Springs than where you're living now. I couldn't stay in Beverly Hills because I sublet my house. Oh, fine. He's here for five days and he sublets his house. I might be here 14 days. Who knows? You even look for a tenant when you go out to lunch. <laughs> now you're reaching. <laughs> Well, down the minute Mary comes in, down goes McBenny. Yes, sir. By the way, Mary, I saw you on the street yesterday. You look very cute in your sun shorts. Thanks, Don. You look cute in yours, too. What? Don Wilson walking around town in a pair of shorts? <laughs> Boy, did he hold up traffic. I can imagine. You got a lot of nerve, Don, walking around in sun shorts. Well, Jack, everybody does it here. I know, but with your figure, hey, that takes courage. What about you in that corny cowboy suit? Oh, I looked all right. And those high heel shoes you were wearing, wow. Well, now I've got you. For your information, young lady, all cowboys wear high heel shoes. With open toes, you're crazy. <laughs> Well, I had to cut them. They hurt my feet. What a cowboy. You should have seen him, Don, swagging around town with two guns in his belt. Three. One is a cigarette lighter. <laughs> anyway, Miss Livingston, as long as you're so cute, the next time we go horseback riding, you can very well pay for your half of the horse. Smarty. Why, Jack, do you mean to say that you and Mary were both riding on one horse? Not only that, Dennis Day was a horse. That was only for practice. We got a real nag later. Yeah, later. Oh, hello, Dennis. How are you? Gee, is my back swayed. <laughs> well, Dennis. Dennis, here you are in Palm Springs. How do you like it? Oh, it's swell here. But I was sure glad when it stopped raining. <laughs> Dennis, it never rains in Palm Springs. This is a desert. Well, it was sure misty the first part of the week. It wasn't even misty. You see, Dennis, uh, Palm Springs owes its hot, uh, dry climate to the mountains that surround it. Like a storm approaching from the Pacific Ocean is always stopped by these high peaks. Oh, yeah! <laughs> yeah. There's never, thing, there's never anything over Palm Springs but a great big bright sun. Well, they ought to put a cork in it. <laughs> oh, stop complaining. <laughs> you find fault every place. We're all having a wonderful time here. Say, Dennis, where are you staying? I'm living with Mr. Benny, far, far away. <laughs> Yes, uh, we couldn't get a place right here in town, so Dennis is with me at the T.P. Motel. It's nice there, isn't it, Dennis? I'll say. We saw the swellest movie in Phoenix last night. <laughs> well, we made it in no time. Gee whiz, Jack. Aren't you lonesome living so far away from everybody? No, we like to rough it. We've even got Indian bellboys. Gosh, am I lucky. I told him to wake me up at 7 o'clock this morning, and I didn't even feel it. Well, Dennis, you're the only guy I know of that sleeps with his hat on. <laughs> and now that you're here, how about singing a number for all of our Palm Springs guests? Okay. I've had a lot of requests to sing Perfidia again. All right. Let's have it. Now, what's that? Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. I'll take it. Hey, buddy, you got a little more hair than the other fellow that was in here. <laughs> Haven't you? Yeah, I left the call for 7.30. <laughs> I'm up at half past eight myself. Uh, who's the wire from? <laughs> uh, 
Well, who's the wire from, Mary? Gee, we're having fun tonight, aren't we? Huh? Who's the wire from, Mary? <laughs> it's from the Paramount Studio, the wardrobe department. The wardrobe department? Yeah, it says, uh, Dear Mr. Benning, new Hopalong Cassidy picture goes into production tomorrow morning. Please return cow suit immediately. A cowboy suit. Cow suit. That cowboy suit. Who ever heard of a cow suit? All right, sing then. It burns me up. They promised me I could have it for two weeks. For I have found you love of my life in some of the love of mine. Your eyes are echoing perfidia. Forget the love, our promise of love, you're sharing another time. With a sad lament, my dreams have faded like a broken melody. And the gods of love look down and laugh at what romantic fools we mortals see. And now I know my love was not for you. And so I take it back with a sigh. Have pity on me. With a sad lament, my dreams have faded like a broken melody. And the gods of love look down and laugh at what romantic fools we mortals be. And now I know my love was not for you. And so I'll take it back with a sigh. Perfidia means goodbye. sung by Dennis Day. And Dennis, you were in very good form. This uh, dry desert air is marvelous for your tonsils. I haven't got any tonsils. <laughs> oh, I... I didn't know that. And now, ladies and gentlemen... I had them taken out about three years ago. <laughs> oh. Oh, I... I see. And now, ladies and gentlemen... You're not mad, are you? <laughs> No, of course not. You can have your tonsils out if you want to. I had mine out, and by a wonderful doctor. Doctor nothing. Rochester took them out. <laughs> he did not. I finally wound up going to the doctor. You know that. Well, you were considering, Rochester. Oh, considering. I asked him if he knew how. That was all. <laughs> considering. Isn't it amazing, Don? All I said to Dennis was, this desert air is wonderful for your tonsils, and look at the routine we got in. You know? Speaking of the desert, ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you about Jell-O, America's favorite dessert. For even though you're on a desert, do not desert this appetizing dessert, as Jell-O is not only good in the city, but also a desert dessert. Don, what's going on here? So remember, ladies and gentlemen, whether you like desserts or deserts, Jell-O is the finest desert dessert, this deserted desert, I mean this deserted dessert... I mean this. I know we get mixed up. I know it. I know it. I know it. I know it. You couldn't, Don. You couldn't quit when you were winners, could you, Don? Well, gee, Jack, that was a mighty tough one, really a tongue twister. What's hard about it? 
If you think that's tough, listen to this. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. How's that? Fine. I'll pick up your teeth. <laughs> I didn't drop them. Larry, why is it every time I open my mouth, you try and top me? Now, you just behave yourself. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Phil. Howdy, folks. How about giving out with a root and toot and western reception, huh? <laughs> well, how's that for an ovation, Jackson? Gunshots and everything. What do you mean, ovation? They were shooting at that Marcel wave in your hair. <laughs> We don't go for male beautifying around these parts, stranger. No, sir. Hello, Phil. I haven't seen you around all week. Yes, we were looking for you. Where are you living? I'm stopping out here at a dud ranch. <laughs> Phil, you mean dude ranch. No, dud. There ain't a dame on the place. <laughs> oh. Well, that's too bad. Huh? Say, Jackson, uh, where are you living? Well, I couldn't get a place right here in town, Phil, so I'm staying at the T.P. Motel. The T.P. Motel? Where's that? It's just this side of Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> oh, stop, will you? Alabama. That's a big fib, isn't it, Dennis? It sure is. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, don't be funny or I'll take off my shoe and give you a call for 7 o'clock right now. <laughs> Say, Phil, you know, this vacation is doing you a world of good. You look much better here at the Springs than you do in Hollywood. Yeah, I do look healthier, don't I? No, you, you don't look healthy, Phil. Here's what I mean. You see, in Hollywood, you always look like you had a bad night. But here, you look like you had a bad night with the window open. <laughs> There, uh, there is a difference, believe me. Well, you see, Jackson, I've been getting a lot of rest here in Palm Springs. How do you like my tan? What tan? Tan little fingers and tan little toes. They tell them no, no. Well, there's a Greyhound bus leaves here in five minutes. Be on it. But I'm... <laughs> I'm serious, Phil. You've got the wrong slant on the kind of life to lead down here. What do you mean? Well, while you're out here on the desert, you ought to get some exercise. Now, take me, for instance. The minute I get hit on the head with that tomahawk, I jump out of bed raring to go. The first thing I do is put on my shorts and go for a long hike. No kidding. And then I put on my cowboy suit, jump on a horse, and away I go across the wide open spaces. Then I put on my bathing trunks. Over your cowboy suit? No, I take that off. <laughs> Then I put on my bathing trunks and swim all afternoon. Boy, I swim till it's time to go to bed. Then he puts on his nightshirt and walks in his sleep. <laughs> I do not. Well, you're going pretty fast there, Jackson. Don't you ever relax and take it easy? Sure. Lots of nights I sit around and play cards with Dennis. I'm teaching him gin rummy. Hey, kid? I thought we were playing bridge. No, 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 no. Uh, gin rummy, the dunes is closed, you know. <laughs> Anyway, there's nothing else to do at the TP. Well, then why are you living way out there, Jackson? What's the sense of it? Phil, I've explained the whole thing to Don. I tried to get a room here in town. Everything was filled up. Well, I can't understand that. The little woman and I got a beautiful bungalow at the La Paz Guest Ranch. It's expensive, but it's worth it. Well, you're... you're very lucky, Don. And I have a lovely apartment at the Lone Palm. It's not cheap, but look what you get. Well, you're lucky, too. But those are the breaks a fella gets, that's all. You kids were fortunate enough to get swell accommodations, and I have to live in a dinky little auto court. Why don't you loosen up, bub? <laughs> Dennis, it's not a question of money. I'd much rather be here in town. Well, Jackson, if you want to live in a high-class place, let me call up Charlie Farrell at the racket club. He's got tennis courts and everything. The, uh, racket club, eh? Yeah, it'll cost you dough, but it's worth every penny of it. Oh, well, well, let's have an orchestra number, Phil, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about it later, huh? Well, wait a minute, Jackson. I better give that club a buzz right now. I'm sure they'll have a room for you. Oh, then again, they may not, and I'll be disappointed. No. You, uh, you better play something, Phil. Oh, Jack, let him make the reservation. Never mind. You've got two guns. You can always kill yourself. <laughs> Come on. 
Mary, I said he can call up after the program. This is much more important. Now, let's have some music. Okay. I was wondering, Mr. Benny, how much do I owe you for gin rummy? Uh, $30,000. Play, Phil. I've had enough trouble with tenors. I'm going to keep this one. <laughs> There'll be some changes made played by Phil Harris and his orchestra who haven't got changed for a quarter. <laughs> you know, Phil, uh, you know, even your boys, though, they look much better out here on the desert. I don't know, in Hollywood, they always look so pale and haggard. You're yeah. right, Jackson. This climate is good for them. Sure is. Look at your guitar player there. Gee, his face is as red as a bee. Where'd he get that tan? He passed out in front of a fireplace. <laughs> I like that screen effect. He looks like a waffle there. Say, Jack, you know what I did? What? While Phil was playing his band number, I sat down and wrote a beautiful poem all about Palm Springs. Well, if you wrote it that quick, it can't be any good. Say, Don... Oh, it's awfully cute, Jack. Let me read it. I told you, Mary, we don't want to hear your poem. You let me read it, or I'll get you a room at the racket club. (laughs) All right, read it. What's the title of your little masterpiece? Did you ever see a palm springing? (laughs) Well, that's silly enough to begin with. Go ahead. Oh, take a trip to old Palm Springs in the desert, oh so sandy. But don't forget to bring your rubbers. You will find they come in handy. Mary, it's not raining here anymore. How I love your Talkwitz Falls and your Indians, whom I talk with. Talk with? Oh, my goodness. And I love your ice cream sodas. You take vanilla and I'll take chocolate. Well, that did it. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Hey, Jackson, I'll let the kid finish her poem. Yes, go ahead, Mary. Oh. About Palm Springs, I shall... Palm Springs? (laughs) About Palm Springs, I shout with glee. It certainly is the place to be. For Don and Phil and little me, but Jack always stays where it's next to free. I try to get a room in town. How many times do I have to tell you? Phil, call up the racket club, will you? Okay, Jackson, and I'll get you the best bungalow in the place. I'm sick of these insinuations around here. Hello, operator, get me the racket club. Hold it, hold it. I forgot to bring my tennis shoes. Oh. <laughs> That's too bad, Phil, but I did. Boy, that was a close one. <laughs> oh, quiet. Phil, I'll send for my tennis shoes, and then you can call up. Let me finish my poem, will you? Oh, yes. Go ahead. So I'll return to old Palm Springs when the cactus is in bloom. And the... There's the phone. I'll take it. Maybe it's the club. Yeah. Hello? 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 Hello, boss. This is Rochester. <laughs> Rochester... Where are you calling from? I'm over here at the TV Motel. 
How's the weather in California? <laughs> It's nice here. Incidentally, I thought I told you to come to Palm Springs and pick me up. I had an accident with the car, boss. One of these Indians around here shot an arrow right through the gas tank. Through the gas tank? Was he intoxicated? No, he thought the Maxwell was a buffalo. <laughs> well, that's just silly. My Maxwell, a buffalo. Well, they're both darn near extinct. <laughs> Never mind. Now, Rochester, you get right out and fix that gas tank. With all those arrows flying around, I ain't gonna bend over. <laughs> now, Rochester, I don't want any more stalling. So get over here because I'm tired and I want to get to bed. I can get you a room at the racket club. The MC in the washroom is a pal of mine. <laughs> Thanks just the same. But do as I tell you. Now, come on into town. Okay, but I can't leave for a little while, boss. I'm under the sun lamp. <laughs> under the sun lamp? Yeah, I want my friends to know I've been on the desert. All right, but hurry up. And incidentally, Rochester, I want you to pack up my cowboy suit and send it back to Hollywood. Paramount wants it. The 10 gallon hat, too? Yes. I'm soaking your socks in there. Well, take them out. And listen, Rochester, when you get to Palm Springs, you'll find me waiting in front of the theater. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. What? Have we got any use for a gross of peace pipes? <laughs> A gross of peace pipes? Yeah, I just won them in a crap game. <laughs> Rochester, I told you not to gamble with those Indians. Well, they got a lot of wampum. I don't care. I'm teaching them gin rummy. Now, goodbye. So long, boss. That kills me. He stays there gambling, and I'll be stuck here till all hours of the night. So I'll return to old Palm Springs when the cactus is in bloom. Oh, stop with that poem. Play, Phil. When the cactus is in bloom. Ah. You sure make Longfellow look like a nickel. Nowadays, the found of great food is not only grand for breakfast, but equally delicious when served at other meals as appetizer, salad, or dessert. For example, in thousands of homes these days... A big favorite is Jell-O Cherry and Grapefruit Mold, a shining ruby-red mold of clear cherry Jell-O nestling in a golden circle of tender, juicy grapefruit sections. As for making it, well, nothing could be simpler. Just prepare one package of cherry Jell-O as you usually do, turn into a mold and chill until firm. Then unmold and arrange grapefruit sections around the gracefully shaped mound of Jell-O, a swell treat the whole family will love. So tomorrow, brighten the dinner table with one of the finest, most successful desserts you ever served, Jello cherry and grapefruit mold. This is the last number of the 21st program in the current Jello series. And we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time, broadcasting once more from Palm Springs. Hey, Jackson, you want me to call up the racket club now? I'll talk to you about it later, Phil. Uh, good night, folks. <laughs> The Jell-O program coming to you from the Plaza Theater in Palm Springs, California, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with I'm Going to El Centro with a banjo on my knee. <laughs> you know, sometimes I think I could write a whole book about what a grand dessert Jell-O really is. For example, I could devote the entire first chapter of the book to telling you how gay and inviting Jell-O looks, with its vivid glowing colors and shimmering beauty. In chapter two, I'd point out how delightfully tender and delicate Jell-O is, and what a smooth melt-in-the-mouth texture it has. Chapter three would deal at great length with Jell-O's glorious flavor, a flavor as distinctive and well-known as its name, and just as refreshing as the juicy, ripe fruit itself. Then in chapter four, I'd explain how quick and easy Jell-O is to serve, and how it sells for only a few pennies per package. And oh yes, in chapter five, 
I'd remind everybody to be sure to try strawberry, raspberry, and cherry jello. Each has a new improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And as a result, they're better than ever. Try a tempting dessert made with rich, delicious jello tomorrow. Central with a banjo on my knees, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our second broadcast from Palm Springs, we're going to show you how Jack and all of us have been enjoying our vacation here on the desert. As you remember, last week, Jack was living quite a little distance from Palm Springs at a place called the TP Motel. But a few days ago, he rented a house here in town with a swimming pool. Yeah, with her. <laughs> Dennis, don't interrupt. Go ahead, Don. Anyway, last Thursday, Jack invited us all over to his pool for a swim. It was a beautiful sunny day, and Jack told us to get there early so we'd have a full day outdoors in the first. Rochester, the gang will be over pretty soon, so I think I'll take my swimming lesson before they get here. Okay. Now watch this, Rochester. I'm going to swim clear across the pool. Clear across? It's only six feet. <laughs> it's too bad. I'm sorry I haven't got the Atlantic Ocean here. Now, keep your eye on me and tell me when I do anything wrong. But, boss, I don't know anything about swimming. I gave you an instruction book last night. Why didn't you read it? I was working on that Navajo rug for your father. <laughs> You're supposed to weave in the daytime. <laughs> now, here I go across the pool, Rochester. Have you got the gun? Right here, boss. Well, start me off. Okay. On your mark. Get set. I'm off. Wow! Me. Well, I did it. I swam clear across the pool. How was that, Rochester? Fine. Now try it without your water wings. <laughs> Nothing doing. This is the deep end. Oh well, I've had enough swimming for a while. Ain't you going to take your diving lesson? Oh yes. Here, help me out. <laughs> there. Now, hold my water wings, and I'll dive in. I think I'll dive from the high board. That'll be a real thrill. Uh-huh. <laughs> of course, I'm not used to this. Maybe I ought to dive off the low board. That's fun, too. Uh-huh. <laughs> of course. Oh, why bother? I'll dive right here from the edge of the pool. There's one more way, boss. I can dunk you. <laughs> No, no, I'll dive in. Here I go. One, two, whee! There he goes. When he takes them water wings off, he sinks like a rock. Oh, hello, Miss Livingston. Hello, Rochester. Did the rest of the gang get here yet? No, ma'am. You're the first one. <laughs> sure is a beautiful day. Yes, it's lovely. Gee, look at those mountains all around us. Majestic, ain't they? <laughs> Can I get you a glass of lemonade, Miss Livingston? No, thank you. Where's Mr. Benny? He's down at the bottom of the pool. The bottom of the pool? Oh, yes, there he is, coming up. That's his toupee. Mr. Benny's over here. <laughs> Darn you, Rochester. I almost drowned. Why didn't you throw me the life preserver? I couldn't. I was sitting on it. Well, you could have got up. Now, pull me out. There. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Oh, boy, get a load of that bathing suit. What's the matter with it? The first one I ever saw with long pants. These aren't long pants. When my trunks get wet, they creep down. They'll be all right when they dry out. When they dry out, they'll break your legs. They will not. This material is very good. Say, so you've got your bathing suit on, Mary. Why don't you go, uh, go in for a swim? Oh, I'll wait till the others get here. 
Hey, Jack, what's that canoe doing in the swimming pool? That canoe? Oh, Rochester won it from an Indian. You know, he brought his dice with him. Would you like a string of beads, Miss Limson? <laughs> Rochester, I told you last week to stop gambling with the Indians. Boss, when a man pays me, I don't look up to see if there's a feather in his hair. <laughs> Well, I want you to cut it out. You got more Indian stuff now than Fred Harvey's. So take it easy. Hey, Jack, look. Here comes Mr. Billingsley, your boarder. Oh, yes. What's he doing here? Oh, he arrived a few hours ago. Claims he flew in from Hollywood on his magic carpet. Over these mountains? Oh, you're as bad as he is. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Billingsley. Good morning, Mr. Benny. Been in for a dip, I see. <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, yes, yeah, uh, uh, why don't you go in for a swim, Mr. Billingsley? I'd love to, but my tuxedo is at the cleaners. <laughs> oh, yes, he always swims formal. You know? <laughs> hmm. Say, Jack, uh, I think I'll stretch out and take a sun bath. Go ahead. Watch out for that sun, Mary, it's pretty hot. Here's a can of oil. I'm not gonna rub that stuff on me. Here, take this can. Nothing doing, it's still got a sardine in it. <laughs> A sardine? Shall I bring you a cracker, boss? Never mind. I think I'll take a sun bath, too. Rochester, rub some oil on my back. You mean out of this can? Yes. I did that yesterday, and the cat licked it off faster than I could put it on. <laughs> well, that cat isn't around here today. Rub me. Okay. Gee, Mary, just think. Here we are taking a sun bath, and right above us are snow-covered mountains. Aren't those peaks beautiful? They're sharp, too. My magic carpet is in shreds. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. How are you going back to Los Angeles? With a banjo on my knee. <laughs> well, that was my fault. <laughs> hey, Mary, Mary, you better, you better cover up there or you'll get sunburned. Oh, I'm all right. Gee, you look cute in that bathing suit. No kidding, Mary. You look just like Miss Hollywood. Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Stand up, Mary. Let's see your suit in the back. There. Oh, boy! <laughs> Dennis! <laughs> now, behave yourself, or I'll take away your pass to my swimming pool. Did he get a pass? I had to buy a membership. Mary, I can't start a swimming club without members. Say, Mr. Benny, you got a lot of swell records here. Do you mind if I play your Victrola? No, no. Go right ahead, Dennis. It's the club Victrola. Any member can play it. Oh, Mr. Billingsley, are you sure you wouldn't like to go in for a swim? No, thanks. I'll just run up to my room for a sun bath. To your room? Oh, did you bring a sun lamp with you? No, just a glow worm. Goodbye. <laughs> he must have traded in his lightning bug. <laughs> oh, well. Look, Mr. Benny, here's one of my records. Would you like to hear it? Yeah, that would be swell. Go ahead, Dennis, put it on. Gee, the sun is hot now. Sure feels good, though. You know, it's fun just stretching out here and... Ouch! Oh, oh! Oh, oh! What's the matter, Mr. Benny? His trunk's just dried. <laughs> oh, my leg. I can't understand the suit shrinking so much. My own father sold it to me. <laughs> My heart wander aimlessly the whole night through. It all comes back to me now. A starry summer sky, a laughing you and I alone. It all comes back to me now. Of midnight blue, your face uplifted to my own. We called it a thrill of the moment and blame the moon up above. 
We didn't know what the glow meant. We never dreamed it might be loved. It all comes back to me now. The love I threw away. Now each lonely night I pray. No kidding, Dennis. That was a swell record. Now, uh, why don't you go in for a swim? I don't know how to swim. Oh. Oh, you don't? Uh, say, Mary... I meant to learn, but I never got around to it. Oh. Oh, didn't you? Say, Mary... You're not going to kick me out of the club, are you? No! No, Dan. Just sit in the sun and peel. Now, forget it. Say, Mary, I wish Don and Phil would get here so we can get started on our hike. Now, wait a minute, Jack. I told you I'm not going on any hike. You are, too. We're going up to Tockwitz Falls. It's one of the most beautiful sights uh, in this part of the country. Here comes your friend for some more of that sardine oil. <laughs> oh, yes. Here, here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Watch kitty. out, kitty, or he'll be playing love and bloom on you. I just want to pet him, that's all. Here, kitty. Hey, Jack, here come Don and Phil. Oh, yeah. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Mary. Hello, everybody. Hello, Hello Don. Don. Hiya, Hiya, Bill. Hiya. Well, fellas, what do you think of this place I rented? Not bad, eh? Hey, it's all right. And what a beautiful swimming pool. Move over, Don. I can't see it. <laughs> it's not that small. And, Phil, if our swimming pool isn't big enough for you, you can very well stay out of it. I don't want to go in anyway. I just had my hair dead. <laughs> That's hair done, and it ain't becoming. <laughs> Incidentally, fellas, before entering pool, please take shower. How much does that cost? No, oh, don't try to be funny. The shower is free. Towels, 15 cents! <laughs> now cut that out! And I'll tell you one thing, fellas. I'm very lucky to get a house like this at the height of the season. Ah, uh, you certainly are, Jack. It's a lovely yard, and look at those fruit trees. Boy, get a load of those oranges. They'll leave those oranges right on the trees. I don't want to break up a crate. <laughs> Jeepers, they counted them. Mary, right, that's part of the landscaping, and I don't want them disturbed. Say, so Jack, uh, don't you think we ought to get started on our hike? Uh, yes, Don, we'll be leaving just as soon as our Indian guide gets here. Indian guide? Yes, he knows the trail. Now, get into your slacks, Mary, so you'll be ready. I am not going on that long walk. Then why did you join the Benny Swimming and Hiking Club? You told me Mrs. Roosevelt belonged. <laughs> I did not. I said I sent her an application blank. That was all. Now, come on. We're all going. Say, Jackson, how do you like my hiking outfit? Oh, you look swell, Phil. Well, what's that bottle sticking out of your coat pocket? Well, that's a little Kentucky painkiller in case a snake bites me. Well, you might need it at that. Hey, wait a minute, Phil. There's another bottle in your hip pocket. What's that for? Oh, that's standard equipment. <laughs> I see. Well, now, come on, everybody. Let's get ready. I'm all set, Jack. I got the rope and everything. The rope? Yeah, I hear the trail's pretty steep in places, so I figured we'd all have to tie ourselves together. Oh. Then in case one of us happens to slip, the others can keep him from falling. Well, that's a beautiful theory, Don, but uh, supposing you happen to be the one that slips. <laughs> uh, what about us? Next Sunday, the Aldrich family. <laughs> you said it. Well, let's get started. Go in and change, will you, Mary? Okay, I'll be right back. Look who's here, boss! Oh, yes. Me, Indian guide. You, Jack Benny? Uh, I mean, yes, yes. <laughs> now, look, uh, Leaping Deer. 
that's, uh, that's your name, isn't it? Leaping deer, my uncle. Me, Eagle Puss. <laughs> oh, he couldn't come, eh? Well, now, look, Eagle Puss. Uh, we'll be starting in a few minutes. Uh, what do you get for taking a party up to Tockwood's Falls? Ten dollars. Ten dollars? I'll get it back, boss. <laughs> All right, all right. Come on, fellas, let's get ready. Hey, Dennis, have you got the water jug? Yeah, I got it. Good. Uh-oh, somebody picked an orange. <laughs> Phil, put that orange <laughs> back. Go ahead, put it back. Well, I'll put hurry up, Mary. we got to get going here. Come on, Eaglefoot, lead the way. Stay on the trail, single file, so we don't get lost. I'm tired, Jack. Let's rest for a while. Me too. Okay, okay. Company! Oh! What a bunch of sissies. It was nice of you to bring your drum along, Mr. Billingsley. I'm sorry, I swallowed my fife. Your fife? Oh, don't worry about your fife. The drum is just dandy. Hey, Jackson, all this walking is monotonous. It is, eh? Yeah, and if a snake don't bite me pretty soon, I'm going to take a drink anyway. <laughs> don't you touch it. Say, Eagle Puss, uh, we've been walking... <laughs> Eagle Puss, we've been walking a long time. How much further is it to Tockwitz Falls? Me don't know. Eagle Puss off the beam. <laughs> Oh, oh, lost, eh? Well, you're a fine Indian. You should have known that. His tomahawk says made in Japan. <laughs> well, well, what'll we do? Here's a sign, Mr. Benny. Talk with Falls, straight ahead. Oh, yes. Well, let's get moving. Oh, I'm hungry, Jack. Let's stop and eat. Don, we're not eating till we get to the falls. But I haven't had a bite of food since breakfast. I know, Don, I know. You're wasting away to a shadow of Mount Whitney. <laughs> we'll eat later. Say, Phil, what are you doing with that bottle in your hand? Bingo! A snake bit me! <laughs> That's impossible. At this time of year, rattlesnakes are in hibernation. They're in their holes, sleeping. Well, this one's a playboy. <laughs> oh, stop, will you? Well, all right, Eagle Puss, there's the sign. Read it. We take them trail up mountain. Follow me, pale faces. So long, boss! <laughs> Rochester, you're coming too. All right, fellas, let's go. I'm tired, Mr. Benny. This water jug is heavy. Well, let somebody else take it. Phil, you carry the water jug. I got the hatchet. Here, John, you take it. Oh, I'm carrying the rope. You take the water, Mary. I got the camera. Here, Jack, you carry it. I'm loaded up with the compass and everything. <laughs> here, Dennis, you take the water jug. Okay. There's something funny going on around here. <laughs> 
Well, you had a rest, didn't you? All right, fellas, let's go. Forward! March! Why, why, Mr. Billingsley, what happened there? I stumbled. Oh. <laughs> well, don't bother with the drum now. I've got the fife again. <laughs> well, we don't need that either. Gee, fellas, get a load, get a load of this rock formation. You know, I've never seen a view with so much hey. Hey, what's that? Look, Jackson, there's something moving in that bush up ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I meant. Wonder what it is. Gee, it might be a wild animal. Oh, Rochester! Yes, boss! Go find out what's in that bush! Let it remain a mystery! <laughs> Rochester, you're nothing but a coward. I found that out years ago. Well, all right. Let's walk around the bush. Come on, fellas. We can pick up the trail on the other side. Lead the way, Eagle Puss. Gee, it's rocky up here. Say, Eagle Puss... Uh, what are all these holes in this in the side of the mountain here? Many moons ago, white men dig gold here. Gold, eh? Yes, Jack. Why, even today, hikers have been known to find nuggets on this trail here. Is that so? Well, that's very interesting. Get up off your knees, Jack. <laughs> I'm just bending over. The snapsack is heavy. Well, let's get going, fellas. Gee, you know, fellas, I wouldn't have missed this hike for anything in the world. Gosh, all the vastness of this gorgeous scenery makes one realize the insignificance of man. Especially me. I can't even swim. Dennis, <laughs> you forget about that. You're right, Jackson. Look at that brook down there with the weeping willows hanging over it. Yeah. What a painting that would make for my bass drum. <laughs> well, I wish you'd put it on there. Your telephone number is a little too obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, golly, but no, no kidding, fella. Gee, you talk... I never saw anything place like... You talk about scenery. Hey, fellas. Hey, look at that cliff over there. Look at that cliff over there. Gee, it makes an echo, too. It makes an echo, too. <laughs> Say, this is fun. Hello! Jack, I'd like to try it. Hey, Echo! Jello has six delicious flavors. Wait for Wilson! <laughs> My goodness. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and what's that other one? Lime! Oh, yes, I ought to have my cliff examined. <laughs> And that's the dumbest echo I ever heard. <laughs> Gee, this this trail is getting real rocky now. Watch them step. Trail face no papoose anymore. Okay, I'll watch it. Gee whiz, fellas, look at those white fleecy clouds against that blue sky. Do you ever see anything so... Whoops! Help me up, Rochester. Why don't you watch where you're going? Well, I didn't see that. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, what's this? What's this? I saw it first. You saw what first? Right there. 
That gold nugget. It's mine. Mine. Where, Jack? I don't see it. Right there. I moved my foot and there it was. See, there may be hundreds of them here. And they're all mine. Oh, boy, I can retire. No more slaving on the radio. No more pictures with Fred Allen. Oh, Jack, stop. I won't stop. Look. Look, I discovered gold. It's gold. Gold. Gold is right. That's your bridge work. <laughs> Oh, yes. Darn that thing. It's always falling out. Pick it up, Rochester. Well, come on, fellas. Let's get to the falls. Ready, Mr. Billingsley? Forward. March. Left, right, left. Friends, I have never see, seen anything to equal the way people have been writing in for that new General Foods dessert recipe book. Every day, thousands and thousands of letters come pouring into the mailroom of General Foods in Battle Creek, Michigan, for listeners all over the country who want this grand new dessert book. But here's the most gratifying thing of all. The fact that an amazing number of these letters ask for not just one, but several, two, three, four, or even five. The folks at General Foods tell me that they've never known any recipe book offer that prompted so many people to write in for more than one copy. Yet it's certainly easy to understand why. Because this new General Foods dessert book is really a winner. A book that will answer your dessert problems day after day for a whole year. It contains recipes and suggestions for 365 luscious desserts of all kinds. Pies, cakes, puddings, cookies, and many tempting jello treats as well. So send for your copy now. Just include 10 cents in corner stamps for each copy you request. And mail your letter to Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. Remember, for each of the copies you request, be sure to send 10 cents in corner stamps. The address again is Don Wilson, General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. Well, fellas, here we are, Tocquets Falls. It was a long hike, but it was worth it. Isn't that a beautiful sight? Tons of water falling 90 feet into an icy pool. Just listen to it. <laughs> ah, what a sight. What a thrill. What a thrill. Oh, quiet. <laughs> Good night, Joni. Are you good at arithmetic, ladies and gentlemen? Can you add, subtract, and divide and get the right answer? Then add together fine South and Central American coffees. Subtract 97% of the caffeine. Divide by two into drip and regular grinds. And what have you got? Why, Sanka coffee, of course. The real coffee that never robs anybody of sleep. Because the sleep-disturbing caffeine has been removed. Better get... Sanka Coffee tomorrow. Sanka Coffee presents We the People over another network every Tuesday night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. 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 J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program coming to you from the Plaza Theater in Palm Springs, California, starring Jack Benny. With Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with the Phil Harris Concerto Number no. 6 for oboe and drum. <laughs> If you can make a collection, ladies and gentlemen, of all the grocery orders written by American housewives during the past few months, you notice there's one item on these orders that's been appearing more and more often, and that item is Jell-O puddings. Jell-O puddings, those swell new members of the famous Jell-O family, are fast winning a place among America's most popular desserts, and no wonder. All three flavors, Jell-O's rich chocolate pudding, Jell-O's creamy vanilla pudding, and Jell-O's golden butterscotch pudding are luscious, mellow puddings, as smooth as cream and chuck full of tempting goodness. And like Jell-O, they take only a few minutes to make and a few pennies to buy. So the next time you write Jell-O on your grocery list, write down Jell-O puddings, too. And remember, in buying either of these grand desserts, be sure to bear the name Jell-O, because Jell-O is a trademark, the property of General Foods. 
Always look for the name Jell-O whenever you buy Jell-O or Jell-O pudding. Concerto number six for old bow and drum played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you may remember, three weeks ago, a certain young man came to Palm Springs run down, anemic, and pale. Oh, I was a wreck. And now, after three weeks on the desert, I bring you that picture of health, that Greek god, that bronze Adonis, Jack Benny. Thank you. Jello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And folks, I wish this was television. No kidding, Don. I don't want to sound vain, but isn't it marvelous the way this deep tan of mine sets off my big blue eyes? <laughs> and all, all in three short weeks. Well, you do look wonderful, Jack. Your face is as brown as a berry. Isn't it, though? But I meant to ask you, uh, what are those three round white spots in the middle of your forehead? Those white spots on my forehead? Yes. Well, I sent Rochester out for a cigar the other day, and I was asleep in the sun when he came back. So uh, that's where he laid the chain. <laughs> you see? Oh, yes, those spots look like a quarter and two dimes. Exactly. In other words, Don, I'm just 45 cents short of a complete tan. <laughs> But, Don, isn't it a shame we have to go back home next week? You know, uh, you're commencing to look great yourself. Ah, oh, feel good, too, Jack. As a matter of fact, in the short time we've been here, I've lost four pounds off my stomach. You lost uh, four pounds off your stomach, eh? Mm-hmm. Well, Don, if you're interested in finding out where they went, uh, take a peek in a rear-view mirror. <laughs> But, um, at that, you have lost a little. How did you do it? Well, I go horseback riding every day, and it's wonderful exercise. Oh, it is. It is. There's nothing in the world like horseback riding. I do it all the time. You do what all the time? Oh, hello, Mary. We were just talking about horses. You know, Don, I've had a lot of experience with them, and, and the main thing to remember... Oh, stop, will you? All you know about horses is they don't wear high heel shoes. <laughs> is that so? I know plenty. <laughs> Tell Don what happened at Roger's stables the other morning. Never mind. What was it, Barry? Jack wanted to get on a horse, so he tried to make it kneel like a camel. <laughs> well, I remember a horse in Vaudeville that used to do that. He got more money than I did. <laughs> and he could count, too. Of course, he had to. He was working on percentage. <laughs> anyway, um, I was talking to Don. You see, Don... The main thing about riding a horse is rhythm. Is that so? Yes. Now, take, for instance, galloping. When the horse goes up, I go up. When the horse goes down, I go down. And when the horse stops, leapfrog. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Mary. The only time I fell off the horse is when I was trying that new trick. And you know it. What trick was that, Mary? Well, Jack put a handkerchief on the ground and said he'd ride by at full speed and pick it up. Oh. So what happened? He picked up his handkerchief, dropped his teeth, picked up his teeth, and fell in a gopher hole. <laughs> oh, boy, you really dream it up, sister. You didn't leave out a thing. You had to tell him everything about the horse, didn't you? I didn't tell him where you tried to put the bit. <laughs> now lay off, will you? Don't listen to her, Don. You know, I've been riding for... Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Well, here I am. So I see. Uh, what are you going to sing, Dennis? Can I have some dialogue first? I got friends in the audience. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, of course. I'm sorry. Uh, tell me, kid, have you been having fun while we've been here in Palm Springs? Oh, boy, have I? Good. I will now sing Frenesy. <laughs> now, wait a minute. You said you wanted some dialogue, didn't you? That was enough. I didn't want to run it into the ground. Oh. Well, there's a kid that's easy to please. All right, uh, go ahead with your song. Okay. Oh, say, Mr. Benny, I meant to ask you something. 
What is it, Dennis? Can I be sent to the penitentiary for parking my car in front of a fire plug? The penitentiary? Of course not. That's ridiculous. Darn that, Mr. Harris. What's Phil got to do with it? He said I'd get ten years, so I gave him my girl who was in the back seat. (laughs) Well, don't worry about it, Dennis. You'll never see jail or your girl either. Sing, kid. was fiesta down in Mexico, and so I stopped a while to see the show. I knew that frenzy meant please love me, and I could say frenzy. A lovely senorita caught my eye. I stood enchanted as she wandered by, and never knowing that it came from me, I gently sighed frenzy. She stopped and raised her eyes to mine Her lips just pleaded to be kissed Her eyes were soft as candle shine So how was I to resist? Quiero que viva solo para mí Y que tú vayas por donde yo voy Para que mi alma sea no mal de ti Bésame con frenesí Bésame tú a mí, bésame igual que mi boca se besó. Dame el frenesí que mi locura te dio. ¿Quién si no fui yo, pudo enseñarte el camino del amor? Muerte y maldivez, cuando mi orgullo rodó a tus pies. Que viva solo para mí Y que tú vayas por donde yo voy Para que mi alma sea no mal de ti Bésame con frenesí Dame la luz que tiene tu mirar Y la ansiedad que entre tus labios vi Esta locura de vivir y amar Que más que amor frenesí Ay, en el beso que te di, alma, piedad, corazón, dime que sabes tú sentir, lo mismo que siento yo. And now without a heart to call my own, a greater happiness I've never known, because her kisses are for me alone. Now you can say frenesí. Now I can say Very good. Very good. Good, very good. That was uh, that was Frenesy, sung by Dennis C. Day, and accompanied by the Guadalajara Trio through the courtesy of the Dollhouse. And very good boys. By the way, these fellows are from Mexico, aren't they, Dennis? Yes, sir. Well, thanks for appearing on our program, boys. It was really a pleasure listening to you. Él nos dijo que viniéramos. Será bueno cobrarle ahorita. Él no paga nada. Nunca tuvo intención. Oh, no sean tontos. Si ustedes creen que nos va a pagar, están locos. <laughs> hmm. Uh... Uh, what did they say, Dennis? One guy said they were going to be paid for singing here tonight, and the other two said he was crazy. <laughs> oh, well, uh, tell him I'll see him tomorrow. He'll see you tomorrow, fellas. Tell him in Spanish. I can tell him in English. <laughs> anyway, boys, you were swell. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, going from our vocal specialty, uh, you were swell, boys. Adios, adios. <laughs> know what they're waiting around for. (laughs) No, they sang and they're through, that's all. (laughs) And now, ladies and gentlemen, going from our uh, vocal specialty to our feature attraction of the evening, as a tribute to Palm Springs, we are going to present an original mystery melodrama entitled 
Murder at the Racket Club, or Ain't His White Flannels Messy? <laughs> now, I will play the part. Oh, by the way, Jack, speaking of the Racket Club, did you finally join it? Uh, no, Don, I was thinking of joining, but... Oh, after all, how often do I play tennis? You know? Well, that isn't their only attraction. They have a beautiful swimming pool, too. I know, Don, but... Oh, oh how often do I swim? But, Jack, know? the club is right out there on the desert. The air is wonderful for you. Is it? Oh, how often do you breathe? <laughs> now, wait a minute, Mary. The only reason I didn't join the racket club is because they don't take in actors. They don't take in actors? No. Don't tell me all that ham around there is just for sandwiches. <laughs> all right, I didn't join the club, and it's none of your business why. Now, getting back to our play, ladies and gentlemen... Hold everything, Jackson. Here I am, folks, the Sheik of Palm Canyon Drive. <laughs> well... <laughs> well, he finally got here. Listen, Sheik, the next time you're late, into your tent I'll creep and hit you on the head with your option. <laughs> Now, where were you? Well, it ain't my fault, Jackson. This is what happened. I was walking over here in plenty of time for the broadcast, and I bumped into a girl I hadn't seen in years. Oh. In fact, I've never seen her before. <laughs> I knew that. Well, anyway, I honked my horn and said, uh, Are you going my way, babe? Honked your horn? I thought you said you were walking. I was. What? I always carry a little horn with me. Whistling ain't polite. <laughs> Oh, you carry a horn. Well, you're the only masher I ever met with accessories. <laughs> Where is this girl, Phil? Uh, I'd like to meet her. Well, she had to go to work. She's a date picker in Indio. <laughs> a date picker? Yeah, you ought to see her climb a tree. <laughs> I'd love to. Well, Phil, I'm glad you finally got here. <laughs> I just... <laughs> I just started uh, casting our murder mystery. Am I going to be in it? Yes, Phil, you've got a very important part. You're going to be the doorman at the racket club. Well, that's life for you. Tonight, I'm the doorman there, and last night, the doorman threw me out. <laughs> you'd have gotten a bigger laugh if you'd have read that a little faster. I don't know what you were stalling around there. Phil. Well, anyway, you're the doorman. I'm going to be the chief of police of Palm Springs. Dennis, you're going to be a sergeant. And, Don, you're going to be a member of the force. All right, Don, go ahead. Oh, Jack, you're so ridiculous. I like it. Don, you're going to be a member of the force. Oh, very well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please remember that you don't have to use force to open a box of jello. <laughs> See, that's very clever. Oh, well, I hate to do the next line. Don, that's the whole pun. <laughs> Don, that's, that's the whole... That's a whole punch. Don, you're a member of the police force. Oh, all right. It is not only economical and easy to make, but comes in six delicious flavors. So the next time you're in your neighborhood grocers, police ask for jello. <laughs> there. Now there, that was swell. Uh, was that your idea, Jack? Yes, at rehearsal it was terrific. Well, that's life for you. Now the doorman can throw you out. <laughs> Say, I wonder if I've had too much, son. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, Mary, in our play tonight, you're going to be a glamorous Hollywood movie star, Miss Mitzi LaRue. And uh, you came to Palm Springs to be near your sweetheart. Oh, boy. Who has just been murdered. Oh, nuts. <laughs> I can't help it. That's the plot. Anyway, folks, this play will go on immediately after a number by Phil Harris and his orchestra. Are you ready, Phil? All set, Jackson. Say, Mr. Harris. What do you want, kid? Can I borrow your horn? I want to get another girl. <laughs> Give it on, Phil. A honk it twice, Dennis. I'm free tonight myself. Playboy. <laughs>
That was Wise Old Owl, played by Phil Harris and his Palm Springs Orchestra. Palm meaning, I've got the boys on my hands. And Springs meaning, they ought to take a drink out of one sometime. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, for our play, Murder at the Racket Club. Que nos pague para ir, Te dije que no nos iba a pagar nada. Que se puede esperar de un hombre como Jack Penny? Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Fellas, wait a minute. I told you I'd take care of you tomorrow. Manana, manana. Manana, he says. Manana. Exactly. Now, the opening scene, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what they're waiting here for. I can't... <laughs> All right, fellas, adios. Now, the opening scene is the police station in Palm Springs, California. Police Captain O'Benny is seated at his desk, attired in a sun helmet, a tin badge, and shorts. Curtain. Music. There's the phone, Chief. I'll take it, O'Day. Hello? Palm Springs Police Station and Date Shop. <laughs> Captain O'Benny speaking. What's that, miss? You're taking a sun bath and there's a peeping Tom annoying you? Don't worry, I'll take care of it immediately. O'Day, get away from that window. <laughs> John, I forgot to ask her if she wanted some stuffed dates. Hey, Sarge. Yes, Chief? You arrested two fellas last night and I want you to stop filling this jail with crooks. Well, I gotta do something with them. I don't care. During the height of the season, this jail is for tourists. <laughs> I'm getting $12 a cell, American plan. <laughs> And catch crooks during the summer. Morning, Chief. Morning, Sergeant Wilson. How are things on your beat? Marvelous. I sold 40 pounds of dates. Good. <laughs> Keep going like that. You'll soon be a lieutenant. Thank you, sir. <laughs> but, Wilson, I wish you wouldn't push the plain dates. You know, we make our profit on the stuffed ones. O'Day, where are you going with those satin bedspreads? I thought I'd make sell nine and ten into a bridal suite. It's a good idea. Put a canopy over the bunk. You know, if business keeps up this way, it, it, it'll really be... I'll take it. Hello? Palm Springs Police Station and date shoppy. <laughs> oh, Benny speaking. What's that? What? Murder at the Racket Club? Well, there's life for you. That's the title of our play. Quiet, you. <laughs> yes? Yes, we'll be right over. What's up, Chief? Les Stofan, the tennis pro at the racket club, just phoned that Kerry Carew, the well-known playboy, has been murdered. Get the squad car, Wilson. Yes, sir. O'Day, bring along some stuffed dates, the ones with the gold tinfoil. We ought to clean up at the racket club. Okay, Chief. Now, come on, fellas. I'm going to find the murder of Kerry Carew, or my name ain't... I'll take it. Hello? Yes? Look, fellas, I told you, manana, manana. <laughs> Adio. My goodness. Now, come on, fellas. I'm going to find the murder of Carrie Carew, or my name ain't... Calling all cars. Calling all cars. Be on lookout for newlyweds. Bridal suite now available at police station. That is all. <laughs> Got to tell him about the canopy. Well, boys, here's the play. How do we get in, Chief? Right through the door. See that sign there? Racket Club, members only. Open up. Open up. It's the police. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? I'm Chief of Police, and I want to get in here. Are you a member of the club? No, I'm here to investigate a murder. I want to see the body. Well, if you're not a member, you can't come in. What? I'll have to throw the body over the fence to you. <laughs> what are you talking about? A man has been killed on these premises, and I'm going to find out who done it. That's who did it. No wonder you're not a member of this club. <laughs> oh, fine. From Harris yet. <laughs> now, look, bud, please. we got to get in here. I'm sorry, but you'll have to speak to the owner, Charlie Farrell. Here he comes now. Oh, hello, Mr. Farrell. Say, what's all this racket at the racket club? <laughs> Thank 
you. Thank you. You can thank them later. <laughs> now, listen, Farrell. I'm Captain O'Benny of the Palm Springs Police Department. Glad to know you. Remember me in Seventh Heaven with Janet Gaynor? Yes, yes. <laughs> I remember. Now, listen. Terry Crew has been murdered on these premises, and I'm going to find out who done it. Who done it? I warned him. <laughs> All right. Who did it? Who did it? Well, how about it, Farrell? Do I get in here or not? Just as soon as you sign this membership blank. That'll be $300, please. $300? I don't take in that much at the police station all season. Well, you are. You're charging more for rooms than I am. <laughs> okay, I'll make out a check. Hmm. Pay to the order of the racket club, $300. Boy, our date's gonna go up. <laughs> you said it. Well, I'm a member now. All right, Wilson O'Day, follow me. Now, tell me, Farrell, was Kerry Carew alone when he was murdered? No, there were several people with him. I see. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is grill the suspects. I'm sorry, the grill doesn't open till noon. <laughs> I'm ignoring that, brother. <laughs> well, here we are in the lounge. Quiet, everybody. Dates, dates, get your fresh dates here. <laughs> Would you like a box of stuffed dates, sir? Not him. That's the body. <laughs> now, everyone line up. I'm going to find out a few things around here. Who are you, miss? I'm a movie star, Missy LaRue. What studio are you with? RKO. Oh, yes. I saw you in Kitty Foo. <laughs> Have you played any other outstanding roles lately? Yes, I had ten words in Western Union. Stop. <laughs> now, Miss LaRue, I want you to tell me everything you know about this crime. I don't know anything. I was just sitting here popping my bubble gum. And you didn't hear a shot? No, I really pop it, kid. <laughs> now, don't evade the issue, Miss LaRue. You were in love with the victim, weren't you? Pardon me, uh, dry martini boy. No, no toothpick in the olive. I like the bob for it. Hey, wait a minute. What's your name? Uh, Butterworth. Charles Butterworth. Oh, Butterworth, eh? Oh. That, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Never mind that. <laughs> now, listen, Butterworth. How'd you know my name? <laughs> you just told me. Well, I better watch that. <laughs> now, listen here, Butterworth. What do you know about Kerry Carew? Oh, a lovely chap. I'm going to play tennis with him this afternoon. <laughs> going to play tennis with him? Why, Kerry Carew is dead. Too bad. Now if he wins, he won't be able to jump over the net. <laughs> of course not. Look, the man is dead. There he is laying on the floor. Well, I was laying there last night, and I'm not dead. <laughs> you can take my word for it. Carew is dead. Now come clean, Butterworth. What do you know about this murder? Well, I tell you, Captain, I was just sitting here bobbing for olives. That's my hobby, you know. <laughs> yes, yes, go on. Miss LaRue, watch that bubble gum. <laughs> Continue, Mr. Butterworth. Oh, forgive me, Captain O'Benny. Are you looking for a murderer? Yes, I am. Then, uh, would I do, Captain? Who's... who's that guy? That's uh, Peter Laurie. Peter Laurie? <laughs> Thank you. Now, listen, folks, will you please stop applauding these guys? One of them is a murderer. <laughs> now, Mr. Laurie, what is that gun doing in your hand? Oh, I was just going out to shoot pheasants. I see. Well, what's that dagger doing in your other hand? Well, I have to pick my teeth, don't I? <laughs> now, Laurie, I want the truth here. And no beating around the bush. Did you kill Carrie Carew? Who? Carrie Carew. Carrie Carew? I don't think so. No, I'm positive I haven't, I haven't killed anyone by that name. Now, cut that out. I'm going to get to the bottom of this, and I don't want any... What's that? Somebody threw a rock through the window. Look, Chief, there's a note on it. Give me that. Let me read it. I'm just standing here. Okay. This may be vital evidence. What does it say? We want our money. Signed, the Guadalajara Trio. <laughs> well, write manana under it and throw it back. Now, Mr. Laurie. Mr. Laurie. 
Where did he go? He went for a plunge in my martini. <laughs> oh. Come on out of there, Laurie. <laughs> now, no use trying to hide. I want the truth. Where were you at the time of the murder? Well, I... Come on. Think fast, Mr. Moto. Oh, I was exceptionally good in that, huh? <laughs> yes, yes, you were swell. Say, what about me in Seventh Heaven? You were marvelous! <laughs> you were marvelous. I wish I could think of a picture I was in. <laughs> me too. See, folks, remember what I said about the ham here? <laughs> Never mind that. This case is solved. Peter Laurie, I arrest you for the murder of Terry Carew. All right, if you insist. Tell me, shall I go voluntarily, or do you want me to struggle a bit? What? You can't arrest him, Jack. I made him do it. You made him do what? Yes, Jack, it was the only way we could get you over here to join our club. Oh, so that's it. Well, what about Carew, the fellow you killed? Who is he? A dummy from Bullock's window. <laughs> oh, well, I thought he was much too pretty. Well, it was a good gag, fellas. As long as I'm hooked, I might as well enjoy myself. Say, Farrell, give me one of those Coca-Colas there, will you? Here you are, Jack. That'll be $12. Yike! <laughs> Move over, Carew. Play, Phil. Tomorrow night, when you're trying to think of what to have for a dessert at dinner, why not decide on Jell-O's new treat, Apple Lime Whip? Or here's a tempting dessert that will make the whole family smile their approval and uh, give you a shining example of how good lime Jell-O can be. Best of all, you can prepare this grand dessert in almost less time than it takes to tell. Simply dissolve one package of lime jello in one pint of hot water and chill until cold and syrupy. Next, whip as directed on the back of the package. Then fold in one cup of strained applesauce and mold. And there's a gay, attractive dessert that you'll agree is one of the most successful you've ever served. So enjoy a delicious treat tomorrow with this swell, creamy combination of spicy applesauce and rich emerald green lime jello. Serve a luscious jello dessert real soon. We're a little late, folks, so good night. The Joe Program, coming to you from Hollywood, California, starring Jack Benny, with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with I See the Moon at Noon. Ladies and gentlemen, along about this time each year, folks seem to appreciate a lovely Jell-O dessert even more than usual. For Jell-O, with its vivid, shimmering colors, seems almost like a preview of spring. Its glowing beauty makes you forget that winter is still with us. It adds a special note of gaiety and good cheer to any March meal. And the refreshing, extra-rich flavor of Jell-O gives you a welcome foretaste of next summer's fruits with all their tantalizing, juicy, ripe goodness. So brighten up tomorrow night's dinner with a brilliant Jell-O dessert. Order several packages from your grocer the first thing in the morning. Choosing any or all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, or lime. And be especially sure to include strawberry, raspberry, and cherry Jell-O. For each has a new, improved flavor, obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And the result is something mighty swell. A unique and delightful flavor that you'll find better than ever. Enjoy a tempting Jell-O dessert tomorrow.
That was I See the Moon at Noon, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, after a month's vacation in Palm Springs, we bring you a man who looks a month younger, as if that made any difference, <laughs> Jack Benny. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Jello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, I may only look a month younger, but believe me, I feel like a kid. If there was anything I needed, it was those four weeks on the desert. Roughing it uh, really did me a world of good. Roughing it? Well, I wouldn't exactly say that you were leading such a rough life there, Jack. Oh, you wouldn't, eh? No, I saw you out many a night in Palm Springs, and you were wearing a tuxedo. Yes, but it wasn't pressed. <laughs> and if you had to look close, you'd have noticed that carnation in my buttonhole was a cactus blossom. <laughs> and full of stickers. Don't tell me I didn't rough it. Why, I'm as hard as nails. So you feel pretty rugged now, huh, Jack? Do I, Don? You remember how soft and flabby my arms used to be? Uh Uh-huh. Well, wait till I roll up my sleeve. I'll make a muscle for you. (laughs) Wait. Oh, Jack, you don't have to bother. I'll take your word for it. No, no, Don. You know what a liar I am. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I want to show you. Now what? I'll raise my arm. There. How's that, Don? How's that muscle? Where? I don't see it. Right there on that tattoo. (laughs) See how fat the eagle is now? (laughs) See? Eagle? I thought that was a sparrow. With E pluribus unum on it? What are you talking about? I tell you, Don, I feel so good, I like to get in a scrap with someone. Wait till Dennis Day comes in, I'll straighten him out fast. (laughs) He'll never know what hit him. Jack, Jack, wait a minute. Take it easy. Take it easy, nothing. I've got a muscle and I'm going to use it. That kid has got to learn how to behave himself. But, Jack, you're being unfair. Ever since Dennis has been on this program, he's been a perfect little gentleman. Well-behaved and well-mannered. Well-mannered? Let me tell you something, Don. Last Monday, when I gave Dennis his salary check, he looked me straight in the eye and said, Thank you very much. Well, what's wrong with that? Don, with the check he gets, that very much is pure sarcasm. (laughs) (laughs) Teach that kid to thank me. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. What are you doing with your fist up in the air? I made a muscle for Don. I can't get my arm down. (laughs) See? See the muscle? Where? Right there. Some muscle. Looks like a marshmallow with a hangover. (laughs) The hardest marshmallow you ever saw. Boy, there's a real muscle. What are you going to do? Stand there like a baking soda ad? (laughs) No. Help me get my arm down. Here, pull. Well, the eagle's a sparrow again. <laughs> but just the same way till Dennis gets here. I'll fix that kid. What about Dennis? I'm going to beat him up, that's all. He's been acting too fresh around here lately, and it's time I straighten him out. Straighten him out? Why don't you do something about Phil Harris? He's the wise guy. Mary, Phil is nothing but a big, playful kid. But Dennis is a real troublemaker. And he's smaller than you are. <laughs> <laughs> that's merely a coincidence. Let me ask you something, Mary. How about when we were driving back from Palm Springs and the Maxwell? All that kid did was complain, complain all the way in. Well, who wouldn't complain? It's a three-hour trip, and it took us four days to make it. Well? Four days from Palm Springs to Los Angeles? Why, it's only 120 miles. 129. We came by way of San Bernardino. (laughs) Besides, we stopped to enjoy the scenery. It was lovely down with those snow-capped mountains and beautiful orange groves. Oh, you and your orange groves. That's all we had for four days, orange juice. Never mind. The sign got them. All you can drink for ten cents. (laughs) (laughs) Now, wait a minute, Mary. Wait a minute. Don't give Don any false impressions. There There was food, too. What about that delicious pressed chicken we had? It had to be pressed. You ran over it. All right, I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. An accident? Yes. And why did Rochester yell, tally-ho, and chase it clear through a cornfield? (laughs) That never happened, and you know it. It would have been a very pleasant trip if you and Dennis hadn't been beefing all the time. I'll fix that, kid. By the way, Don, how did you come back to town? Well, the little woman and I took the train. It was a very nice, restful trip. Oh, the train is swell, Don, but I prefer motoring myself. I don't know, you see more of the country that way. But, Jack, even allowing for sightseeing, I can't understand why it took you four days to come from Palm Springs to Los Angeles. Oh, four days isn't so bad. That's progress. It used to take the covered wagon six. 
And they didn't come by way of San Bernardino like I did. Anyway, Mary, you had a swell time in Palm Springs. You're back in Hollywood, safe and sound, so forget it. Hello, everybody. Oh, here he is. All right, kid, put him up. Put him up. You've been aching for trouble, and you're going to get it. What's going on here? It's a long story. Jack found a muscle. It's not it at all. Come on, kid, up with your dupes. I'll teach you to be careful. Well, gee, I didn't mean to run over that tin can with the lawnmower. That's not what I'm talking about. A small fine covers that. I just don't want you to go around complaining about your trip home from Palm Springs. I was nice enough to invite you. Gosh, I drank so much orange juice, I feel like a sunset. Well, let me tell you something, Dennis. Orange juice is not only nourishing, but it's very good for you. It'll keep you from catching a cold. I won't sneeze till 1980. Well, that does it. All right, Dennis, put up your dues. Oh, Jack, will you stop being so childish? You're just picking on Dennis because he's the smallest one in our gang. Hmm. Mary's right. It's not like you, Jack, to be a bully. Why, in your physical condition, you could mangle the kid. I could? <laughs> Gee. Huh? Certainly, you're a gorilla. You don't realize your own strength. I don't? <laughs> Well... No. Now, the least you can do is apologize to Dennis. Well, all right. You don't have to, Mr. Benny. I'm a rat, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> no. No, you're not a rat, kid. Well, one of us is. <laughs> Look, Dennis, you better sing your song before I lose my temper again. I don't know my own strength, like Don says. Now, what's it going to be? I'm going to sing In Dublin's Fair City. Good, good. Oh, Mary. What do you want? Help me get my arm down. It's stuck again. Okay. (laughs) Thanks, Mary. Sing, kid. Dublin's fair city where girls are so pretty I first set my eyes on sweet Molly Malone As she wheeled her wheelbarrow through streets broad and narrow Crying cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh Alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh Cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh Was a fishmonger, but sure it's no wonder, for so were father and mother before. They wheel, they wheel barrow through streets broad and narrow, crying cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh. She died of a fever, and no one could save her. And that was the end of sweet Molly Malone. Her ghost wheels her barrow through streets broad and narrow, frying cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh. Alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh. Crying cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh. Crying cockles and mussels alive, alive, oh. Very good. That was In Dublin, Fair City, sung by Dennis Day. And very apropos, Dennis, uh, tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day, isn't it? Sure, and it is. (laughs) Yes, sir. You tell me to put up my duke tomorrow, and I'll knock your block off. (laughs) Dennis, I'm not going all the bother putting my arm up again. 
So control yourself. Oh, Jack. What is it, Don? Tomorrow being St. Patrick's Day, I have a great treat for our audience tonight. A treat? Yes, I prepared my commercial this evening with a Gaelic clamp. I'm going to deliver it with an Irish brogue. I do it very well. No kidding. Well, that really is a treat, Don. Any novelty is always welcome on this program. You say you do it with an Irish brogue, eh? Yes. Well, well. Now, now go ahead. Let's hear it. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the next time you go to your neighborhood grocer, why not ask him for a package of tempting and appetizing jello? Hmm. It is not only economical and easy to make. Well, where's the bro? But comes in six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. John, where's the bro? So always insist on genuine jello and look for the big red letters on the box. Be gone! Oh! There it is! No, we were going to have... Well, you did that beautifully, Don. Oh, that's a marvelous brogue. How did you ever acquire it? Oh, I do several dialects, Jack. Would you like to hear me read the same commercial as a Swede would do it? Don, if you think I'm going to listen to that whole thing again just to hear you say yump and yiminy at the end of it, you're crazy. Now, go away. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. You back in town already? Yeah, I got in last night. But you know... I don't know. I wish we could have stayed in Palm Springs a couple of more weeks. He is wonderful there. Well, personally, I'm glad to be back in the city. What's the matter, Phil? Don't you like the desert? No, that fresh air gets under my eyes and puffs them up. <laughs> oh. And I can't stand that hot sun beating down on my head. Well, why don't you wear a hat? Look, Jackson, I got gorgeous hair, and it would be sheer madness to hide it. <laughs> Well, that's the most conceited thing I ever heard. You know, Phil, I could have gorgeous hair, too, if I got it marcel every week like you do. Well, why don't you? Well, maybe I will. If you can get a Marcel, so can a coconut. <laughs> what? What did you say? Did I put my dukes up, Mr. Benny? Not this time, kid. This is strictly between Miss Livingston and me. You want to step out in the alley? Oh, quiet. <laughs> We're talking to Phil about Palm Springs. Now, how long did it... Mary, put your dupes down. <laughs> Phil, how long did it take you to drive back? Well, with all the traffic and everything, uh, uh, about an hour and 45 minutes. Only an hour and 45 minutes? Yes, and I stopped for a rumble lesson in Pomona. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. An hour and 45 minutes. That's what I can't understand, Jack. Why in the world it should take you four days to drive that distance? Well, we had a lot of tough breaks, Don, and hard luck all the way. I'll say. Just as we were pulling into Beaumont, all the tires blew out. Yeah. All four of them? All four in the spare. They've got a union. <laughs> Wait a minute. You're wrong, Mary. We had that tire trouble in Banning. Beaumont is where we ran out of gas. We ran out of gas in Azusa. No, Mary, I think it was Arcadia. Yeah, yeah, we ran out of gas in Arcadia. Arcadia is where the top blew off. The top didn't blow off. It shook off. And besides, it didn't happen in Arcadia. It was Pasadena. It was not. It was, too. Pasadena is where we hit a bump and the headlights changed places. <laughs> oh, yes. We had motor trouble there, too. Motor trouble? Were you held up very long? Yeah, we had to stay overnight so Jack and Rochester made a personal appearance at the theater. That's right, Don. I figured as long as we had to stay there, we might as well do our act. How was the business, Jackson? Did you pack them in? Well, it was on such short notice, Phil, and then it was raining, and besides that, we were bucking a terrific picture that was playing right across the street. Yeah? What was the name of it? A Puppets of Passion, starring Ronald Glick and Heather Noodleman. <laughs> Adults only. But we did pretty well at that. Anyway, enough of our adventures getting back home. What do you say, Phil? How about a band number? Okay, Jackson. What do you want us to play? Something popular or something classified? <laughs> That's classical. Classified. Oh, brother, what a dodo. Well, it ain't my fault. You dragged me down to Palm Springs and I missed four weeks of night school. Oh, that's right. You did miss night school. Did it set you back any? Yeah, the teacher's going around with another guy now. <laughs> oh, she is. Say, your teacher must be good looking. Jackson, she's pretty enough to be a cigarette girl. I see. Well, Phil, let me know when you graduate from school, will you? I want to send your diploma to Ripley. Now, let's have a number. I don't care whether it's classified or classical. Just play it. Wait a minute. Come in. 
Pues bueno, muchachos, estamos esperando aquí mucho tiempo. No vale la pena. Mira la molestia que ya nos ha dado. Esperamos por tanto tiempo. Ya voy a pedir a Jack Benny que nos pague enseguida pronto. Hey, wait a minute. Wait, who are these three guys? Those are the boys that sang on the program last week. Oh, the Guadalajara Trio from Palm Springs. Well, I paid them their money. What do they want? More. More. I gave them plenty. I gave you mucho pesos, boys. Remember? Pero queremos más dinero. Por eso estamos aquí. Look, fellas, if you want more money, I'll straighten it out with you tomorrow. Mañana. Mañana. Why don't you pay them tonight? I don't know the word. Mañana, boys. All right, go ahead and play, Phil. Hey, fellas, adios, will you? Adios. I wish I knew a good Spanish lawyer. was Darling Nellie Gray, played by Phil Harris and his classified orchestra. <laughs> classified meaning, I'm going to put an ad in the paper. I've had enough of them. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... Oiga, Jack Benny, ¿por qué no la arreglamos ahora? Oh, please, fellas, I'll pay you pronto. Pronto. Pronto means right now. Oh. Mañana, fellas. Mañana. <laughs> Adios, will you? Hmm. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce that next Sunday night for our feature attraction, the Benny, we know our business, but we're in the wrong one, players, will present their version of 20th Century Fox's version, of Jack Kirkland's version, of Erskine Caldwell's famous book, that sensational and daring saga of the Georgia Hill Country, Tobacco Road. Thank you, Cupcake. <laughs> I should have hit that thing. I've got a muscle. <laughs> Now, this great American classic will be the outstanding effort of our next Sunday's broadcast. I haven't seen the picture yet, Jack. What's it like? Well, it follows the play pretty closely, Mary. And just think, the legitimate show is still playing at the Forest Theater in New York. Remember the time I took you to see Tobacco Road when it first opened? Oh, yes. Gee, that was a long time ago. Uh-huh. I'll never forget that night. You wore a derby hat, white spats, and a checkered suit. And a bamboo cane. You know, in those days when I'd walk down the street, I wanted people to know I was an actor. You never could tell in the theater. <laughs> oh, yes, they could. Say, Jackson, I remember Tobacco Road in them days. Oh, did you see it, Phil? No, I lived there. <laughs> oh, that's right. Well, Phil, you can be our technical advisor and tell us when to take our shoes off. <laughs> Anyway, folks, tonight, as a trailer to this outstanding dramatic vehicle, we are going to present a few of the highlights that will... Pardon me, I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bay. Guess who this is? Hmm. Well, really, I haven't the slightest idea. I'll give you a hint. Who works harder than any man in the, anybody in the world? Not you, Rochester. I bet $12 you're laying down while you're talking to me. You got the phone in one hand and a chicken sandwich in the other. White meat or dark meat? <laughs> Never mind. I'm 
very busy now, Rochester. What do you want? Well, I'm over here in Pasadena to pick up the Maxwell, but you didn't give me enough money. Rochester, I gave you $20 to have that motor fixed. And that's plenty. I know, but complications have set in. <laughs> what do you mean? You remember how the motor used to backfire just before it blow up? Yes. Well, now it whistles eight bars of there I go and boom. <laughs> Well, that's only because it's overheated. Is the fan turning over? What's that, boss? I said, is the fan turning over? How can it? You've been wearing the belt for two weeks. <laughs> well, that's your fault. You gave me a buckle for Christmas. Now, tell the man who, uh, to put on a new fan belt and have him fix that little leak in the radiator. Little leak? Yes. Boss, that thing drips like a California sky. <laughs> Oh, it's not that bad. I have it fixed and pay the garage man. And Rochester, if I didn't give you enough money, pay the difference and I will reimburse you. I beg your pardon? I said I'll reimburse you. That means I'll pay you back. I know what it means. I just want to hear you say it. <laughs> You'll get it. Don't worry. I'll see you at home. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? I read in the paper where you signed a contract to make another picture pretty soon. Is that correct? Yes, why? I wish you'd speak to me about those things. That's none of your business. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> you speak to him about it. Now, where were we? Oh, yes. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as I start to announce, we will now have a preview of Tobacco Road. Take it, Mr. Wilson. Tobacco Road, a few of the highlights from this sensational production. First, romance. I love you, Ellie Mae. What do you say we get hit? You mean get married? No, get hit. I want to plow the field. Drama! Hey, Jeter, ain't the clouds fleecy tonight? That's the mattress. You're under the bed. Intrigue! Is there anybody home? Yes. Come in, tree. Comedy! Why does a hen cross the road? So Jack can have pressed chicken. Now cut that out. Suspense. Estamos pensando sem esperar aqui. Queremos seu dinheiro. I told you, fellas, manana, manana. Technicolor. Who, boss? Rochester. <laughs> These are only a few of the highlights of dramatic thrills that are in store for you next Sunday night. Don't forget to tune in, folks. Tobacco Road. Bigger than puppets of passion. You said it. Play, Phil. Many folks find that Sunday evening is a swell time for writing those letters they've intended to write all week but just haven't got around to. So if you haven't yet written for your copy of General Foods' new dessert recipe book, as I know you've meant to, why not do it tonight? Just address an envelope to me, Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. Then place a dime in coin or stamps in the envelope together with your name and address and mail it right away. In return, we'll send you a copy of our new dessert recipe book, a big 48-page recipe book so beautiful that you'll never tire of looking at it and so convenient that you'll use it not just once or twice, but all the time. It's a new idea in recipe books altogether because it's designed to give you a different idea for dessert every single day of the year. There are tempting suggestions and recipes for 365 luscious desserts. Pastries, puddings, cakes, cookies and every other kind of treat you can think of, including lots of desserts made with rich, shimmering jello. And this grand book is simply full of colorful, fascinating pictures, lovely photographs, and clever, attractive paintings. Page after page of them. So don't wait another day to send for this useful and beautiful book. Tonight, take a few minutes to write for your copy. Just send 10 cents in coin or stamps to Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. Be sure you remember the address. Don Wilson, care of General Foods, 
Battle Creek, Michigan. The last number of the 24th program in the current Jello series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. So be sure to tune in and hear our version of Tobacco Road. <laughs> Say, Mary, I'm going to be a hillbilly next week. I better dig up some old clothes. Why don't you wear that checkered suit? You still got it. Oh, yes. But the coat is so tight on me now. I'll never be able to get my muscle in it. Oh, just wear the vest. That hollow chest of yours will fit anything. Not when I inhale. <laughs> Good night, folks. Whenever you reach for a cup of coffee, ladies and gentlemen, is there a still small voice inside that says, Careful now. You know you didn't sleep a wink last time you had coffee. Then see that your coffee in the future is Sanka coffee. Because it's the caffeine in ordinary coffees that keeps so many people awake. And Sanka coffee has had 97% of the caffeine taken out. Sanka is a real coffee, a delicious coffee, and it won't interfere with anybody's sleep. Sanka Coffee presents We the People over another network every Tuesday night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. 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 J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O program coming to you from Hollywood, California, starring Jack Benny. With Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Goodbye Broadway, Hello Figueroa Street. <laughs> Today, ladies and gentlemen, those big red letters on the box mean twice as much as they ever did before. For today, the name Jell-O not only means America's favorite gelatin dessert, it also stands for those rich, creamy Jell-O puddings. Jell-O puddings are so downright delicious and so quick and easy to make, they're winning new friends every day. With Jell-O puddings, all you have to do is add milk, bring to a boil, and pour into sherbet glasses to cool. And there, almost before you know it, You've made the family a smooth, creamy pudding with a mellow flavor so grand that it outrivals any other pudding you ever tasted. So the next time you ask your grocer for Jell-O, ask him for Jell-O puddings, too. In all three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. And when you buy, be sure the name Jell-O is on the package. Jell-O is a trademark, the property of General Foods. And it identifies two of the finest desserts that ever graced a dinner table, Jell-O and Jell-O's Creamy Puddings. Goodbye, Broadway. Hello, Figaro Street, played by the orchestra. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I bring you a man with whom I have been associated for many years. 
A man whose friendship and thought... Hold it, Don, hold it. We've got a long play to do tonight, so you needn't bother with the introduction. But, Jack, I had a very special reason for wanting to... Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And, Don, I'm sorry I had to rush you like that, but as I said, we're doing a very important play tonight, Tobacco Road. And I'm anxious to get into it. Did the uh, rest of the gang get here yet? Don, did the rest of the gang get here yet? Who cares? What's the matter with you? I simply asked if the gang got here yet. Well, if they mean more to you than I do, I'd like to tender my resignation. What are you talking about? Well, just this. The reason I wanted to introduce you tonight was because I wanted to tie it in with my eighth anniversary. Your eighth anniversary? Yes, I've been on this program eight years tonight. And the least you could have done was to acknowledge it. Oh, so that's it. Well, gee whiz, congratulations, Don, and many happy returns of the day. Thanks. <laughs> well, what do you know? It's your anniversary. I'm sorry it slipped my mind. Say, I wonder what happened to the rest of the gang. Slipped his mind. <laughs> what? That's fine treatment. After I've worked and slaved and given you the best years of my life. The best years of your life. For heaven's sake, Don, we're not married. <laughs> Jeepers. You think I was the husband and you were the little woman. Now, please, don't be unreasonable. I don't think it's unreasonable to talk about my anniversary. All right, let's talk about it. So you've been with me eight years, eh, Donzie? Well, if you hate me, come right out and say so. <laughs> now, look, Wilson, if you're going to act like a baby, I'm going to put you over my knee and change your options. Now pull your lips in and behave And stop laughing when you're supposed to be mad <laughs> Now the reason Now the reason I asked about the gang getting here Is because I want to start casting Tobacco Road I think we've got a swell play for tonight It happens that my writers are very illiterate And this hillbilly <laughs> This hillbilly stuff is right up their alley. Yes, sir. Don't expect me to laugh, brother. <laughs> Who asked you to laugh? I merely said my writers are a couple of hillbillies. And that's the truth. Well, why don't you get writers that are educated? Don, if they were educated, they could read. And if they could read, they would never have signed their contract. I got Phil Harris the same way. <laughs> oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Don. Congratulations on your eighth anniversary. Thanks, Mary. I'm glad you remembered. Mighty nice to find out who your friends are. Don, I'm your friend, believe me. I just happen to forget your big, fat anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now, look, there are only two ways out of this, Don. You can either accept my apology and I'll buy you a lovely present, or I can kill myself. Now, which do you want? Which is easier for you? Well... I'll be darned, he's thinking it over. You're just thinking how silly you are, and Wilson, too. Well, I don't blame Don. He never forgets your birthday, does he? Nobody forgets it. How can you? Every year, I send each one of you a telegram. Don't forget Jack's birthday, a friend. <laughs> it's lucky that I'm sentimental, or I wouldn't get a thing. Why, Jack, you even send us telegrams two weeks before Christmas. Well, certainly, those are just holiday greetings. Some greetings. Merry Christmas. All the stores know my sizes. I don't remember sending anything like that, and if I had, it would have been funnier. <laughs> anyway, I'd be much more subtle than that. Oh, you're about as subtle as the $2 toupee. Now, let's analyze that little remark, Mr. <laughs> anniversary. <laughs> In the first place, you can't get a toupee for two dollars. They cost a lot of money. You got yours for nothing. Never mind. Remember that windy day? <laughs> now, wait a minute, Mary. That, that thing I grabbed that was rolling down the street was not a toupee. It was a bird's nest. Well, well a seagull must have made it. It had a wave in it. All right, forget it. Now, Mary, I ask you to be here early tonight because I want to get going with Tobacco Road. Of course, I'm going to play the leading role, Jeter Lester. Why can't I be Jeter Lester? It's my anniversary. Don, you can't be a hillbilly. If you ever took your shoes off, your feet would spread out clear across the stage. <laughs> now, Mary, you're going to be my wife, and we have 18 children. 18 children? 
What are you laughing at? You can write anything. <laughs> that's the play, and that's the story. Now, let's see. Hiya, Jackson. Here I am, bright and early. Well, I might know you'd been on time tonight, Phil. This hillbilly stuff is your me. Yeah, you know, my mammy and pappy down in Tennessee are listening in tonight. I just sent them a radio. Thought you sent your folks a radio over a year ago. Well, I did, but pappy spilled a drink on it, and it ate the dialogue. <laughs> well, there's an eight that Wilson can't tie into. Say, where's Dennis? I told him to get here... <laughs> What'd I you told say? I said, where's Dennis? Thanks, Phil. I said, where's Dennis? <laughs> <laughs> I told him, uh, I told him to get here early tonight. Oh, I've seen the kid. He's across the street shooting pool. Shooting pool? Why doesn't he get over here? Well, he was making a tough shot and he got his foot caught in the side pocket. <laughs> what? Imagine he's paying 60 cents an hour just for laying there. <laughs> Well, if that's the case, you might as well play your band number, Phil. And, Mary, you run over to the bowling alley and get Dennis. I'm tired of that place. I've been setting up pins there all morning. You have not. You're just too lazy to go over, that's all. All right, hit it, Phil. Hold it a minute. Come in. Estamos aquí otra vez y muy enojados. Pues, ¿qué dice? Nos va a pagar o no? Sí. Ya esperamos mucho tiempo, Jack Benny. Páganos el dinero enseguida pronto. Well, I told you last week. Mañana. Mañana. <laughs> Play, Phil. All right, boys. Adios, will you, muchachos? <laughs> Adios. My goodness. Played, played by Phil Harris and his lovely orchestra. Lovely being as close as we could get to the word that was blue penciled at rehearsal. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... Now, wait a minute, Jax. Now, we should lay off of my boys. They're high-class artists and they're commencing to resent it. High-class artists? Yeah. Phil, I'd like to throw a cigar away just once without having one of those high-class artists grab it on the first bounce. <laughs> They're all down there on their hands and knees. Not my first violinist. No, he's proud. He's got a nail on the end of his bow. <laughs> Seriously, Phil, I wish you'd speak to your boys about that habit. It embarrasses me. Well, I will, Jackson. Hey, fellas, no more smoking cigars unless it's their maiden voice. <laughs> Well, at last, we're on the right track. All right, Don. At last, we're on the right track. Sorry, Jack, I'm not going to do that. What? Don, at last, we're on the right track. Now, go ahead. I'm not going to read the commercial unless it ties in with my eighth anniversary. Don, I'm not going to argue with you. Now, go ahead. At last, we're on the right track. Oh, keep your old track. <laughs> All right, then I'll read it. Mary, give me the lead. Okay. Okay. At last, we're on the right track. Ladies and gentlemen, you are always on the right track when you ask your grocer for a package of tempting and appetizing jello. But even though you are on the track, don't let him switch you to another brand. Boy, is that obvious. 
quiet. So remember, folks, always insist on genuine jello. And look for the big red letters on the box. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that awful? Don, I'd kick you right in the pants if you could feel it. <laughs> Personally, I think that was a very clever commercial. And now, folks... Hello, Mr. Benny. I'm sorry I'm late. Well, I wanted you here early tonight, Dennis. Are you all set for Tobacco Road? This ain't sense then I'm chewing. <laughs> Dennis. Boy, am I sick. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, the idea of chewing tobacco just because we're doing a play called Tobacco Road. Well, I'm such a lousy actor, I figured anything would help. Dennis, we don't use that word on this program. You're a lovely actor. L-O-U-S-Y. Lovely. Then, then I ought to get more money. Look, bud, make off like I didn't correct you. Anyway, Dennis, in our play, you're going to be Dude Lester, my son. Say, Jack, who's that fat girl standing in front of the piano? Where? Oh, her. That must be the actress I hired to play the part of Ellie May, my daughter. Are you looking for me, miss? I sure am, kid. <laughs> Well, look, uh, Miss, uh... Noodleman. Heather Noodleman. <laughs> Heather Noodleman. Oh, yes, I saw you in your latest picture, Puppets of Passion. Wasn't I lovely in that? You certainly were. <laughs> Now, look, Miss Noodleman. Just call me Heifer. <laughs> That's Heather. Heather. It's Heifer from where I'm standing. <laughs> Never mind. Now, look, Miss Noodleman, you're not exactly the type I had in mind for our play. You see, Ellie May is supposed to be a thin, undernourished girl, and you're a little bit on the plump side. Uh, what do you weigh? I beg your pardon? I said, uh, what do you weigh? I don't know. Every time I put a penny in the machine, a little card comes out that says, if you don't get off, I'll scream. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's what I'm getting at. Uh, frankly, Miss Noodleman, you're much too fat. Be careful, young man. I'm a high-class artist. You are? But don't drop your cigar. <laughs> I won't. Well, Miss Noodleman, it's too late. Uh, <laughs> it's too late to make any changes, so we let you handle the part. Thanks, kid. However, try and look as hungry as possible. And now that we're all here, ladies and gentlemen, our version of Tobacco Road will go on immediately after Harris and the boys get us in the mood. Go ahead, Phil. <laughs> Nice going, boys. Now, there's the number they can play. No music. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we bring you our feature attraction of the evening, Tobacco Road. All right, fellas, let's get in the spirit of this. Take off your shoes, everybody. Good. Hey, Jackson, you only took one shoe off. Well, I got a little hole in my other sock, so I better leave it on. Take both shoes off. You made us do it. Oh, all right. Mm. Darn it. Oh, boy! Get away from there, all of you. It's mine. <laughs> See, our shoes are off. Phil, come on. You're a hillbilly, too. Muss up your hair. I'd rather die first. <laughs> all right, if you won't cooperate. Well, let's go. Ladies and gentlemen... Our version of Daryl F. Zanuck's 20th Century Fox production, Tobacco Road. Set the scene, Mr. Wilson. I won't do it unless it ties in with my eighth anniversary. <laughs> it does tie in with your eighth anniversary. Look, Don. Tobacco Road is in its eighth year on Broadway. Erskine Caldwell wrote the novel, Caldwell Has Eight Letters. Jack Kirkland wrote the play, There Are Eight Letters in Kirkland. John Ford directed the picture, There Are Eight Letters in John Ford. 
Natalie Johnson wrote the screenplay. There are eight letters in Johnson. There are only seven letters in Johnson. Eight. I borrowed an extra N from Zanuck. John Sonnet. <laughs> Now, set the scene, will you, Don? Please. Oh, all right. Gosh, what I have to go through. Music, boys. Tobacco Road, a hundred years ago, was the scene of the richest cotton and tobacco plantations in the entire South. But today, it is a famished and desolate land. The opening scene is the tumble-down shack of the Jeter Lester's. It's a hot summer's day, and Jeter is lying on the front porch asleep in the sun. Jeter, Jeter, Lester, you lazy good for nothing, wake up. Wake up, Jeter, wake up, I say. Hit me with something. Okay. Thanks, Mo. What do you want? I want you to go out and rustle up some food. We ain't at for a month. Don't worry, Ma. We'll get some food one of these days. I hope so. I'd like to burp just once more before I die. <laughs> we ain't gonna get that much. <laughs> well, Ada, it's about time for my nap. If I dream of turnips, I'll save you one. Now, Jeter Lester, you get up and go find Ellie May and Dude. I ain't seen them since this morning. Ellie May and Dude? Them's our hogs, ain't they? No, them's our kids. The hogs moved out on us. <laughs> oh, that's right. You know, Ma, that Ellie May is getting to be a mighty pretty gal. And besides that, she's a half-wit. <laughs> yeah, she sure is smart. You know, Pa, I was wondering, if Ellie May is a half-wit, what does that make Dude? I don't know. I never was no good at traction. <laughs> He's very happy, though. Giggles all the time. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello, Skeeter. Hi, yes, Skeeter. Where's Peter? He went to Toledo. Oh. So long, Skeeter. So long, Skeeter. <laughs> hmm. Who is that, Pa? Just a stooge. I'm sick of talking to you. <laughs> hey, Ma, ain't that our son, dude, a coming down the road on his hands and knees? That's him, 18 years old, and he never learned to walk. Well, give the kid a chance. Maybe he never thought of it. <laughs> Hello, son. Hello, Jitter. That's Jeter. The way you shake. Well, by gum and by jello, that's a fine way to talk to your poor old Paul. Where you been? I drove your old car down the village and stole that load of wood that was in the back seat. What'd you get for it? A dollar and a half, including the car. <laughs> True deal, son. I hand over the money. I ain't got it. I bought gasoline with it. Bought gasoline? What good is gasoline after you sold the car? If I knew that, I could walk standing up. <laughs> Why, you... Leave him alone, Pa. At least we got a can of gasoline. Yep. Now, if we just had a lemon, we could have a cocktail party. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, Pa, I saw Banker Wilson down the village, and he said if you ain't got $100 by tonight... He'll send us all to the poorhouse. The poorhouse? What's wrong with that? Go so there, you gotta take a bath. Not me. I've had three baths this year already. Getting caught in the rain don't count. <laughs> Does too. I was chewing soap at the time. <laughs> anyway, where am I going to get a hundred dollars? Say, I got an idea, Ma. Hello, Skeeter. Where you going, Skeeter? Gonna buy a heater. Well, you can get one up the streeter. Street here. I had a reach for that one. <laughs> So long, Skeeter. So long, Skeeter. I got an idea, Ma. If we can only get our daughter Ellie Mae married to some rich fella, our troubles is over. Oh, I'll be glad to marry a rich fella. You're a boy. <laughs> Ma, haven't you never told him what he is? I didn't know. <laughs> Well, he's a boy. He's got long pants. Hey, Paul! Paul, I'm hungry. Now go over to that barrel, son. Help yourself with some ice cream. Thanks. Listen, Jeter, I wish you'd stop feeding our kids cotton. Oh. They know it ain't ice cream. Their gums don't get cold. <laughs> what's the difference? Got vitamins. Say, what's that coming down the road? That's our daughter. Hello, Ellie. Hello, Ma. Boy, is she thin. <laughs> Sit down, Ellie. I want to talk to you. Okay. 
Well, there goes the chair. The only one in this county, too. Well, too bad. Now, listen here, Ellie Mae. We're up against it. The only way out is for you to get married in a hurry. I'm willing, Pa. I chased a man ten miles today. Nice work. I'd have got him, but he took a shot at me. <laughs> they always do. Say, how about you getting married to Twitch Harris? He works at the Wilshire Bowl, and he'd be a good catch for you. Well, tell me, Pa, do you think I'm his type? His type? Ellie Mae, that is a general classification if I ever heard one. <laughs> Hear that, Ma? Ellie may want to know if she was Twitch Harris's type. I'm his type, and I got a mustache. There you are. I tell your daughter, if you play your cards right... Hiya, Jeter! Well, howdy, folks. By gum and by jello, here's Twitch now. Hello, Hello Twitch. Well, howdy, howdy. Howdy. You're looking good, Twitch. I see you got your banjo with you. That ain't my banjo. I just put strings on my jug to fool them revenuers. Well, I'll be doggone. <laughs> Say, Twitch. Have you ever thought of getting married and settling down? Sure, lots of times, but a little bromo in the morning takes care of that. Well, Twitch, you ought to have a wife. Someone to drag you in off the road at night. You're liable to get run over. Well, maybe I ought to get married. What gal you got in mind, Jeep? <laughs> well, there's a few of them around here. First is my daughter, Ellie May. I said Ellie May. Keep a talking, brother. <laughs> Now, hold on, Twitch. Ellie May's a fine gal. She's homelier than a mud fence, but she's a wonderful cook. Who cares? If I marry her, I couldn't eat. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Twitch. Ellie May is very affectionate. Give him a kiss, daughter. Okay. You come near me and I'll straighten your teeth. <laughs> wait a minute. Her teeth don't stick out so far. My hat's hanging on them, ain't it? <laughs> well, that's just plain rudeness. Now, listen here, Twitch. The reason I Hello, want... Skeeter! Hi, you Skeeter. Did you get the heater? Yep, and you can't beat her. That's good. So long, Skeeter. So long, Skeeter. <laughs> now, Twitch, the reason I want you to marry Ellie May is because I need $100 or Banker Wilson's going to take away my land. What you worrying about? You got most of it on you. <laughs> well, that's the last straw. Twitch, Harris, you get off my property. Get well, what's keeping you? Make Ellie May open her mouth. I want my hat back. <laughs> yeah, no, daughter. Hey, Paul, here comes Banker Wilson. Doggone, he's here already for his money. We better hide. Yeah, let's all get behind Ellie May. Oh, take no use. Might as well face it. Hello, Banker Wilson. Nice day, ain't it? Now, listen here, Jeter Lester. I came here for that money, and I'm going to get it. Well, I'll tell you. Tell me nothing. You give me that $8, or I'll throw you out. Eight dollars? I owe you a hundred. Make it eight. I want to tie it in with my anniversary. <laughs> mm, we ain't got eight dollars, Banker Wilson. We ain't got seven dollars. The six. Shucks, we ain't even got five dollars. Have we more? Gosh, no. We ain't been to Cerro's for weeks. <laughs> That's right. Then get going, Jeter. Get off this land. Where are going, Wilson? Come on, more. Come on, Ellie Mae. Hey, dude. Yes, Pa? Get down on your hands and knees. We're a-walking to the poorhouse. <laughs> I sure hate to leave the old place, though. Hello, Skeeter. Hello, old Skeeter. Say, have you got eight dollars you don't need her? Sure. Can I marry your Skeeter? <laughs> Skeeter, she'll be better than that heater. <laughs> Here, Banker Wilson. Here's your eight dollars, and we're a-staying on this land. Thanks, Skeeter. You're welcome, Skeeter. So long, Skeeter. So long, you old bum. <laughs> well, that was it, folks. Our version of Tobacco Road. Play Twitch. <laughs> few months now, along about the end of May or the 1st of June, cherries will be on the market again, and once more we'll be able to enjoy their sweet summery goodness. But why wait until June, when all the rich, delightful refreshment of juicy ripe cherries can be yours right now in a big, red, shimmering mold of fruited cherry jello? 
This grand dessert is an eye-filling, taste-teasing treat that your family will ask for time and time again. And you'll always be glad to make it, too, because it's uh, so easy to prepare. Just dissolve one package of cherry jello in one pint of hot water and chill until slightly thickened. Fold in three-fourths of a cup each of diced orange sections and diced grapefruit sections. Then mold, and there's a mighty swell dessert. A brilliant blend of sweet, juicy oranges, golden grapefruit, and bright crimson cherry jello. So get a package of cherry jello tomorrow and make up this luscious dessert. Cherry jello, like strawberry and raspberry jello, now has a new improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And today you'll find it better than ever, even more distinctive, even more delicious. Try a glistening mold of rich, colorful Jell-O real soon. This is the last number of the 25th program in the current Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Say, Jack. What did I say? The same time. <laughs> you certainly did. The same. <laughs> with you next Sunday night at the same time. Say, Jack. What? You, you know that Fred Allen did Tobacco Road last Wednesday. <laughs> he did? <laughs> well. You don't have to be. Oh. <laughs> you don't have to be jealous, Jack. More money fell out of your shoe than his. Oh. <laughs> I knew I was a better actor. And now, folks, at this time, I want to wish a lot of success to Sam Schlepperman Hearn, who opens at the Palomar Theater in Seattle, Washington, tomorrow. Good luck, Schlepp. Good night, folks. program coming to you from Hollywood, California, starring Jack Benny, with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Way Down Upon the Los Angeles River. <laughs> the delight to the eye, that's Jell-O, and the treat to the taste, that's Jell-O, too. The most attractive dessert you've ever seen. The most luscious dessert you've ever enjoyed. Jell-O's rich, glowing colors make your mouth water just to look at them. And when it comes to flavor, Jell-O is simply unrivaled. In its grand flavor, you enjoy a rich refreshment that reminds you of juicy, ripe fruits fresh from tree or vine. And no other dessert, we believe, can give you such swell, tantalizing goodness or offer you more downright pleasure. So order several packages of Jell-O from your grocer, choosing any or all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, or lime. Incidentally, strawberry, raspberry, and cherry Jell-O are now better than ever. Each has a new improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And the result is a dessert of sheer delight. Treat the family to a rich, shimmering mold of Jell-O tomorrow. upon the Los Angeles River played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, spring has come to Southern California. Birds are twittering in the treetops. Buds are bursting on the branches. All nature is in tune. Yeah, twittering. <laughs> Dennis, go ahead, Don. So without further ado, we would like to show you how a typical gentleman farmer is heralding the arrival of spring. The time early this afternoon. The scene, Jack Benny's backyard. The farmer... Jack Benny. Da 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 da. Rochester, Rochester, hand me those tomato plants. I'll set them out next to the string beans here. Why don't you plant these seeds instead? 
I don't want those. I want tomatoes. But these are mighty appetizing when they reach maturity. Rochester, we've planted enough watermelons. <laughs> That's all you think of, watermelons. We planted more now than we can eat. Then who can eat? Than I can eat. <laughs> now, please remember, this is my garden. There. That's in deep enough. <laughs> you sure look funny in those overalls and that old straw hat. I do look like a farmer in this outfit, don't I? All but the rubber gloves. They're too clinical. <laughs> Well, I've got soft, lovely hands, and I'm going to keep them that way. <laughs> Rochester, uh, go get the hose. I want to water the soil around these plants. I meant to tell you about that. Remember when Mr. Billsley came home the other night after he'd been out celebrating? Uh-huh. Well, he thought the hose was a snake and shot it full of holes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That was a brand new hose. Well, go get it anyway. We can patch it up. Too late now, boss. He mailed it to Frank Buck. <laughs> What? He wants to know what species it is. That's the silliest thing Mr. Billingsley has ever done. You know, I think I've got some of these plants upside down. No, I guess they're all right. Dennis, don't mow so close to the rose bushes. Watch it. I'm almost through, Mr. Benny. Well, keep at it. Now, Dennis, while I think of it, I want you to go over to Claudette Colbert's house first thing in the morning and mow the lawn there. She'll be expecting you. Claudette Colbert? Gosh! And you'll get 35 cents an hour. But gee, Mr. Benny, I'm nuts about her. I couldn't charge her anything. You'll charge the regular rate. <laughs> I'm your agent, and I set the deal. <laughs> so don't worry about it. Okay. Now, let's see. Hey, Rochester, look, uh, look at these mushrooms here. I don't remember planting any mushrooms. Those are toadstools, boss. They're poison. No, no, Rochester, I think they're mushrooms. Go ahead and taste one. I wouldn't eat one of those if you shoved a steak under it. <laughs> oh, what a baby. You know, Rochester, there's an old saying, a coward dies a thousand deaths. A hero dies but one. Yeah, but suppose I eat that thing and find out I'm a hero. <laughs> All right, don't eat it. Who cares? Oh, hello, Rochester. The garden looks lovely. Thanks, Miss Livingston. I see you got the scarecrow up already. This is me, and you know it. <laughs> you buy that package of cucumber seeds like I asked you to? Yes, here you are. They were ten cents. Thanks. Gee, just think, Mary. I'm going to take these little seeds, plant them in the ground, and before you know it, vines will spring up with oodles and oodles of cucumbers on them. Isn't nature wonderful? Yeah. And, Mary, half of those cucumbers are going to be yours. The heck with nature. Give me my dime. <laughs> Give me my dime. Give me my dime. I'll be sorry when the crop comes in. I feel it's going to be a big season. Oh, you're some farmer. You and your crazy experiments. Oh, they're not so crazy. Remember last year? You sprinkled cheese all over the ground and tried to raise all grot and potatoes. <laughs> Sure, I sprinkled cheese. I had an idea. <laughs> oh, what are you giggling about? Every other gardener around here had trouble with potato bugs, but you had mice. <laughs> All right. I still say it doesn't hurt to experiment. In California, is just a place to do it. You know, Mary... I, I only have a little more to go, Mr. Benny. Okay. You know, Mary, I wouldn't laugh if I were you. I might turn out to be another Luther Burbank. Who? Burbank. Luther Burbank. Oh, yeah. They named Glendale after him. They named Burbank after him. <laughs> Burbank, not Glendale. Oh, I guess I didn't analyze it. You certainly didn't. Say, Mary. Hello, Miss Livingston. What's new? Haven't you heard? I just missed being the cucumber queen. Oh, Mary. Well, see you later. Ding, ding. He always plays conductor when he mows the lawn. <laughs> what a kid. You know, Mary, every year when spring comes around, I, I wish I was a kid again. Of course, I'm still full of pep. I feel young. Oh, stop rolling your eyes. I'm not rolling my eyes. I save that little trick for pictures. Now, let's see. Oh, Mary, I was just having a little argument with Rochester. Look. 
Look down there. Are those things, is there mushrooms or toadstools? Those are toadstools. They are? Well, I'm certainly glad you told me. I, I almost ate one. You almost ate one? <laughs> well, I mean, I would have eaten one after you did. With me laying there? <laughs> All right, forget it. I better dig these up and throw them away. Shoo, shoo! Time those chickens. Get out of here. Go, go, go. Whose chickens are they, Jack? What? Whose chickens are they? Oh, Ronald Coleman's. They're always flying over the fence. Chase them back, Rochester. All of them? Yes. <laughs> Yes, all of them. They're young and tender, boss. <laughs> I don't care. They're ruining my garden. I'll chase those chickens back to Mr. Coleman's yard. Every single one of them. But, boss, you're stifling my personality. <laughs> chase them away. Okay. Shoo, shoo. <laughs> Dog, gone. How can I have so much willpower when I'm drooling? <laughs> you, know, Mr., uh, you know, Mary, Mr. Coleman and I are very good friends. I want us to stay that way. Well, I better get these cucumber seeds in. Hey, Jack, here comes one of your writers. Oh, yes, it's about time. We go on the air pretty soon. I haven't even seen the script yet. Well, so you finally got here. Here's the script, Jack, if I do say so myself. <laughs> Thanks. Where's your partner? Bill went to Catalina. Your Bill! <laughs> Eddie must have gone to Catalina. Well, one of us did. <laughs> hmm. Now, let's see. Uh, let's see what you two guys wrote here. Hello, Mary. Hello, Happy. <laughs> I hope it's a play or something. They are... Hey, wait a minute. This is Tobacco Road. We did that last week. This time we're doing it with jokes. <laughs> what? And if they don't laugh tonight, we'll do it again next week. Oh, don't be so stubborn. <laughs> now, look, you run ahead to the studio, and you better have something else written before we get there. Okay, chum. <laughs> I have more trouble with those guys. Well, it's your own fault, Jack. Why don't you fire them? Oh, I can't. You know how soft-hearted I am. And besides, they saw me once at Laguna Beach with a... Well, anyway, they're... <laughs> Anyway, they're just a little tired now. And, uh... Hey, Dennis, we'll be leaving for the studio pretty soon. What are you going to sing on the program? I got a swell number called High on a Windy Hill. Well, go in the house and run over it on the piano. I want to hear it. Okay. Shall I take Mr. Coleman's lawnmower back to him? Never mind. I think he bought another one. <laughs> now, Mary, uh, hand me that trowel. <laughs> hey, Jack. Jack, look what Rochester's got. Well, I'll be darned. Oh, Rochester! Yes, boy! <laughs> what have you got in your arm? All we need is dumplings! <laughs> Put down that chicken! <laughs> I'm warning you for the last time, chase those hands over the fence. Mary, hand me that trowel. Still, oh, 
mercy on me When will I see your face? Why do you just elude me And leave me this lonely space? Oh, into eternity Your love will beckon me I can't forget your voice That calls my Hey, that song was all right, wasn't it, Mary? That should be swell on the show tonight. Uh-huh. I hope I'm planting these cucumbers in the right place. It might be a little too shady for them. Say, Jack, look at that cute little robin over there. He just flew in from Miami Beach. How do you know? He's got a towel from the Roney Plaza. Oh, cut that out. Save that stuff for the program. Say, Rochester, get the car. We'll be leaving for the studio in a few minutes. Yes, sir. Do you want the town car or the deluxe convertible coupe? <laughs> What are you talking about? It's spring. I'm dreaming. Stay in the clouds if you want to, but get the Maxwell. Okay. Well, it's beginning to shape up pretty good. I got cucumbers, tomatoes, string beans. Aren't you going to plant beets this year? No, Rochester makes terrible borscht. <laughs> Anything he can't barbecue, he doesn't put his heart into. Well, let's go. Uh-oh, here comes your border. Oh, yes. I wonder why he's wearing that turban. Uh, hello, Mr. Billingsley. Good afternoon, Mr. Benny. Digging in your garden, I see. <laughs> yes, yes. I uh, thought I'd get started early this year. I, uh, I do hope you plant pistachios. They're delightful. But, Mr. Billingsley, <laughs> pistachios are nuts. Well, who isn't? <laughs> Oh, I didn't... I didn't look at it quite that way. Hmm. Well, goodbye, Mr. Benny. I'm going out for a little stroll. Goodbye. Oh, by the way, Mr. Billingsley, you... You look just like a Hindu. Is that a turban wound around your head? No, that's a bed sheet. I slept like a top last night. <laughs> oh. Well, we've, uh... We've got to uh, run along to the studio. See you later, Mr. Billingsley. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, no, thanks. I never touch it. <laughs> I wish I could figure him out. Oh, well. Come on, ready, boy. Oh, Dennis, come on. We're leaving for the studio. Be right with you, Mr. Benny. You know, it's such a nice day, Rochester. You might have put the top down. It'll go down as soon as we hit a dip. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I got one of those new automatic tops, Mary. Oh, shut up. <laughs> well, what's the matter with you? Relax, kid. Spring is here. Enjoy it like I do. You ought to enjoy it. That's when you stop aching. <laughs> I don't ache in the winter, either. Come on, get in the car, kid. The three of us will sit in the back. Now, before you get in, Dennis, I want you to sign this release. Here, sign on the dotted line. Okay. What release? It's just a formality. Dennis bumped his head in my car the other day, and he's suing me. <laughs> suing you? All I want is ten cents for that bottle of iodine. Isn't that silly? Why don't you settle out of court? Give him half of your cucumbers. <laughs> he won't get anything. I don't like his attitude. Now, get in the car. Get going, Rochester. We haven't much time. Gosh, I don't know what to do on the program tonight. Dennis, would you like to sing the next... Rochester, watch that bump as you go out the driveway. <laughs> Whoops! Where's Dennis? Never mind him. Get off my shoulders. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Drive on, Rochester. <laughs>
us off there at the, uh... Let us off there at the studio entrance. Uh, let's stop here at the drugstore, Jack. I want a sandwich. Sure, we got plenty of time. Okay. Stop here, Rochester. Yes, sir. <laughs> I gotta have those brakes fixed. <laughs> Park the car, Rochester. I'll see you after the broadcast. I was thinking on going down to Central Avenue and taking my girlfriend out for a drive. Okay, but be back in time to pick me up. Yes, sir. So long, boss. <laughs> hmm. Rochester, did you hear that? This is all right, boss. Nobody speak. <laughs> Rochester, what have you got under that front seat? Which seat? The front seat. Well, dog gone if it ain't supper. That's one of Mr. Coleman's chickens. Now, how did that hen get in my car? I know, and she knows, but we ain't talking. You don't have to talk. Now, hand me that hand, and I'll see that Mr. Coleman gets it back. Okay, here you are. See you later. Now, hold still, Chicky. Nothing to be afraid of. Huh? Well, that tops everything. You certainly look silly walking into a drugstore with a chicken in your arms. When I get the studio, I'll put it in a box. Gee, it's crowded in here, isn't it? One tuna fish on whole wheat. One tuna coming up. Hello, Marvin. Hello, Mr. Benny. Where'd you get the chicken? It's not mine. It's Ronald Coleman. Well, that's funny. I've never seen him carry it around. <laughs> Believe me, it's his chicken. Now, give me a chocolate and malted milk, will you? Okay. One chocolate malted milk. One malted with an egg in it. Wait a minute. I don't want an egg in it. Have you looked in the mirror lately? <laughs> Listen, all I want is a plain malted milk. See, uh, I think I'll have the special here. Chop suey and all the tea you can drink. Fifteen cents. Gee, you can get anything at a drugstore now, can't you? Bring her the chop suey, Mervyn. Okay. Hey, Laverne! ping o chong o kung ping song ma ka o ka o la piu ka o Coming up! <laughs> Those boys certainly get in the mood for things, don't they? Huh? You said it. Last Sunday I ordered Swiss steak and they put a watch in it. Oh, they think they're so smart. What do you want, Dennis? I think I'll have the special sandwich. Peanut brittle on whole wheat. You mean you mean peanut butter? No, look, it says right here. Peanut brittle. Oh, that's a misprint, kid. I'll bring you a peanut butter sandwich. Nothing doing. It says peanut brittle here, and that's what I want. <laughs> Now listen. I know my rights. Dennis! <laughs> bring, uh, bring him a glass of milk and a piece of apple pie. Okay. It better have peanuts in it. <laughs> I'm going to knock you right off that stool, kid. Now behave yourself. Here's your chop suey, Mary. Well, what about it, Mervyn? Where's my malted milk? Now, don't get huffy or I'll put a Mickey in it. <laughs> what? One Mickey coming up! <laughs> Isn't that awful? Why do I come in here? Why? You want a meal ticket on a punch board. That's all used up. Come on, fellas, give me a little service, will you? Oh, hiya, Don. Oh, hello, Jack. Say, what in the world are you doing with that chicken? Belongs to Ronald Coleman. Sit down and have a sandwich, Don. Oh, I just finished, thanks. I've got to run back to the studio and go over my commercial. Oh. What do you think of this idea, Jack? Now, in the middle of the program, uh, you get into an argument with me and say, Now, listen, bud. Uh, listen, bud? Yes, then I'll say, Speaking of buds, ladies and gentlemen, spring is here. So why don't you run down to your neighborhood grocer and blossom jello? Blossom jello? <laughs> yes, it sounds like buy some jello. Oh, they'll oh. scream at that. Oh, oh, Blossom, eh? I see. Don, just do a straight commercial and it'll be much better. But, Jack, I think we ought to do one that'll get a laugh. So do I, but this ain't it, brother, believe me. <laughs> now, now, frame something that isn't so complicated. Here's your malted milk, Mr. Benny. It's about time. Hey, Jack, look who just came in. Where? Isn't that the fat girl who was on our program last week? Oh, yes, Heather Noodleman. <laughs> Hello, Miss Noodleman. What's new, kid? No, nothing much. What are you doing around here? I just stopped in for a late breakfast. Oh. Well, what do you have, miss? A leg of lamb and a cup of coffee. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, my goodness. No cream in the coffee. <laughs> A lot that'll help. Yeah. Well, I'm going now, Jack. See you at the studio. Okay, Don. Oh, say, Jack, my new picture, the Roundup, is playing at the Paramount this week. Would you mind mentioning it on the program? Uh, no, no, I'll be glad to. Maybe you can tie it in with spring. Yeah, okay, bud. See you upstairs, Don. Hey, you, where's that leg of lamb? Take it easy, Miss Noodleman. You can't be starving. Gee. How's your malt and milk, Mr. Benny? Very good, Dennis. <laughs> What was, what was that? Hey, Jack, look. Well, I'll be darned. Hmm. Hey, Mervyn, put this egg in my Malta. <laughs> Here. I thought you didn't want an egg. Mary, this is destiny. <laughs> Leave me alone. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Boy, am I low. Feeling bad, eh? Yeah. Same thing, Mervyn. Hey, Laverne, pull Harris together. One bromo coming up. They sure know you, Phil. A bromo for lunch. You know, if you keep this up... Holy smoke, hurry up, Mervyn. I see a chicken on the counter. <laughs> it's a real one. Calm down. Say, Phil... We only got a few minutes here. What numbers are you playing on the program tonight? I don't know. How do I know? Well, don't get mad. I just asked. So. Didn't you rehearse anything? What are you worried about? Everything we play sounds the same, don't it? I know. I but... use your molded milk with an egg in it. That'll be 20 cents. 15 cents. My chicken laid the egg. That's Ronald Coleman's chicken. All right. I'll give the nickel to him. <laughs> now, look, Bud. Hey! And all I'm paying is 15 cents. Jack, Jack, look what time it is. Oh, my goodness, we're on the air in a minute. Come on, Dennis, Phil. Phil, hurry up. Oh, no, hey, up. Okay, Don, we're on the air. The Jell-O program coming to you from Hollywood, California, starring Jack Benny. With Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program. During the seven years this program has been on the air, ladies and gentlemen, I've broadcast hundreds and hundreds of grand Jell-O recipes. Many of you I know from your letters have wished that you might have these recipes in printed form so that you can refer to them whenever you want to. And now we've made this possible. Now you can have these very same radio recipes as we gave them to you on this program gathered together in one of the handiest and most beautiful books you ever saw. You'll find the best of these favorite Jell-O recipes all ready and waiting for you in our big new 48-page dessert recipe book, a lovely picture-filled book that you'll be proud to add to your kitchen library. But wait, that's not all. In addition to these clever Jell-O recipes, this handsome book contains hundreds of recipes for all kinds of other tempting desserts, pastries, puddings, cakes, and cookies. In fact, there are 365 different dessert recipes and suggestions, a brand new dessert for every day in the year. The charming way this beautiful book is illustrated with page after page of bright colored paintings and photographs, well, you simply have to see it to believe it. So send for your copy right away. Just mail 10 cents in coin or stamps to Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. Do it tonight. Remember, all you do is send in 10 cents in coin or stamps. And the address again is Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. <laughs> the last number of the 26th program in the current Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Say, Jack, when are you leaving for Chicago? Tomorrow night, Mary. Hey, what's this about Chicago? I'm going to, uh, Phil, I'm going to appear at a benefit there Wednesday evening for the Greek War Relief at the Civic Opera House. So I'll see you all next Sunday, fellas. And incidentally, I'm going to bring the quiz kids back with me from Chicago. They're going to be on our program next Sunday. Boy, am I going to show them up. Hey, where's my leg of lamb? <laughs> What a voice, all the way from the drugstore. <laughs> Good night, folks. Listen here, folks, and I mean all you men and women who love coffee but are kept awake by the caffeine in ordinary coffee. Why don't you try drinking Sanka coffee and see if you don't sleep better? Sanka coffee has had 97% of the caffeine removed. What's more, Sanka is real coffee. 
Rich, mellow, full-bodied. So start drinking Sanka coffee tomorrow, won't you? Sanka coffee presents We the People over another network every Tuesday night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. 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 The Jello program coming to you from Hollywood, California, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with silver threads among the brass section. <laughs> Welcome as spring, as colorful as an April rainbow. That's Jell-O, one of the gayest, cheeriest desserts you ever laid eyes on. Jell-O's glowing colors offer a rich invitation you simply can't resist. And when you taste its intriguing flavor, you're tasting a flavor that's beyond compare when it comes to downright goodness. Because Jell-O's grand flavor is just as delightful and refreshing as the juicy, ripe fruit itself. Jell-O is one of the easiest desserts to prepare, too. It dissolves instantly in lukewarm water, sets as quick as a wink. So ask your grocer for several packages of Jell-O, choosing any or all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, or lime. By the way, next time you try strawberry, raspberry, or cherry Jell-O, just notice how much better they are than they've ever been before. Each has a new improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And the result is something truly distinctive, really swell. Try a rich, shimmering mold of Jell-O tomorrow. <laughs> that round still the threads among the brass section played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you our master of ceremonies who has just returned from a quick trip to Chicago, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, quick trip is right. I was in Chicago and back before I knew it. 3,600 miles. Oh, that's really traveling. Did you fly, Jack, or did you go by train? I took the train, Don, and you know, that's the first time I've ever been on the Streamliner. You talk about modern design, I never saw anything like it. Take the engine was streamlined, the coaches were streamlined, and the compartments were so compact and narrow. Well, you see, Jack, uh, that's to cut down wind resistance. Everything has to be streamlined. I know, Don, and I'm in favor of it. But when the conductor asked me to tape back my ears, I thought that was going too far. <laughs> After all, how much can they slow the train down? <laughs> but at that, you do save a lot of time. Oh, know? there's no question about it. In fact, the next time I go east, I think I'll take the streamliner myself. With your hips? <laughs> Why, that would spoil the whole effect. Huh? <laughs> After all, Jack, I could do the same as you did and tape my hips back. You could, eh? Well, Don, let me know when you're going to use that much adhesive tape. <laughs> I want to buy some Johnson & Johnson stock. <laughs> That'll really start a boom. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Good to see you. We kind of missed you around here all week. Well, thanks, kid. I'll thanks. bet it was pretty chilly in Chicago, huh? Well, it was for me, Mary. I'm used to this warm California climate, and that cold air sort of got me. My teeth were chattering all the time. Why didn't you put them in your pocket? <laughs> well, there's our little Mary right on schedule. I go all the way to Chicago to appear at a benefit, and you can't even ask me, did they like me? How did I go over? Was I a big hit? I'll ask you, Jack. Were you a big Don, hit? Don, they adored me. <laughs> there were 6,000 people in that Civic Opera House, and when I made my entrance, you'd think that... Oh, let's forget it. Nobody but a conceited ham could describe that ovation. <laughs> now, really, the minute I walked on that stage, the audience screamed. Well, how often do they see a guy with his ears taped back? <laughs> that wasn't the only reason. I've always been a big hit in Chicago. Hiya, Jackson. You back in town? Yep. Well, I was hoping you wouldn't make it. You know, I was going to do a lot of those snappy gags tonight. Oh, you were? Yeah, I had a swell monotone already. That's monologue. <laughs> monotone. I wish you wouldn't correct me all the time, Jackson. It makes people think I don't know big words. Well, you don't. 
Been going to night school for six months now. When are you going to learn something? Don't worry, I'll get there. Romeo wasn't built in a day. <laughs> Oh, fine. Huh? Romeo, yeah. Say, Phil, why don't you ask Jack if he was a big hit in Chicago? Don and I got a face full of it already. Well, I was a hit. What do you want me to do, lie about it? Oh, yeah, you played that big benefit for the Greek War Relief, didn't you? Yes, and it was a swell affair, too. Uh, did you get paid for it? No. No, it was a benefit, Mary. Naturally, I didn't get any money. Uh, did you know that ahead of time? Well, certainly. <laughs> Certainly I did. Of course. Well, didn't you even sell magazines on the train? Oh, quiet. <laughs> and that reminds me, Mary, I want you to stop kidding me about being cheap. Thanks to you, I had the most embarrassing thing happen at the station in Chicago. What was it, Jack? Well, Mary keeps saying I'm cheap so much, people get to believe it. Here's what happened, Don. I got off the train in Chicago carrying four heavy grips, and all the red caps just stood there looking at me. You mean they didn't offer to take your baggage? No, they just stood there. So I said, well, how about it? Will one of you fellows help me or not? Finally, one little red cap came over and said, I'll take your grips, Mr. Benny. Uh-huh. So I said, are you sure you want to? He said, yes, if you can do a benefit, I can. <laughs> So you see, Mary, you're to blame for the whole thing. All right, why don't you buy a second-hand gun, one bullet, and shoot me? That's exactly the kind of remark I'm referring to. Hello, Mr. Benny. Did you have a good time in Chicago? Hmm. You're a little late tonight, aren't you, young man? Yeah. I'm sorry, Dennis, but I'll have to fine you $10. Well, the benefit's over. <laughs> Mary, that's an old established rule on this program. The last one in gets it. I'm sorry, Dennis. Well, it's not my fault, Mr. Benny. I was stuck in a phone booth for ten minutes. Stuck in a phone booth? What do you mean? Well, I was talking to my girl over the phone. Uh-huh. And when I kissed her goodbye, my lips got caught in the mouthpiece. <laughs> well, my goodness, Dennis, as long as your girl wasn't right there, you didn't have to kiss her with so much feeling. Well, she says I'm better over the phone than in person. <laughs> Well, she ought to know. What a kid. Say, Jackson, that reminds me. Did you call up that number I gave you in Chicago? What number? You know, the one I gave you before you left. Mamie Peterson. Oh, yeah. Well, that was a smart trick you pulled on me, Phil. I called her up and her husband answered the phone. That was Mamie. She talks like a man. <laughs> what? You ought to hear her sing asleep in the deep. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, I'm not going to discuss it now, Phil, as we have a long show. Dennis, are you ready for your song? How can I sing with this mouthpiece on? You'll sing. You'll sing. Go ahead. This is some program. Dennis is wearing a mouthpiece. You got tape on your ears, and my clip is showing. Well, pull it up. Sing, Dennis. <laughs> In the night, in the magical light of the moon, knowing how soon night is gone. Ooh, hearts that join in a glance and discover romances are made only to fade with the dawn. So. Mine and my heart was a glow with a power beyond divine. Two hearts have tasted delight. Must they always be lonely? Alas, two hearts. was Two Hearts That Pass in the Night, sung by Dennis Day through a mouthpiece which belongs to the Southern California <laughs> Telephone Company. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as we announced last week, 
For our feature attraction this evening and our cultural contribution of the season, we have with us tonight four youngsters from one of radio's most popular programs, which comes to you every Wednesday night from Chicago, The Quiz Kids. Uh, these, uh, these children are here tonight to match wits with Mary Livingston, Don Wilson, Dennis Day, and Phil Harris. And I will be the quiz master. That is, I will ask the questions. You're picking out a pretty safe job, ain't you, Jackson? <laughs> no, no, that's not it. That's not it at all. Of course not. I can understand Jack's side of it. He's had much more experience in the quiz kids, and naturally he doesn't want to take advantage of them. Certainly. And besides, he's as yellow as a banana. <laughs> Oh, I'm yellow, eh? Well, for your information, Mary, a week from Wednesday, a week from next Wednesday, I am going to be quizzed on the Quiz Kids program. Well, you won't need that tape. They'll pin your ears back. <laughs> oh, quiet. Now, let's see. Where did I put that list of baffling questions? Oh, Mr. Benny. Yes? Do I have to answer some of the questions, too? Yes, Dennis, and I'm depending on you to pull the Jello team through to ultimate victory. Do you think you can do it? Yes, sir. Good. And now, folks... Ultimate? What does that mean? <laughs> oh, fine. That's a nice start we're getting, huh? Don't worry, Jackson. Ask me the tough ones. I'll pull it through to ultimate. That's ultimate victory. <laughs> Phil? That's ultimate victory. Uh, ultimate is an adjective. Why not? <laughs> Well, I'd call this off right now, but the quiz kids came all the way from Chicago. Don, I hope you won't let us down. I'll do my best, Jack. Of course, it's only fair to tell you that in school, I flunked in everything but cooking. I, uh... <laughs> I, uh, I see. Hmm. What's going to happen to us shouldn't happen to Einstein. <laughs> you've, uh, you've got something there, Mary. Oh, well, we'll do the best we can. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this battle of wits will go on immediately after a short number by Phil Harris. And then we will... Hold it a minute. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Rochester, I'm very busy right now. You'll have to call me later. But this is important, boss. Carmichael just came out of hibernation. Carmichael? Why, that's impossible. That polar bear was supposed to sleep in the basement for two more weeks. How did he happen to wake up? Well, the gas man went downstairs to read the meter, and all of a sudden it sounded like feeding time at the zoo. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, what happened to the gas man? I don't know, but I doubt if we get a bill this month. <laughs> now, that's... now, that's just silly. Rochester Carmichael wouldn't hurt a fly. He was just playing, that's all. Yeah, but where's the man? <laughs> Stop being so pessimistic. Now, Carmichael's pretty hungry after sleeping all winter, so the first thing you have to do is give him a big dinner. Well, all we got an icebox and some roast beef. All right, put that on a plate and give it to him. Uh-huh. But uh, don't, uh, don't let him eat too fast. This is his first meal. Second meal, where's the man? <laughs> Forget about the gas man. He must have run away. Now, there's nothing to be afraid of, Rochester. After you feed Carmichael, take him in the bathroom and give him a nice warm bath. Uh-huh. Scrub him good, comb his hair, and brush his teeth. Uh-huh. And then, after you've done that... After I've done what? After you brush his teeth. I forgot to tell you, while I was combing his hair, I fainted. What? Threw some brandy on me. Now, cut that out. And if you're such a baby, I'll take care of the whole thing when I get home. Now, goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? Are you really going to have the quiz kids on your program tonight? Yes, I am. They're supposed to be pretty smart, ain't they? They're brilliant. They know everything. Well, ask them what happened to the gas man. <laughs> Will you forget about that? <laughs> and Goodbye. <laughs> I can't understand why Carmichael got up so early this year. He must have had coffee before going to bed. Play, Phil. I'm sure the gas man got away all right.
uh, that was a very short number played by Phil Harrison as orchestra, and quite enough, believe me. Oh, Gerard, uh, Gerard, are all you children here? Yes, we are, Mr. Benny. Good, good. Well, here we go, folks. The Quiz Kids versus the Jello Kids. And may the best team win. May the better team win. Oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, better. That's right. Just a little... I mispronounced the word there. <laughs> All right. I will now call the roll. First, the quiz kids. Richard. I am Richard Williams. I'm 11 years old, and I'm in the sixth grade at Harrison School, East Chicago, Indiana. Neat cue. You know, folks, that Richard's a whiz at mathematics. Claude? I am Claude Brenner. I'm 12 years old, and I'm a sophomore at Sen High School. Well, I was a sophomore once. <laughs> Yes, sir. I was sharp as a tack. Now you can sit on one and not even feel it. Quiet. Joan? I'm Joan Bishop. I'm 14 years old, and I go to the Chicago School for Adults. Well, oh, she's sweet. You see, Joan knows everything about music. She does, huh? Yes. Fortissimo, kid. Top that. <laughs> Keep out of this, Phil. You don't even know what fortissimo means. Ah, oh, stop, will you? Fortissimo means when you're playing a violin and you pluck on the strings. That's a cadenza. <laughs> Isn't it, Joan? <laughs> no, Mr. Benny. When you pluck the strings, the musical term is pizzicato. Oh, oh, yes, yes, of course. I was thinking of raviola. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's it, Joan. Oh, brother. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll be all right, Joan. Don't worry. Now, who's next? Oh, yes, Gerard. I'm Gerard Darrow. I'm eight years old, and I go to the Bradwell School. Eight years old, yeah. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Jell-O kids. Philip. I'm Philip Harris, and I attend the Hollywood Recreation Bowling Alley. <laughs> Isn't he adorable? Uh, what do you specialize in, Philip? Funny monotones. We know. <laughs> and now, Mary. Mary? I am Mary Livingston. I am six years old, and I graduated from the May Company. <laughs> oh, that's a lovely school. Uh, what did you learn there, Mary? If you worn the stockings, madam, you cannot exchange them. <laughs> Very good. Isn't she bright? Now, Donald. I am Don Wilson. I'm seven years old, and I have eight chins. <laughs> Isn't he a doll? Sit down, Donald, but easy. <laughs> now, Dennis. I am Dennis... Uh, Dennis... Day. Dennis Day. <laughs> Fine chance we've got. How old are you, Dennis? I'll be one in December. <laughs> You'll be one? Yes, my mother's raffling me off. <laughs> I don't blame her. And now, of course, we will proceed with the battle of wits. And I would like to announce that I am personally awarding a prize of $10 to the winning team. That's fair enough. You'll find out. Mary. Now, our first question this evening comes from Miss Edna West of Evanston, Illinois. Listen carefully, Gerard. A coleoptera, a musca domestica, and a lepidoptera were having a bit of a tete-a-tete -tete on a screen door. Now, if you suddenly appeared with a fly swatter, one of the party would leave quite hastily. Who would it be? The Coleoptera, the Musca Domestica, or the Lepidoptera? Wipe your chin. Quiet. <laughs> now, Gerard, have you, have you the answer? Yes, sir. The Musca Domestica had a reason to leave in a hurry because it was the common house fly. Uh -huh. The coleoptria and the lepidoptria shouldn't leave you in a hurry because the coleoptria is the beetle, the lepidoptria is the mob. Very good, Gerard. <laughs> That's one point for the quiz kid. <laughs> now, Dennis, in order to be absolutely fair, I'm going to ask you a question along the same line. Now, listen carefully. What fly would you associate with butter? <laughs> Well, that, that's a little tough, so I'll put it this way. Butter is associated 
With what fly? The butterfly, of course. Gerard, I didn't ask you. <laughs> this question is for the Jell-O kids. Dennis, do you know the answer? No, sir. Mary Livingston. Mary Livingston. The butterfly. Correct. And there's a point for the Jell-O team. <laughs> Both sides are even. Now, let's see. Or is it a bumblebee? The question is over. <laughs> now, here's a problem in mathematics sent in by Miss Catherine Johnston of Los Angeles. I think this is in your department, Richard. I'm ready, Mr. Benny. Now, listen carefully. Two men who earn $450 and $150 a month, respectively, decide to build a house and divide the cost in proportion to their income. Each of these two men has three sons who help with the work, but they cannot work full time. Listen carefully. One works every day, uh, the second every other day, the third every third day, and so on. Are you following, Richard? Yes. Are you? <laughs> Don't worry about me, Bob. <laughs> Now, they, uh, they all work the first day. Get this carefully. They all work the first day and finish the house the second day that they all work together. Each guy has three kids, huh? They'll go away, will you? <laughs> now, Richard, one joint owner, I mean one joint owner... <laughs> had to pay $1,500 more than the other. How much did the house cost and how long did it take to build it? Well, Richard, have you figured out the answer yet? Yes, sir. The house cost $3,000 and it would be 60 days before the house was finished. Excellent. $3,000 and 60 days is correct. How do you know? I trust Richard. <laughs> Now, Dickie boy, will you please, Richard, will you please tell us how you arrived at the 60 days? Well, you fi find the prime factors in each number and multiply them the most times they appear in any one group of numbers. Uh -huh. So that would be mu multiplying 1 by 2 by 2 by 3 by 5. Oh, yeah. If you don't get that prime factor, you're a dead pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Really? You... Oh, you must prime it up, you know. You... If I was Richard, I'd kick you right in the shin. Quiet. Continue, Richard. By multiplying these prime factors together, you get the product of 60, which is the least common multiple of these numbers. Obviously. Very good, Richard. I was afraid you'd miss on that least common multiply. Or multiple. <laughs> and there's another point for the quiz kids making the score two to one. Now, Mary, here's your question. The answer is 15. Wait till I ask you. <laughs> Now, Mary, concentrate. If you had 20 apples and your mother took away five, how many would you have? I give up. You know it's 15. <laughs> the score is now two for the quiz kids and two for the jello kids. <laughs> that was a tough one, Mary, but you, you came through. There's something funny going on around here. <laughs> Gerard. If you don't think that's fair, I'll ask one of the Jell-O team another question. Donald Wilson. Yes, sir? Now, listen carefully. If you are on your way to your neighborhood grocer, and his store was two miles from your house, and you could make it in 17 minutes by rowing a boat across a river, have you got it so far? Uh, how wide is the river? Uh, 350 feet. I see. However, on this particular day, there is a strong current carrying you downstream at the rate of 3.6 miles per hour. So it takes you an extra 23 minutes to reach the grocery store. Now, here's the question. What did you buy when you got there? <laughs> Jello. Absolutely correct. <laughs> now, Don, what flavors of Jello would you purchase? Uh, strawberry, raspberry, uh, cherry. Yes, yes, go on. You say there was a strong current downstream? Yes. Orange, lemon, and lime. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Don, you're a big, fat genius. The score is two to two, and both teams are even. Wait a minute. I demand the recount. Dennis, you're on our side. Oh. <laughs> Remember that. Now, Claude. Yes, sir? Here's a problem in the field of 
ichthyology. Ichthyology? What's that? How do I know? <laughs> now, Claude, name the five subclasses of fish in order of their development and give examples of each. Go ahead, Claude. Authorities differ, but I prefer this setup. Oh, I do. I do, too. <laughs> First come the cyclostomata, which are the lamprey eels and hagfishes. Uh -huh. Next, we find the elasmobranchii, which are the sharks and rays. Mm -hmm. After that, we came up, come upon the gaynoidii, which are the armored fishes, an example of which is the sturgeon. Oh, the sturgeon, yes. I have it quite often, the sturgeon. I, I get it in Lindy's a lot. Right? <laughs> then come the teleostomi, the Oh, the tele, yeah, the tele, yes. <laughs> Of which 90% of the fish world are composed. I see. And last but not least come the dipnoi, which are the lung fishes, of which there are only five species living in the world today. Only five. I thought there were six. Wasn't that funny? <laughs> Very good, sir. Now, Phil Harris, I'm not playing any favorites, so I'm going to ask you a question on the same subject. Are you ready? Yeah. How do you spell fish? Go ahead, fish. F-I-F-C-H. <laughs> That's right, Joe Fish. I know him well. <laughs> That's three points for each side. Both teams are even. Isn't it wonderful how we're running neck and neck? I'm sorry, I know you. Quiet. And now for the final question, and this is the toughest one of all. Joan Bishop. Yes, Mr. Benny? I understand you're an authority in the field of music. That is, you can identify any number played, whether classical or popular. Is that correct? Well, I think I can. You can. That's your specialty. Now, Mr. Harris and his orchestra will play a few bars of a musical selection. Now, Joan, I won't tell you whether it's classical or popular, but see if you can identify this melody. The kid ain't got a chance. <laughs> we shall see. Go ahead, Phil. <laughs> That's enough, boys. All right. All right, Joan. What's the title of that number? Oh, I'm sure I don't know. Hmm. Well, is it popular or classical? I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> oh, you haven't. Well, Joan, would you like to hear that melody again? Well, I'm afraid that won't help. <laughs> Aha! We stumped one of the quiz kids. Here's your chance, yellow kid. Phil Harris, what was the name of it? I don't know. Hey, Eddie, what was the name of that song? I don't know. Hey, Phil, what was the name of that song? I don't know. Hey, say... Never mind. The name of that song is There I Go, and the Jello Kids win four to three. <laughs> Congratulations. Tough luck, quiz kid, but you lost fair and square. Play, Phil. <laughs> the prominent citizen arrived in town today to be with us for the Easter holidays. He's... Mr. Easter Rabbit himself. In interviewing him for this program, we asked Mr. Rabbit, what's the good word? And he replied, the good word, my friends, is jello. And confidentially, you might tell your listeners that a swell dessert for Easter would be a creamy jello parfait. A swell dessert, ladies and gentlemen, and I might add, an easy one to bake, too. Simply prepare one package each of strawberry jello and jello's grand vanilla pudding as directed on the boxes. While the jello is chilling, turn the pudding into parfait glasses, filling them about two-thirds full, and then chill. When the jello is slightly thickened, pour it over the pudding and chill until both are firm. The result will be a gloriously creamy, delightfully refreshing dessert. So get a package of strawberry jello tomorrow and blend it with a package of jello vanilla pudding for the best Easter dessert you ever tasted. Creamy jello parfait. We're a little late, so good night, folks. <laughs> this is the National Broadcasting Company. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Wyoming, Why Do You Begin With W? <laughs>
comes to gay, colorful beauty, ladies and gentlemen, the flowers that bloom in the spring certainly have a real rival in Jell-O. Jell-O is one of the most attractive, most inviting desserts you can possibly serve. It fairly glistens with goodness, shining and shimmering with a rich, lustrous look all its own. And Jell-O's bright, glowing colors are a joy just to behold. As for flavor, well, Jell-O's flavor is simply irresistible, as delightful and refreshing as the juicy, ripe fruit itself. And Jell-O is pleasantly inexpensive, pleasantly easy to make. So enjoy this swell treat real soon in all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Be especially sure to try strawberry, raspberry, and cherry Jell-O, because each has a new, improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And that means a new, distinctive goodness, something really fine. Make up a luscious mold of rich, radiant Jell-O tomorrow. Wyoming, why do you begin with W, played by the orchestra? And now, ladies and gentlemen, once again, I bring you our master of ceremonies, a man who last Sunday night refereed that famous battle of wits between the quiz kids of Chicago and the jealous... Hold it, Don, hold it. Mary just called up and said that Jackson won't be here tonight. Well, why not? Well, he's worried to death about his appearance on that quiz kids show next Wednesday night. He's home studying, so he'll be as smart as they are. He should live so long. You said it, Dennis. You know, them kids is mental giants. Why, even I'd be afraid to go on their program. No kidding. Well, Jack is taking this pretty seriously. I understand he even had Mary over to his house all day yesterday asking him questions. That's all that's on his mind. The quiz kids. Questions, answers, questions, answers. I think it's most important. What a mess. I can't get over it. If my father told me once, he told me a thousand times. <laughs> Go to college, learn something. But no, I had to get into vaudeville. Jack, concentrate. Have you got the answer to this question yet? Hmm. I can name you every vaudeville theater in the country. I even know the first name of every one of Fink's mules. From Bessie to Jerome. <laughs> but will they ask me that next Wednesday? No. Oh, quit beefing. Do you know the answer to this question or not? No, what is it? Fourteen ninety-two. <laughs> Holy smoke, was it that long ago? All right, Mary, ask me another one. Okay, here's an easy one. What's the Taj Mahal? An auto court on Ventura Boulevard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, the Taj Mahal is in India. And it's one of the seven wonders of the world. Oh. See, I'm dumb. I guess I don't know anything, do I? Well, let's keep on anyway. Here's another question. Name the president of the United States whose likeness appears on a $20 bill. A $20 bill? I don't know. Well, go up and look in your mattress. <laughs> oh, stop, will you? Say, I wonder if the quiz kids know anything about the Taj Mahal. I'll have to ask them after dinner. After dinner? Yeah, didn't I tell you, Mary? You know, I'm so nuts about those kids, I invited three of them to stay here at my house. I just couldn't let them go to a hotel. Oh, Rochester. Yes, boss? Uh, where are the quiz kids? Well, Richard and Gerard are in the backyard discussing anthropology. <laughs> anthropology, eh? Well, did you hide in the bushes and make notes of what they said? Like I told you to? Yes, sir. And say, boss. What? Did you know I'm not a Caucasian? <laughs> no, but if they say so, it's right. Now, where's the, uh, where's the other boy, Claude? He's in the library reading Shakespeare. Shakespeare? Well, I'm going to have a tough enough Wednesday night without him pulling that on me. Go in the library and see if you can mix him up. Mix him up? Yes. I tried to, and he said, Oh, fellow, don't mess around. <laughs> Gazooks, I'm cooked. Well, at least find out what he's reading, and I'll read the same thing. See you later. Okay, boss. Parting is such sweet song. Get out of here. <laughs> 
Hmm. Say, Jack, here's a question in American history they might ask you. A lot of good that'll do. All I know is show business and vaudeville theaters. Go ahead, anyway. Uh, what city is on an island that was purchased from the Indians for $24? What city is on an island that was... Let's see. I'll give you a clue. Where's the Roxy Theater? New York. New York is the answer. <laughs> I got that one right. You know, Mary, I might do pretty well against those quiz kids Wednesday night. Oh, sure. All I need is a little hint now and then. A big hint would throw you. <laughs> no, I don't know about that. Well, that's enough for now, Mary. I'm going to the library and talk to Claude. See you later. Now, let's see. The Taj Mahal is in New York, and it was built in 1492. I must remember that. And then a... Whoops! Rochester, what are you doing at that keyhole? Bend down here, boss, and take a look at Claude. Now, what's he doing? That boy's got Shakespeare in one hand, H.G. Wells in the other, and his forehead ain't even wrinkled. <laughs> well, I'm going in there and talk to him. Meanwhile, Rochester, why don't you get Richard and Gerard and take him down in the basement to see Carmichael? I better not, boss. That bear's been in a mean mood ever since he came out of hibernation last week. Oh, nonsense. Carmichael's as gentle as a lamb. Then what happened to the gas man? <laughs> Will you stop worrying about the gas man? He probably went downstairs, read the meter, and walked out the basement door. Well, we know he went downstairs, and we know he read the meter. Uh-huh. But walking out that basement door ought to pay fantastic odds. <laughs> oh, don't be so pessimistic. Now, take, uh, take Richard and Gerard down to see Carmichael. I'm going in and talk to Claude. Well... How's my little man this evening? Fine, thank you, Mr. Benny. Good, good. I see you're studying up on the immortal bard. That's Shakespeare, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, uh, how are you coming along? Very well. I'm memorizing Hamlet. Mem memorizing? <laughs> well, look, Claude. Uh, Claude, I want to ask a little favor of you. It's nothing much, but it might help me out. What is it, Mr. Benny? Well... When I appear on your program, I wish you and the rest of the kids would kind of take it easy and miss on a few questions. Miss? Yes. Now, I wouldn't ask you any favors, Claude, but you see, when I was a child back in Waukegan, I was kind of a poor kid, and I didn't have any books or much of an opportunity to learn anything. Huh? Well, didn't they have a library in Waukegan? Yes, Claude, but you had to walk up three flights of steps to get there. <laughs> I was such a weak, sickly child, I, I didn't have the strength to climb those steps. Eh? Well, didn't you have any friends who could go to the library and get a book for you? No, Claude. Everybody hated me. <laughs> <laughs> they... They used to call me Mouse Face. <laughs> so you see... So you see, Claudie boy, if you'll, just, if you'll just give your Uncle Jackie a break Wednesday night, you'll be doing me a great favor. Well, I'd like to, Mr. Benny, but I'm afraid that wouldn't be ethical. Oh. We must answer the questions if we know them. Hmm. All right, kid. If it's a battle you want, let's go. What's the Taj Mahal? The Taj Mahal is a white marble mausoleum which was built at Agra, mm -hmm. India, by the Shah Jahan as a monument for his favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal. Oh, yes, Mumtaz. <laughs> it took 20,000 men 22 years to construct That's this enough, temple. Claude. You know it all right. And let me tell you something. As long as you're so ethical, I'm going back and study my books, too. But, Mr. Benny, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. You didn't, eh? Well, before I go, kid, here's one that'll stump you. Answer this. Who was the manager of the Penn Theater in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania? <laughs> come on, come on. What's, what's his name? I'm sure I don't know. Johnny Galvin, that's who. <laughs> Think it over, kid. <laughs> that burns me up. I invite him to the house. He can't do me one little favor. It has to be ethical. What kills me at dinner tonight, that kid will probably have four helpings of mashed potatoes. He eats like a horse. 
Who eats like a horse? Claude. He won't even cooperate with me. Did you pull mouth face on him? Not only that, I had tears in my eyes. Oh, well. Ask me some more questions, Mary. Okay. I got him on that Johnny Galvin, though. You should have seen his face, Mary. I'll bet. Here's a good one, Jack. Name the states that border the Mississippi River. The Mississippi? Let's see. There's Missouri, Tennessee, Louisiana, and then there's Idaho. No, that's wrong. No, no, I know. Alabama. You know, Mary, one time I played Mobile, Alabama. And then there's uh, Kentucky. I guess that's about all. Ask me another question. Okay. Here's one in spelling. How do you spell physiotherapy? What? Physiotherapy. Physiotherapy? Let's see. Capital F. I Z. Never mind. Spell cat. Wait a minute. I'm not through with physiotherapy yet. I am, and I'm sick of you, too. The fine attitude. Well, I've got a headache again. Come on, Mary. Let's go out in the yard and see what Richard and Gerard are doing. Okay. Burns me up. Why'd I ever accept that invitation to go on their program? I wouldn't mind being stupid, but I've got gray hair. <laughs> oh, well, this is only Saturday. I still got four days to study. Yeah, why worry? You might get run over before Wednesday. With my luck, they'd broadcast from the hospital. Where are you going, Rochester? I'm going out in the kitchen and fix dinner. Well, did you take the children downstairs to see Carmichael? Boss, I don't think I ought to take those kids near that polar bear. Now, listen, Rochester, if you're so worried about what happened to the gas man, for goodness sake, call up the gas company. I did call the gas company. What did they say? Where's the man? <laughs> oh, you're as crazy as Mr. Billingsley. Now, call us as soon as dinner is ready. I'll be with Gerard and Richard. Physiotherapy. I hope I can... Oh, there they are. See, those kids are cute. Yeah. Let's sneak over and hear what they're talking about. Every little bit helps. Say, Richard, hasn't Mr. Benny got a nice house? He certainly has. But you know, Gerard, I think we're paying as much here as we would at a hotel. <laughs> Why, Jack Benny, so that's why you put that sign out front Beverly Hills Tourist Haven. I just did that for a gag. Well, hello, Gerard. Richard? Hello, Mr. Benny. Are you still worrying about next Wednesday night? No, no, no. I, I've been studying like a little demon, and I expect to be very good on your program. I hope so, Mr. Benny. We like you. We sure do. Well, that's good. You know, kids, I didn't intend to bring this up, but... When I was a child, your age... Uh-oh. Mary. I had, a, I had a stand on the street corner selling newspapers when I should have been in school. I mean, what chance did I have to study? Well, why didn't you read the newspapers? <laughs> my, my eyes were bad. <laughs> I tell you, kids, I used to stand there on the street corner barefooted. Get your paper here, I'd say. Extra. Extra. Dewey takes vanilla. <laughs> oh, stop. Anyway, kids, if I miss on some of the questions Wednesday night, you miss some of them too, will you? But, Mr. Benny, we don't know what the questions are until they ask us. I know, but, Richard, whatever they do ask you, miss a few, just, just as a favor to me. That wouldn't be ethical. <laughs> ethical, schmethical, that's all I hear. <laughs> How would you kids like it if I raised your rent? Now, look, fellas, I don't like to get tough. But hey, let's... Jack, look who's coming. Oh, yeah. Pardon me, kids. Uh, good evening, Mr. Billingsley. Good evening, Mr. Benny. Playing with the kiddies, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we're having a lot of fun. They're adorable little rascals. 
Very brilliant, too. Yes, I know. I asked one of them to look at my watch this morning, and he told me the exact time. Your watch? Well, what's so difficult about that? The hands have mittens on them. <laughs> oh. Oh, I see. Well, look, Mr. Billingsley, if the hands are covered, how do you tell time? Oh, I always go by the stars. You can't miss that way. The stars? Well, that's a good system at night, but uh, what do you do during the day? I'm a busboy at the Brown Derby. <laughs> oh, hmm. Well, I can see we're not getting any place, so let's discuss this later. Shall we, Mr. Billingsley? Yes. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. Goodbye. Oh, I wouldn't dare. <laughs> Can't understand that guy. <laughs> now, kids, getting back to hey, the. Claude, get us ready. Okay, Rochester, go get Claude. Come on, Mary. Come on, Richard, Gerard. Oh boy, food. Gee, I'm hungry. Well, we've got a nice dinner prepared for you: roast duck and everything. You know, kids, there was one thing I forgot to tell you about my childhood. You know, there was a public library in my hometown, but you had to climb three flights of steps to get there. And I was so weak and frail that as much as I wanted an education. <laughs> I'm full. Well, kids, didn't Uncle Jackie give you a nice dinner tonight? Yes, Mr. Benny. I'm glad you liked it. I certainly enjoyed that Marilla Kalaris. Oh, it was sent... I beg your pardon? <laughs> Marilla Kalaris? Uh, what's that, Gerard? That's the Latin word for duck. Oh, oh, the roast duck. The Latin word, yes, it was delicious. I thought the mashed potatoes were a little too lumpy. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, don't be funny. Well, kids, Uncle Jackie's pretty tired from studying all day, so if you don't mind, I think I'll go up to bed. See you in the morning, everybody. Oh, well, Mr. Benny, do you want me to tell you a story again tonight? No. <laughs> no, no, thank you, Richard, thank you. I'll fall asleep all right. Well, good night, kids. Good night, good night Mr. Benny. Benny. Good night, Mary. Good night, Jack, and for heaven's sake, stop worrying. I'm not worried. Say, Rochester, go upstairs and turn down my bed, will you? Okay, boss. I'll answer the door. Marilla Calaris. Amazing how that little child knew that. Huh? Uh, good evening. Good evening. Say, mister, my wife and I'd like to rent a room. A room? Yes, we were driving by and saw your sign. We're on our honeymoon. Oh, that sign, Beverly Hills Tourist Haven. Well, I, I just put that up for a gag. I really have no rooms for rent. Show him the license, Homer. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, uh... <laughs> no, I really haven't any vacancies. I'm sorry. Okay, come on, Sam. <laughs> Sam, that must be short for Blanche. <laughs> well... I might as well hit the hay. Now, let's see. Physiotherapy is the Latin word for duck. No, that's not it. Oh, well, I'll probably think of it in the morning. Well, good night, Rochester. Tomorrow's Sunday, and it's my busy day, so wake me up early, will you? Yes, sir. Boy, am I tired. It's been a tough day for me, all right. Gee, this bed feels good. I wonder if I ought to look now and see whose picture is on a $20 bill. (laughs) 
Now, no, I'll, I'll wait till morning. You better take your clothes off, boss. You're liable to fall asleep that way. I'll just rest for a few minutes and take them off later. Good night, Rochester. Good night, boss. I left your chin strap on the dresser. Thanks. Oh, boy, am I all in. Questions, answers. I don't know why I ever got into this mess. Taj Mahal. Imagine it took 22 men, 20,000 years to build it. No, that can't be it. Must have been 20,000 men. Can't get over that little kid knowing all about it. Physiotherapy. I never saw kids with so much. Here they are, the Quiz Kids, presented every Wednesday night by the makers of Alka Seltzer. Hey, look at all those people. Well, I just have to do the best I can. I will now call the roll. Jackie? I am Jackie Benny. I am nine years old. And I attend the Taj Mahal School in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. I'm ready, sir. William? I am William Shakespeare. I am seven years old, and I go to the King Lear School in Hamlet, Indiana. Shakespeare? Gee, he ought to know all about Shakespeare. What chance have I got? Isaac? I am Sir Isaac Newton. I am four years old, and I discovered the law of gravy. <laughs> That's gravity. Hey, mister, Phil got that wrong. I mean, Sir Isaac. Gee, he looks like Phil. And now, Lady? I am Lady Godiva. Lady Godiva? I am 12 years old, and I'm riding at Bay Meadows. <laughs> oh, boy. I pity the horse. Well, let's get going with the question. Did Uncle Jackie give you a nice dinner tonight? Yes, Mr. Benny. 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 <laughs> The score is now Quiz Kids, 1492, Benny Nothing. Hey, I better get going here. Now, William Shakespeare. Yes, sir. Finish the quotation, to be or not to be. Hey, I know that one, but I haven't any vacant room. Show them the license, Homer. To be or not to be. To be or not to be, that is the question. And the answer is Jell-O, America's favorite gelatin dessert. That's Don. Don Wilson. It is not only economical and easy to make, but comes in six delicious flavors. Oh, it's not. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and morella calaris. Gee, that must be the Latin word for lime. So look for the big red letters on the duck. Darn it. That's another question I missed. Hey, mister, ask me something. I know lots of answers. All right, Jack Benny. Here's a question for you. <laughs> Gee, if you had a farm of 22,000 acres, and on this farm you planted library steps... Library steps? Yes. And each of these farmers had three sons, but the fifth son could only work every eighth day. And the seventh... Son... Wait a minute. Wait a... Wait a minute. Now, here's the question. How wide is the river? What? What river? The Taj Mahal. <laughs> the Taj Mahal? What are you talking about? Are you crazy? Who are you? I am the gas man. <laughs> I am 32 years old, and I'm wearing a white fur coat. Oh, my goodness, he's inside a car, Michael. Correct. One point for Rochester Van Jones. You keep out of this. Come on, Jackie. Are you going to answer the question or not? How wide is the river? <laughs> Let's see. 22,000 acres of library steps. i got to find the prime factor in the least common multiple. Well? Do you know the answer or not? Give me a chance, will you? Let him have it, Chief. We'll beat it out of him. I'll get it. I'll get it. You better get it or you'll get the electric chair. The electric chair? No, no, I didn't do it, I tell you. I didn't do it. The electric chair? <laughs> Mary, what are you laughing at? Who discovered electricity? Benjamin Franklin, but I'm sorry. Hey, mister, I've got the answer. The river is... 
Take it easy, Sam. <laughs> I know. I know the width of that river. The river is... He doesn't know. He doesn't know. He doesn't no. know. He doesn't know. Mouth face. Mouth face. I know it. Mouth face. Please, fellas, give me a chance. Wrap him down, men. Off with his head. Let me out of here. Let me out of this chair. I know the answer. The river is... Boss, boss, wake up. The river is 300 and... Boss, what's the matter with you? Wake up. Rochester, get away from me. I've got the answer. Boss, wake up. You've been dreaming. The river is... What? You've had a nightmare, boss. Wake up. A nightmare? Oh. Well, gee whiz. Wow, what I've just been through. You know, Rochester, I just dreamt I was in the Quiz Kids program, and I didn't know the answers. Did you have to dream that? <laughs> Thank heaven it was only a dream. Hand me that chin strap, Rochester. I want to look nice for my new picture. Here you are. Good night, boss. Good night, Rochester. <laughs> Friends, when you receive your copy of General Foods' new dessert recipe book, I bet the very first thing you'll say is, what a beauty, because it certainly is one of the most attractive books you ever saw. Just take the cover itself. Front and back, it's one big, beautiful picture, showing almost two dozen different luscious desserts in a vivid pattern of reds, blues, yellow, pinks, and every other color you can think of. And when you look inside this lovely book, you'll be practically dazzled by the sight of so many rich, glowing color photographs and paintings. And then you'll see that the whole book is crowded with what strikes you as the world's cleverest and most enticing recipes. Recipes for every dessert under the sun. Pies, cakes, cookies, Bavarians, ice creams, and, well, just simply everything. 365 different dessert recipes and suggestions of all kinds. A brand new dessert for every day in the year. So, friends, be sure to write for your copy. All you have to do is mail 10 cents in coin or stamps to Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. That's all, just 10 cents. And remember the address, Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. Send for your copy today. Hurry, 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 Hey, hurry, say, say, hurry. wait a minute, wait a minute, Frank. Hurry. Frank Bingham, what's all this hurry about? Is there a circus in town? Well, it is circus time, Don. But what I'm telling the folks to hurry about is to hurry and try Jell-O puddings. Those new, creamy, ready-prepared puddings that bear the Jell-O name. Like Jell-O, Jell-O puddings are topped for quality and unsurpassed for rich, delightful flavor. And like Jell-O, Jell-O puddings are easy to make. To prepare them, you simply add milk, cook until thickened, and then cool. And what a grand, mellow flavor. Jell-O puddings sell for the same low cost as Jell-O, too. And you can have your choice of three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. Start in tomorrow to enjoy the tempting goodness of smooth, creamy Jell-O puddings. Remember, when you go to your grocers for Jell-O, be sure to get Jell-O puddings. Hurry, 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 hurry. This is the last number of the 28th program in the current Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Now I want to take this opportunity of thanking the makers of Alka-Seltzer, Lewis Cowan, and the Quiz Kids for their splendid cooperation on tonight's program. And folks, if you think I had a nightmare tonight, listen in Wednesday. Those kids will... Mo this is the National Broadcasting Company. No, no, Mary, I've made up my mind. I am not going into that studio and broadcast tonight. Oh, Jack, let's not stand out here in the hall arguing. Everybody's looking at us. Let them look. If you think I can do a show tonight after making a monkey out of myself on that Quiz Kids program, you're crazy. That was Wednesday. People have forgotten all about it. Oh, they have, eh? And besides, you're a comedian. You're not supposed to have any brains. <laughs> oh, you're just trying to make me feel good. There I was with those little kids, and I, I couldn't answer one question. And me, 34 years old. <laughs> I, 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 I couldn't even answer a simple question like, where's the Taj Mahal? You could have built the Taj Mahal since you were 34. <laughs> Go ahead, rub it in. What a blunder. After all the years I spent in showbiz, I had to stick my neck out and ruin everything. Oh, well... That's life for you. Pardon me, Mr. Benny. May I have your autograph? You don't want my autograph, girlie. I'm washed up. 
Thanks, just the same. Oh, Jack, you have to dramatize everything. I do, eh? Supposing you did miss on a few questions. You're not supposed to be Einstein. I'm not supposed to be Phil Harris, either. (laughs) (laughs) My goodness. My my cousin Boo Boo would have been as good as I was on that program. And all he knows is... I tell you, I tell you, Mary, I'm not going on the air tonight. Oh, for heaven's sake. If you're so ashamed of yourself, why don't you go out and join the Foreign Legion? You might think that's a gag, Mary, but the Foreign Legion isn't such a bad idea. I can't get over it. Imagine not getting that one question about the Taj Mahal. I knew the answer, but I opened my mouth and nothing came out. Not only that, a fly came in. <laughs> Oh, well. Nothing I can do about it now. Jack! Jack, hurry up. The program starts in 30 seconds. Well, I won't be on it. Now, Jack Benny, stop acting like a big baby. He'll be right in, Don. Mary, I'm not going... Stop pulling me! Mary, let go my arm! Come on, Jack. Remember, you're a trooper. A what? Oh, yes, that's right. Once a trooper, always a trooper. The show must go on. Quiet, Jack. We're on the air. Okay. Gee, I hope I'm good tonight. J E L L O. The Jell O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with The Vine Street Viggle. <laughs> Every housewife knows that in cooking and baking, you get the best results if you follow specific recipes instead of just guessing at the measurements and ingredients. And it certainly pays to be very specific, certainly pays to be very specific when you're ordering the foods that go into those recipes. That's why it's always a wise thing to ask for Jell-O whenever you're buying a gelatin dessert. If you ask for this swell dessert by name, you can be sure of getting every single time all those good things that Jell-O has come to stand for. You'll get Jell-O's brilliant colors that always look so gay and inviting. And you'll get Jell-O's grand, distinctive flavor. A flavor as refreshing as the juicy, ripe fruit itself. The very ultimate in rich dessert enjoyment. So when you ask for any of those famous six delicious flavors, remember, ladies and gentlemen, to specify the name Jell-O. Jell-O is a trademark, the property of General Foods. And those big red letters on the box tell you that here's a mighty delightful treat. America's favorite gelatin dessert... Jello. Street Viggle, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we bring you one of the most brilliant minds in America today. A man whose meek and humble appearance conceals the brain of a genius. A man who appeared on the Quiz Kids program Wednesday night and didn't know the Taj Mahal from the Empire State Building, Jack Benny. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And Don, I can't blame you for ribbing me tonight. Those quiz kids really gave me the old one, too. I was never so humiliated in my life. Well, I wouldn't take it so hard. After all, Jack, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Oh, it isn't, eh? Well, let me tell you something, Don. Everybody's snubbing me. I met Barney Dean on the street the other day, and he wouldn't even speak to me. Barney Dean? Who's he? Just throw a cigar away in front of the Regent Hotel. You'll find out. <laughs> can't understand it. We've always been such good friends. Well, that's the way it goes. But I'm not complaining, Don. I had it coming to me after that showing I made Wednesday night. 
I can take it, though. You can take it? Yes. Then why did you try to hang yourself Thursday morning? <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, I was hanging up a little laundry. I fell off the ladder and got tangled in the clothesline. That's all. Then explain that note you left. Farewell, cruel world. <laughs> oh, that must have fallen out of my scrapbook. That's a note I wrote one time when Clara Bow wouldn't go out with me. <laughs> She got mad because my garter got caught in her wristwatch during a Charleston contest. <laughs> we, we were disqualified. Anyway, Don, when Mary saw me, I was just hanging up a few socks. On Thursday? I thought you always did your washing on Monday. I couldn't do it Monday. I gave a reception for Lady Mendel. <laughs> What do you want me to do, ask her to run the ringer? She came over to my house to meet the quiz kids. Then why didn't you do your laundry Tuesday? You know darn well that Tuesday is my day to go out and catch dogs in Beverly Hills. <laughs> I was elected to the office, and it's my duty. Now, oh. oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Say, I heard you on the quiz kids program last week. Oh, did you? Yeah, you sure were Smart? Smart? I didn't even open my mouth. That's what I mean. Don't talk, brother, unless you've got a lawyer with you. <laughs> hmm. You're a little mixed up, Dennis, but thanks anyway. You know, Mr. Benny, when I was eight years old, I was just as bright as any one of those quiz kids. You were? Yeah. What happened to me? <laughs> I'm sure I don't know. Some say one thing and some say another. Well, don't... Don't worry about it. You've got a... Don't worry about it, Dennis. You've got a good voice. What more do you want? You know, Don, as a rule, I'm pretty hard-boiled, but even though those quiz kids made me look like a nickel, I can't help liking them. They're... They're so sweet and unspoiled. By the way, Jack, are they still living at your house? Uh, yes, Don, but they're leaving tonight. They better check out before 6 o'clock or they'll be hooked for another day. <laughs> Listen, Mary, at a lot of hotels, the guests have to, cut, uh, to, to be out by noon. So don't run down the Beverly Hills Tourist Haven. <laughs> Rotary Club every Wednesday. I thought the campfire girls met on Wednesday. <laughs> Only in the winter. <laughs> but honestly, fellas, those kids really made a hit with me. Gosh, they were wonderful company. I may be a bit sentimental, but I don't know. I'm going to miss the patter of little feet running around the house. It'll be so quiet. Why don't you put shoes on the mice? <laughs> oh, stop. No use being sentimental around here. Say, Dennis. Yes, please? As long as Phil isn't here yet, how about your song? What's it going to be? I'm going to sing a brand new number called Once Upon a Summertime. And this is the first time it's ever been done on the air. Well, a newie, eh? Huh? Let's hear it, Dennis. Okay. Hold it a minute. Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. Take it, Mary. Wait a minute, buddy. Here's a dime for you. Oh, goody. Now I get my curls out of hock. <laughs> That's all that zombie needs is curls. <laughs> Say, Jack, huh. this wire's from Waukegan. Oh, from home, eh? Yeah, it says, uh, you certainly disgrace the family on the Quiz Kids program. Personally, I'm disgusted with you. Disgusted with me? Who's that from? Cousin Boo-Boo. <laughs> well, how did Boo-Boo ever find out about telegrams? He must have seen the picture, Western Union. Sing, Dennis. <laughs> The story I'm about to tell isn't very new. A lot of people know it well. Now I know it too. It's a load off my heart, nothing more. So don't stop me if you've heard this one before. Once upon a Summertime, not so long ago, there were two in a love affair. One of them didn't care. What happened, I'll never know. For once 
upon a winter time. This affair turned cold, and because of a change of heart, this story had to be told. It lasted through September, October, and November, and I still I love some other time I'll know what to do I'll find someone who loves me through summer and winter time too through summer and Once Upon a Summertime, written by Jack Brooks and Norman Barons, and sung by Dennis Day. And Dennis, that was not only a great number, but your voice was really heavenly. It was positively ethereal. All right, Don. Ethereal. Oh, Jack, it's so ridiculous. <laughs> Don, Dennis's voice was positively ethereal. Now go ahead. Oh, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, the next time you're in the market for a real treat, be sure to buy a package of Jell-O. Keep going. Remember, folks, Jell-O is not ethereal, it's a dessert. <laughs> there. But what does it mean? I don't get it. Don, ethereal is a pun on the word cereal. Jell-O is not ethereal. Now continue, this is the cute part. Okay. Why don't you run down to your neighborhood grother and ask him for any one of the thick, delicious flavors? <laughs> Keep going, Don. Oh, this is so silly. <laughs> Don! So look for the big red leathers on the box. Don, you jack Benny, I'm going home. What? Well, I'll be darned, he left. I must have wounded his big fat vanity. So temperamental lately. Well, I don't blame him. Did you write that commercial, Jack? Yes. Well, I thoroughly stunk. <laughs> Mary, those are all clever ideas and should be tried out. You know, I've got a marvelous one for next week. Look, as soon as Dennis, uh, Dennis finishes his song, we'll... Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. What's the matter with Don? I've just seen him walking down the hall. Oh, he's mad at me. The guy's screwy. I said hello to him and he says, I'm thick of you, too. <laughs> He, uh, he did, eh? Yeah, you know, the guy was lipsing. That's lisping. <laughs> Not lipsing. Well, he did it with his lips. <laughs> I don't care what he did it with, the word is lisping. All right, have it your way. Hiya, Mary. Hello, Phil. Say, Phil, how are you and the boys going over at the Paramount Theater? Mary, we're all right. You ought to hear the laugh I get with my gags. I can imagine. Get this one, Jackson. When I first walk out on the stage, I say to my guitar player, I say, uh, Hey, Frankie, who was that lady I seen you with last night? Uh-huh. And before he can answer, I hit him right in the kitchen with a blueberry pie. <laughs> hmm. Why, Phil Harris, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Throwing a pie in a guy's face is the oldest comedy bit in show business. With blueberry? You're thinking of custard. <laughs> Oh, I see. You you modernized it, huh? You know, I can't imagine people laughing at that kind of stuff nowadays. Neither can I. Oh, you can't, eh? Why, after the first show, the manager came backstage and told me I was terrific. He said, uh, Harris, you ought to have your own radio program. He did, eh? Yeah, but don't worry, Jackson. I'm loyal. I'm with you for years. Well, thanks. Now, if I was loyal, you'd be all set. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Phil. I used to be in vaudeville, but I never stooped so low as to throw a pie at anybody. That's real hokum. What about that corny piece of business you used to do in your violin act? Corny piece of business? What was it, Mary? <laughs> Jack used to play by the waters of the Minnetonka, and for a finish, Barney Dean would squirt him in the face with a bottle of seltzer. 
Yeah. Now the guy won't even speak to me. But, Mary, that was a very clever tie-in. You see, the song I was playing was about water. So Barney Dean squirted seltzer water on me. That was the idea. Uh, remember the time he played Among My Souvenirs and he took your watch? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was just for a gag. I got it back later. Anyway, I'll never forget one day when Bar... Come in. Hello, boss. Oh, hello, Rochester. I got the quiz kids out in the car. They're all ready to go to the station. Already? I didn't know it was that late. Say, Phil, the kids are going back to Chicago tonight, and I promise to take them down to the train. So you carry on with the show, will you? Okay. Hey, Frankie, go out and get a blueberry pie. <laughs> you don't have to do that here. Just play some numbers. Come on, Mary, you ride down with us. So long, Phil. See you later, Dennis. So long, Mr. Benny. The kids are in the car, eh, Rochester? Yes, sir. And, boss, listening to those kids talk is really an education. It certainly is. You know, I told them the salary you were paying me, and they took my weekly earnings, multiplied by 52, and gave me the square root of my annual income. <laughs> the uh, square root, eh? What was it? Believe me, boss, it ain't worth rooting. <laughs> That's too bad. Now, listen, Rochester. Oh, there you are, Mr. Benny. Yes? I've got your papers ready to sign. You leave in ten days. What? Oh, I meant to get in touch with you about that. I'm, I'm not going. Well, it's pretty late for that, Mr. Benny. I'm sorry. You'll have to forget the whole thing. Come on, Mary. Darn it, I meant to write him a letter. Who is that, Jack? The recruiting officer for the Foreign Legion. <laughs> <laughs> you know how depressed I was. It's all off now, though. I'm sure disappointed, boss. I got a gal in Morocco. Well, you weren't going. Well, there are the kids. Come on, Mary. Okay, Bo Jess. Hello, kids. Here's Uncle Jackie to take you to the train. Now I'll sit up in front with Rochester. And Mary, you get back there with the kids. Move over, Gerard. <laughs> Rochester, I don't like that horn. It sounds too cheap and tinny. Uh -huh. <laughs> that didn't come with the car. Where do we get that horn, Rochester? That ain't no horn. It's an old atomizer. <laughs> an atomizer? Yeah, don't you smell that to sure the more every time I squeeze it? Well, that's one on me. An atomizer for a horn. That's nothing. Our spare tire is a life preserver from the Albany night boat. <laughs> Oh, yes, I fell overboard one night. It's lucky I had that on. Everything comfortable in the back seat, kids? Yes, yes Mr. Benny, Benny, it's fine. Yeah, fine. Good, good. You know, Uncle Jackie is going to miss you, little rascals. But you certainly had me on the ropes last Wednesday night. We sure did. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you still feel like hanging yourself, Mr. Benny? <laughs> no, 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 I'm all right now. But you kids certainly made a monkey out of me. Gosh. I didn't know anything. Cousin Boo Boo is sick about it. <laughs> Never mind. Well, Claude, are, are you going to miss California? I certainly am, Mr. Benny. I believe that Horace Greeley put it very succinctly when he said, Go west, young man. Oh, he did. He put it very... 
Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, uh, Horace Greeley was a great inventor. Why, Mr. Benny, Horace Greeley wasn't an inventor. Hmm. He was a newspaper editor. Oh, he was, eh? Well, if you're so smart, what paper? The New York Tribune from 1841 to 1872. Hmm. I'd give a $1,000 if I could learn to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Anyway, I wouldn't be surprised if Horace Greeley did invent something. As Dan Amici, he'll know. <laughs> All right, Gerard. 1841, I'll check on that. Hey, boss, there's Mr. Wilson walking down the street. Oh, yeah, pull up alongside him. Okay. Oh, Don. Don, would you like to ride down at the station with us? I'm not speaking to you. <laughs> okay, okay. Keep going, Rochester. Poor guy, his tongue is still twisted. <laughs> well, Richard, you're rather quiet back there. Did you enjoy your visit with Uncle Jackie? Yes, Mr. Benny, but I'm sure sorry I didn't get to see Carmichael. Oh, oh, yes, I was quite anxious to see your polar bear, too. Me, too. Well, kid, you certainly missed a treat. Carmichael is just about the cutest thing you ever saw. Soft, white, silky fur, loves to play, and he's just as gentle as a lamb. Then what happened to the gas man? <laughs> you just drive the car. And Rochester, watch out. Watch out for that bump up ahead. The what? That bump. Oh, hang on, everybody. <laughs> Rochester, will you please watch where you're driving? You're at the wheel now. <laughs> Oh, my goodness, get over here. Mary, are the kids all right? You better call the roll. Okay. Claude? Here. Richard? Here. Gerard? I'm Gerard Darrow. I'm eight years old and I go to the Bradwell School. Don't give your billy. Just answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank heaven the kids are all right. Be careful now, Rochester. Yes, sir. Still don't like that horn. I want to get something unusual. Something that sounds different. Why don't you get your cousin Boo Boo to go? <laughs> Just keep my relatives out of this, will you? Well, kids, it won't be long now before you'll be on that choo choo. Choo choo? What's that? Oh, that's baby talk for locomotive. <laughs> I said choo-choo till I was 29 years old. <laughs> hmm. You didn't stop drooling till you were 30. <laughs> no quiet. Hey, Rochester, we're near the station, are we? Pretty soon, boss. Oh, Gerard, I think we ought to straighten things out with Mr. Benny now, don't you? Let Richard do it. Do what? What is it, Richard? Well, Mr. Benny, we've been living at your house, and we haven't paid our bill yet. Your bill? Oh, forget it, kids. I... <laughs> I, I don't want your money. But, Mr. Benny, we ought to pay you. We lived at your house two weeks. Two weeks and a day. <laughs> but forget <again. laughs> <laughs> But forget it, kids. <laughs> it's all right with me. I enjoyed having you, really. But, Mr. Benny, if we went to a hotel, it would have cost us money. So why shouldn't you get it? Yeah, why should... Oh, forget <laughs> it. Forget it. You kids were my guests. Let it go at that. But, Mr. Ben... Watch out, Claude. This can't last forever. <laughs> Mary, you know very well I wouldn't accept any rent from these lovable children. But when they get to Chicago and they feel like sending me a little gift, <laughs> that's entirely up to them. <laughs> Well, kids, here we are at the station. Pull up by the entrance, Rochester. Oh, well, we haven't got much time. Pile out, kids. Gee, Come on. It's be funny. Funny. Watch your funny. step, kids. Watch it there. Take it easy. Say, boss, should I put my red cap on and take the bags in? <laughs> Not so loud. There are a lot of them standing around. Come on, kids. Come on, Mary. This way, kids. Just got time to make the train. 
Oh, look, there's Mr. Kelly, our quiz master. Yes, and there are the other kids. And there's Aunt Bessie. Wait, Mr. Oh. Rod. Don't run ahead. Everybody stick together. Come on. Come on. Well, here we are on the choo-choo, as Mr. Benny puts it. <laughs> Gee, he's a nice man. And he didn't even charge us for those two weeks. He certainly fooled me. <laughs> Ready to go, boss? Yeah. Gee, I hated to see those kids leave. You know, Mary, they got to be just like my own children. No kidding, I, I was crazy about them. Oh, stop blubbering. You'll see them again. Yes, but I was so used to playing with them and everything. I mean, what'll I do now? I mean, what'll I do when I come home evening? What, what'll I do in my spare time? Let's look for the gas main! Oh, quiet! <laughs> Come on, let's go. Here's a dessert that's just as pretty as a picture. And you'll be so proud of how good it looks that you'll probably want to put a frame around it and hang it on the kitchen wall for family and friends to admire. But putting it on the dining room table instead, you'll find it tastes just as good as it looks. The name of this dessert masterpiece is Banana and Raspberry Mold, a really different dessert that's not only easy to get, but easy to make. Simply dissolve one package of raspberry jello in two cups of hot water and chill until slightly thickened. Next, fold in two medium bananas sliced. Mold and chill until firm. Then garnish with sliced bananas and serve. And what a treat. A dessert that's as different as it is delicious. Incidentally, raspberry jello, like strawberry and cherry jello, has a new improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And that means it's better than ever. Discover its new goodness for yourself by making the swell dessert combination of luscious sliced bananas and rich red raspberry jello. Folks, the next time you buy jello, get jello pudding too. You'll find hey, hey, it. why all the whispering, Frank? No, I'm not really whispering, John. I, I'm just holding myself in because. If I let myself go when I talk about jello puddings, I get so excited I just can't talk straight. Oh, now, now, Frank. Try it again now. Try it again. Go ahead. All right. Jello puddings, ladies and gentlemen, are made by the same folks who make jello, and like jello, they're downright swell. For smooth, creamy goodness, jello puddings are simply unrivaled. They're easy to prepare, just as jello is. And they sell for the same low jello price. So try these rich, mellow puddings in three flavors. Chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. There, I told you you could do it. Get Jell-O puddings tomorrow. Get Jell-O puddings tomorrow. Oh, we're a little late. Good night, folks. <laughs> Remember, next Sunday, April 27th, this program will come to you on Daylight Savings Time. Consult your local newspaper or movie and radio guide for current time in your community. Is the National Broadcasting Company. J-E-L-L-O. The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with, I'm building a palace for Alice in Dallas. <laughs> Scarcely a day passes, ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't bring us dozens of letters full of praise for Jell-O. Some of these letters tell us how much children love Jell-O's gay color and delightful goodness. Others report on new and especially tempting desserts that can be made with Jell-O. And still other letters applaud the fact that Jell-O is so easy to make, sets so quickly, and dissolves in lukewarm water. Put all these letters together and you get a picture of a dessert that just can't be beat. A dessert full of rich, tangy flavor, as refreshing as the juicy, ripe fruit itself. And a dessert that takes only a few minutes to make, a few pennies to buy. Order it tomorrow in any or all of Jell-O's six delicious flavors... Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Incidentally, if you think strawberry, raspberry, and cherry jello taste even better than ever, you're right. 
because they now have a new improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. Start to enjoy Jell-O right away, friends. Ask your grocer for this grand dessert tomorrow and make up a rich, luscious mold of shimmering Jell-O. I'm building a palace for Alice in Dallas, played by the orchestra. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, as there are only five more weeks left in the current Jell-O series, at this time I would like to pay tribute to a man who, for the past 30 weeks, has brought joy and happiness into millions of American homes. Well, what's that? A man whose wit, charm, and personality have endeared him to the hearts of his public. Something fishy going on here. A man who every year at this time renews the contracts of myself and the other members of the Jell-O cast. Oh, ho! Jack Benny! <laughs> oh, so that's it. Jell-O again, this is Jack Benny talking. And, Don, I was wise the minute you opened your big fat mouth. <laughs> <laughs> there are only two times a year when I hear that malarkey. Christmas time and option time. Well, Don, I suppose you've looked over the contract I mailed you for next season and you're all ready to sign it. On the contrary, Jack, I'm not quite satisfied with some of the clauses in it. What? Yes, Jack, I discussed the matter at home and the little woman doesn't think uh, my increase in salary is quite big enough. Oh, she doesn't. But, Don, when I spoke to you on the phone, you seemed quite happy about everything. I know, Jack, but after talking it over with the little woman, I feel that you're taking advantage of me. Oh, you feel, huh? Well, Don, let me ask you something. Uh, who does the announcing on this program, you or the little woman? You can expect her any week now. Oh, fine. Now, Don, before the others get here, exactly what kind of a raise do you think I ought to give you next season? Well, here's the situation, Jack. You've been getting a lot of laughs at the expense of my being fat. Uh-huh. And this year, my weekly salary has been at the rate of $2 a pound. Oh. So I think it's only fair that next year I ought to get $3 a pound. Three bucks a pound, eh? Don, I can get blue ribbon, grade A, Kansas City beef cheaper than that. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, Don, the raise I offered you is as high as I can go. Now, what do you say? Well, I can't decide right now, Jack. I'll have to talk it over with the little woman. Oh, you and the little woman. Haven't you got a mind of your own? Yes, but I respect my wife's opinion, and I'm very devoted to her. Oh, you are. After all, I'm home with her every day except Sunday. Well, I can fix that, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, Don, I've been very fair about this whole thing. And I think that... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. What are you talking about? Oh, Don isn't satisfied with his new contract for next season. He isn't? No. Oh, my goodness. After all you've done for him? Well, that's the way it goes, Mary. There isn't much gratitude in this business. Why, Don Wilson, you ought to be... Never mind, Mary. Thanks, just the same. By the way, have you read your new contract? Yeah. What are you trying to do, bring back slavery? <laughs> oh, so I'm going to have trouble with you, too. What's the matter with your contract? Well, I'm getting paid to rehearse on Saturday and do this program on Sunday. Well? But if you think I'm going to mend your socks the rest of the week, you're crazy. Well, you're getting paid on the basis of a full week. Anyway, I can't mend my own socks. I don't know anything about sewing. You don't know anything about sewing? No, I don't. I hate to race you making a soup, brother. <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake. I maybe made a half a dozen suits when Vaudeville started to slip. <laughs> And that was so long ago, I've forgotten all about it. Go on, you could thread a needle with your toes. <laughs> oh, stop, will you? I was never a real tailor, so forget about it. Say, Don... Sleeve 32. Sleeve 32. <laughs> now cut that out! <laughs> Listen, Mary, I want you to stop kidding about me being a tailor. <laughs> I don't like it. Oh, it's nothing to be ashamed of, Jack. If you made that suit you're wearing now, you're an excellent craftsman. Uh, this suit... Oh, it's a lovely fit, Don, but I didn't make it. A fellow named Marino makes all my clothes. Marino? Yes, you ought to try him sometime. Hiya, Jackson. Boy, are you lucky I made the broadcast tonight. 
Oh, hello, Phil. Well, that audience wouldn't let me off the stage at the Paramount. Oh, you're still there, eh? Say, Phil, are you doing the same gags you did last week? No, Mary, everything new, all fresh material. I can imagine. No kidding, Jackson. You remember that bit last week we did where my guitar player pulls a gag and I hit him in the face with a blueberry pie? Yeah. This week's strawberry shortcake. <laughs> well, that's a switch. It's a little more subtle, Phil, but I imagine the audience gets it, huh? So you hit Frankie with a with a strawberry shortcake, eh? Yeah, but I had to take out the strawberries. He's allergic to them. <laughs> Allergical? Yeah, you know, he breaks out in a rat all the time. <laughs> Phil, you only came in here two minutes ago, and you've already set this program back 50 years. <laughs> now, before, uh, before we go back another generation, how about playing a number? Okay, Jackson. What would you like to hear? Glenn Miller, but I'm stuck with you. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> now, go ahead. Play anything. Hold it. Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. Take it, Mary. Wait a minute, bud. Here's a dime for you. Oh, darn it. Now I have to sew up that hole in my pocket. <laughs> I'd love to have his head for my rock garden. <laughs> <laughs> who's, uh, who's the wire? Who's the wire from, Mary? Oh, look, Jack, it's from Dennis Day. From Dennis? Yeah, it says, I'm out in the hall, we'll be in soon. Regards. <laughs> well, isn't he a thoughtful little dodo? <laughs> Play, Phil. Was, uh, Wouldn't You Like to Know, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature... Hey, Jackson, are you in a good mood tonight? Why, what's on your mind, Phil? Well, I want to talk to you about that new contract you sent me. My lawyers don't like it. Your lawyers? Who are they? McDermott, McMillan, McFadden, and Fink. It's a nice firm. Well, Phil, just uh, what is it your lawyers object to in the contract? Well, they don't like that clause that says I got to get to bed Saturday nights before 3 a.m. Well, it's for your own good, Phil. After all, we got a program to do on Sunday, and I want you to look bright and fresh. I know, but if I lose those bags under my eyes, I ain't got no character. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Phil, but that clause stands. You'll have to be in bed by 3 a.m. Okay, okay, but you won't be able to call me Twitch no more. <laughs> I'll just have to take that chance. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as I started to announce, for our feature attraction this evening, the Benny, if you like us, tell your friends, even though you lose them, players, <laughs> will present an original detective thriller entitled Murder at the Movies or No Croaking on the Main Floor. <laughs> now, in this gripping drama, Don Wilson will be sergeant of police and I will be the captain. We knew that. You always have to have the star part. Well... Yeah, Jack, why can't I be the captain? Because you're too soft, Don, too sympathetic. 
Well, you got to be a tough and callous and, and hard boy like I am. Look who's hard boiled. When the quiz kids left town last week, you cried like a baby. Well, I did feel pretty bad at the station, especially when little Gerard put his arms around my neck and kissed me. <laughs> that really made me cry. Well, I didn't mind that. But when you got down on your knee and sang a chorus of Sonny Boy, I could have kicked you. <laughs> As if you didn't, sister. <laughs> Anyway, getting back to our play, I'm going to be the captain. Now, let's see. Hello, Mr. Benny. Uh, did you get my telegram? Yes, but what a silly thing to do, Dennis. You're only out in the hall. Why send a telegram? Why, am I too young? <laughs> no, but a telegram. You were right outside here. Why didn't you open the door and yell in? That's old-fashioned. Old-fashioned? You're the kind of a guy that said the automobile wouldn't be practical. What? You better wake up, bub. <laughs> What the heck are you talking about? It's the silliest thing. I've... Now, settle down. And as long as you're here, kid, we're casting our play. We're doing murder at the movies, and you're going to be the ticket taker. You mean the guy that takes tickets? No, the guy that shovels coal in the basement. <laughs> the guy that takes tickets. And, Mary, you're going to be the girl in the box office, the one that sells tickets. Okay, give me a stick of gum and let's get going. Here you are. Here's your penny. Thanks. <laughs> Now, uh... <laughs> now, this play, ladies and gentlemen, will go on immediately after a song by our young tenor. Are you ready, Dennis? Yes, sir. Say, Dennis, I like that new suit you're wearing. Who made it for you? Marino and Benny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dennis, go ahead with your song. Why, Jack Benny, I thought you weren't making suits anymore. Marino makes them. I'm just the outside man. That's all. Now, go ahead, Dennis. I'll take it. Hello? Hello, oh, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. All right, Rochester. What do you want? I've been listening to the press program, boss, and it occurred to me that we haven't discussed my contract yet. Well, Rochester, you've been working in my house now for four years, and I feel there's no necessity for a written contract. Uh-huh. <laughs> Everything is perfectly clear. We have what is known as a verbal agreement. Uh-huh. <laughs> That means we have a mutual understanding. Why put it on paper? The amount of money involved is too small. That's what I mean. Let's get it up. <laughs> Never mind. Now, believe me, Rochester, there's no necessity for a written contract. But my attorneys advised it, whereas, and to wit. Your attorneys, who are they? Sambo, Tambo, Sugarfoot, and Smythe. <laughs> No. Oh. Well, tell Sambo, Tambo, Sugarfoot, and Smythe to get in touch with McDermott, McMillan, McFadden, and Fink. Let them handle it. That's the same firm. They got a branch on Central Avenue. <laughs> no. Well, anyway, Rochester, you've got nothing to worry about. I'm giving you, I'm giving you a substantial raise next year. Substantial? Yes. You know what the word means, don't you? I am literate. I'm skeptical. <laughs> well, you'll get it, so don't let it bother you. Now, we got a play to do. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? In this play tonight, you're going to be a detective, ain't you? Yes. Does that mean you're going to solve a murder? Yes, it does. Well, when you clear that up, find out what happened to the gas man. Forget about the gas man. Goodbye. Gas man, gas man. Carmichael didn't touch him. He's as gentle as a lamb. Sing that.
and a dream upon a distant shore. A maid with a way of whispering, see, si, senor. Each night, while guitars would softly play, the tune seemed to dance from the words that he said. Um, uh, oh, oh, my pretty little poppy, you're like a lovely flower, so sweet and heavenly. Since I found you, my heart is wrapped around you, and loving you it seems to be a rhapsody. I'm a poor, a pretty little poppy. Must copy its endearing charm from you. Sung by Dennis Day. And Dennis, I can't get over how you're improving every week. Tonight your voice was like a breath of spring. Okay, Don. Dennis's voice was like a breath of spring. Oh, Jack, it's so far fetched. Don, go ahead. But they're still ribbing me about the one I did last week. Don, Dennis's voice was like a breath of spring. Oh, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, even though you run out of breath, why don't you spring down to your neighborhood grocer and ask him for a package of jello? Uh, keep, uh, keep going, Don. Remember, you've just run five miles. When you get there, say to your grocer, hey, I want a package of jello. <laughs> keep going. I like all six delicious flavors. But I don't care whether it's strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, or... <laughs> keep going. <laughs> Fine. I'm going out to get a rub down. <laughs> Come back here. I never saw such a guy. Say, I rack my brains out trying to think of clever commercials. The least he can do is read them. Do you think I wrote the corniest material in the world? Next to the corniest. Don't forget Strawberry Shortcake Harris. <laughs> oh, yeah. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our play, Murder at the Movies, or He Took the Count at the Paramount. <laughs> now, the scene opens. The Paramount? Am I the guy that's going to be killed? Phil, if you've been there two weeks and no one has taken a shot at you yet, you're safe. <laughs> now, the scene opens at police headquarters, where Captain Benny is seated at his desk, is seated at his desk. <laughs> Curtain. <laughs> Music. <laughs> now, listen, Wilson. Things are going from bad to worse. The chief just phoned, said we better clean up the crooks in this district or else. Oh, we're doing all right. Doing all right. You were on duty in Westlake Park last night. You let somebody steal a canoe. Well, what are you worried about, Cap? I was in it with my girl. <laughs> and another thing, you're a fine-looking policeman. Where's your badge? Down here. My suspenders broke. <laughs> well, put it back where it belongs. They'll fall down. Let them fall. <laughs> and listen, Wilson, I want action around here. Action. I'm going to fill this jail if I have to put in jukeboxes. <laughs> That's what. I'll take it. Hello, police headquarters. Captain Benny speaking. Hello, this is Mamie Livingston, cashier at the Paramount Theater. Oh, hello, Mamie. How's Trick? Fine. She just had pups. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that. What'd you call me up for? Better get over here right away, Cap. A fellow was murdered right in front of my box office. He was cute. Murder day. Eh? How do you know he's dead? He doesn't wink back. <laughs> I see. Well, tell me, when did this murder happen? About three hours ago. Three hours ago? Why didn't you call me then? I was reading a movie magazine. Oh. Is there a picture of me in it? Yes, and you look worse than the guy that's laying here. 
I doubt that. Well, hold everything, Mamie. We'll be right over. Come on, Sarge. A murder's been committed in front of the Paramount. Let's go. Okay, the squad car's right out in front. Good. Pull up your pants. Yes, sir. <laughs> you drive, Wilson, and we'll find the murderer, or my name ain't... Calling all cars. Calling all cars. There's a sale on uniforms at Marino and Benny. <laughs> that is all. Forgot to mention those easy payments. Step on it, Sarge. Here's the tater, Wilson. Look at that marquee. Bing Crosby and Bob Hope on the road to Zanzibar, and Phil Harris on the road to Annie Bar. <laughs> all right, all right, break it up. Stand back, everybody. There's the body, Cap. Guy's dead, all right. Yeah. Get a load of that suit he's wearing. Tailoring is awful. That sleeve is enhanced stitch. It was done with a machine. I wonder who made it, Cap. I'll find out. Let's see the label. Well, I'll be darned. Who made it? McDermott, McMillan, McFadden, and Fink. <laughs> Lawsuits and clothes. <laughs> I was wondering what Fink was doing there. <laughs> Well, there's Mamie in the box office. I'll see what she knows about this crime. Hello, Mamie. Hello, Cap. I'm glad you got here. Now, tell me, Mamie, how was this man murdered? He was shot through the little finger. Little finger? How could that kill him? He was scratching his head at the time. <laughs> well, you're a witness, Mamie. Tell me exactly what happened. Well, Cap, I was sitting here selling tickets when all of a sudden... How many, please? One in the balcony. If you got a man with you, I'm going to hold him. Come on, mister. <laughs> All right, Mamie, let's get going. I want the facts about this crime. Well, Cap, I was sitting here selling tickets when all of a sudden I heard a shot. Yes, yes. So I looked around and... How many, please? A six. I want to lie down. <laughs> all right, Mamie, a shot was fired. You looked around and what happened? Where did the murderer go? He bought a ticket and went inside. That's all I want to know. Come on, Sarge. We'll go in and get that killer. Right behind you, Cap. Oh, no, you're not. Lead the way. <laughs> There's the doorman. Hey, buddy, did a man come in here a few minutes ago with a gun in his hand? Yes, sir, he did. Was the gun smoking? Yes, so I made him sit in the lodge. <laughs> you hear that? Come on, Wilson. Okay. And pull up your pants. Let's go inside. I'm sorry, mister, but you fellas will have to have tickets. <laughs> tickets? We're the police and we're after a criminal. Here, look at our badges. They're very pretty, but you've got to have tickets. <laughs> Oh, all right. Hey, Wilson, buy two tickets. Okay, Cap. Now, see here, buddy, you have no right to hold us up. I'm Captain Benny. Got a good mind to give you a belt in the back. That's what I told Marino, but he wouldn't put one on. <laughs> well, he is stubborn. Now, look. I've got the tickets, Cap. Okay. Here you are, buddy. Hold your stubs, please. Off to your pants, Wilson. Now, come on. The murderer must be upstairs. Follow me. Okay, here are the loaders. Now, let's take it easy. We might corner them. Stubbs, please. Oh, here you are. I'm sorry, sir, but these tickets are for the main floor. Now, look here, buddy. We're the law. We're after a desperate criminal, and he's sitting in the loaders. Well, if he can afford it, can't you? <laughs> oh, all right. What do we owe you? It'll be 30 cents extra for two tickets. Here you are. Make a note of that, Wilson. Now, come on. We've got to find the murderer. <laughs> Hey, look, the stage show is starting. Oh, yes, and there's Phil Harris making his entrance. Hiya, folks. Make me know you're glad to see me. <laughs> hmm. I guess you'll do some of those corny gags now. Come on, Cap. We've got to find that murderer. You look around. I want to stay here a minute. Okay. You know, folks, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the theater. I stopped in the restaurant and said to the waiter, Do you have frog legs? And he said, No, nah, I always walk this way. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Listen to him laugh at that. Ain't that stuff terrible? How does he get away with it? You got me, mister. Anyway, folks, when I got through with the frog legs, I wanted some coffee. 
So I said to the waiter, give me a cup of coffee, half and half. So he brought in half of the cup and half of the saucer. <laughs> oh, brother. Isn't that awful? It sure is, buddy. And now, folks, we're going to play a little number entitled, Papa, get the hammer, there's a fly on baby's head. Holy <laughs> moly! Hit it, boys! Oh, boy. I can't get over those gags. I wonder where Harris gets them. I know where he used to get them, but he ain't going to get them no more. What do you mean? I just bumped off the guy that wrote that stuff. What? Yeah, he's laying out in front of the theater right now. Oh, so you're the murderer. Well, I'm from police headquarters. I'm sorry, but I'll have to arrest you. Okay, Cap, let's go. Not right now. I want to stay here and listen to the rest of Harris's act. Well, I can't stand this anymore. I'm going over to the jail and wait for you. <laughs> Okay, just tell them who you are and they'll let you in. Thanks. So long, Cab. So long, and you got nothing to worry about, mister. There ain't a jury in the world that'll convict you. See you in jail. In the past seven years, ladies and gentlemen, we've broadcast hundreds of Jell-O recipes on this program. And during that time, many listeners have written in to ask us if these recipes are available in printed form. Well, the answer now is yes. Yes, you can now get these very same radio recipes gathered together for your convenience in one of the handiest, most attractive cookbooks ever printed. You'll find the best of these swell recipes in General Foods' new dessert book, a big 48-page collection of the grandest desserts you can imagine. But don't think that's all. No, sir. Not only does this handsomely illustrated book contain lots of luscious yellow desserts, it also gives you ideas and directions for making all kinds of other tempting treats. 365 different recipes and suggestions in all. A new dessert for every day in the year. And it's a book that's really beautiful. With its brightly decorated cover and its rich, striking color photographs and paintings. But the only way to tell how good-looking it is is to get a copy. So send for yours now. Mail 10 cents in coin or stamps to Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. Remember, all you send is 10 cents in coin or stamps. And the address again is Don Wilson, care of General Foods, Battle Creek, Michigan. We're a little late, so good night, folks. Oh, who goes there? Private Frank Bingman. Advance to get the password. Jell-O puddings. Don't you mean Jell-O? No, I mean Jell-O puddings. Jell-O puddings are not gelatin desserts like their partner in pleasure, Jell-O. They're smooth, creamy puddings that you make with milk. And they're so rich and creamy and luscious that they simply melt in your mouth. How many flavors do these jello puddings have? Chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. And are they swell? Did you hear that, folks? Well, tomorrow when you enter those new creamy jello puddings and see if we're not right. Pass, friend. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with I Wonder Who's Kissing Her Now That I'm Drafted. Tomorrow morning, thousands of housewives will say to their grocers, Jell-O, please. And tomorrow night at dinner, thousands of families will say, Jell-O pleases. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it certainly does. Jell-O is a bang of good dessert, a swell treat that everyone likes right from the very first shimmering spoonful. The vivid colors of Jell-O give this attractive dessert a bright, tempting beauty that no other dessert can surpass. And the Jell-O's intriguing flavor is just as refreshing as the juicy, ripe fruit itself. Jell-O is delightfully easy to make, too. It dissolves instantly in lukewarm water, and sets in the twinkling of an eye. And Jell-O costs so little, you can afford to enjoy it as often as you please. By the way, strawberry, raspberry, and cherry Jell-O now taste better than ever. Each has a new, improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And the result is something mighty delicious. So try a rich, glistening mold of Jell-O tomorrow.
says, I wonder who's kissing her now that I've moved to Glendale, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pride and pleasure that I present to you a man who next Friday, May the 9th, celebrates his 10th anniversary in radio, Jack Benny. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. My goodness. <laughs> well, hmm. Uh, Jalal again, this is Jack Dunny talking. And Don, I can see the whole party. <laughs> My goodness. Uh, gosh, fellas, I'm really getting a send-off here. It's a wonderful tribute. Uh, Jalo again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your thoughtful introduction. You know, I'd almost forgotten about my 10th anniversary. But I... <laughs> now, Phil, don't overdo it, you little rascal. <laughs> Gosh, this reception has made me all choked up here. Look, my big blue eyes are full of tears. Have you got a handkerchief, Mary? No, here's a blotter. <laughs> Never mind, I'll leave the tears in my eyes. It makes me look like Betty Davis. <laughs> but no kidding, fellas, all this fuss and everything about my radio birthday is more than I expected. Really, I don't deserve it. Ah, yes, you do, Jackson. Why, certainly. You're a pioneer in radio, and you're worthy of this recognition. That's right, Jack. You've got it coming to you. Well... Thanks again, fellas, but I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, gosh, I don't know what to say. I feel like a fool. Look, I'm blushing. Hooray, you've got blood. <laughs> well, I'm just excited, that's all. Naturally, I'm, I'm flustered. Well, that's perfectly natural, Jack. After all, we're making great big fuss over you, and you've always been so modest and unassuming. Well, not always, Don. There are times when I'm a little on the hammy side. Of course, it doesn't show, but, uh, but it's there. Eh, Mary? Well, if you ask me... Who asked you? <laughs> Go away, Mary, please. Yeah, leave him alone, Mary. Say, Jackson, when you started out in radio, I'll bet you never thought you'd last ten years, did you? You said it, Phil. Ten years in this business is a long time. See, I'll never forget how nervous I was on my first broadcast. See, there I stood, 24 years old and scared to death. <laughs> Oh, boy, what I went through, huh? Uh, what was that age again? 37. Anyway, <laughs> fellas, as I started to tell you, that first broadcast was really a thrill. There I stood shaking like a leaf. Nervous, huh? Why, Don, I couldn't even hold the script. I thought I was going to faint. But the announcer came over, put his arm around me and said, Take it easy, son. There's nothing to worry about. Just step up to that microphone and show him what you can do. And good luck to you, lad. Gee, he was a nice guy. By the way, Jack, who was the announcer on your first broadcast? Peter the Hermit. <laughs> now cut that out. Mary, for heaven's sake, will you please try and remember that this is my 10th anniversary? <laughs> fellas. Thanks, thanks. You can stop with that. I'm a jolly good fellow. Now, let's forget it. Now, where was I? You were telling us about your first radio program. Yeah, what product were you selling in them days, Jackson? Well, I was on the air for Burger's Black Beauty Buggy Whip. <laughs> buggy Whip? And this was only ten years ago? Well, old man Burger was trying to bring back the horse. Gosh, I'll never forget that program. We had a theme song and everything. A theme song? Yeah, I even remember it. It went like this. Now, let's see. What was that melody? Oh, yes. Dump, pum, 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 pum. Won't you buy our buggy whip? You will find that they are pips. If you want your horse to jump, he will go kalump, kalump. When you hit him on the rump with a burger's buggy whip. It really snapped. <laughs> of course, of course, fellas, that doesn't sound like anything now, but if you could have heard those eight voices behind me and a team of horses whinnying, <laughs> I tell you, it was sensational. Hey, Jack, whatever made you leave that program? Oh, it was one of those things. I went up to see old man Berger one day about a raise, and he whipped me. 
with a burger's buggy <laughs> whip. But enough reminiscing about my early days. It's probably boring, everybody. No, no, this is very interesting, Jack. Uh, what program did you go on after Burger's Buggy Whip? Well, from there, I went on one of those early morning dramatic shows. The Heartbreaks of Hortense Hooligan. <laughs> I used to break her heart every morning at 7 a.m. I was pretty good, huh? Oh, I remember that program, Jack. Were you the leading man? Yes, sir, that was me. I remember that show, too. It was awful. Well, it was so awful, Mary. Why'd you listen to it? Why didn't you turn it off? I was such a little girl, and I couldn't reach the dial. <laughs> Mary, that was only nine and a half years ago. And if I remember correctly, young lady, you didn't have any trouble peeking over that hosiery counter. <laughs> anyway, Don, if I'd have kept up with my dramatic work today, I might have been one of... Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Congratulations on your anniversary. Thank you, Dennis. Oh, uh, oh, by the way, Dennis, uh, you haven't signed your contract yet for next season. Did you speak to your mother like I told you to? Yes, I did. Well, what'd she say? She said, it's not worth the Kleenex it's written on. <laughs> Dennis, in the first place, it's not written on Kleenex. And in the second place, let me give you a little advice. On my first radio job, I made the same mistake you did. I went to my boss, asked him for a raise, and he whipped me. Well, beat me, Daddy. I want one, too. <laughs> Dennis, this is no time to talk about money. It's my anniversary. And now that you're here, let's have your song. Okay. Hold it a minute. Come in. Telegram for Jack Benny. Take it, Mary. All right, buddy, what are you waiting for? Did you ever hear about tipping, or do I have to enlighten you? <laughs> oh, yes, a tip. Here's a dime for you. I'm sorry I overlooked it. Oh, don't mention it. <laughs> the guy's nuts. Mary, uh, who's the telegram mm, 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 from? Huh? It's from Fred Allen. Fred Allen? What is that? Now, wait a minute. Now, stop her. What's the matter with you? Allen is not a jolly good fellow. All right, Mary, what's he got to say? Uh, dear Jack, congratulations, and I knew you'd leave your print in radio. You're just the heel that can do it. <laughs> What a rap. Why do I let him get away with that stuff? Why don't I do something about it? Why don't I beat him up? Because you're a coward. Oh, yes, that's it. Sing, Dennis. <laughs> Mary, save that wire. I'm going to send him ten awful words. The warm and lovely world we knew has been struck by a bitter frost but my sister and i recall with a sigh a world we knew and loved and lost my sister and i remember still a tulip garden by an old duck mill and the home that was all our own until don't talk about that My sister and I recall once more The fishing schooner pulling in to shore And the door caught me cold in days before But we don't talk about that We're learning to forget the fear That came from a troubled sky we're almost happy over here But sometimes we wake at night And cry Oh, my sister and I Recall the day We say goodbye Very good. 
good. Very good, Dennis. Very good. Yes, sir. That was My Sister and I, sung by Dennis Day, our own Irish Nightingale. And now, ladies and gentlemen... I'm not a Nightingale, Mr. Benny. I'm Irish, though. I know you are, Dennis. I just called you Nightingale as a figure of speech. And now, ladies and gentlemen... A Nightingale? No. I, mean, I know it's a bird. It happens to be a bird that sings beautifully. Oh. That's why I called you Nightingale. It's meant as a compliment, that's all. Hmm. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Are you mad because I'm not a bird? <laughs> no, believe me, Dennis, I'm very happy that you're almost human. And now, ladies and gentlemen... It's a wonderful feeling, isn't it? <laughs> it certainly is. And now, folks... I'm tired of saying ladies and gentlemen, are you? And now, folks, in response to a number of requests, Mr. Don Wilson, the eminent American playwright, has written another of his famous one-act plays. Take it, Mr. Wilson. The scene, ladies and gentlemen, is the home of Mr. and Mrs. Boyle Heights in the little town of Eight Plant, Missouri. It is 9 a.m., and as the curtain rises, Mr. Heights, who is a haberdasher, is dashing to his half. Well, curtain music. <laughs> Well, goodbye, dear. I'm off to work. Give me my bear trap. I want to get customers today. Here you are, Boyle. Thank you, dear. By the way, dear, what are we having for dessert this evening? I thought we'd have Jello, dear. Jello, dear? All right, I'll stop at our neighborhood grocer, dear, and buy a package. Is Jello very dear, dear? No, it's economical, dear, and easy to make. And it comes in six delicious flavors, dear. <laughs> Strawberry dear, raspberry dear, cherry dear, orange dear, and a lion dear. Well, I better be going, dear. Uh, take your umbrella. It looks like rain, dear. That sounded a little corny, dear. <laughs> anyway, I think I will. <laughs> Goodbye, dear. Goodbye, dear. Well, he's gone. You can come out of the closet now, dear. Here I am, dear. Kiss me. Hey, hey, what is this? So Mr. and Mrs. Height's son, who hasn't seen his daddy for years, comes out of the closet. Oh. And will Mr. Heights be in for a surprise that evening when he comes home with the jello? I thank you. Very good. That was excellent. You know, Don, dear, or Don, that was one of the cleverest plays you've ever written. It's got suspense and everything. It's one of those plots that you just can't wait to see what's going to happen. Well, as a matter of fact, Jack, I wrote a second act to it. The scene where you come home to dinner that same evening. And meet my son? Well, let's do it. Come on, Mary. Set the scene, Don. Okay. It's 7 o'clock that evening, ladies and gentlemen, and Mr. Boyle Heights is returning home after a busy day trapping customers. Curtain. Music. <laughs> Quick, dear, hide under the sofa. Okay, dear. Quick. Come in, Boyley. <laughs> ah, good evening, dear. Hello, dear. Did you work hard today? Yes, dear. And my feet is killing me. <laughs> well, where's the surprise, dear? What surprise, dear? Our son, dear. Isn't he anxious to see his daddy? What son, dear? Our son, dear, that was hiding in the closet, dear. Where is he? Uh, did you bring the jello, dear? Never mind that. Now, there's no use lying, dear. I'm going to open that closet and find out who's in there. Now, open that door or I'll shoot. Aha! Who are you? Believe it or not, I'm a nightingale. <laughs> Dennis, my son! Well, Don, that second act was certainly a switch. Well, I've got a third act, Jack, where later that same evening... Uh, thanks, Don, but it's too good for this program. That's theater gill stuff. Hey, Phil, it's time for a band number. What's it going to be? Well, Jackson, we're going to play a real old-timer tonight in a swell tune. It's called Ida, Sweet as Apple Cider. Say, that is a good tune. You know, when I did my violin act in vaudeville, Ida used to be one of my feature numbers. Be nice hearing it again. Go ahead, Phil. Oh, say, Jack, this being your anniversary, I think we ought to put the spotlight on you tonight. Now, how about playing a chorus of Ida on your fiddle? On my fiddle? Oh, say, I, I might at that. Don had opened his big fat mouth. <laughs> well, Don's got a little sentiment in them. That's more than you have. Bill, can I borrow a fiddle from one of your violinists? You ask him. He doesn't speak English. 
Never mind. I'll use my own. I happen to have it right here under my arm. Now, wait a minute. I'll tune it up. Lot well, that'll help. Just the same, I'm going to tune it up. I'm not going to start out off key. <laughs> hey, Charlie. Charlie, give me A, will you? There, that's it. <laughs> uh, incidentally, fellas, when I did this number in my vaudeville act, I used to do a lot of tricks in the second chorus. You know, I'd hold my violin on my head and play it, and then between my knees. And then for a finish, I'd put the bow between my teeth and move the violin up and down. Try that now, and your teeth will move up and down. <laughs> Mary, the next time you say I have false teeth, you're going to make the June payment on them. <laughs> All right, fellas, let's go. Ida, sweet as apple cider. Calling when the rain at Emma falling. Oh, come out in the silvery moonlight. Our love will whisper so soft and low. I'm a Yankee Doodle kiddo. At the girls, I tip my lid off. These girls can't live without you. <laughs> Listen, oh, I do. This is really jazzy. Everybody thinks it's yes, nasty. Yes, my Ida, I idolize you. I love you, I do, indeed I do. <laughs> I knew my violin would get this program going, no kidding, man. <laughs> That was Ida, Sweet as Apple Cider, sung by Phil Harris with a violin solo by Jack Benny, that syncopated boy. <laughs> well, how'd you like it, fellas? Oh, well, that was swell, Jack. Very good, Mr. Benny. No kidding, Jackson. That was okay. Huh, Mary? It was a lot better than I expected. Thanks, Mary. What I expected shouldn't, shouldn't happen, happen to, to a, a dog. dog. <laughs> that I knew. Oh. Well, I haven't played my violin a long time. I am a little rusty. Anyway, thanks for helping me out, Phil. That was a nice touch on my anniversary. And that ain't all, Jackson. Shall we give it to him now, fellas? Give me what? You tell him, Don. Tell me what? Well, Jack, we've all been with you for a long time, and we felt that the least we could do on this occasion was to buy you a gift as a token of our love and loyalty. Well, so you devils have been holding back on me, eh? Well, where's the present? Where is it? The men are out in the hall with it, Mr. Wilson. Men? What can it be? All right, carry it in, boys. Right this way, fellas. Now take it easy. Don't drop it. Oh, my goodness. Look at that enormous crate. See, it takes four men to carry it. Uh, set it down here, boys. Easy now. God, it's certainly heavy. Well, quick, quick, open it up. I'm dying to see what it is. Okay, men, open it up. Gee, this is the biggest present I ever got in my life. Those men are working like fever. By golly, I haven't been so excited to talk yet.
No, well, well, thanks. Uh... <laughs> well, thanks, boys. Well, there it is. Get out of my way, Don. I can't see the press. Oh, pardon me, Jack. Well, Jackson, are you surprised? <laughs> oh, my goodness. How you like it? Oh, fellas, just what I needed. A cigarette lighter with 50 gallons of fluid. <laughs> Well, by golly. Is it well, Mr. Benny? Oh, gee, I can't get over it. Just think, I'll be able to light my cigars with this lighter until I'm 8,000 years old. Uh, 10,000 if I'm conservative. Oh, what a present. Well, we didn't know what to get you, Jack. You've got everything. Everything and a barrel of oil. Well, thanks. All right, boys, roll out the barrel, leave it in the hall. Oh, wait a minute, Jack. I wrote a poem that goes with that present. Oh, goody, that's all I need now. <laughs> Never mind the poem. Let her read it, Jackson. It's very apropos for Paul. <laughs> apropos for Paul? Phil, you've got the right word, but you ought to have brakes put on it. <laughs> all right, Mary, let's hear the poem. It's my own fault for being on the radio so many years. What's the title of it? Old Man Benny, he just keeps puffing along. I'm warning you, Mary, this better be good. <laughs> now, go ahead. <clears throat> oh, Jack Benny, oh, Jack Benny, I salute you, Mary Liz. A gal darn I do not give. I don't give a gal darn either. You, know. you have stood the acid test, and you've had a great success. People think you are a mess. So do I. <laughs> Mary, you bees mean to me. <laughs> Mary, you bees mean to me. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Uh-uh. That's a silly show. <laughs> How we love you, dear Jack Benny. How we hope Hold that... it. Hold it. Wait till I answer the phone. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. All right. What do you want? Boss, I'm telling you for the last time, I don't live in the same house as Mr. Billsey. He's crazy every day. Oh, you're always worrying about our border. What's he done now? He came down to eat a little while ago dressed in a dinner jacket. Well, it's Sunday night. What's wrong with a dinner jacket? That's all he had on. No pants, no shoes, no socks, no nothing. <laughs> oh, well, he's, he's absent-minded. We know that. He's a little peculiar. Then right in the middle of the dinner, he sent the mashed potatoes back to the kitchen. What is wrong with the mashed potatoes? He wanted lumps put in them. <laughs> Well, next time, make him with lumps. Believe me, Rochester, there's nothing wrong with Mr. Billingsley. He's just a little eccentric. Eccentric? Yes. Boss, when a man walks with the hall tree all afternoon, eccentric ain't apropos <laughs> What? Mr. Billingsley's been waltzing with the hall tree? He calls it Dolores. Dolores? Why the romance, boss? They're flying to Yuma tonight. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. That's the silliest thing he's ever done. Well, humor him, Rochester. Do something. Maybe I ought to look him instead of a potato. <laughs> no, don't touch him. I'll be home right after the broadcast. Meanwhile, tell him the hall tree is married already. <laughs> See you later. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? The gas man came today. <laughs> Oh, he did, eh? You see, Rochester, and you thought Carmichael ate him. What did he want? You wanted to know what happened to the other gas man. <laughs> oh, forget it, will you? Goodbye. Gosh, I, I hope Mr. Billingsley doesn't go too far off the beam. Now, he's the best boarder I've ever... How we love you, dear Jack Benny. Oh, yes, the poem. More than ever, deed we do. And we hope that we will always keep on loving mm -mm you. <laughs> oh, get this over with. Dennis loves you, Philby loves you, Donzie loves you, so do I. So does Sammy, so does Arthur, so does Bert and Apple Pie. <laughs> Oh, 
For a real treat, ladies and gentlemen, in the spirit of the season, try Jell-O's new spring salad that will lend zest to any meal. A salad with a grand, tantalizing goodness, all ready to add brightness and gaiety to a springtime menu. It's a salad that's easy to make, too. Simply prepare a package of lemon jello as you usually do, add one tablespoon of vinegar, and a chill until slightly thickened. Next, fold in one cup of chopped nut meat and one cup of diced celery. Then mold and serve on crinkly green lettuce with a dab of golden mayonnaise. And there's one of the swellest salads you ever tasted. A delicious combination of chopped nut meats, crisp diced celery, and rich sunny lemon jello. Incidentally, friends, this is National Restaurant Week, and I hope a lot of you will take the occasion to drop in at your favorite restaurant where you'll find a grand jello dessert or salad on the menu. Visit your favorite restaurant this week and enjoy a delicious meal that includes a treat that's really tops jello. Gee, I was thrilled with my violin solo. This is the uh, last number of the 31st program in the current Jell-O series. And we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. And, fellas, I can't tell you how happy you all made me on my 10th anniversary. Gee, it was... Oh, for heaven's sake, stop, will you? Good night, folks. K-E-L-L-O Say, folks, you want to hear a swell echo? Well, listen. Jello, Jello puddings, Jello, Jello puddings. No, Frank, Frank Bingman. What kind of an echo is that? Jello puddings aren't the same as Jello. Oh, I know it, but they're made for the same people. Jello, you see, is a grand gelatin dessert, and Jello puddings are rich, creamy puddings full of the most delightful and mellow flavor and tempting goodness. So always ask for both. Whenever you buy Jell-O, get Jell-O puddings in all three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. Order Jell-O puddings tomorrow. Order Jell-O puddings tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles. KFI Los Angeles. KFI Los Angeles. KFI Los Angeles. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with brown eyes. Why are you so close to my nose? <laughs> when it comes to bright, vivid beauty, ladies and gentlemen, there are two sights that are mighty hard to beat. One is a garden of spring flowers bursting into color with daffodils, tulips, and primroses. And the other is a big shimmering mold of Jell-O in any of its six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, or lime. Jell-O's rich glowing colors are so gay and inviting, they make Jell-O one of the most attractive desserts of all. There's bright golden lemon, rosy pink strawberry, clear green lime, ruby red cherry, sunny orange, and crimson raspberry, the cheeriest, most charming colors that ever delighted the eye or tempted the taste. And flavor? Mmm, say... There's just nothing more delicious than the flavor of Jell-O. A delightful flavor as refreshing as the juicy ripe fruit itself. So enjoy Jell-O real soon. Let's say the strawberry, raspberry, or cherry flavors. All three have a new, improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially enhanced. And the result is a grand, distinctive goodness better than ever. Try a rich, glistening mold of Jell-O tomorrow. <laughs> are close to my nose, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you one of Hollywood's most versatile movie stars whose new picture has just gone into production. An actor whose roles extend from leading man in Love Thy Neighbor to leading lady in Charlie's Aunt, Jack Benny. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Jalo again. This is Jack Benny talking. 
And, Don, you were a little confused in your introduction. You see, in the picture I'm making now, Charlie's aunt, I'm really a man. I, uh, I merely masquerade as a woman. Oh, I see. Well, that's a rather difficult assignment, isn't it, Jack? Oh, it is. Tis. You see, Don, the uh, picture takes place around 1890, and I never realized how uncomfortable women's dresses were in those days. Boy, they had more contraptions. Leg of mutton sleeves, tight collars, seven petticoats. Yes, they were pretty complicated. By the way, Jack, does your uh, dress have a bustle on it? A bustle? I think so, Don. It can't be me. (laughs) (laughs) But I don't mind that, Don. The thing I really object to is that darn corset I have to wear. So tight and hot and always sticking in my ribs. You know, mine does that, too. (laughs) Uh Oh! So I finally got it out of you. You admit that you wear a corset, eh, Don? Well, the little woman thought it was a good idea. It helps my figure and takes an inch off my stomach. An inch? Yes. Don, taking one inch off your stomach is like taking a clam away from Pismo (laughs) Beach. Anyway... Anyway, wear it in good health. (laughs) But getting back to my costume, Don, I... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. What are you talking about? Uh, corsets. Well, that lets me out. (laughs) I mean, the corset I wear in my picture. And Don... Don, listen. There's one thing I found out about women's clothes in those days. Excuse me, Mary. I want to go over and talk to Don. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, boy. Don. Don, you'll never believe it. What is it, Jack? Long pants. <laughs> no kidding, Don. The, uh, the ones I wear go clear down to my ankles. But I'll tell you something about my costume, Don. I look cute as the dickens in it. I wear a black dress, a lace shawl, and a wig with long gray curls. Uh, do they go down to your ankles, too? Mary, I'm playing a woman, not a French poodle. <laughs> If you could bark, I'd bet on you. Well, stop. I look very attractive in that outfit. And you know, Don, it's amazing how I fool everybody around the studio. They think I'm really a woman. Doesn't anybody think you're a poodle? No, nobody (laughs) but you. Uh, Get this, Don. I was walking around the lot the other day, all dressed up in my costume, and Jack Oakey pulled alongside of me in his car and said, uh... How about going out for a spin, babe? Oh, he didn't recognize you, huh? No. Well, anyway, I thought I'd rib him a little, so I got in the car and we drove <laughs> off. No kidding. He, he really fell for it. What happened, Jack? I walked home from Santa Monica. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll either have to get another picture or roller skates. It's terrible. By the way, Jack, is Charlie Zand a Paramount picture? Uh, no, Don. I'm making this one for 20th Century Fox. You see, I'm signed at three different studios now. Paramount, Fox, and Warner Brothers. Well, that's odd. Why should three studios want you? They don't. They toss them around like a hot potato. <laughs> they do nothing at the kind. Now, you were at the studio, Mary, and you know very well that when I walked into Mr. Zanuck's office the other day, he gave me a wonderful reception. Some reception. He said, I'm busy. See me later. He said, I'm busy. Please see me later. <laughs> <laughs> He's a swell guy. Believe me. Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Dennis, this is Mother's Day, but if that was meant for a rib, I don't like it. Oh, I wasn't ribbing, Mr. Benny. You know, you've been like a mother to me ever since I've been on this program. Oh. Gee, you've taken care of me, you've always inspired me, and you've encouraged me in my work. Well. And you've even been kind enough to save my money for me. <laughs> oh, forget it, Dennis. I'm glad to do it. Nothing at all. I'm keeping track, bub. <laughs> All right, keep track. I'm only doing it for your own good. When summer comes along, you'll be able to take a little trip somewhere. You know, we'll be off the air in three more weeks. Oh, yeah. Say, Mr. Benny, where are you going on your vacation this summer? Jack Oakey is taking him to Honolulu. (laughs) Now, cut that out! (laughs) Don't be silly. 
I haven't decided yet, Dennis, but I may go. Hiya, with... Jackson. Oh, hello, Phil. I'm sure sorry I missed that big banquet NBC gave you, but I was playing that night in Pasadena. Well, we missed you too, Phil. Yeah, Phil, we certainly had a wonderful time. Well, I tried to get out of my engagement, but the manager said okay so fast I went right into a number. <laughs> I don't blame you, but you sure missed a swell party. You know, I look pretty nifty in my full-dress suit. <laughs> Say, Phil, you should have been there when Jack was introduced. Boy, was he embarrassed. Well, accidents will happen. You know. What was it, Mary? <laughs> when Jack took a bow, his shirt flew up and shoved a cigar right down his throat. <laughs> well, that's nothing to laugh at. I could hardly go on with my speech. That was nothing to laugh at either. <laughs> I did all right, sister. Anyway, it was a grand testimonial, and I appreciate it. Say, Jackson, did you hear the wonderful tribute Fred Allen gave you last Wednesday? Tribute? Certainly I heard it. But what do you mean, tribute? He did your biology, didn't he? <laughs> That's biography. Biology is with the bees. <laughs> Allen was supposed to eulogize me for 60 minutes, and he practically ignored me. And after all, I've done for that guy. What have you ever done for Allen? What have I... Did you hear that, Mary? When Alan first broke into show business, who gave him a friendly pat on the back? You did. Yeah, who gave him advice? You did. Who gave him money when he needed it? You did? <laughs> yes, I did. And that shows you how grateful Alan is. Well, that's all you can expect from that guy. Phil, how about a band number so I can get good and mad? Okay, Jackson, we're going to play it. Never mind, thing. play it. Who cares? I'm going to get even with Oki, too. Go ahead, Phil. Hold it a minute. I'll take it. Hello? Hello, oh, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Oh, what do you want? Well, due to conditions beyond my control, I'll be unable to pick you up this evening. You can't pick me up. Why not? Well, I was on my way to the studio, and the Maxwell broke down. I think the heat got it. The heat? <laughs> Well, there must be a leak in the radiator. See if you can find it. Find it? I can't even duck it. <laughs> Rochester, I don't want to have to take a cab home. Now, where are you calling from? Just a second. Where are we, Mabel? <laughs> Mabel, what is this? Rochester, where are you? I'm calling from the Central Avenue. Our ribs will tickle you. Barbecue pit. <laughs> Well, let me ask you something. What are you doing on Central Avenue with a girl when you're supposed to pick me up? If you could see Mabel, you'd forgive me, boss. She's TNT from Tennessee. I imagine. She's really... What's that, honey? Correction, boss. Mabel's name is Magnolia. I don't care what her name is. I want you over here, so get out of that barbecue stand and fix that car. But, boss... You're not afraid to get a little grease on your hands, are you? I don't think so. I just tucked away seven plates of ribs. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to argue with you, Rochester. Get over here right away. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? That was a nice gold watch they gave you at the banquet the other night. Yes, it's beautiful. What are you going to do with your old watch? Oh, I don't know. I guess I'll give it to you. Thanks. You can keep it, Magnolia. What? <laughs> so long, boss. And that boy doesn't waste any time playing.
That was Amapola, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the National Broadcasting Company is taking over the remainder of this evening's Jell-O show for a special program which they have prepared. May I now introduce to you my good friend, Ken Carpenter. Thanks, Don. Ladies and gentlemen, last Friday night, NBC had a special program dedicated to Jack Benny's 10th anniversary on the air. For that particular occasion, a musical tribute to Jack had been prepared, but due to a limitation of time, we were unable to include this in the broadcast. However, we feel that you, Jack Benny's listeners, would like to hear this salutation. So if Jack and the rest of the cast will take seats in the audience, we will proceed with the life of Jack Benny in music. Okay, let's go. Forty-seven years ago, Waukegan, Illinois, was a little-known settlement boasting a few scattered stores, one of which was owned by one Meyer Benny. There was much excitement around Mr. Benny's store the day we start our story, easily explained by the cries of the newsboys on the neighboring streets. Extra! Extra! A message from the store! Mr. Benny found a baby boy when he came home from work. He's proudly handing out cigars and boasting he will be the father of a president in 1903. The father of a president. As Jack remembers only too well, his father's predominant characteristic was strictness. He was the sort of a man who regarded the raising of a youngster as stern, stern business. On the occasion of bringing his first report card home from school, we find Jack approaching his father with considerable alarm. Let me look at your report card, Jack, my boy. Jack, my boy. I am sure my heart will overflow with joy. Flow with joy. What's this? English C. Algebra D, History D, Geography F. He draws his maps in the treble clef. Scholarship poor, deportment poor, scholarship poor, deportment poor. I just can't do a thing with him. He won't study, he won't work. I can't make him concentrate. He'll be the death of me, a bad influence. Thinks of music all the time. Music. Deportment poor, scholarship poor, deportment poor. What's this? Music A. Music A. Yes, Jack's main interest as a child was the violin. He hated to practice, but he loved to play, especially with his devoted grandmother for an audience. She would sit for hours in the cold parlor alone on the row of chairs that was supposed to represent the audience while her grandson played show for her. He played comedian. Who was that lady? I say he was there with no lady. Magician. Now watch me very closely. I have nothing up my sleeve. Dancer. Singer. Waukegan's sprays are funny. Violinist. <laughs> in spite of his intense dislike for practice, Jack soon attained sufficient skill to play in the junior orchestra of Waukegan, and occasionally in a real for sure dance orchestra in one of the neighboring towns. Then, suddenly, out of a clear blue sky, the bolt fell. Jack was expelled from high school for spending his afternoons in a vaudeville theater. Yes, they threw out our hero, alas and alack. The burdens of school were too much for poor Jack. He much preferred to hang around the Barrison Theater, worshiping the ingenue and wondering what they paid her. He got a job as doorman so he could watch the stars emerging from this wondrous place and help them to their cars. He got in the orchestra after a bit and played violin with the boys in the pit. From his seat in the orchestra pit, Jack reveled in the imposing array of stars of that year. The Marx Brothers, Marilyn Miller, Joe Cook, Chick Sale, all the big time acts played there. When the theater closed some months later, the leader of the orchestra, Cora Salisbury, asked Jack to join her in a violin and piano act. He consented, and a new act was born. Salisbury and Benny, from Grand Opera to Ragtime. Jack Benny's apprenticeship was served in musty old theaters with a few worn pieces of scenery, a two-piece orchestra in the pit, cramped dressing room in the cellar, rats that ate the grease paint right off the shelves, but he loved it. 
Four years of this until a family illness called Cora back to Waukegan. Jack's adventure was over. There was nothing for him to do but to go to work in his father's store. He waited on the customers with his mind a million miles away. Some pink and white suspenders, please. My brother needs a pair. Gosh, Eva Tangway, singing I Don't Care. Have you any black silk socks of size 11, please? Jolson was sensational singing Mammy on his knee. Selling men's apparel only filled young Jack with loathing. He wanted to be next to closing instead of next to clothing. Dissatisfied as a salesman, Jack began to look around for a new partner. Friends told him of a great piano player in Chicago, and they formed an act. Benny and Woods, ten minutes of syncopation. The act went so well that by the third season, they received an offer from one of New York's biggest agents. He not only agreed to handle them in New York, but proceeded to book them immediately into that mecca of all vaudevillians, the palace. New York, 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 New York. Now every act that's ever been from Jacksonville to Chickapin has always wanted to be in the palace. Though they're a wow and canker key and get a raise in salary, their ultimate goal will always be the palace. We'll kill them in the palace, we'll slay them in the palace, we'll wow them in the palace, we'll lay them in the aisle. They'll love us in the palace, they'll cheer us in the palace. <laughs> Benny and Woods were a flop in the palace. Some performers are doomed forever to be second raters, never to reach the big time. Violinist Jack Benny was one of these. He would never succeed. Well, it was after Jack joined the Navy that he discovered himself to be a comedian. There was nothing mysterious about it. He appeared in the Great Lakes Review, and the author, Dave Wolf, gave him a few lines to speak, and people laughed at him, that was all. When the war ended, Jack went back to Baldville, but as a single this time, emphasizing comedy and using the violin just to fill out the act. Not long after that, Jack fell in love. He was wandering around the May Company in Los Angeles one day in search of a new... I, I, I beg your pardon, but where can I find men suit? Four aisles over and three aisles down. Well, well, thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, what do you sell? I sell ladies' hosiery and things. Oh, oh, yes, I, I just remember that, that's what I need, some ladies' hosiery and things <laughs> for uh, uh, my, my sister. Really? Can I help you in your selection? Uh, definitely. Here and when I buy my suit and, and whenever I need anything else. Ha, ha, ha. That's fine. That's just fine. Guess what her name was. Guess what her name was. My name was Mary March that day that Benny bought his suit. But now I'm Mary Livingston and Mrs. Benny DeBoot. Her name is Mary Livingston and Mrs. Benny DeBoot. As Mrs. Jack Benny, Mary tried hard to forget the comfortable security she'd given up for a portable existence in hotels and trains, but she was pretty unhappy the first year, packing, unpacking, checking in, checking out. Whenever Jack would play a town that Mary thought was swell, she'd find a nice apartment and fix it up real well, and just when she'd begin to think that they were there to stay, Jack would get a booking 1,500 miles away. One day he got an offer to do a Broadway show. That's for me, said Mary. Just say the word. Let's go. We'll get a nice apartment near Central Park, and then we'll hope and trust and pray we'll never have to move again. So Jack assumed the starring role in Carol's Vanities, and they were sitting pretty, as pretty as you please. But just when they had signed a lease and paid the bills they owed, the Vanities closed its New York run and went out on the road. So Jack turned to radio as a solution to his problem. He auditioned and auditioned and auditioned to no avail. Finally, the New York columnist Ed Sullivan invited Jack to make a guest appearance on his program. A far cry from his familiar Jello again, these are the first words that Jack Benny ever uttered on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Benny talking. There will be a slight pause while you say, who cares? <laughs> 
You know, Ed, I, I just got in from Hollywood, but I'm going back in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be in a new picture with Greta Garbo. They sent me the story last week, and it's a very novel idea. When the picture first opens, I'm found dead in the bathroom. <laughs> it's, uh, it's sort of a mystery picture. I'm found in the bathtub on Wednesday night. <laughs> It wasn't long before Jack had his first sponsor, Canada Dry, and that was the start of a career almost unsurpassed in radio. He had swell help at first from writer Harry Kahn, but in recent years, his authors have been Bill Morrow and Ed Beloyne. And let us not forget Harry Baldwin, Jack's faithful secretary, who's been with him ever since his early days in radio. Most of America listens on Sunday nights to hear the familiar strains of... J-E-L, hello to you. J-E-L, hello to you. You'll hear this old familiar sound on every Sunday night When Jack Benny comes around to make your Sabbath bright Say a hello to you Means half an hour of fun that's new He'll tell you how he killed him at a Wednesday matinee Complain about the awful salaries that he has to pay No matter what he talks about, you're glad to hear him say Say a hello to you We must have music, so play, Phil you're okay, Phil, you know the way, Phil. He murders the English language and he panics all the dames. He plays the kind of music a jitterbug acclaims. And then he found out long ago you simply can't embarrass Phil Harris. We must have a singer, so sing, Denny. Your fans are many, so sing, Denny. He's as Irish as a shillelagh. Yeah. Shillelagh. And he hits a high C daily. Yeah, daily. Whenever Jack puts on a play, the boy that plays the menace is Dennis. We must have an announcer, so sell Don. Do it well, Don. Give him Don. He weighs a cool 265, and then he loves to kid him. It must have been those six delicious flavors that undid him. But when they need a man to push the Maxwell up the hill, son, it's Wilson. We must have a comedian, so here's Mary, 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 quite contrary. She reads the most outrageous poems that you have ever heard, and when she isn't doing that, she's giving Jack the bird. The one who has Jack Benny on the verge of Harry Carey is Mary. We must have a butler, so bring on Rochester. I'm coming, boss. Bring on Rochester. He's a dusky devil, but on the level, he's really a wonderful yes man. His main concern is he'd like to learn what happened to the gas man. There's always a crowd around him asking for autographs. Jack and Mary do all the work and he gets all the laughs. The folks back in Waukegan, there's a sort of testimonial. Planted a tree for Jack one day in manner ceremonial. Now this made quite a hit with Jack, and proudly he would boast, but the poor tree died. Fred Allen says it's because the sap was on the coast. J.E.L. hello to you. J.E.L. hello to you. When Jack does his programs away from home, you may have heard him say just before signing off, Good night, Joni. Joni is his baby girl, and Jack carries her picture and brags about her just like any proud father. And so on his 10th anniversary in radio, we pay tribute to a man who has consistently topped the list of radio comedians. A man who has made the world laugh and laughs at the world. A man who still remembers the friends he made on the way up. Comedian, star maker, and good fellow, Jack Benny! Jack Benny! Jack Benny! Please say hello! Thanks to NBC and you, Ken Carpenter, and to Gordon Jenkins for a swell job of directing. And thanks to all the others who participated. It really was a thrill, and I got a big kick out of it. I'm sure my cast did, too. Here's a dessert, ladies and gentlemen, a really swell dessert that will please the eye and tease the taste. 
It's a grand springtime delight called Jell-O Cubes with Strawberries. And what a rich, enjoyable treat it is. Full of tempting, tantalizing flavor and one of the most colorful desserts you've ever seen. It's easy to make, too. Simply prepare one package of orange Jell-O as you usually do. Turn into a shallow pan and chill until firm. Next, cut into small cubes and arrange in sherbet glasses with sweetened sliced strawberries. Then serve either plain or with cream and watch the whole family smile approval. For beguiling flavor, for sheer attractiveness, and for easy, inexpensive preparation, this new dessert hits a new high. So try it soon. And see if you've ever tasted anything more delicious than sweet, juicy red strawberries mingled with tiny, shimmering cubes of golden orange jello. This is the last number of the 30-second program in the current Jell-O series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. This has been a pretty hectic week for me, ladies and gentlemen. I have so many people to thank, I don't know where to begin. However, I would like to express my gratitude to those who appeared on the NBC program Friday night. Claudette Colbert, Herbert Marshall, the Quiz Kids, Eddie Cantor, Ed Sullivan, Ole Olson, Ed Thorgerson, and Alois Havrilla. Thanks a million. Well, Mary, I'm pretty tired. I think I'll go home. Where's my hat? I threw it away. It doesn't fit you anymore. Oh, yes. Good night, folks. May we thank the Signal Oil Company for the services of Gordon Jenkins this evening. Everybody loves a grand dessert, and featured on many dinner tables these days are Jell-O. Wait a minute, Frank Bingman. Are Jell-O? Don't you mean is Jell-O? Well, you didn't let me finish. What I was going to say was, featured on many dinner tables these days are Jell-O puddings. Jell-O, you know, is a delicious gelatin dessert. And Jell-O puddings are rich, luscious puddings as smooth as cream and simply unrivaled for mellow melt-in-the-mouth flavor. So whenever you order Jell-O, order Jell-O puddings in all three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. Jell-O puddings are really swell. This is the National Broadcasting Company. program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with The Knot Was Tied and then Sonata, played by the orchestra. <laughs> the birthstone from May, the emerald, is a jewel that is said to bring real contentment. And the same thing is true, ladies and gentlemen, of that perfect jewel of a dessert, Jell-O. For there's nothing like a grand meal topped off with a rich, shimmering mold of Jell-O to put a person at peace with the world. Jell-O's beautiful jewel-like colors hold a promise of true enjoyment, a promise that is always fulfilled by Jell-O's delightful goodness. You'll find in Jell-O a new dessert flavor that comes from Jell-O's superb flavor, a flavor as refreshing as the juicy, ripe fruit itself. And you'll be pleasantly surprised to discover how easy Jell-O is to prepare because it dissolves instantly even in lukewarm water and sets as quick as a wink. So try Jell-O tomorrow, friends, in any of Jell-O's six delicious flavors, strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, or lime. And by the way, the next time you try a strawberry, raspberry, or cherry Jell-O, just notice how much better they are than they've ever been before. Each has a new, improved flavor obtained by using a natural flavor base artificially in hand. And the result is something really swell. A rich, unique goodness that you get only in genuine Jell-O. Try a colorful mold of bright, tempting Jell-O tomorrow. The knot was tied in Ensenata, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as we mentioned last week, Jack Benny has started production on his new picture, Charlie's Aunt, in which he masquerades as a woman. So without further ado, let us eavesdrop on Jack's dressing room at 20th Century Fox Studio, where he's getting ready to go on the set. Take it away. Now, Rochester, hurry up. I want that cork that's pulled tighter. I'm pulling, boss. Ooh. 
You don't have to put your knee in my back. What's the matter with you? You've been half an hour getting me dressed. Well, boss, I'm not used to women's clothes. What you need is a maid. I don't need a maid. Just use your head, that's all. You ought to know that my pantaloons go under my petticoat. <laughs> now, let's see. Uh, hand me my wig. Old Faithful or the one you wear in the picture? <laughs> The one I wear in the picture, with the curls on it. I want to be all dressed in my costume by the time the gang gets here. They're coming over to watch me shoot. Here you are, boss. Thanks. Darn it, these curls always get in my eyes. Oh, well, I'll just have to peek through them. <laughs> According to the blueprint here, you got on backwards. <laughs> backwards? Obviously. Well, how do I know about this stuff? Oh, by the way, Mr. Carnegie, you're supposed to be my makeup man, and all you do is sit in the corner and stare at me. Why don't you get started? Well, frankly, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> oh, you don't? Well, let me tell you something. My makeup man at Paramount never had any trouble. He used to make me look good. I know. The whole industry's talking about it. <laughs> oh, don't be smart. Now, get over here and make me up, or I'll tell Mr. Zanuck on you. He's the head of the studio, and I play polo with him every Saturday. Will you please hold still? Hold still, hold still. Now, close your eyes. I want to glue your eyelashes on. Oh, all right. Get going. What's that? I did it again, boss. I caught another mouse. <laughs> Rochester, how many times do I have to tell you that's not a mouse trap? That's a bustle. <laughs> The idea. A bustle? Yes. Okay, I'll take the cheese out. <laughs> take everything out. I have to put it on in a few minutes. There. There, that's fine. What are you talking about? You've got the lashes on my lower lid. I look like I'm peeking over a head. <laughs> a fine thing. Oh, nobody will notice it. They will, too. <laughs> now, now paint my lips on, will you please? And I'll give you a hint. They go horizontal, not vertical. <laughs> what a makeup man. Come in. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Well, get a load of those eyelashes. You look like you're peeking over a head. You see? You see? I told you. <laughs> now, now put them where they belong, Mr. Carnegie. Oh, very well. <laughs> what a dodo. You think you know everything, don't you? If you didn't remind me of my mother, I'd punch you right in the nose. <laughs> oh, yeah? Mary, hold my dress. <laughs> I'll show him. Now, Jack, be careful. He's got much longer fingernails than you have. What do I care? Sit down, Mary. Oh, say, Jack, here's that pair of earrings you wanted to borrow. Thanks. Well, what do you know? I gave you these earrings for Christmas, didn't I? Yeah, one in 39 and one in 40. <laughs> well, they're very expensive. Oh, Rochester. Yes, ma'am. Stop with that yes, ma'am. <laughs> Rochester, as soon as the picture is over, remind me to return these gold earrings to Miss Livingston. Don't ever drop them in spinach. You'll never find them. That green is antique. And we'll get a better gag later. Now, Mr. <laughs> <Tommy. laughs> Now, Mr. Carnegie, will you please finish making me up? After all, I'm not supposed to be Betty Grable. In the first place... Hey, Jack, look who's on the horse. It's Mr. Zanuck. Hello, Mr. Zanuck. Hi, ho, Freddy! <laughs> See, isn't that a beautiful... Isn't that a beautiful horse, Mary? He keeps it right here on the lot. You ought to know, eh, Jack? <laughs> Mary, if you mention one word about that to anybody, you'll get yours. Say, Rochester, run over to the set and ask the director how soon he'll leave you. Yes, sir. Oh, say, boss, can I put in a word for myself? Rochester, I've already explained to you that you're not going to be in this picture. You're out of it. Well, don't look for a long run on Central Avenue. <laughs> They'll like it. Don't worry. Now get over to that set. Okay. 
Here's Mr. Wilson and Mr. Day, boss. Oh, hello, Don, Dennis. Oh, hello, Jack. Hi, Mary. How are you doing? Well, what do you think of me, boys? Oh, you're pretty as a picture, Jack. Mr. Benny, what are you wearing a dress for? Well, Dennis, in the picture, Charlie's aunt, I'm Charlie's aunt. Oh, well, why doesn't Charlie have an aunt that's a woman? Well, he has got an aunt that's a woman, but I'm his aunt that's a man. I mean, I mean, when his real aunt doesn't show up, I'm the aunt that takes his aunt's place. Do you understand? Who, me? <laughs> Who the heck do you think I'm talking to? <laughs> Sit down, Dennis. I'll explain it to you later. Hey, Jack, this is a pretty swell dressing room we've got here. Beautifully furnished, isn't it? Yes, Don. Frigid air, shower, bath, and everything. Oh, boy, a shower. Certainly is lovely, Jack, but what's that pitchfork doing in the corner? <laughs> Mary. <laughs> Uh, yes, Don, it is lovely. This is about the swankiest dressing room on the lot. But what about that pitchfork? Oh, that. Uh, there's a clause in Jack's contract. He's got to take care of Mr. Zanuck's heart. <laughs> never mind. Why, I never heard of such a thing. Well, you see, Don, I have what is known as an actor stable boy contract. <laughs> see, they have a lot of those two-way agreements. See, mine is like a producer-director contract. Only... Only you're in their kitchen. <laughs> well, it's more or less of a personal favor, so I don't mind. Of course, I could kill my agent. <laughs> oh, well. There we are, Mr. Benny. You're all made up. Thanks. I'll see you on the set. Okay. Bring your pitchfork, you little devil. Get out of here! <laughs> I have to put up with that guy every morning. But at that, I do look cute in this outfit, don't I? You certainly do, Jack. You know, I think these curls are just the right touch. Hey, listen to that. Who's taking a shower? It must be Dennis. He went in there. Oh, well, I'll be darned. I hope the kid didn't forget to take his clothes off. I'll bet eight to one he sings. Well, naturally, all tenors sing in the shower. Sing, Dennis. You know, I think these curls add just the right touch to my face. They get a song out Well, uh, very good, Dennis. You can dry yourself now. Where are the towels? In the laundry. They'll be back Thursday. <laughs> okay. As soon as they come, throw one in. I will. The kid's got more patience. Say, I wonder... 
I wonder why they don't call me on the set. By the way, Jack, is Phil coming over to watch your work today? Yeah, he'll be along pretty soon. Say, what do you think about Phil getting married? Wasn't that a surprise? It sure was. And incidentally, kids, I got a great idea. When Phil comes in, let's not say a word about it and see how he takes it. Yeah, let's make off like we don't know anything about it. Oh, he's so embarrassed he won't know what to do. Now, look. <laughs> look, kids. Look, kids, as soon, as soon as he walks in, I'll... That must be the set for him. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. The director says he'll be ready for you in about ten minutes. Okay. In the meantime, can I ask him about me being in the picture? Rochester, I told you there's no part for you. The scene is in England. You can't be an English butler. No, but I can be a carbon copy. <laughs> Never mind. Tell the director I'll be over in a few minutes. Okay. Cheerio, boss. I wish he'd stop bothering Mr. Mayo. Do you think Archie Mayo is a good director for you, Jack? Oh, he'll be marvelous. He's made a lot of important pictures. The Great American Broadcast, Four Sons, Marco Polo, Convention City, Petrified Forest. Well, if he made Petrified Forest, he'll be perfect for you. <laughs> well, maybe that's a funny gag, but I don't get it. Now, ribbing is all right here, Mary, but when we're on the set... Hey, wait a minute, I'll bet that's Phil. Now, remember, no talk about his marriage. Come in. Well, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Mary. Don. How are you, Phil? How's the boy? Oh, I can't complain. I've been on a little vacation down in Mexico. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, did you, uh, uh, did you go down there for a rest, Phil? Yeah, I kind of wanted to change the scenery. You know how it is. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes, uh, Mexico is beautiful. Oh, cheers. Hey, Jackson, this is some dressing room. Sure is ritzy. You like it, Phil? You know, uh, Alice Faye used to have this dressing room. Alice Faye? Is she that cute little blonde? You know who she is. <laughs> and we can't hold back any longer, Phil. Congratulations. I hope you and Alice will be very happy. Congratulations, Phil. Oh, good luck, Phil. Atta <laughs> boy. Well, doggone, so you went and done it, huh? Yeah, believe me, Jackson, this is a life. Home every night for dinner, then I put on my slippers and we sit in front of the fireplace for hours. You two sit by the fireplace in this hot weather? Who knows about the weather? <laughs> well, love... Love sure is a wonderful thing. Well, as long as we're all here, let's go over on the set. They're waiting for me. Okay, Jack. I'll take this mouse trap along. That's my bustle. Take it. So long, Dennis. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. If you run across a towel, let me know. We will. Come on, kids. Stage four is right down this way. Oh, by the way, Jack, uh, before you start shooting, is there any place in the picture where you can mention Jell-O? Well, if it could be done in a subtle way, Don. Have you any suggestions? Well, I noticed that your wig has six curls on it, so I thought it'd be rather clever if they were in different colors, like strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Well, yes, that's novel, all right, Don, but you see, this picture is not in catchy color, so they wouldn't identify the flavors. They would if you hung a fruit on each curl. <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. Well, Don, that might be good for a flash, but I doubt that it would sustain through the whole picture. I'll keep it in mind, though. We turn to our right here, fellas. Say, Jack, isn't that Cesar Romero coming towards us? Where? Oh, yeah. Joe, this costume I got on fools all the boys. Watch the work with him. He's handsome. Hello, Mr. Romero. Hello, miss. Get this. Hello, Cesar! Hello, Jack! <laughs> Oh, nuts. He's the only guy that didn't fall for it. Gee, I hope I know my line. The director gets so mad when I hold up. Oh, hello, Mr. Danny! Hi, ho, buddy! <laughs> Gee, he's so proud of his organization. And you can't blame him either. Gee, that's a beautiful horse he's riding. It sure is. Is that a Palomino? No, it's a pal of Jack. <laughs> Uh, here's the stage, fellas. Now, listen, Mary, I'm warning you for the last time. When we're on that set, I don't want you to be wisecracking all the time. Mr. Mayo isn't temperamental, but I'm taking a chance now bringing you on the set without permission. So you just sit over in that corner and watch out for the...
Well, this is it. You see, fellas, this set represents an English garden. Come on, they're going to shoot over there by the gate. Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Quiet on the stage. Listen, boys. Cut out that noise. The director's in a race. Now settle down. Uh, those, uh... Those are Mr. Mayo's assistant directors. They used to be a trio in Waterville. Baldy, Bride, and Baldy. <laughs> nice boy. Huh? Say, Jack, who's that fellow crawling around on his hands and knees? Where? Oh, that's Pev Marley, the cameraman. The cameraman? Yes, he broke his glasses the other day, and he's afraid he'll bump into something. <laughs> I hope the sound man doesn't lose his ear trumpet. Say, Jackson, ain't that Kay Francis standing over there? Yes, we're doing our first scene together in the picture today. Come on over, Phil. I'll introduce you to her. Now, wait a minute, Bob. What are you trying to pull? You're talking to a married man. <laughs> well, what are you getting excited about? I'm only going to introduce you to the girl. Well, you know how weak I am. <laughs> All right, Phil. Stay here with Don. I'll see you later. Quiet, please. Quiet, please. All this noise must faulty. We're head men here. The land and ear. To Baldy, Clyde, and Baldy. We have no hair. <laughs> you know, I, um... You know, I worked with those boys once in Peoria. They used to do a trapeze act. Two of them fell off a lot. <laughs> well, um... Excuse me, fellas. I'm going over and uh, I'm going over and talk to Kay Francis. Uh, I've never met her, Jack. Can I come along? Not now, Mary. You charge me twenty-five cents to come on this set, and I want to meet Kay Francis. <laughs> All right, come on. Now, Mary, Mary, don't let this get around. But I hear that Kay's nuts about me. Oh, you think every girl you work with in a picture is nuts about you. Well? You haven't got as much sex appeal as a smoked white fish. Oh, yeah? I'll go up any, against any white fish you dig up, sister. <laughs> I'm telling you, the girl likes me, so don't start anything. Well, hello, Kay. Oh, hello, Mother. <laughs> mother, it's me, Jack. Pardon me. You you look gorgeous in that outfit, Kay. That dress is very flattering to your figure. Thank you, Jack. And that's a stunning gown you have on. Do you think so? Yes. But pull it up a little. Your tattoo shows. <laughs> oh, yes. I must remember that. Well, Kay. Uh, Kay, uh, here we are, finally making a picture together. Kay Francis and Jack Benny. See, isn't it thrilling? Gosh. Aren't you excited? Aren't you, Kay? What do you want me to do, pant? <laughs> well, no. No, of course not. Are you sure you're nuts about Jack? Mary. <laughs> oh, uh, pardon me, Kay. This is Mary Livingston. Oh, hello, Mary. I've always enjoyed you on the radio. It's a pleasure to meet you. Well, that's... Too, too sweet of you. <laughs> Mary, what's the matter with you? Uh, don't, uh, don't pay any attention to her, Kay. She's always a little jealous. Oh, I don't mind. After all, Mary and I have something in common. Oh, are you jealous too? No, but I used to shop at the May Company. <laughs> Ah, uh, very good, Kay. Very good indeed. Give me my quarterback. <laughs> Nothing doing. You met her, didn't you? You know, Kay, I was just thinking. The scene we're going to do today is where you find out I'm not Charlie's aunt, but that I'm really a man. And that's the beginning of our romance. Yes, I've read the script. Oh, have you? Well, it's a wonderful situation, but it lacks something at the finish. Don't you feel that we ought to embrace and kiss each other so that the audience will realize we're in love? Don't you feel that way? Frankly, I feel a kiss there, you know? I mean, uh, a kiss would seal our relationship. Well, why does a kiss a seal? 
Well, I'm serious, Kay. Well, I don't agree with you, Jack. A kiss at that point would spoil the entire story. Oh. Uh, well, don't you think that... Jack, why don't you speak to the director about it? Okay, Kay. Well, that's quite a pun. <laughs> oh, okay, Kay, yeah. That's a good one. Jack Jerk, there's another pun. <laughs> Mary, please. Yes, Kay, I'll speak to... Oh, here comes Mr. Mayo now. Uh, uh, hello, Mr. Mayo. Hello, Archie. Hello, Jack. Hello, Kay. Well, Archie, here I am, raring to go. We'll find out. Uh, now, Kay... Uh... <laughs> now, Kay, you understand the first scene we're shooting is the one where you discover that Jack is really a man. Yes, Archie. And as I understand it, the situation comes to me as a surprise. Exactly. Oh, Archie... Archie, uh... <laughs> oh, Archie, Miss Francis had a rather good suggestion a moment ago. She thought that at the finish of the scene, we ought to embrace and kiss each other. Isn't that a good idea? Why, Jack Benny! I mean, how, uh, how do you feel about it, Archie? I don't feel about it. The kiss is out. Oh. Oh, well, tough luck, Kay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's too bad. They told me about you, but I wouldn't believe it. Well, I... Uh... Now, come on, now, you lovely people. Let's rehearse it the way it's written. All right, all right. Oh, pardon me, Archie. This is Mary Livingston. Oh, how do you do? Hello, Archie. You ought to lay off the starchy. <laughs> Mary, he's not so plump. Now, listen, Jack, let's get going. Let's rehearse. Well, Mary insulted you. She said you were fat. Well, I am fat. Okay, okay. All right, now, everybody, quiet for rehearsal. Quiet, please. Quiet, please. They're ready for rehearsal. Hickory, dickory. Dickory, doc. The mouse ran up the bustle. Oh, Mother Goose! Oh, what? What is this, anyway? Come on, let's cut the clowning. Now, you've got the first speech, Kay. You've just found out that Jack is not Charlie's aunt, but you kid him along. Yes, I understand. And, Jack, you're still the woman. Yeah, I get it. Now, go ahead, Kay. Read your first line. <clears throat> So you're Charlie's aunt, eh? That's a coincidence. I knew your late husband quite well. I knew your late husband quite well. Well, Jack, what are you waiting for? The Robert E. Lee? <laughs> oh, pardon me. I was worried about Dennis Day. He needs a towel. <laughs> <laughs> um, give me, uh, give me that again, Kay. So you're Charlie's aunt, eh? That's a coincidence. I knew your late husband quite well. Oh, did you really? Hiya, Jack. You're a woman. Oh, did you really? Hiya! Oh, did you really? How's that? I mean, how's that? Is that a woman? Nobody I know. Well, that's the best I can do. Well, now, look, Jack, your voice is all right, but remember you're in England, so talk with an English accent. Well, Mr. Pearlberg, the producer, said I should do it my own way. I don't care what Pearlberg says. Talk with an English accent. All right, all right. Give me that lead again, Kay. I knew your late husband. I knew your late husband quite well, and I wish you were with him. That's not the lie! <laughs> now, please, Kay. Hey, Jack. What? I'm beginning to like her. Oh, stop. <laughs> now, Kay, give me the whole speech, will you, please? Oh, my goodness. Now, remember, Jack, an English accent. Go ahead, Kay. So you're Charlie Brown, eh? That's a coincidence. I knew your late husband quite well. Oh, did you, Riley? <laughs> Riley, what kind of an accent is that? Well, that's the best I can do. Anyway, I'm not English. I was born in Waukegan. I'm going to see Mr. Pearlberg. Quiet! Quiet! Quiet on the set! Oh, quiet, Now, cut that off, you guys. Heaven knows I'm not fussy. But if you think I'm going to change my personality and my character just to make you happy, you... Oh, hello, Mr. Zanuck! Hello! You've got another thing coming, and I'll tell you something else. This wig I'm wearing is too darn hot. Oh, go grab a pitchfork. I'm talking to Mr. Mayo. You know, Archie, this isn't the first picture I've ever made. I fought with other directors, too. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to read my lines my way. Come on, Kay, give me that line again. I ain't your late. Springtime is salad time, friends, and here's a salad that's right in tune with the season. It's called Cool Cucumber Salad. 
And the more tempting, taste-teasing salad just never was invented. It's easy to make, too. Simply prepare one package of lime jello as you usually do. Add one teaspoon of vinegar and a dash of salt and chill until slightly thickened. Then fold in one cup of diced cucumber, mold, and serve on lettuce with mayonnaise. You'll find this gay springtime salad a grand treat that the family will enjoy the whole year round because it has such a swell, tantalizing flavor and such an inviting appearance. And it's a salad you'll enjoy making because it takes almost no time at all. So start serving it now. For a delightful salad, try this intriguing combination of cool, crisp cucumbers and delicious lime jello. We're a little late, but thanks, Miss Francis and Mr. Mayo. Good night, folks. Cool, refreshing, homemade ice cream. It's easy to make. Inexpensive, too. And boy, is it swell. Yes, everybody has a good word to say for homemade ice cream. It's a grand treat and easier than ever to make with Jell-O freezing mix. Blended with milk and cream and frozen in your automatic refrigerator, Jell-O freezing mix turns out exquisite velvety smooth ice cream. And you can enjoy this deluxe ice cream in a whole variety of grand flavors. So get Jell-O freezing mix tomorrow for luscious homemade ice cream, freshly made when you want it, just the way you want it. This is the National Broadcasting Company. 